Section 28 of The History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kadir Carter The History of Prostitution By William Sanger Section 28 Chapter 22 Sweden and Norway Comparative Morality Illegitimacy Perfligacy in Stockholm Infanticide Foundling Hospitals Store Barnhorts Laws Against Prostitution Toleration Government Brothels Syphilis Marriage in Norway the ancient Scandinavian peninsula, land of the Skald and the Rune, with its Vikings and Beiskers, has sent down to us many a legend of war and conquest, but few of social manners or moral relations. The high esteem in which the ancient Germans held their women, and the affinity of laws and customs between the Norsemen and the Teutons, justify us in believing that the blue-eyed maids, of the Scandinavian heroes, were as much respected for virtue as beloved for beauty. The eternal versions in the Walhalla of Western mythology were not associated with the grosser pleasures with which the impure fancy of the Koran invested the horrors of the Mohammedan paradise, and the Norsemen through their posterity. The Normans introduced, among the other amenities of chivalry, that prominent obligation of true knighthood, de Vavudam, perhaps not the least humanizing incident of the institution. Passing by a long stride at once to modern times, we find in the joint kingdom of Sweden and Norway two territories as distinct in their social condition as they are in their geographical divisions. Norway has always been remarkable for a simple and hardy population of fishermen and small farmers. Elements in the highest degree favorable to virtue and independence, and their poverty and isolation from the continental interests of Europe, have exempted them from politics and war. Sweden, on the other hand, though not much wealthier as a nation, has had an hereditary nobility, and the ambition and ability of some of her monarchs especially of the great Gustavus, caused her to play a part in history wholly disproportionate to her territorial importance. If, however, the historical significance of Sweden be somewhat greater than that of the less pretentious sister kingdom, statistics do not accord to the former the same estimation, in point of morals as they concede to the latter. The average of illegitimate births, though not infallible, is generally accepted as a fair test of the immorality of a people. Taken by this standard, Sweden ranks lower than almost any country of Europe. But if the character of the general population be indifferent, that of Stockholm, out Herod's Herod. In Stockholm, in 1838, there were 1,137 illegitimate to 1,577 legitimate. In 1839, there were 1,074 illegitimate to 1,492 legitimate births. The average of illegitimate to other births in the capital and throughout the country was as follows. 1835. In Stockholm, 1 in 2.44. In other towns, 1 in 6.18. In the country, 1 in 20.41. Throughout the kingdom, 1 in 15.20. 1838. In Stockholm, 1 in 2.47. In other towns, 1 in 6.18. In the country, 1 in 20.01. Throughout the kingdom, 1 in 14.69.
1839. In Stockholm, 1 in 2.38. In other towns, 1 in 6.40. In the country, 1 in 20.01. Throughout the kingdom, 1 in 14.94. As regards the average of the whole kingdom, the proportion is much the same as that of England and France. What, then, must be the condition of the towns, and in particular of the capital? The figures are such as to justify the allegation against Stockholm of being the most immoral capital in Europe, and also the presumption that the late decrease in its population, from which it is but recently recovering, is a direct consequence of the vice that stains it. With so large an amount of illegitimacy, it is not surprising that infanticide should be of common occurrence. The penalty of this crime is death, although, from a growing aversion to capital punishment, it is generally commuted. There are numerous family hospitals throughout the kingdom of Sweden, one in particular, the Stora Barnhorts in Stockholm, established by Gustavus Adolphus, originally intended for the children of military men of broken health and fortunes. It has been perverted from the simplicity of its original foundation, and now receives children of all corners, who pay an entrance fee of about thirty-five dollars. No questions are asked on the presentation of an infant to the asylum, and, accepting the fee, it is in no respect different from the ordinary foundling hospitals. This very fee, however, it is considered by some writers, makes all the difference, as it in some measure justifies those parents who, having adequate means, choose to release themselves of the care and expense of their offspring and who use this payment as a solve to their consciences, considering that they have to that extent done their duty. The store Bonhorts is wealthy, having an income of above $150,000 per annum. In 1836, prostitution was forbidden by express enactment throughout all Sweden, and women who had not a legally recognized occupation were liable to imprisonment as disorderly characters. The prostitute, of course, came within the category. It was asserted at the time that there was no common prostitution, but a counter-statement was made by the jurist Angelot, who affirmed that every house of entertainment was a brothel, and every servant a loose woman. This prohibitory system did not work so well as had been anticipated, and in 1837 a change was effected. A large hotel was taken by the corporation, and after the plan of various cities in the Middle Ages, was managed by public officers. Thus a government brothel was established. Nor did this lewdness by authority have the desired effect. The brothel was filled with women, but no customers appeared. Private brothels were resorted to for a time and were opened under regular licenses. They have now disappeared, and as the inefficient police management never succeeded in repressing illicit prostitution, even while tolerated brothels were in existence, it will surprise no one to learn that Stockholm is now one vast, seething hotbed of private harlotry. There are lock hospitals throughout Sweden, established by public funds and kept up by direct taxation as a charge upon the municipal rates. The Stockholm Hospital for Syphilis in 1832 received 701 patients, of whom 148 were from the country and the remainder from the city. The capital contained in that year 33,581 persons of both sexes above the age of 15. Consequently, one person in every sixty-one was affected with syphilis. The superficial aspect of society in Sweden is certainly not such as here described. The upper classes are cultivated, polite, and observant of all the usual refinements of modern society, while, to the humbler classes, excepting that intercourse is free and unrestrained among them, there is no ground for attributing any unusual departure from modesty and propriety. 
Neither are the laws remarkably stringent. Although difficulties are thrown in the way of affiliation, they are the same in principle as those which have been adopted by the modern statute law of England. Still, that there is such an excess of immorality cannot be doubted. The official statistics of the country prove it, were any possible doubt thrown upon the statements of the many travellers, of the highest repute for correctness and reliability, who have noticed it. The latest publication upon the matter is from Bayard Taylor, who, writing from Stockholm under date, May 1st, 1857, says, I must not close this letter without saying a word about its Stockholm's morals. It has been called the most licentious city in Europe, and I have no doubt with the most perfect justice. Vienna may surpass it in the amount of conjugal infidelity, but certainly not in general incontinence. Very nearly half the registered births are illegitimate, to say nothing of the illegitimate children born in wedlock. Of the servant girls, shop girls, and seamstresses in the city, it is very safe to say that scarcely one out of a hundred is chaste, while, as rackish young Swedes have coolly informed me, a large proportion of girls of respectable parentage are no better. The men, of course, are much worse than the women, and even in Paris one sees fewer physical signs of excessive debauchery. Here the number of broken-down young men and blear-eyed, hoary sinners is astonishing. I have never been in any place where licentiousness was so open and avowed, and yet where the slang of a sham morality was so prevalent. There are no houses of prostitution in Stockholm, and the city would be scandalized at the idea of allowing such a thing. A few years ago two were established, and the fact was no sooner known than a virtuous mob arose and violently pulled them down. At the restaurants young blades ordered their dinners of the female waiters with an arm around their waist, while the old men placed their hands unblushingly upon their bosoms. All the baths in Stockholm are attended by women, generally middle-aged and hideous, I must confess, who perform the usual scrubbing and shampooing with the greatest nonchalance. One does not wonder when he is told of young men who have passed safely through the ordeals of Berlin and Paris, and have come at last to Stockholm to be ruined. Which is best, a city like Stockholm where prostitution is prohibited, or New York where it is tacitly allowed, or Hamburg where it is legalized? We have spoken of the difference between Sweden and Norway, and their moral relations. At first this is not apparent, for illegitimacy is as frequent in one as the other, but there are attended qualifying circumstances, which go to constitute a material variation in the conclusion to be drawn from the unexplained fact. We may remark that street-walking and open prostitution are rare, Illegitimacy is of considerable extent, averaging one in five, or, in some parts, one in three of the total births. The people are betrothed by the practice of the Lutheran Church a long time before the actual marriage. This is considered as nothing more than a wholesome check upon hasty unions in a general point of view. In Norway, however, this probationary period is extended to a limit beyond the endurance of flesh and blood. The wedding is a prodigious merry-making, and it is absolutely indispensable that the means for an extravagant hospitality should have been accumulated before the parties dare attempt the public ceremony. The profusion is so great as sometimes to dissipate a whole year's earnings. The obligation to this expense increases the delay required by the church, and it frequently happens that the affiance cohabit before the nuptial benediction is pronounced. As the betrothal is a half-marriage, the arrangement loses part of its offensive character in the eyes of the parties themselves, and also of their neighbors. The children are legitimized by the subsequent marriage, which takes place in by far the largest number of cases. In those occasional instances where the wedding ceremony is not duly completed, 
there is a particular legal act by which a child can be acknowledged. Failure of marriage under such circumstances or failure of natural duty to offspring is against the sentiment of the people. While these facts do not alter the actual concubinage or legitimacy, it is easy to understand that a considerable difference exists between such conduct, however reprehensible, and those habits which may be fairly characterized as licentiousness or profligacy. Norway is very far from being free of syphilis. Bayard Taylor says, Bergen is, as I am informed, terribly scourged by venereal diseases. Certainly I do not remember a place where there are so few men, tall, strong, and well-made as the people generally are, without some visible mark of disease or deformity. A physician of the city has recently endeavored to cure syphilis in its secondary stage by means of inoculation, having first tried the experiment upon himself, and there is now a hospital where this form of treatment is practiced upon two or three hundred patients, with the greatest success, another physician informed me. I intended to have visited it, but the sight of a few cases around the door so sickened me that I had no courage to undertake the task. We have no means of ascertaining whether the malady exists with the same virulence in the interior as on the coast. The habits of the people would seem adverse to the supposition that it does. End of section 28 Section 29 of The History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 29 Chapter 23 Great Britain History to the Time of the Commonwealth the first references to prostitution which we find in the works of the early British analysts are so vague that it is difficult to derive from them any very definite idea as to its extent and character. Among the crude efforts at legislation there are laws to enforce chastity among women, but whether the necessity for these enactments was owing to general licentiousness or to the existence of a regular class of prostitutes does not appear. At the period of the Roman invasion, the morals of the Britons were as low as might be expected from their nomadic habits. The population was divided into small communities of men and women, who appear to have lived promiscuously, no woman being attached to any particular man, but all cohabiting according to inclination, the carnal instinct being the feeling which regulated sexual intercourse. A sort of marriage was instituted, but with no idea that either of the parties to it should be restricted by its obligations. Its only object seemed to be to provide means for rearing the children, and to fix somewhere the responsibility of their nurture and support. A society constituted as this was can, of course, be considered scarcely a step removed from barbarism. The regulation to provide for the children was necessary to prevent depopulation, its tendency was to remove from the woman's path every obstacle to lust. Over the man it exercised but very slight control. A still further proof of the demoralized condition of the people is found in the gross ceremonies attending these marriages. The man appeared on his wedding day dressed in all the rude trappings of the time. The woman was entirely naked. A repulsive coarseness marked their licentiousness, and the rudeness of manners was nowhere more conspicuous than in the relations existing between the sexes. It is to be presumed that the Anglo-Saxons imported into England the laws and customs prevailing in their own country. The rules they made against adultery were frightfully severe. When a couple were detected in the commission of the offence, the woman was compelled to commit suicide, to avoid the greater tortures awaiting her if she refused. Her body was then placed on a pile of brushwood and consumed. Nor did her partner in guilt escape punishment. He was usually put to death on the spot where her ashes lay collected. These penalties would appear to be sufficiently severe, 
but in some instances worse were inflicted. Where the case was one of peculiar aggravation, the adulteress was hunted down by a number of infuriate demireps of her own sex, each armed with a club, a knife, or some other formidable weapon, and stabbed or beaten to death. If one party of her pursuers became weary of the sport, another took their places, until the victim expired beneath the blows. These extremely rigid ideas of the Anglo-Saxons do not seem to have been consistent, for while adultery was punished in the severe manner described, incest was not only permitted, but commonly practised, and it was even the custom for relations to marry within the closest degrees of consanguinity. But they were not long located in England before the more savage traits of their character were softened down, and the women soon found amusement more suitable to their sex than that of chasing their erring sisters as quarry. The marriage ceremonies also assumed a more refined and decent character, although the wife continued to be regularly purchased by her husband, and the contract was still considered a mere matter of bargain and sale. By the laws of Ethelbert, marriageable women were made commodities of barter, and enactments of this character are to be found in existence long subsequent to his reign. As the Anglo-Saxons were a hardy, vigorous race, and existed chiefly by hunting, fishing, and a rude and imperfect system of agriculture, it is not probable that prostitution existed among them to any great extent. The fatigues of the chase and field exhausted the energy of the body, and diminished the desire and capacity for sexual indulgence. And, living in small detached communities as they did, they knew nothing of the stimulating incentives of city life. Yet that prostitutes existed is proved by the fact that women, who were entitled by law to hold and dispose of property, bequeathed their wealth to their daughters, with the occasional stipulation that they should live chaste lives in the event of their remaining single, and not earn money by prostituting their persons. In the reign of Canute, a law was enacted by which anyone found guilty of adultery was to be punished by the loss of the nose and the ears. In the course of time, the crime came to be punished by a fine paid to the husband of the woman. The penalty soon fell into disrepute, as it was found that some husbands and wives took advantage of it to extort fines from persons possessing more money than prudence. By a subsequent enactment, the male adulterer became the property of the king, who might send him to the wars, or employ him at hard labour as he pleased. By a law of Edgar's time, the adulterer of either sex was compelled to live for three days in each week, on bread and water for seven years. This was treating the evil on physiological principles. We cannot infer any very strict condition of morals as the result of this harsh legislation. When punishment is carried to an extreme entirely disproportioned to the offence, it is as likely to fail in its object as mistaken lenity. Forgery and arson were more frequent in England when punished with death than they are at present, and, although we have no statistics of the time from which we can deduce any positive conclusions, we may reasonably imagine that neither the death penalty nor the other barbarous punishments substituted for it exercised any very powerful influence in the diminution of the crime among our hardy progenitors. It may have taught them greater caution and dissimulation in the prosecution of their evil purposes, but it did not render them the less eager to profit by the opportunities thrown in their way. It has been already shown that the founders of Christianity treated illicit sexual indulgence as a sin, and resorted to extreme measures for its suppression, but yet, to some extent, tolerated prostitution. Shortly after he had established himself in Britain, Augustine put some curious queries to the Pope, touching the manner in which chastity among converts to the new faith should be enforced. The nature of these interrogatories and replies 
forbids their appearance here. That Augustine required to be instructed on such prurient details proves that he was a believer in the Jewish observances of physical ablutions and cleansing of the person being necessary to the removal of moral impurities, and that he carried his scrutiny into the morals of his flock much farther than was consistent with modesty and good sense. However much his religious teachings might have improved the manners of the people, the regulations alluded to would have exercised no very salutary or efficacious influence over them. The lives of the early kings and rulers of Britain serve to illustrate the morals of the nation during their respective reigns, not only by exhibiting individual examples where the condition of the masses is hidden from view, but by affording us an index to that condition, when it is considered that the manners of the court have in all ages and all countries exercised an important influence on those of the people. Augustine converted Ethelbert, but his son, Endbald, deserted the Christian church because it refused its sanction to his mother-in-law becoming his wife. It is true that he afterward divorced her and returned to Christianity, but in this he was influenced rather by satiety than by the promptings of a reviving faith. Many of the other kings of the Heptarchy were as remarkable for the headstrong ardour of their passion as Endbald. Canulf of Wessex had, in the year 784, an intrigue with one of his female subjects, and frequently quitted his court to enjoy her society in the country. During one of these clandestine excursions, he was surprised and surrounded in the night by the followers of Kinchard, a rival pretender to the throne and murdered in the arms of his mistress. In the ninth century, prostitution seems to have been a prevailing vice throughout the country, and frequent references are made to it in the discussions of the period. In the arguments used in favour of tithes in the time of Ethelstan, it was held by some canonists that the clergy had a right to demand one-tenth of the profits earned by prostitutes in the exercise of their calling. It is but right to add that the church did not persist in enforcing this extraordinary claim. Edwy, who ascended the throne at the early age of seventeen, became involved in a controversy with the monks on the question, then first started, of the celibacy of the clergy. The celebrated Dunstan favoured the new doctrine, but Edwy opposed it. The youthful and inexperienced prince was no match for his sagacious antagonist, as he soon after discovered. On the day of his coronation, which took place soon after his marriage with his cousin Elgiva, whom he loved and resolved to wed, though she was within the degrees of consanguinity prohibited by the church, his nobles were indulging in the pleasures of the banquet, when it was discovered that Edwy had stolen away. Dunstan and Odo, Archbishop of Canterbury, conjecturing the cause of his absence, proceeded to the private apartments of the Queen, and found him in her company. They tore him from her, and dragged him back to the party. Elgiva's face was seared with a red-hot iron to destroy her beauty, and she was transported to Ireland. Her wounds being soon healed, and all trace of the injuries removed, she returned to her own country but was met by a party the archbishop had sent to intercept her, and put to death. Thus, professedly to preserve the morals of the king, these high ecclesiastics committed crimes of far greater gravity than a marriage even between persons more nearly related than Edwy and Elgiva. Edgar, who succeeded Edwy, was of a still more passionate and licentious disposition, he broke into a convent and carried off one of the nuns, named Editha, who was remarkable for her beauty. In the heat of passion he violated her person, and for the double offence of abduction and rape, the church, according to the peculiar morality of the time, punished him by compelling him to resign his crown for the period of seven years. By a curious inconsistency, he was permitted to retain possession of Editha, who lived with him as a concubine. Another of his mistresses he obtained by a less violent process. In passing through Andover, he accidentally met the daughter of a neighbouring noble, 
who fascinated him by her remarkable beauty. Listening only to the suggestion of his passion, he proceeded immediately to the residence of the maiden's mother, and, informing her of the violent love with which she had inspired him, demanded that she should be permitted to share his bed that night. The mother, fearing to excite the king's anger by a refusal, resorted to a stratagem by which she hoped to evade his wrath, and at the same time preserve the chastity of her daughter. She directed a handsome waiting-maid to introduce herself into the young lady's chamber, and the king was admitted after dark. When Edgar discovered the trick which had been played on him, he manifested no resentment, and the accidental partner of his bed became afterwards his favourite mistress. These were not his only amours. Elfrida, daughter of the Earl of Devonshire, was distinguished by extraordinary beauty, and the fame of her charms reached the court. Although she resided in the country, in strict retirement, and had never been a mile from home, Edgar, hearing of her beauty and doubting whether her appearance justified the extravagant praise lavished on it, sent one of his trusted favourites, Earl Athelwold, to her father's residence to make a report to him on the subject. Athelwold himself, like many a similar envoy, fell in love with the young lady, and informed the king that rumour had greatly exaggerated her merits, and that she was positively ungainly. This was sufficient to allay the king's curiosity, and Athelwold, shortly afterwards, secured the young lady's hand in marriage. He explained the matter to Edgar by remarking that it was her fortune which induced him to overlook her homely features. The king desired him to introduce her at court, and, Athelwold persistently refusing, the king suspected the true state of the case. He intimated to the earl that he had determined to visit the castle where she resided, and the husband, dreading the consequences, implored his wife to conceal her beauty as much as possible. Elfrida, womanlike, did precisely the contrary, and set off her charms by the richest and most becoming toilette in her wardrobe. Edgar was so enraged at the deception practised on him that he put the unfortunate earl to death and married the widow. The infusion of Danish blood does not seem to have exercised an improving influence on Anglo-Saxon manners. Judging from the following, the contrary may be inferred. Ethelred kept a number of Danish troops in his pay, who were stationed in different parts of the country. A complaint was made to the king that the Danes had attained such a pitch of refinement, and made such an advance in luxury, that they combed their hair daily, and were guilty of other acts of personal embellishment equally reprehensible. Worse still, it was averred that the women looked with favour on these practices of the Danes, and that the latter debauched the wives and daughters of the English, and disgraced the nation. It is evident that women who could thus easily be led away were only virtuous from the want of opportunity. The legislation of this period shows that prostitution was not only tolerated, but indirectly encouraged. If a man seduced the wife of another, he was compelled by an early Saxon law to pay a fine to the husband, and to procure for him another woman, whom he was to remunerate for admitting him to her bed. This was not only offering a direct premium to prostitutes, by providing for the debauching of a woman every time another chose to be seduced, but it shows that females were in the habit of cohabiting with men for hire. The fines for adultery were graduated according to the rank of the woman. If she happened to be the wife of a nobleman, her chastity was valued at the moderate sum of six pounds sterling, about thirty dollars, while the wife of a churl brought to her husband, as a salve for his injured honour, about a dollar and a half. The effect of these enactments could not but exercise a demoralising and injurious influence on the manners of the people. They reduced the estimate of female chastity to that of a cheap marketable commodity, whose loss could be repaid by a small money compensation. By the laws of Ethelbert, a man was permitted to buy a wife, provided the purchase was made openly, and many such transactions are recorded, the price being sometimes paid down in money, and sometimes in palfreys and other kinds of property. The practice, however, was soon modified, and it became necessary to obtain the consent of the bride. 
The husband was compelled to support and protect her, and to treat her with respect. A couple desirous of contracting marriage were formally betrothed in presence of the priest, and this practice, having something of an ecclesiastical obligation, without any of its legal force, was frequently productive of the same evil consequences as in Norway at the present day. This custom of betrothal prevailed down to the time of Elizabeth. The Normans introduced into England, if not a higher standard of morals, at least a greater refinement in vice. Their laws were moulded by the spirit of the feudal system, which they imported with them. Under their sway, society was divided into two classes, feudal lords and their vassals. The lord could dispose of the person and property of the vassal, limited indeed by certain restrictions, but still leaving so much power in his hands as to render the latter a virtual slave. Thus, by the laws of the time, a vassal who seduced or debauched his lord's wife or near relative, or who even took improper liberties with them, might be punished by the forfeiture of his land. When a baron died, the estate is cheated to the king, who took immediate possession, and kept it until the heir applied to do homage for it, and pay such a fee as the king might demand. If the heir happened to be a minor, the king retained possession of the estate until he reached his majority, and when the inheritance devolved on a female, the king might give her any husband he thought proper. He often turned this privilege to account by selling the right to the hand and fortune of an heiress. Geoffrey de Mondeville paid Henry the Third a sum equal to about twenty thousand dollars for permission to wed Isabel, Countess of Gloucester, with the right to all her lands and revenues. Even a male heir could not select his own bride except by purchasing permission from the king, otherwise he had to accept his majesty's choice. We have no means of estimating the amount of licentiousness arising from these arbitrary regulations, but we only require a little acquaintance with human nature to arrive at the conclusion that they must have been a prolific source of vice. The husband being selected by the king from purely mercenary or interested motives, no attention was, of course, paid to disparity of ages or other circumstances on which the purity of the marriage bed depends. When the inclinations are forced in this way, women as well as men are apt to revenge themselves on their partners by seeking illicit enjoyments. Mercenary marriages, when projected, as they are even in our day, from sordid motives on the part of parents or guardians, almost invariably lead to infidelity, and many an old dotard who forces himself upon a girl under age merely serves as a screen for her clandestine amours. In the reign of Henry the Third, grave disputes occurred between the civil and ecclesiastical courts on the subject of bastardy. The common law deemed all children to be illegitimate who had been born before marriage. By the canon law they were held to be legitimate if the parents married subsequent to their birth. When a dispute of inheritance arose, it was customary for the civil to issue writs to the spiritual courts, directing an inquiry to be instituted into the legitimacy of the claimants, and as the bishops always returned answers in accordance with the canon law, all persons whose parents had married at any period were legitimate. When it is considered how strongly most parents feel for the honour of their offspring, the tendency of such decisions to increase prostitution becomes apparent. It may be considered unjust to inflict disabilities on the child for the sins of the parent, but such penalties undoubtedly have the effect of imposing a check upon concubinage. End of section 29。section 30 of the history of prostitution。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 30. Chapter 23. Great Britain. History to the Time of the Commonwealth. We have stated that the king claimed the disposal of the hands and fortunes of the heiresses, 
The barons claimed a still greater privilege from their tenants. In some localities, the feudal lord insisted upon enjoying the person of one of the daughters of each tenant who happened to be blessed with a plurality of them. He returned her to her parents within a given time. Every extreme is followed by a reaction in the opposite direction. The abject condition of women, as indicated by the foregoing facts, led to the institution of chivalry, which elevated her from the position of a slave and the mere instrument of sensual gratification to that almost of a deity, thus assigning her a rank as much above her real sphere as her former one had been beneath it. Previous to the advent of this system, women could not appear at any public exhibition or place of amusement, unless accompanied by a band of armed retainers. Any female encountered alone and unprotected was liable to insult. Chivalry, if it did not put an end to, greatly modified this state of things. By its rules, each of its members was constituted a champion of female virtue and honour. No man was admitted into the order whose valour was not above suspicion, and a word uttered by him derogatory to the beau sex excluded him from its ranks. No woman, however, was deemed worthy of knightly protection who had not preserved her honour, it being to that quality alone that knighthood volunteered its safeguard. At public ceremonies, if a woman of easy virtue ventured to take precedence of a woman of honourable fame, she was immediately reminded of the impropriety of her conduct by some member of the order, and compelled to retire to the rear. This recognition of virtue had a strong tendency to promote female chastity. It could not put a stop to voluntary prostitution, but it at least prevented virtuous women being necessitated to yield their honour to force. It held out, moreover, an attractive premium to correct conduct among the sex, by making it the object of heroic exploits, celebrated in the romantic lays of minstrels and troubadours. Its observances have a fantastic aspect in the light of modern civilization, but they unquestionably exercised a powerful corrective influence over the female character, so degraded at its commencement, while at the same time they elevated that of the male sex by teaching them to respect themselves. In the wars of the period it was against the rules of chivalry to take women prisoners. When a town was captured and entered by victorious troops, the first step taken was to make proclamation that no violence should be offered to any female. This conduct was so much at variance with the notions and habits of soldiery that the feelings which sustained chivalry must have taken deep root in the minds of all classes to restrain the passions of the military strengthened as they were by dissolute habits and the absence of opportunity for their gratification during service in the field. To such an extreme was this feeling of deferential courtesy to the sex carried that the Normans were severely censured for their conduct at the capture of the castle of Du Guesclin, it being alleged that they disturbed the repose of the ladies. But as the tendency of every human institution is to degenerate from its original purpose, the rigid purism which marked the foundation of chivalry soon began to relax, and disorders crept in and sapped the basis of a system which was too theoretically perfect to have any extended duration. It is difficult to ascertain the precise character of the relations which existed between the troubadours and the mistresses to whose service they devoted themselves, and who were frequently married women. The knight Bertram happened to lose the favour of his mistress, the wife of Talleyrand de Perigord, in consequence of stories which had been related to her, implicating his fidelity, and charging him with dividing his knightly attentions. He protests his innocence of these accusations, in a lay as impassioned as that of a lover to the object of his adoration, and invokes a number of knightly calamities upon himself if his devotion to her be not above suspicion. It is hardly creditable that the love of such ardent admirers was immaculate Platonism. On the other hand, the fact that husbands were rarely or never jealous of them goes some way to refute the idea that they had a more serious character. The lords of those times were proud of the protestations of regard offered to their ladies, and rewarded the troubadours with rich and valuable presents. 
The lords of our day, grown wise by experience, make a point of keeping all such interlopers at a distance. While chivalry poised its lance in defence of the Lucretias, and then of the Dulcineas of the day, the religious view of the commerce of the sexes was particularly ascetic. Although the most profound devotion was paid to woman in the abstract by the order, the church sought to encourage perpetual celibacy, the seclusion of women, and the separation of the sexes. The clergy were forbidden to marry, and the idea seemed to prevail that it was impossible for men and women to mingle without being under the influence of lascivious ideas, and ready to carry them into practice as soon as opportunity offered. The attempt to organize society on such a basis had an inevitable tendency to produce demoralization. Its obvious result, instead of promoting chastity, was to increase secret licentiousness and encourage prostitution. Even the voluntary vows of knights and troubadours were, in the end, as little observed as these ecclesiastical precepts. The profligacy of the troubadours became open and undisguised, and the virtue of their mistresses naturally kept pace with their example. The knights who enlisted in the Crusades, with a large amount of zeal and but a small share of wealth, supported their retainers by robberies on the way, and the females who accompanied them acted as camp followers usually do. No institution which deals merely in external observances can restrain immorality in circumstances favorable to its development, and hence chivalry was forced to yield before more powerful influences. That it served its purpose in elevating the condition of woman and in giving a better tone to society at large, it would be unjust to deny. Even when chivalry declined and ceased to inspire feats of knight-errantry, we find women, instead of falling back into the degrading position they had formerly occupied, employing themselves in intellectual pursuits, publishing books, mixing in public controversies, distinguishing themselves in the acquisition of languages, and even taking a leading part in the political affairs of the time. Among the women who acquired a historical notoriety by their position as royal mistresses, during the epoch comprised between the Norman conquest and the reign of Henry the Eighth, were the fair Rosamond, concubine of Henry the Second, and Jane Shaw, the mistress of Edward the Fourth. The misfortunes, as well as the generous qualities of these fair sinners, have thrown a sort of halo around them. Rosamond, surnamed the Fair, on account of her exquisite beauty, was the daughter of Walter, Lord Clifford, and was educated in the nunnery of Godstow. The popular tradition concerning her is that Henry, hearing of her charms, paid her a visit, but finding her virtue inflexible, had to exercise his authority as sovereign to compel her to yield to his wishes. He placed her in a building erected in the midst of a labyrinth at Woodstock, access to which could only be obtained by a clue of thread. Henry located her here to protect her from the jealousy of his queen Eleanor. She bore the king two sons, William Longsword, Earl of Salisbury, and Geoffrey, Bishop of Lincoln. During the king's absence in France, he entrusted the keeping of Woodstock and the care of the fair Rosamond to one Lord Thomas, who endeavoured to seduce her. In revenge for the rejection of his overtures, the faithless warden conducted Queen Eleanor to her retreat, and the latter is said to have mixed a cup of poison, which her minions compelled the unfortunate Rosamond to drink. It is also alleged that the Queen struck the poor girl on her lip with her clenched hand, some assert that Rosamond died a natural death in a convent at Oxford, and attributed the origin of the story of poisoning to the figure of a cup which was sculptured on her tomb. It is more probable that this effigy was placed there to commemorate the actual event. Rosamond was buried in the church of Godstow, opposite the high altar, where her remains lay undisturbed until they were ordered to be removed with every mark of indignity by Hugh, Bishop of Lincoln, in the year 1191, she was regarded by the people as a saint, if not a martyr, and wonderful legends were related concerning her. The celebrated concubine of Edward IV was the wife of Matthew Shaw, a goldsmith in Lombard Street, London. 
Edward possessed a good figure and pleasing address, and was fond of athletic sports and exercises, which he enjoyed in company with the citizens, among whom he became exceedingly popular. His popularity extended to many of the citizens' wives, and it was not considered out of the natural course of things that Mrs. Shaw should be removed from Lombard Street to shine at court as the royal favourite. Historians represent her as extremely beautiful, remarkably gay in temperament, and of uncommon generosity. The king, it is said, was no less charmed with her temper and disposition than with her person. She never made use of her influence over him to the prejudice of any one, and if she ever importuned him, it was in favour of the unfortunate. After the death of Edward, she attached herself to Lord Hastings, and when Richard III cut off that nobleman as an obstacle to his schemes, she was arrested as an accomplice on the ridiculous charge of witchcraft. This accusation, however, terminated in a public penance, with the loss of whatever little property she possessed. Notwithstanding the severities exercised against her, it is certain that she was alive in the reign of Henry the Eighth, when Sir Thomas More mentions having seen her poor and shrivelled, without the least trace of her former beauty. Mr. Rowe, in his tragedy of Jane Shaw, has adopted the popular story related to the old ballad of her perishing from hunger in a ditch, where Shoreditch now stands, but Stowe assures us that that street was thus named previous to the time of Jane Shaw. The example of none of the English kings had a greater influence in bringing the marriage tie into disrepute than that of Henry the Eighth. An effort has been made by Mr. Frond in his New History of England to redeem the character of this monarch from some portion of the obloquy with which it is covered, but there is no doubt that he was an unmitigated monster. Curious to say, during his youth and early manhood, he betrayed no evidence of the brutal passions which afterward moved him. He was the husband of Catherine for seventeen years before his domestic conduct incurred reproach. At that late period of his career he conceived a violent passion for Anne Boleyn, and, in order to get her to share his bed, sought to divorce his wife. From this period he seemed to become the prey of a restless concupiscence, which sought gratification in new objects of indulgence, and his passion for the women he married and beheaded was as short-lived as it was violent. There is reason to believe that his marriage with Anne Boleyn was more than adulterous. It is said Anne's mother had been more complacent to Henry than her duty to her husband or the laws of morality would have sanctioned, and we have the authority of Bishop Fisher for concluding that Anne was the result of this illicit connection, and that when the king expressed an intention of marrying her, Lady Boleyn exhorted him to abandon his design, as Anne was his own daughter. Henry was not to be deterred by an obstacle of this sort. He had great difficulty in procuring a divorce, and in the meanwhile he and Anne had become so intimate that she began to exhibit proofs of the connection which could not be concealed. A private marriage was resorted to, considerations of state rendering it prudent to keep the union secret. Catherine was divorced through the instrumentality of Cranmer, but Henry did not long continue to repose confidence in his new bride. Soon after the marriage was made public, and she had been formally inaugurated as queen, she attended a tilting match at Greenwich, accompanied by the king and a large concourse of spectators. The king observed her exchange amorous signals with one of the combatants, who was also one of her paramours. Henry had entertained suspicions of her connection with this man, and this proof, as he regarded it, of her infidelity aroused his jealousy. He left the scene on the instant, and returned to Westminster, where he issued orders to have her immediately arrested. She was thrown into prison, and tried on the joint charges of adultery and incest. She was accused of having committed adultery with four separate members of the king's household, and of having had incestuous intercourse with her own brother, Lord Rochford. She was tried, found guilty, and executed. Whether she committed the entire criminality laid to her charge, it is impossible to say, 
but that the incidents of the career just described were in perfect unison with the doings of Henry and his court, there is no doubt. Of the influence of such examples on the morals of the people at large, there is, unfortunately, as little question. If court manners and court styles are zealously followed, the vices that spring from them are not less assiduously improved upon. Henry's strong sexual passions, as well as his arbitrary disposition, were bequeathed to his daughter Elizabeth. However historians may differ as to the degree of her depravity, they all agree that her right to the title of Virgin Queen was exceedingly ill-founded. Many of her delinquencies with persons of the opposite sex were notorious, although perhaps difficult of proof. While she had not the slightest claim to beauty, she delighted in flattery, and could swallow any amount of gross and fulsome adulation. Her vanity so blinded her that she never perceived that the extravagant praises lavished on her personal attractions were merely covert satire. It is said that Elizabeth indulged in almost indiscriminate lewdness, and that Leicester, Hatton, Essex, Mountjoy, and numerous others shared her favours. In one of the notes appended to Hume's fourth volume, the nature of Elizabeth's dealings with a large number of her favourites is set forth, the author of the statement being the Countess of Shrewsbury. Mary, Queen of Scots, at a time when friendly relations existed between her and Elizabeth, wrote to the latter that the Countess had reported that Elizabeth had given a promise of marriage to a certain courtier, but, finding the marriage inexpedient, had dispensed with the ceremony and admitted him to her bed. The Countess also stated that she had been equally indulgent to Simier, the French agent, and that Hatton, another of her paramours, had spread many reports indicative of her extreme sexual passion. The immediate successors of Elizabeth were of a different personal temperament, and did not abandon themselves to such scandalous excesses. James I had no mistresses, and was not of a character to seek pleasure in extravagant licentiousness, but his court was not free from the scenes which had disgraced those of Henry and Elizabeth. James, being desirous of uniting the Earl of Essex with the Lady Frances Howard, daughter of the Earl of Suffolk, had the young couple betrothed, although they had not attained the age of puberty. The Earl was only fourteen years of age, while Lady Frances was but thirteen, and it was deemed proper for the youth to travel, until both should have arrived at the maturity necessary for the consummation of the marriage relation. After four years spent on the continent, the Earl returned to England, and found his affianced bride in the full lustre of extraordinary beauty, and of the fame which great personal charms excite. He had also the mortification to find himself repulsed when he approached her as a husband, and was met by every manifestation of dislike and contempt. He complained to her parents on the subject, and they compelled her to accompany him to the country. Although the young countess obeyed this mandate literally, the feud between her and Essex was far from terminated. She recognized him as her husband in name only, and sedulously kept herself aloof from his society, nor could any of his endeavors overcome her repugnance. The lady persisted in her obstinacy. The husband redoubled his attentions and importunities, but, finding that she was invincible, he finally abandoned the pursuit and separated from her. The cause of this strange conduct on the part of the countess was the passion which she entertained for a Scotch adventurer named Robert Carr, who had found a favourable reception from the king by whom he was created Viscount Rochester. She believed that by refusing to consummate her marriage with Essex, she would not be considered by the world in the light of his wife, and she hoped to procure a divorce which would enable her to marry Rochester. As their mutual attachment was ardent and their opportunities for being together frequent, they anticipated the probability of a marriage and indulged their passions without waiting for the ceremony. They did not find as much trouble in procuring a divorce as they had anticipated. The king, who had a strong partiality for Rochester, favoured their views, and Essex, finding that his suit was hopeless with his wife, opposed no obstacle to the nullification of his marriage. 
The grounds on which the Countess sued out the divorce were of rather a curious character. The chief allegation against Essex was impotency. At that time, a firm faith existed in the absurd notions that there were people who possessed the power of witchcraft, enabling them, among other things, to deprive a man of his virility. It was asserted and maintained that Essex had been subjected to this influence, and was therefore incompetent to occupy the position of a married man. The divorce was secured, and Rochester and the Countess experienced no further obstacle to the gratification of their desires. Rochester had previously consulted Overbury on the difficulties of his position, and the latter strongly advised him not to marry the Countess. These facts, coming to the ears of Lady Frances, she induced Rochester to have Overbury poisoned. On the discovery of the murder, Rochester and his wife were brought to trial and convicted, but the mistaken clemency of the king interposed between them and the doom they so richly merited. They passed the remainder of their days in obscurity, but as bitter enemies, and although they resided in the same house for many years, no word or message was ever exchanged between them. End of section 30section thirty one of the history of prostitution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by peter yearsley the history of prostitution by william sanger section thirty one chapter twenty four great britain history from the commonwealth to the present day on gaining the ascendant the Puritans endeavoured to reform the general corruption of society by cutting to the root of the disorders that afflicted it. Instead, however, of applying the knife judiciously, they excised the sound as well as the unhealthy parts. Their measures went to the extreme of killing all the affections and impulses natural to the human breast, in order to repress the excesses arising from too free an abandonment to them. Some fanatics, for instance, gravely suggested that, in order to put an end to fornication and adultery, all intercourse should be prohibited between the sexes. In our days it is found that innocent amusements are the best safeguard against criminal indulgence, but the Puritans thought otherwise, and looked upon joyous exhilaration of any kind as almost sinful. They enforced their gloomy doctrines with a tyranny as unbending as their tenets themselves were harsh and unnatural. Theatrical entertainments, dancing, etc., were sternly placed under ban, and Puritanism presented merely a heavy and murky atmosphere, with scarcely a social star to enliven its gloomy aspect. When the Restoration removed the oppressive weight of fanaticism from the public spirit, it rebounded as far above a healthy pitch as it had been formerly depressed below it, an immediate revolution took place in the manners and habits of the people. The theatres, which had been closed by the Puritans, were at once reopened, and the populace abandoned themselves to pleasurable excesses with an eagerness proportionate to the restraint which had been imposed on them. This license would in time have been checked by reflection, had not the impulse been supplied from the quarter where a repressive influence should have been exercised. The merry monarch and his court led the race in this national carnival, and the examples which they set only served to stimulate the public appetite for debauchery. Indeed, the court of Charles was little better than a public brothel, and the wit with which its orgies were embellished only served to increase the dangers arising from its conspicuous position, and its power over men's minds as the centre from which all rank and consideration flowed. The conduct of the courtiers was strictly modelled on that of their royal master, and their social accomplishments only imperfectly varnished over the gross features of a coarse sensuality. Women were flattered and caressed, but not respected, and the homage paid them was such as no decent woman in our time would consent to receive. The most faithful portraiture of the manners of this epoch is to be found in its dramatic literature, the staple incidents of the pieces represented at the theatres consisted of love intrigues, seductions, and rapes. The fop of the play 
never elicited such hearty applause as when he recounted his exploits in the ruin of female virtue among the citizens' wives. The theatre not only fostered lewdness by depicting it in glowing and attractive colours, but its actors spread abroad the corruption which it was their business to delineate. Their personal character corresponded in too many instances with the parts which they performed, and they re-enacted in private the debaucheries which they presented on the stage. The theatre itself became a central rendezvous for immoral characters, and the place where assignations were most conveniently fixed. Lively wenches, under the pretense of selling oranges to the spectators, frequented the pit, and took their places in the front row, with their backs to the stage. It was well understood that they were as ready to sell favours as fruit, and in fact that they had come from the neighbouring brothels for that express purpose. Deep drinking was another characteristic feature of the times, and bacchanalian orgies were freely indulged in by all classes, from the king to the beggar, differing little in the extremes to which they were pushed. Conversation, even in what was called the best society, was disfigured by the grossest obscenity and blasphemy, and bon ton consisted in the extravagance to which this vicious conduct was extended. Even the peasantry endeavoured to imitate the costumes and carriages of the courtiers, and country women were to be seen in flaunting dresses cut so as to expose as much as possible of the person. Up to this period no female had ever appeared upon the English stage. Where women were introduced, their parts had been filled by boys. Neither was it customary for a monarch to show himself at a public representation of a play, but when they were enacted for his amusement, the performance took place in some apartment of the royal palace. In Charles's reign, women, for the first time, appeared on the stage, and performed the parts allotted to the heroines of the drama. The king and queen became regular frequenters of the theatre, and encouraged by their presence the double entendre and broad indecencies of the pieces in vogue. We may remark, parenthetically, that unmarried actresses usually adopted the title mistress before their names, the word miss as then applied, signifying that she who bore it was a concubine. In modern days it is the habit to reverse this practice, as the marriage state is considered to divest the actress of half her attractions. There were but two theatres in London at this period. The King's Theatre, where the celebrated Nell Gwynne and Mrs. Rebecca Marshall were the chief actresses, and the Dukes, where another company performed. One day the reigning favourites at the King's Theatre had a violent quarrel, and Mrs. Marshall called Nell Lord Buckhurst's mistress. Nell contented herself with rejoining that she was but one man's mistress, though brought up in a brothel while Mrs. Marshall bore the same relation to three or four, notwithstanding she was the daughter of a Presbyterian. Their own accounts of each other leave no doubt as to their morality. The pieces represented in the London theatres in the time of Charles II were, as we have before stated, filled with indecent allusions, and their interest with the public turned on the number and intensity of these prurient passages. The ladies never attended the first representation of a comedy except in masks, and when the dames of the court, with their established reputations for gallantry, were apprehensive of being seen at them, some idea may be formed of the licentious character of the pieces most in favour. But many of these plays are still in evidence to speak for themselves. It will be seen that in the majority the plot is so framed as to admit the greatest license in libidinous allusions. The distinguished feature of them is that the most immodest passages are put into the mouths of women, and indeed we know that that actress was the most successful who took the greatest liberties with the text, and most improved upon its lewdness of expression. As a specimen of the general character of these plays, we may name All Mistaken or the Mad Couple, quite a favourite with the public in its day. The hero is importuned by six clamorous unfortunates, whose ruin he has effected, and dunned in addition by the nurses of their illegitimate offspring, for wages owing to them. The delectable superstructure of obscene dialogue, which is raised on this foundation, may be better imagined than described. 
The usual hour at which the theatres opened their doors was four in the afternoon, and after the close of the performances the audience generally repaired to some garden or other place of public amusement. Here scenes were enacted which proved a fit sequel to those witnessed on the stage. The Orange Girls had a superior, known as Orange Moll, who occupied a position somewhat analogous to that of the modern brothel-keeper. She attended the girls to the theatre, and superintended and directed their operations there. During the entre-acte, lewd conversations were carried on between the Orange Girls and the Gallants, which were interspersed with obscene jokes, and highly relished by the audience. The custom of interpolating the gay women who frequented the theatre was continued to a period comparatively recent. Everyone has heard the story of Peg Plunkett and the Duke of Rutland in the days when the gods of the Dublin theatre were esteemed the most discriminating, though boisterous and rollicking, audience of the three kingdoms. Charles selected several of his mistresses from the stage, for which he had a passionate fondness. Miss Davis literally sang and danced her way into his affections. Her conquest of the king was consummated by the manner in which she sang the popular ballad, My Lodging is on the Cold Ground. Charles thought she was deserving of warmer quarters, and raised her to his own bed. He established her in a splendid residence, and lavished on her the most extravagant gifts. The Queen at first resented the open and undisguised infidelities of the King, and publicly manifested her sense of them on one occasion by quitting the theatre when Miss Davis made her appearance on the stage. But, finding it impossible to reclaim him from his vicious propensities, she abandoned all hopes of restricting his libertinism, or even of keeping him within the bounds of conventional decency. The Countess of Castlemaine afterward created Duchess of Cleveland, was of a more jealous temperament than the Queen, and took a more characteristic revenge on Charles for his frailties. She took another lover, and went to reside at his house, very much to the comfort of her royal patron, who had a kingly dislike of trouble. After quarrelling with Lord Buckhurst, Nell Gwynne returned to the stage, but had not long resumed her profession when it was rumoured that she had made a conquest of the king. These reports were apparently contradicted by her continued appearance at the theatre, and the progress she made in her art, which could only be the result of careful study. A tragedy by Dryden was advertised, the principal character to be performed by Nell, but before the night of its first representation arrived it was found necessary to postpone the performance, owing to Nell's not being in a condition to appear. From this time her connection with Charles no longer remained a secret. Nell, like her predecessors, was not long suffered to maintain uncontested her supremacy over the king's affections. When the Duchesse d'Orléans, the sister of Charles, paid a visit to the English court in 1670, she had in her train a handsome maid, who was admired for her simple and childish style of beauty. Whether instigated by the courtiers who accompanied her mistress, whose visit was a political one, or prompted by her own sagacity, she made her acquiescence in the king's desires conditional upon his executing the shameful treaty which gave France such important advantages, and rendered Charles a mere tributary to the French king. This girl... Louise de Kerouai became the rival of Nell Gwynne, and had a child by Charles who was created Duke of Richmond. So scandalously public had the relations of Charles with the loose women who surrounded him become, and so flagrant and unblushing was the conduct of the latter, that the Queen could no longer reside in the palace of Whitehall, and accordingly removed to Somerset House in the Strand. This feeling of indignation on the part of Her Majesty soon extended to the virtuously disposed part of the public. Efforts were made to apply a remedy to the disorder which threatened to corrupt the whole framework of English society. In Parliament it was proposed to levy a tax on the playhouses, which had become undisguised nests of prostitution. 
The debate which ensued elicited a witticism which led to serious consequences to the gentleman who uttered it. On Sir John Birkenhead's remarking that the players were the king's servants and part of his pleasures, Sir John Coventry was imprudent enough to inquire whether the king's pleasures lay among the men that acted or the women. For this offence to Charles, he was waylaid by some of the courtiers who slit his nose and otherwise maltreated him. It is impossible, however, to deny that this very license of manners rendered the king popular with a certain class of his subjects. The only exception taken by them to his conduct was the selection of a foreigner as one of his mistresses, and even this would have passed without comment but for the political consequences of the connection. It was generally understood among the people that Mademoiselle de Kerouaille, or Mrs. Carwell, as she was commonly called, was an agent used for the purpose of securing the ascendancy of French interests. This brought upon her the hostility of the populace, who availed themselves of every opportunity of manifesting their dislike to her. Nell Gwynne was an Englishwoman, a Protestant, and the idol of the town. She was known by the title of the Protestant Mistress, while Mrs. Carwell went by that of the King's Popish Concubine. Nell was one day insulted in her carriage at Oxford, and came very near being mobbed by the populace in mistake for Mrs. Carwell. With her usual wit and presence of mind, she put her head out of the window and quieted the rioters by telling them that she was the Protestant W. Blank E. As the literature of the times reflected the general licentiousness of manners, it was not to be expected that the arts would escape their demoralizing influence. Most of the paintings then executed were characterized by the same freedom of expression which was used on the stage. There is an old print extant of the Duchess of Portsmouth reclining on a bank of violets, wearing no other covering than a lace robe, and in another Nell Gwynne is represented in the same semi-nude condition. It is said that this dress had belonged to the Duchess, and had been much admired by the King, but that, with her usual love of mischief, Nell had purloined it, greatly to the amusement of her royal lover, and very much to the chagrin and mortification of the Duchess. The King had his own peculiar way of celebrating the Sabbath. On that day he usually collected his mistresses around him, and amused himself by toying with them and humouring their caprices. We have a picture by a contemporaneous writer of one of his Sunday evenings at Whitehall, where the court resided. It was shortly before his death. Charles sat in the centre of a group of these women, indulging in the most frivolous amusements and apparently in high humour. At a little distance stood a page singing love-songs for the delectation of the king's mistresses, while round a gambling-table were seated a number of his courtiers, playing for stakes which sometimes ran as high as ten thousand dollars of our money. The orgies of the night were kept up until daylight broke in upon the revellers. At eight o'clock the same morning the king was seized with a fit of apoplexy, and died within a week. James the Second, though of a grave and stern character, was scarcely less amorous in his temperament than Charles. They differed, however, in their tastes. Charles required beauty in his mistresses, and Nell Gwynne and some of his other concubines were not only beautiful in person, but possessed of intellectual graces which gilded their gross sensuality. James, cared but little for personal attractions, and lavished his favours on coarse-featured and coarse-minded women. His wife was below him in rank, and he did not stoop to her for her beauty, for she was plain, if not downright ugly, in her features. He soon transferred his affections to a still plainer mistress, Arabella Churchill. His strongest attachment was, however, that which he entertained for Catherine Sedley, who possessed a powerful influence over him. She was the daughter of Sir Charles Sedley, and seems to have inherited from him the strong passions and reckless disregard of public opinion by which he was distinguished. 
Sedley's writings were more licentious than those of any of his contemporaries. His literary talents were not of a high order, but he possessed fair conversational abilities, which made his society attractive. The extreme dissoluteness of his life and disregard of all decency provoked censure even in that age of loose morals. On one occasion, after a drunken revel with some of his profligate companions, he presented himself on the balcony of a tavern near Covent Garden in a state of complete nudity, and commenced a harangue so full of lewdness and obscenity that the crowd pelted him with stones and other missiles, and compelled him to withdraw into the house. A daughter, inheriting these propensities, and brought up under the influence of this example, could not fail to become conspicuous for similar traits of character. Her person possessed none of the attributes which render women attractive. A lank, spare figure, a hollow cheek, sallow face, and an eye of glaring brightness comprised the sum total of her charms. Charles, whose taste was more cultivated, remarked that his confessor must have recommended Catherine to his brother as a penance for his sins. She herself had the discrimination not to be insensible to the truth of this remark, and was even in the habit of boasting of her own plain looks. Her taste for finery was as great as if she possessed attractions worth setting off by its aid. James, when he formed this connection, had advanced to middle age, and it is difficult to account for the influence which she contrived to exercise over him. On his accession to the throne, he promised the Queen to abandon her, but his good resolution soon gave way. Whenever the absence of his wife afforded the opportunity, Chiffinch might be seen conducting Catherine through the private passage leading to his chamber. Notwithstanding all the affected austerity of his manners, James was, in reality, but little better than his volatile brother. At no period in the history of England, as we have just shown, had the licentiousness of the court been greater than it was during the reigns of Charles the Second and James the Second, only to be exceeded, perhaps, by the fearful abyss of debauchery and atheism which a few years later was beheld in the courts of Louis the Fifteenth and the Regent of France. The vigour and intellect of the early part of the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, the magnificence of his tastes, and the glory of his enterprises, stand out in powerful contrast to the doings of the imbecile, corrupt, and utterly profligate and debased court of England. The influence of this most pernicious example it is somewhat difficult to arrive at. The great body of the people, especially in the country, in those times of difficult communication, were probably but little affected by the extravagance of the restored cavaliers, added to which there was a powerful leaven of religious feeling working through the country, which did not for some time settle down into the apathy that called for a new manifestation of Puritan feeling in the establishment of Wesleyan Methodism. In the upper classes of society, however, the core rottenness of the courts of Charles and James was yet felt throughout the reigns of the succeeding sovereigns, even down to the time of George the Third. The writings of contemporary authors, especially of the comic dramatists, the abstract and brief chronicles of the times, are a fair type of the public morals and intelligence in all ages. At this epoch, we have from these sources overwhelming evidence of the reaction which had taken place. After the removal of the compulsory restraint of Puritan control, the nation seemed at once to have lost its reason. Modesty and decency were badges of Puritan republicanism, and therefore unsuited to loyal men, who showed their attachment to the monarchy by their abandonment of decorum and violation of every moral virtue. The productions of the favourite authors teem with coarse images, unequivocal allusions, and gross facts. Wit degenerated into blasphemy, liveliness into obscenity, metaphors into lasciviousness. The scenes that took place in the court, and which constituted its daily amusements, were disgusting to the last degree. 
the mere commerce of the sexes and the libertinism of the period in that respect were the smallest vices and might almost be considered merely follies but the venality and corruption were open and shameless the courtiers cast aside the last rag of patriotic propriety and avarice cruelty lust and perjury filled the measure of wickedness on one occasion it is said an infant was prematurely born in one of the rooms of the palace and charles with many jocular remarks had the body conveyed to his own closet for dissection by his own hand an incident of such brutality which might be frequently paralleled by others equally bad in degree though different in fact shows the hideous destitution of all decency with which the court must have been cursed the pages of rochester etheridge buckingham congreve vanborough and fletcher in the close of the seventeenth and prior gay swift and scores of inferior writers in the commencement of the eighteenth century all exhibit this state of affairs while the noble muse even of a dryden could stoop to earn base applause by lending her powers to the decoration of vice and voluntarily quitting her native regions to wallow in the mire the vices of this period must have left an ineradicable taint behind them when after the full tide of iniquity had swept on and purer waters were succeeding we find lord chesterfield a british statesman of distinguished ability and high position thus advising his own son let the great book of the world be your principal study nocturna versati manu versati diurna which may be rendered thus turn over men by day and women by night i mean only the best editions while as we have already observed there was probably a wholesome religious element in a portion of the population which operated as an antiseptic against the rottenness of the court it is impossible but that the capital must have been imbued with the reckless iniquity outrageous dissoluteness and general immorality of the higher classes the poets playwrights essayists and biographers of the age all bear traces of the effects of bad example in high places on public manners a critic of those days says the accomplished gentleman of the english stage is a person that is familiar with other men's wives and indifferent to his own and the fine lady is generally a composition of sprightliness and falsehood a thorough disrespect for female virtue or rather the admiration of libertinism tainted the life's blood of the capital and when passing over the coarse wit of prior or the perverted genius of dryden we come to the sober and moderate writings of essayists and satirists we find material which gives us some little insight into the lower london life of the period and that which has more immediate interest for us in this inquiry in the delightful and ever youthful pages of the spectator there are some incidents of great pathos touching the state of those unfortunates whose condition was then as now one of the disgraces of civilization one paper contains a singularly apposite remark i was told says the writer a woman of the town by a roman catholic gentleman last week who i hope is absolved for what then passed between us that in countries where popery prevails besides the advantages of licensed stews there are larger endowments given for the incurabili i think he called them this manner of treating poor sinners has we think great humanity in it and as you mr spectator are a person who pretends to carry your reflections upon all subjects which occur to you i beg therefore of you to lay before the world the condition of us poor vagrants who are really in a way of labour instead of idleness at another time the spectator himself meets a slim young girl of about seventeen who with a pert air asked me if i was for a pint of wine i could observe as exact features as ever i had seen the whole person in a word of a woman exquisitely beautiful she affected to allure me with a forced wantonness in her look and air but i saw it checked with hunger and cold her eyes were wan and eager her dress thin and tawdry her mien genteel and childish this strange figure gave me much anguish of heart and to avoid being seen with her i went away but 
could not avoid giving her a crown. The poor thing sighed, courtesied, and with a blessing expressed with the utmost vehemence, turned from me. This creature is what they call newly come upon the town. The arts of the procuresses, their experiments on inexperienced country girls, their attendance at coach offices and public places to hunt for and entrap the unwary, the regular customers they have for new wares, the mode first of offering them to private sale, and then, when the first gloss is worn off, casting them on the public market, are all as true of 1858 as of the day for which it was written. In one case, the spectator, being at a coach office, overhears a lady inquiring of a young girl her parentage and character, and especially if she had been properly brought up, and has been taught her catechism. Desirous of seeing a lady who had so proper an idea of her duties to servants, he peeps through and sees the face of a well-known board, thus decoying a young girl just arrived in London. One amusing cheat in the business of these go-betweens is complained of by a lady correspondent. For a consideration they profess to introduce some ambitious foreigner or country gentleman to the favours of ladies of high degree, ruling toasts, leading bells, etc., some lady, Wilhelmina Amelia Skeggs, is foisted upon the deluded customer, who must, of course, be ignorant of the person of his inamorata, and he walks off boasting, in great self-gratulation, of his good fortune to the great injury of an irreproachable woman's fame. It was reserved for the reign of George the Third to give a favourable turn to court morals, and to make virtue respectable. The Georges I and II had exercised but a negative influence on their subjects. They were merely viewed as political necessities, and held in little or no personal esteem. Their uncouth manners, foreign mistresses, and decidedly heavy liaisons had no charm for either eye or fancy. With George III and his queen, virtue in courts became in some degree fashionable. The slough of libertinism in which Louis the Fifteenth and the Regent Orléans had plunged themselves, seemed in France to have created some reaction. Louis the Sixteenth in Paris and George the Third in London presented the rare spectacle to their respective subjects of two well-conducted men, whose domestic life and character were unimpeachable. But as the sons of George the Third, especially the Prince of Wales and the Duke of York, attained their majority, they were surrounded by bands of flatterers and parasites, who stimulated and encouraged the natural proneness of youth to pleasure and dissipation. The libertinism and excesses of the Stuarts again became bon ton, devoid, it is true, of political debasement and national dishonour, checked also by parental disapprobation and by the influence of public opinion. This, though very weak, was not quite powerless, and though lenient to the errors of youth, it drew an unfavourable comparison between the reckless extravagance and dissolute tastes of the princes, and the moderate and personally estimable conduct of the king and queen. The masses of the English people were distinguished for plain good sense and attachment to the cause of religion and morality, and although drinking, gambling, boxing, and racing were, in honour of the royal princes, fashionable amusements, and their attainment coveted and emulated by many of the rising generation, still the general sentiment of the nation at this period was condemnatory of these vices. Those inclined to charitable views of human nature found excuses in the temptations of youth, a fine person, a commanding position, and lastly in the infamous counsels of those who found political capital in the encouragement of these excesses, thereby promoting a division between the heir to the throne and his sovereign parent. Others there were who beheld in George the Fourth, whether as prince or monarch, a modern Tiberius, a man of ungovernable lusts, a ruthless libertine and a debased sensualist, without any redeeming qualities. As a fact, apart from causes and political prejudices, George the Fourth was undoubtedly a debauchee, and a man of dissolute habits, but he was a man of liberal education, of cultivated taste, of distinguished appearance and elegant manners. He and the Count d'Artois, brother of Louis the Sixteenth, 
were considered the most finished gentlemen in Europe, so far as mannerism went. These externals glossed over, and even lent a charm to, the vices of his youth, and the mysterious orgies of Carlton House were associated in the public mind with the brilliant wit of Sheridan, the manly grace of Wyndham, that beau ideal of an English gentleman, the vast talent of Fox, and the enchanting grace of Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire, the bright particular star amid a galaxy of minor luminaries. The respectability belonged to the court party. The genius and fascination were ranged on the side of the Prince of Wales. It is difficult even at this brief lapse of time, and when so many eyewitnesses are yet surviving, to speak with any degree of confidence of the state of general public morals in England, as affected by the French Revolution and the violent Tory and Whig contests of the period. The literature which preceded and accompanied the French Revolution went the whole length of undermining and unsettling every established institution, both of politics and religion, without building up an effective substitute in place of the structure destroyed. The doctrines of moral obligation and the balance of general convenience, which, according to the Volney, Voltaire, and Rousseau school, were to supersede the effete and worn-out dogmas of the gospel, were little known and less liked in England. At the outset of the French movements, the cause had the sympathy of the English liberals, but afterward, when the social and political excesses of the time disgusted even its moderate British supporters, and when the deep-rooted and apparently innate antagonism of the two nations was revived by the war, the hatred and contempt of the English people for French manners, French literature, French men, French everything, knew no bounds. Thus, while the leaven of Parisian philosophy was fermenting in the breasts of all continental Europe, it is our opinion that its influence in England was purely of a reactionary character, and as, under the last Stuarts, patriotism and libertinism went hand in hand, so, in the end of the eighteenth and the commencement of the nineteenth centuries, an Englishman's love of his own country and his hatred of France were associated with a detestation of the heresies of French philosophers and patriarchs. Of the effect produced on the morals of the people by the loose manner in which, previous to 1753, the marriage ceremony was performed, we have the evidence brought forward in the debate on Lord Hardwick's marriage bill. Anterior to that time, a boy of fourteen and a girl of twelve years of age might marry against the will of their parents or guardians, without any possibility of dissolving such marriage. The law, indeed, required the publication of bans, but custom and the dispensing power had rendered them nugatory. A dispensation could be purchased for a couple of crowns, and the marriage could take place in a closet or a tavern, before two friends who acted as witnesses. But dispensations were not always necessary. There were privileged places, such as May Fair and the Fleet, where the marriage ceremony could be performed at a moment's notice, and without any inconvenient questions being asked. Gretna Green, on the borders of Scotland, was long a famous place for runaway matches. It has been questioned how far the Scotch law of marriage was conducive to morality, but, judging from its effects upon the people themselves, it can scarcely be considered an ally of vice. This law, which has only been repealed within a few years, treated marriage as a civil contract, valid if contracted before witnesses, and required no ceremony or preparatory notice. That unions so formed were binding admits of no possible dispute. The question has been tried in the British courts of law on every conceivable ground, and their legality has been always affirmed. But in the case of marriage at Mayfair or the Fleet, the same certainty did not exist. Gretna Green is the first village after passing the dividing line between England and Scotland, and owes its fame to its locality. It has doubtless been the scene of many heartless adventures, for which the actual law of the land must be held accountable. The Marriage Act, which came into operation in 1754, had for its object the prevention of clandestine marriages in England, but did not interfere with the law of Scotland. It sought to effect this reform by making it necessary 
to the validity of a marriage without license, that it should take place after the proclamation of bans on three Sundays in the parish church, before a person in orders, between single persons consenting, of sound mind, and of the age of twenty-one years, or of the age of fourteen in males and twelve in females, with the consent of parents or guardians, or without their consent in cases of widowhood. The new Marriage Act of 1837 allows marriage, after notice to the superintendent registrars in every district, either in the public register offices, in the presence of the superintendent registrar and the registrar of marriages, or in duly registered places of worship. We have no statement as to the number of marriages previous to the year 1753, all we know is that from 1651 to 1751 the population only increased 16%, the increase being only 1,014,000 in 100 years. Since the Act of 1753 came into operation, the registers of marriages have been preserved in England and show an increase of marriages from 50,972 in the year 1756 to 63,310 in 1764. The rage of marrying is very prevalent, writes Lord Chesterfield in the latter year, and again in 1767. In short, the matrimonial frenzy seems to rage at present, and is epidemical. After many fluctuations, the marriages rose to seventy, eighty, ninety, and one hundred thousand annually, and in 1851 to one hundred and fifty-four thousand two hundred and six. Fourteen millions were added to the population, an increase of a hundred and eighty-seven per cent, or at the rate of one per cent annually. End of section thirty-one. Section 32 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bev Stevens. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 32, Chapter 25. Great Britain, Prostitution at the Present Time, Part 1. Influence of the Wealthy Classes, Devices of Procuresses, Seen at a Railway Station, Organization for Entrapping Women, Seduction of Children, Continental Traffic, Brothel Keepers, Fancy Men and Spoonies, Number of Brothels in London, Causes of Prostitution, Sexual Desire, Seduction, Overcrowded Dwellings, Parental Example, Poverty and destitution, public amusements, ill assorted marriages, love of dress, juvenile prostitution, factories, obscene publications, census of 1851, education and crime, number of prostitutes, female population of London, working classes, domestic servants, needlewomen, Ages of prostitutes, average life, condition of women in London, charitable institutions, Mrs. Fry's benevolent labors, the corruption of court morals alone, and without circumstances of national weight and moment, has seldom, we take it, affected the bulk of the population. It is nevertheless undeniable that a lax morality and a fortiori a system of absolute profligacy among the wealthy classes of society will contribute in a significant degree toward the increase of prostitution in metropolitan cities. It is in the service of her wealthy customers and patrons that the professional procuress is chiefly employed, and, stimulated by high gains, she plies her vile calling and exerts all her hellish ingenuity to discover new sources of amusement and gratification for them. In Fletcher's Humorous Lieutenant, written in 1690, a court bawd is introduced reading her minute-book, 
and calling over the register of the females at her command. Chloe. Well, Chloe should fetch three hundred and fifty crowns. Fifteen, good figure, daughter of a country gentleman. Her virtue will bring me that sum, and then a riding horse for her father out of it. Well, the merchant's wife, she don't want money. I must find a spark of quality for her. The representation of such character is out of vogue in these days on the English stage, but while the proprieties are observed, the omission is but a veiling of the subject. The reality exists, though unseen. In the London Times of July, 1855, an incident is thus related by a correspondent. I was standing on a railway platform at blank, with a friend waiting for a train, when two ladies came into the station. I was acquainted with one of them, the younger, well. She told me she was going to London, having been fortunate enough to get a liberal engagement as governess in the family of the lady under whose charge she then was and who had even taken the trouble to come into the country to see her and her friends, to ascertain that she was likely in all respects to suit. The train coming in sight, the fares were paid, the elder lady paying both. I saw them into the carriage, and the door being closed, I bowed to them and rejoined my friend, who happened to be a London man about town. "'Well, I will say,' said he with a laugh, you country gentlemen are pretty independent of public opinion. You are not ashamed of your little transactions being known. What do you mean? I asked. Why, I mean your talking to that girl and her duenna on an open platform. Why, that is Miss Blank, an intimate friend of ours. Well, then, I can tell you, said the Londoner to me, coolly, her friend is Madame Blank one of the most noted procuresses in London, and she has got hold of a new victim, if she is a victim, and no mistake. I saw there was not a minute to lose. I rushed to the guard of the train and got him to wait a moment. I then hurried to the carriage door where the ladies were. Miss Blank, you must get out. That person is an unfit companion for you. Madam Blank, we know who you are. That was one victim rescued, but how many are lost? In another case, the practices of a scoundrel named Finn were made the subject of a public warning by the Lord Mayor of London from his judicial chair. This fellow's plan was to advertise from abroad for ladies to go to Cologne or other places on the Rhine to become governesses in his family, which was travelling, and whose governess had unexpectedly left them or being taken ill, or was otherwise got rid of. The candidates were to pay their own passage to the place of rendezvous when the appointments of the situation were to commence. In some cases in which the practices of this rascal had failed of their full effect, he had succeeded in defrauding poor women of their funds, and they had found the utmost difficulty in making their way home again. While it is impossible to have any precognizance of the persons and circumstances among which these wretches find their prey, some cases are peculiarly within the scope of their operations. Young females who have lost their natural protectors and are brought into contact with the world under their own guidance are easily imposed upon by the pretended friendship of these persons, and being under a pretense of employment, inveigled into their houses, are there kept until their fall is accomplished by persuasion or force. It is said that women even attend regularly at churches and Sunday schools for the purpose of decoying female children. They first accost them and interest them without making any direct advances. The next time they proceed a little farther, and soon invite them to accompany them a little distance when they lead them to a brothel. They have been known to take the children away in the presence of the teacher, who, seeing them act as acquaintances, had no suspicion of the real nature of their associations. The London Society for the Protection of Young Females have recorded instances of children of eleven years of age 
being entrapped by procuresses into houses of prostitution. Those who are thus decoyed are not permitted to escape, nor to go into the streets for two or three months. By that time they are supposed to be incapable of retracing their steps, or to have become reconciled to their mode of life, and are permitted to go or remain. Occasionally they are turned adrift to seek new lodgings, their places being supplied by fresh arrivals. Some of these children find their way home again, but the majority of them are, of course, irretrievably lost, and continue in the course into which they have been thus indoctrinated. The procuresses have agents in different parts of London, whose business it is to discover young persons, servant girls and others, who are dissatisfied with their earnings and condition in life, and who may be considered suitable subjects. The number of servants out of place, in London alone, is enormous, many thousands in number, and as service is no inheritance, such a body constitutes a very favourable field of operations. The intermediate agents in these cases are small shopkeepers, laundresses, charwomen, and such others as, from their avocations, have the opportunity of becoming acquainted with young women in service. Common lodging-house keepers, too, residing in the suburbs of London, contribute their quota of assistance. Young women coming fresh from the country and sleeping in such places for a night receive recommendations to procuresses and brothel-keepers as servants. Intelligence offices for hiring servants, which in London are called servants' bazaars, and are not under any license, are visited by these people in search of new faces. In some cases, procuresses are found to act on behalf of particular individuals only. In one case, such a woman kept a small shop, to which she invited servant girls in the neighborhood after a little acquaintance. By her assistance, aided by liberal entertainment with wines and spirits, her employers, two men of property, were enabled to corrupt eight servant girls in a short space of time. A constant trade in prostitution is carried on between London and Hamburg, London and Paris, and London and the country. Three or four years ago a trial took place at the Central Criminal Court, London, of a man and woman who were engaged in the importation of females for purposes of prostitution. The prisoners were convicted. The details of the trial show that a regular organization existed. In some cases, Parisian prostitutes were hired in Paris for the London market by the ordinary agents in such contracts. In other cases, the parties in both capitals decoyed young women into their service on pretense of reputable engagements and shipped them over to their consignees. Of course, every care is taken in these matters to keep the transaction confidential, for although the English laws are practically most defective, still, in cases exciting any degree of notoriety, and in which the offence can be satisfactorily established by legal proof, prosecutions do take place. We cannot close this branch of our subject better than by once again quoting from the spectator, and giving a genuine letter, which, although written a century and a half ago, is just such a one as might, for a similar purpose, be penned at the present day. It as accurately describes the mode in which articles of trade in the procurous line are disposed of now as then. My lord, I, having a great esteem for your honour, and a better opinion of you than of any of the quality, makes me acquaint you of an affair that I hope will oblige you to know. I have a niece that came to town about a fortnight ago. Her parents being lately dead, she came to me, expecting to have found me in so good a condition as to set her up in a milliner's shop. Her father gave fourscore pounds with her for five years. Her time is out, and she is not sixteen. As pretty a gentlewoman as ever you saw. A little woman, which I know your lordship likes, well-shaped, and as fair a complexion for red and white as ever I saw. 
I doubt not but your lordship will be of the same opinion. She designs to go down about a month hence, except I can provide for her, which I cannot at present. Her father was one with whom all he had died with him, so there is four children left destitute. So, if your lordship thinks fit to make an appointment, where I shall wait on you with my niece, by a line or two, I stay for your answer, for I have no place fitted up, since I left my house, fit to entertain your honour. I told her she should go with me to see a gentleman, a very good friend of mine, so I desire you to take no notice of my letter, by reason she is ignorant of the ways of the town. My lord, I desire, if you meet us, to come alone, for upon my word and honour you are the first that I ever mentioned her to. Next to procuresses in this gradation of iniquity are the brothel-keepers, who, although often procuresses, are not necessarily so. Shakespeare, who included all human existence in the sphere of his observation, says of them, A bawd, a wicked bawd, the evil that thou causest to be done, that is thy means to live. Do thou but think what tis to cram a maw, or clothe a back from such a filthy vice, say to thyself, From their abominable and beastly touches I drink, I eat, array myself, and live. Canst thou believe thy living is a life? so stinkingly depending. Many of these persons have been prostitutes themselves, and when past service in the one branch of business have naturally fallen into the other. Others, without having been such, adopt the trade from inclination or circumstances. The condition of these people and the interior of their houses are as various as the people themselves. At the west end of London there is a considerable degree of style. In the lower parts of the town they are sordid and filthy habitations, fit only for deeds of darkness. They are confined to private streets, alleys, and lanes out of the great thoroughfares. The law is usually put in operation in England against the brothel-keepers as the representatives of the whole class. As they get the chief profits of the trade, so they run all the legal risks. The indictments against them, however, are comparatively few. There is no public prosecutor in England, as with us. The police administration of the metropolis, perhaps the best organized, the most efficient and cheapest department of the public service, does not include the prevention of brothels within its duties which are confined to the preservation of life and property. The prosecution of brothel-keepers and abolition of their establishments are usually undertaken by the parish authorities, when the places are so conducted as to become a nuisance to the neighborhood, and police officers merely interfere to prevent the assemblage of prostitutes in the public streets, or the solicitation of passengers by them. Virtually this provision is little better than a dead letter, and the women evade it by walking when an officer is in sight, and thus deprive him of the only proof which would enable him to make an arrest. Some of the girls who pay exorbitant board also stipulate to give their mistresses one half of their cash receipts, which are frequently very large in the case of attractive women amounting sometimes to one or two hundred dollars a week. The mistress is treasurer, and the prostitutes rarely succeed in receiving back what ostensibly belongs to them. The very prosecution before mentioned originated in a French girl's being cheated by the brothel-keeper. The clothing is furnished by the mistress, and for this she charges prices which absorb the entire earnings of the girls— she even contrives to furnish them with such a number of showy and useless garments that she keeps them always in her debt, and so has a lien on each to prevent her leaving, as long as she is a profitable member of the establishment. Some girls who have been seduced have, when entering on a life of prostitution, extensive and valuable wardrobes. 
the mistress runs them into debts of her own contracting, and if they become dissatisfied with their treatment and desire to leave, they are held for the debt. By the common law of England, all debts incurred for an immoral purpose are void, but this law is of little value to those who are ignorant of its existence, besides which the brothel-keepers have possession of the booty, and thus effectually drive the debtor to an adjustment of the matters in dispute. Such of the brothel-keepers as have no lawful husbands form intimacies with some man whom they support. In slang dialect there is a class of men called spoonies, who support the women or furnish them with funds when necessary. They set them up in business, become responsible for their debts, and assist them in all their difficulties. The fancy men are those who do nothing for them but live at their expense. The lower class of brothel-keepers have no spoonies, but they invariably have fancy men, who act as bullies and settle by physical force any disputes that may arise between the inmates and their visitors. These men spend the day in taverns and the night in the particular brothels to which they are attached, and are frequently felons of the deepest dye. Some of the brothel-keepers are married women and even mothers of families. The husbands are lazy, worthless wretches, addicted to gambling and drinking, and brutally indifferent to the sources from which their luxuries are supplied. In some cases the wealthier individuals have been known to send their children to good schools away from home, and to have kept them in ignorance of their own wretched vocation. Thus sin entails its own punishment. The number of brothels in London has been variously estimated. The whole number of houses at the last census was three hundred thousand and upward. Among them it was calculated, and probably correctly, that there were five thousand brothels, including houses of assignation. The rents of these establishments vary as much as the houses and situations, from fifteen hundred down to one hundred dollars a year. In good neighborhoods we should be slow to believe that landlords had any previous knowledge of the purposes to which their houses are to be applied. Independent of moral objection, such a house deteriorates the character of the property. Indeed, the clauses in leases of the great London properties are very strict, and include all objectionable trades as causes of forfeiture. The owners of the houses are of all classes. The Almonry of Westminster, once the abode of Caxton, which within these six or eight years has been pulled down, was one of the vilest aggregations of vice and crime in existence. This was the property of the dean and chapter of Westminster Abbey. The common law of England, as already mentioned in the matter of dress, prohibits the recovery of the rents of houses let for immoral purposes. Many of the brothel-keepers themselves hire houses, furnish them, and sublet them. It has been made a matter of reproach that landlords should, even indirectly, derive income from such sources. But poverty and vice are closely allied. Where poverty exists, vice will come. It is impossible for a landlord to exclude any class of tenants in a particular neighborhood suited to them, and those who know aught about the improvement and ventilation of large cities and the breaking up of bad neighborhoods are well aware that they are accompanied with a fearful amount of extra misery to the very poor. In a subsequent portion of this work we have endeavored to analyze the causes of prostitution as it exists in the city of New York. It may be reasonably supposed that the same reasons would be applicable to the kindred people of Great Britain. We give the following, mainly deduced from English writers, as indicating the sentiments of the best informed in that kingdom, as to the sources of so deep-rooted an evil, which must be sought in a variety of circumstances, national as well as personal. A professional man, Mr. Tate, to whose pages we have turned for information as to prostitution in Great Britain, 
classifies the causes as natural and accidental. The natural he subdivides into licentiousness of disposition, irritability of temper, pride and love of dress, dishonesty and love of property, and indolence. The accidental include seduction, ill-assorted marriages, low wages, want of employment, intemperance, poverty, defective education, bad example of parents, obscene publications, and a number of minor causes. Without assenting to the classification, we will accept the enumeration. The operation of sexual desire on the female sex is a mooted question among English writers on prostitution. Whether it is latent and never powerful enough to provoke evil courses until it is itself stimulated and roused into energy by external circumstances, or whether it be an active principle impelling the ill-regulated female mind to sacrifice self-respect and reputation in the gratification of dominant impulses, has been frequently discussed. Many consider that its influence on the inducement of prostitution is no less unsatisfactory of solution than the physiological problem, alleging that those who have followed the bent of their natural appetites would undoubtedly prefer to ascribe their lapse to other circumstances. This subject is treated more fully elsewhere, and it is needless to repeat here the views there expressed. That sexual desire, once aroused, does exercise a potent influence on the female organization, cannot be questioned. Self-abuse, which is a perverted indulgence of the natural instinct, is well known to English physicians as being practiced among young women to a great extent, though in a far less degree than among young men. Its frightful influences upon the latter have been the subject of the liveliest anxiety to those who have made the care of youth their profession, and this source of trouble is shared to some degree by female teachers. Such subjects seem by common consent to be banished from rational investigation by the majority of people, as if shutting one's eyes to the fact would prove its non-existence. This false delicacy is more injurious than is commonly supposed, for the unchecked indulgence in such habits is not only destructive of health, but in the highest degree inimical to the moral feeling, and directly subversive of all self-respect, leaving but one step to complete the final descent. Seduction the effect of undue familiarity and too unrestrained an intercourse between the sexes cannot be exaggerated as paving the way for the last lapse from virtue. It is precisely these familiarities which, in ill-regulated minds, excite the first impulses of desire, and even where such a result does not immediately flow from too free an intercourse, it breaks down that modesty and reserve which so much enhance the beauty of woman and constitute her best safeguard. The inclined plane by which the female, who permits the first freedom, glides unchecked to final ruin, though gradual, is very difficult to retrace. The unrestricted intercourse permitted, or rather encouraged between the sexes at places of public amusement, much facilitates the opportunities of seduction. Prostitutes frequently, and we believe with truth, allege seduction as the first step toward their abandoned course of life, and the allegation itself should induce a sympathy for the misfortune of their present existence. Although in some cases the story cannot be implicitly believed, at the same time there is no doubt that a heartless seduction— is but too frequent a circumstance in such cases, and contributes its sad quota of heavy account to prostitution. It is a general opinion that cases of so-called seduction in England occur between employers and female servants, and that of these are vast numbers. By seduction in such circumstances is meant the inducement to do wrong by promises or other suasives, 
in opposition to the commonly received idea, which makes the fall the result of strong personal attachment. In a work like this we must notice the largest definitions, and cannot consistently limit ourselves to the inducement customarily brought forward in law proceedings, namely a promise of marriage. In this sense, illegitimate children may be said to be the consequence of seduction. Certainly not all of them, however, because many persons, voluntarily and with their eyes open, enter upon cohabitation arrangements, but doubtless many are. Once seduced, of course, the female becomes herself the seducer of the inexperienced. The policy of English law of late years has been to compel the woman to protect herself, in the main a wise policy. But the balance of human justice is very unevenly maintained. The male, the real delinquent, incurs no legal punishment and but little social reprobation. Actions for seduction are very unpopular, and those brought bear but an infinitesimal proportion to the occurrence of the crime. The onus of proof in bastardy affiliations, of course, rests upon the woman. Of late years the alterations in the law have thrown great difficulties in her way by what is called the necessity of corroborative evidence, namely some kind of admission, direct or indirect, or some overt act which will furnish oral or documentary testimony other than the woman's unsupported statement. This may be strictly expedient, but it renders the man almost irresponsible, if he only play his part with knavish prudence. Lastly, popular feeling is against charges of rape. Acquittal is very frequent, and the usual rebuttal is to impeach the character of the prosecutrix. The opinion of one of England's greatest judges has passed into a proverb, No charge so easy to make, none so difficult to disprove. Queen Elizabeth's mode of proving her disbelief of rape is also expressive of public opinion. From the combination of these circumstances it would seem that seduction must, almost as a matter of course, lead to prostitution, inasmuch as, in ordinary English parlance, the mother of a bastard and a prostitute are almost synonymous. Overcrowded Dwellings The natural impulses of animal instinct in both sexes seem to be implicated in the effect of crowded sleeping apartments, as met with in the habitations of the poor, both in town and country. In the latter we have the show, and sometimes the reality, of family life and virtuous poverty. In the towns we find abodes of poverty sometimes honest, sometimes in closest propinquity or intimacy with vice, and there, too, we have the dwelling-places of the lowest depravity and vagabondism. Those who have not given their attention to the condition of the poor and the relation which their lives hold to the ordinary habits of decency and morality, have much difficulty in comprehending, or even believing, statements which embody the plainest everyday truths. It is hard to realize things as they are, if the mind has been full of ideal pictures of things as they should be. The dive ease of society has been often reproached with his ignorance of Lazarus. The sin lies exactly in that ignorance. As Carlyle finally says, The duty of Christian society is to find its work and to do it. Negative virtue is of no practical use to the community. But yet the ignorance is natural enough, and no easier of removal than other ignorance. It has been generally attributed to the wealthy and upper classes of society, but it exists just the same, differing only a little in degree, in the middle class and moderately rich members of the English social system. The misery and inconvenience which the poor suffer from the straightness of their domestic arrangements 
are beyond belief. Grown-up girls and boys sleep in the same bed. Brothers and sisters, to say nothing of less intimate relations, are in the closest contiguity, and even strangers who are admitted into the little home to help in eking out the rent are placed on the same family footing. This momentous question to the moral well-being of the poor has excited very lively interest in England, and has called into active operation several philanthropic associations, which have in view the employment of capital in improving and cheapening the dwellings of the working classes. In London this system of close lodging was carried to a fearful pitch. In some places from five to thirteen persons slept in a single bed, while in the country the evil was nearly as bad, although, from the slight restraint imposed by family ties, the actual evil is positively less, though the moral contamination is of nearly the same extent, and paves the way for other relations out of doors. The facts which justify these conclusions are to be found in a variety of shapes, parliamentary reports, statistical tables, appeals from clergymen, addresses from philanthropic associations, etc., etc. The Honourable and Reverend S. O. Osborne, a clergyman well known for his philanthropic exertions in behalf of the poor, says of country life in England. From infancy to puberty the labourer's children sleep in the same room with his wife and himself, and whatever attempts at decency may be made, and I have seen many ingenious and most praiseworthy attempts, still there is the fact of the old and the young, married and unmarried, of both sexes, all herded together in one and the same sleeping apartment. I do not choose to put on paper the disgusting scenes that I have known to occur from the promiscuous crowding of the sexes together. Seeing, however, to what the mind of the young female is exposed from her very childhood, I have long ceased to wonder at the otherwise seeming precocious licentiousness of conversation which may be heard in every field where many of the young are at work together. Mr. A. Austin, Assistant Poor Law Commissioner, says, The sleeping of boys and girls, young men and young women, in beds almost touching one another, must have the effect of breaking down the great barriers between the sexes. The accommodation for sleeping is such as necessarily to create early and illicit familiarity between the sexes. Without entering into disgusting details, the pain of perusing which could add nothing to the value of the statements, the conclusion is indisputable that much of prostitution, if not of prostitution for hire, certainly of prostitution from corrupt and profligate motives, is engendered by the vicious habits induced by habitual proximity of the sexes in early life. The prostitutes themselves frequently assign these habits as the commencement of their career of vice, and some even admit the breach of the closest natural ties during early youth, by reason of the two great facilities thus offered. The great importance of this want of decency and propriety in family life cannot be overrated. The contagious nature of vice is proverbial and it is almost impossible to imagine the power attained by ill-conditioned children, and the fatal readiness with which their sinful words and practices are propagated. The cheap lodging-houses are a pendant to the close-packed dwellings of the poor, although they do not produce the same early pernicious results as indecency and immorality in family life. The latter prepare the way to the scenes of the common lodging-house in which the lowest depth of vice is speedily reached. Here prostitution is habitual, a regular institution of the place. The smallest imaginable quantities of food can be purchased. Adults, youths, and children of both sexes are received and heard promiscuously together. The prices of beds are of the lowest from three to six cents, 
no questions are asked, and the place is free to all. A newcomer is soon initiated, or rather forced into all the mysteries of iniquity. Obscenity and blasphemy are the staple conversation of the inmates. Every indecency is openly performed. The girls recite aloud their experiences of life. Ten or a dozen sleep in one bed, many in a state of nudity. Indeed, the details of these places are horrible beyond description. Unmitigated vice and lustful orgies reign, unchecked by precept or example, and the point of rivalry is as to who shall excel in filth and abomination. Example is the next immediate cause in what may be considered the natural series. There are a few prostitutes who have children. That these latter should follow the same course is quite in the common course of events, although considerable anxiety is occasionally evinced by such women to have their children brought up to better courses. Such redemption is all but impossible. In ordinary life, however, the mind of youth is often perverted by direct evil example in the elders, and as we have already remarked, the corruption of the human affections in their fountainhead, family life, where they ought to be sweetest and purest, is more fatally demoralizing, and more certain to ensure eventual ruin than almost any other. Fathers and mothers are both wanting often enough in their duty, although it is a matter of universal faith that the influence and example of the father are of less importance than that of the mother. A bad man may have virtuous children, a bad woman hardly ever. There are cases where the mother and daughter sleep in the same bed, each with a male partner. In the city of Edinburgh there are two mothers, prostitutes, each with four daughters, prostitutes. Five prostitute mothers, each with three prostitute daughters, ten such with two daughters each, and twenty-four such with one daughter each, all following the practices of the mothers. Such influences brought to bear on the young are irresistible. This may perhaps account for the number of sisters who carry on prostitution. The effect of mere sisterly example would be sufficient to account for the circumstance, but the parental becomes almost a compulsion, inasmuch as the parent, in such circumstances the mother, will not only connive at, but be the main cause of her child's ruin for her own direct profit and advantage. This, indeed, seems more accordant with our ideas of the natural tendencies of prostitutes and procuresses than that such persons should be excessively anxious for their children's purity and moral welfare. End of section 32 Section 33 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bev Stevens. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 33, Chapter 25. Great Britain, Prostitution at the Present Time, Part 2. Poverty is an integral part of nearly all the conditions of life which we have to consider as incentives to prostitution. In some instances, more, perhaps, than may be generally credited, poverty is a direct and proximate cause of this vice. In other words, women previously and otherwise virtuous do prostitute their bodies for bread. In most of the cases enumerated, except that purely natural, but rare one, innate sexual desire, poverty is a remote cause. From the number of the human race who are under its griping, chilling pressure, poverty may be set down as a fruitful source of prostitution. The connection of political circumstances with the phases of public morals is more intimate than the consideration of the superficial differences of the two matters would at first sight imply. 
but an attentive comparison of the state of public prosperity with the state of public crime will show that crime is somewhat dependent on food. The man with a well-filled stomach is no foe to order. Prostitution, as a means of supplying the cravings of hunger, is part of the same connection. It is true that in England there are poor laws and workhouses, from and in which every destitute person, without reference to character, has a right to food and shelter. In the first place, however, the workhouses are objects of unmitigated aversion to the poorer classes. Various rules, in themselves hard, but rendered necessary by consideration for the ratepayers as well as for the beneficiaries, such as separation of husband and wife while receiving relief, separation of child and parent, etc., make the workhouse system odious to the worthy and honest poor, while the strict rules and the restraint and discipline enforced within the walls make it still more odious to those who place their happiness in a license and irregularity. Added to this, in populous and poor districts, the claims upon the workhouse in seasons of distress are too numerous for its capabilities. It is an awful truth that, notwithstanding the enormous revenues, nearly fifty millions of dollars per annum, collected for poor relief, and the immense establishments instituted throughout the country for the support and shelter of the distressed, sometimes the number of applicants is so great that their demands cannot be met. Possibly, if these unfortunates could be distributed throughout the kingdom, so that the poverty of one spot could be balanced by the comparative prosperity of another, the fearful starvation in the midst of plenty, which is occasionally witnessed, need not occur. But in the meanwhile, and until the time when all the schemes and devices of modern improvement and advancement shall be finally perfected, and universal happiness attained, there is a mass of inconceivable wretchedness to be dealt with. In Household Words, for November, 1855, Mr. Dickens gives a harrowing picture of London distress, of which he was himself an eye-witness. It was a dark, rainy evening, and close against the wall of Whitechapel Workhouse lay five bundles of rags. Mr. Dickens and his friend looked at them, and attempted to rouse them in vain. They knocked at the door, were admitted saw the master of the workhouse, and asked him if he knew there were five human beings, females, lying on the ground outside, cold and hungry. He did. At first he was annoyed. Such applications were frequent. How could he meet them? The house was full. The casual ward was full. What could he do more? When he found that Mr. Dickens's aim was inquiry, not fault-finding, he was softened. The case was certainly shocking. How was it to be met? Mr. Dickens said he had heard outside that these wretched beings had been there two nights already. It was very possible. He could not deny or affirm it. There were often more in the same plight, sometimes twenty or thirty. He, the master, was obliged to give preference to women with children. The place was full. Unable to do more, Mr. Dickens left. On getting outside, he roused one of these poor wretches. She looked up, but said nothing. He asked her if she was hungry. She merely looked an affirmative. Would she know where to get something to eat? She again assented in the same way. Then take this, and for God's sake go and get something. She took it made no sign of thanks, gathered herself up and slunk away, wilted into darkness, silent and heedless of all things. To what will not such misery as this compel suffering human nature? In times of commercial depression, the police of London note an increase of street prostitution. It is said in the cities of England that the permanent prostitution of each place has a numerical relation to the means of occupation. In Edinburgh there are but few chances of employing female labour. 
Glasgow, Dundee, and Paisley are the seats of manufactures, and employ female labor extensively. According to Tate, the prostitution of Edinburgh far exceeds its proportion of prostitution to population as compared with the manufacturing towns. It seems unnecessary to multiply instances of poverty and indigence inasmuch as the fact is most miserably indisputable. Shirt-making at three cents, pantaloon-making at five or six cents, unceasing labor of fourteen hours a day bringing in only sixty or eighty cents a week, and competition even to obtain this. As the London Times once said, The needle is the normal employment of every English woman. What, then, must be the condition of those tens of thousands who have nothing but that to depend upon? Of late years, too, a still farther competition has been introduced in that ingenious invention of our country, the sewing machine. In order to show the relation between unpaid and excessive labor and prostitution, we will instance a few cases. One young woman said she made moleskin pantaloons, a very strong, stiff fabric, at the rate of fifteen cents per pair. She could manage twelve pairs per week when there was full employment. Sometimes she could not get work. She worked from six in the morning until ten at night. With full work, she could make two dollars a week, out of which she had to expend thirty-eight cents for thread and candle. On an average, in consequence of short work, she could not make more than seventy-five cents a week. Her father was dead, and she had to support her mother, who was sixty years of age. This girl endured her mode of existence for three years, till at length she agreed to live with a young man. When she made this statement, she was within three months of her confinement. She felt the disgrace of her condition— to relieve her from which she said she prayed for death, and would not have gone wrong if she could have helped it. Such a case as this scarcely comes within the term prostitution, but she stated that many girls at the shop advised prostitution as a resource, and that others should do as they did, as by that means they had procured plenty to eat and clothes to wear. She gave it as her opinion that none of the thousands of girls who work at the same business earn a livelihood by their needle, but that all must and do prostitute themselves to eke out a subsistence. Another woman, a case more directly in point, also said she could not earn more than seventy-five cents. She was a widow and had three children when her husband died herself and her children had to live on these seventy-five cents. She might have gone into the workhouse and been there better supported than by her labor. Had she done so, the laws of the workhouse are inexorable. She would have been separated from her children. Although one child died, she was now so reduced that she could not procure food. She took to the streets for a living and she declared that hundreds of married and single women were doing the same thing for the same reasons. A widow who had buried all her children could not support herself. From sheer inability to do so, she took to prostitution. A remarkably fine-looking young woman, whose character for sobriety, honesty, and industry was vouched by a number of witnesses as unimpeachable, had been compelled to work at fine shirts, by which she could not earn more, on an average, than thirty-five cents a week. She had a child, and being unwilling to go to the workhouse, she was driven by indigence to the streets. Struck with remorse and shame, and for the sake of her child determined to abandon prostitution, she fasted whole days, sleeping in wintertime in sheds, once her child's legs froze to her side, and necessity again compelled her to take to her former course. Her father had been an independent preacher. These circumstances, and innumerable others, will establish incontestably the intimate relation which poverty bears to prostitution. A consideration of such circumstances as the foregoing 
and the everyday observation of hosts of others of a similar character, which will come within the cognizance of any one who searches into human motives, must incline all but the most outrageously virtuous to judge more tenderly of the failings and errors of their fellow creatures. All young females engaged in sewing are liable to the same distress, and the same resource against it is, of course, open to all. The hard labor and long hours are the least part of the evil, although in that light even there would be ground for commiseration. The real grievance is that the most patient and industrious cannot, by any hours of labor, earn a sufficiency to support themselves. It is true that the workhouse is the legal refuge of the poor, but the tender mercies of the workhouse have passed into a proverb. The policy of the poor laws, as administered, is to deter the needy from applying for relief, except in very extreme cases. Hence, many rules are made, and much formality is interposed, which render the legal provisions so irksome and unbearable that many fly to the nearest means of satisfying their wants, rather than demand their legal rights. Domestic servants are, in respect of their removal from absolute want while in service, more happily situated than those who are thus dependent upon the needle. But they are open to influences of another kind. We mean seduction by masters and male members of the household. Where this evil begins is an exceedingly difficult question to determine. When corrupted, they become themselves, by the very opportunities they possess, ready and dangerous instruments of corruption, and contribute to disseminate the poisons of immorality and of bodily disease. We have already incidentally mentioned that this class is at times open to a great deal of poverty and distress, namely when out of service, and at such times they are peculiarly the mark for the lures of persons who make seduction their business and profitable occupation. The domestic servants and the sewing women are the principal adult laborers of Great Britain, except the factory girls. In 1851 there were Female domestic servants, 905,165 Dressmakers, 270,000 Seamstresses, 72,940. Staymakers, 12,969. And of these, one-third were under twenty years of age. Places of public amusement in England are few when compared with those of the continent, and their influence must be proportionately less. On the continent, dancing saloons are a prominent feature, in England, this character of entertainment is almost unknown. In London, there are a few places of this sort, such, for example, as Cremorne Gardens. Mr. Tate lays some stress on the evil effects of dancing houses in Edinburgh. We should be inclined to think the cases of misconduct traceable to these places actually few in number, though not unworthy of notice. The single females who frequent dancing-rooms, theatres, and other similar places in England, without friends or family escort, have very little virtue to risk. The country fairs are far more injurious. They are indiscriminately attended by all ages and sexes, and their effects upon the female agricultural population are often very pernicious. Greenwich Fair, a three days scene of rollicking and junketing, was held at Easter and Whitsuntide, in the outskirts of London, but is now abolished. It had its uses a century or two ago, but recently had been attended by all the idlers of London, of both sexes, and was justly dreaded by the friends of youth. It is proverbial that more young women were debauched at Greenwich Fair allowing for its duration, than at any other place in England. Ill-assorted marriages are decidedly a cause of prostitution. 
Certainly breach of the marriage vow is one thing, prostitution for hire another. In estimating the number of prostitutes in Edinburgh at eight hundred, Mr. Tate adds two hundred to them under the head of married women, which he considers a crew from ill-assorted marriages. That the marriage was ill-assorted is plainly shown by its result, and that want of congeniality and temperament is the cause of prostitution, to the extent thus named, we have no ground to question. He speaks of such women selling their favours generally to one lover only, occasionally to any one who will pay. Although the latter forms what is commonly known as prostitution, no other construction can be put upon the former. Love of dress is another incident which many writers, and Mr. Tate among them, have introduced into the direct causes of prostitution. We should consider it doubtful if any woman ever positively sold her virtue for a new gown or a knot of ribbons. Of course, after the Rubicon is crossed, all subsequent steps are easy, and may be taken from any motive. The love of admiration, which, under regulation, is sometimes a commendable instinct, when uncontrolled, becomes a snare. The love of dress is a modification of this sentiment, and may help to work out the effect when other causes have overthrown the balance of the mind. Juvenile Prostitution We have now arrived, in the consideration of the causes of prostitution in England, at decidedly the most painful of all the phenomena connected with this condition of human life, namely, the immense extent of juvenile depravity. We have already sketched the evils of insufficient house accommodation and its noxious effects upon the morals of the rising generation. In this connection also, bad example is particularly prominent. Perhaps, indeed, with respect to the young, evil communications are the greatest dangers. The workhouse was formerly one great hotbed of vice, and the greatest license and irregularity prevailed in every department. That children born or brought up in such a place should grow up debased was perfectly in the expected course of things. Now, however, under the new Poor Laws Commission, the scene is stripped of its more revolting accessories. The sexes do not mingle, children do not associate with adults, some modicum of education is given. The sweetest and holiest of all ties, that of family, is yet wanting, and self-respect is totally deficient. In the absence of these protective influences, the wonder is, not that so many children should turn out ill, but that so many girls should turn out well. Formerly, also, there was a system of compulsory pauper apprenticeship, and the interests of the parish apprentice out of doors were very little looked after. This, again, has been altered, both in town and country, and the improvement is marked. Even with all this, it is recorded in the London Times, June 1848, that a correspondent visiting one of the metropolitan workhouses was struck by the happy and healthy appearance of the female children, and inquired of the master of the workhouse what became of all of them. He was informed that they were sent out, at the age of fourteen, as servants, or in other capacities, and that nine-tenths of them, after coming backward and forward from their places to the workhouse, eventually got corrupted and took to the streets. Factories are made accountable by many writers for much juvenile immorality and prostitution. Factories in England are, as most of our readers are aware, institutions materially differing in some respects from those of our own country. In no feature is there so wide a dissimilarity as in the character of the workpeople. The factory children of England are the offspring of the poorest of the community, whose only heritage is pauperism, with wages at no time too good and often at starvation point. The miserable earnings of the factory operatives are still farther reduced by constant strikes and contests with their employers, 
in which it is a foregone conclusion that the workman must yield. Macaulay tells us that, two centuries ago, the employment of children in factories, and the dependence of the parents' bread upon the children's earnings, was a notorious fact, much condemned by philanthropists. The introduction of machinery and the value of child labor gradually aggravated all the horrors of the factory system, the enormity of which called down the indignation of the non-manufacturing community, and compelled the protective interference of Parliament. The Ten Hours Bill, the Factory Children's Education Regulations, appointment by government of factory commissioners and inspectors, have all contributed to ameliorate the hard lot of the factory child. The employment of very young children in factories is still to be regretted, or rather its necessity, for probably it is better they should be employed in a not very laborious occupation than left to roam the streets. The direct influence of factory work on juvenile prostitution is insisted on by many writers. By others, some reservations have been introduced, such as the young associate only during hours of recreation. In business hours, they are generally employed in different parts of the building. They have a certain amount of education. Their parents are generally, or very often, employed in the same establishment. Assume that these children were not in the factory. Where would they be, and what could they do? Are evil influences rife only in the factory? The overcrowding at home, the frequent drunkenness and debauchery of their parents and associates, the endless indigence, the frequent visits to the workhouses, are all circumstances which have been considered and argued in the case but of the fact of juvenile prostitution and depravity in factory populations none can doubt. Of its being exclusively or chiefly attributable to factory life, others are not certain. That children who labor in factories and thereby contribute to the family earnings and their own support could do better in the present condition of English society is doubtful. Mill owners are required to devote a portion of their time to education. Sunday schools are established. Personal attention is paid by leading mill owners to the improvement of the poor. Many build good cottages, for which, by the way, they receive a good interest in the way of rent. Many inspect the schools. Some build schoolhouses and pay the teachers. The good example of benevolent mill owners, in a measure, compels others, whose moral perceptions are less keen, to follow them. We would not be supposed to argue that English cotton factories are types of the millennium, any more than are similar institutions on this side of the Atlantic. In fact, we have a very decided opinion on the matter, but common honesty requires that the opinion of all who have investigated the subject should be fairly recorded. In submitting the various arguments adduced in favor of factory labor and its bearing on immorality, we present merely subjects for consideration. Disease in Children A fact of importance to public health is the disease acquired by children. In the first address issued by the London Society for the Protection of Young Females, it is stated that in three of the London hospitals, during the preceding eight years, there had been no less than 2,700 cases of venereal disease in children between 11 and 16 years of age. Dr. Ryan, on the same subject, speaking from his professional experience as medical officer of several charities, mentions the shock he felt on seeing numerous cases of venereal disease in children. Mr. Miller of Glasgow testifies to the same fact. The very imperfect data which exist on this important branch of our subject will not enable one to form any sound opinion on the spread of disease from these juvenile sources. It is, however, reasonable to conclude, from the few facts and from the very facilities afforded at their age for intercommunication between children, 
that the spread of disease from direct contamination and the deterioration of health and constitution from unknown excesses must be very great. Obscene Publications Of these there are vast numbers, and the extent of juvenile contamination from this source must be very great. The Society for the Suppression of Vice, in London, reports having seized, at different periods, thousands of obscene books, copper plates, and prints, all of which they caused to be destroyed. Within a period of three years they procured the destruction of Blasphemous and Impure Books, 279, Obscene Publications, 1,162, Obscene Songs on Sheets, 1,495. Obscene Prints, 10,493. And even this was but an item in the calculation. The police of London take but little interest in this matter. The above-mentioned society is the principal agent in the repression of this infamous species of depravity. There are certain places in London in which the trade still lives and flourishes, notwithstanding the attacks made upon it. Holywell Street, in the Strand, and the vicinity of Leicester Square, are places of disgraceful notoriety in this respect. The secret is that wherever there is a public demand, no repressive laws will ever prevent trade. The attempt at repression but makes it more profitable. To the corruption of the youthful mind and the preparatives for prostitution these publications must contribute. It is a matter of question what number of prostitutes have become such directly from this cause. The results of visitorial inspection do not show among London prostitutes, any more than elsewhere, a taste for books and prints of an obscene tendency. Their taste in literature is that which would prevail among persons of low intellectual calibre. Startling tales, romances with a plentiful spice of horrors, thrilling love stories, highly wrought and exaggerated narratives, are their taste. In the practice of prostitution, the use of indecent or prurient prints is chiefly for the adornment of visitors' rooms in brothels. Education. In the relations between education and crime are found no distinctive marks whereby prostitution may be separated from any other development of vice or immorality. It is to be presumed that the same general laws which apply to the unregulated manifestation of the passions apply to those with which prostitution is chiefly implicated. In the present generation it is generally assumed that crime is the offspring of ignorance. Therefore, education is the cry. Education has become a party watchword in England. The necessity of education, the quality and the quantity, with all the minor propositions that branch off from the main question, are, and have been for years, the subject of the hottest polemics. But recent results, evolved from statistical inquiries, would seem to call up the previous question as to the value of education at all. The present work is not the place in which to discuss the fact, or to point out a remedy, or indicate the deficiencies of a system which can suffer such a question to arise. We give the facts. From the Parliamentary Reports of 1846 to 1848, it appears that the number of educated criminals in England was, at that time, more than twice, and in Scotland more than three and a half that of the uneducated. 1846 England, educated, 16,963, uneducated, 7,698. Scotland, educated, 3,155, uneducated, 903. 1847. England, educated, 19,307, uneducated, 9,050. 
Scotland, educated, 3,562, uneducated, 1,048. 1848. England, educated, 20,176, uneducated, 9,671. Scotland, educated, 3,985, uneducated, 911. In calculating a percentage on certain criminal returns during the undermentioned years, the results were 1839 Uneducated, 33.53 Imperfectly educated, 53.48 Well-educated, 10.07 Superior education, 0.32 Unascertained, 2.60 Total, 100% 1840 Uneducated, 33.32 Imperfectly educated, 55.57 Well-educated, 8.29 Superior education, 0.37 Unascertained, 2.45 Total, 100% 1841 Uneducated, 33.21 Imperfectly educated, 56.67. Well-educated, 7.4. Superior education, 0.45. Unascertained, 2.27. Total, 100%. 1842. Uneducated, 32.35. Imperfectly educated, 58.32. Well-educated, 6.77. Superior education, 0.22. Unascertained, 2.34. Total, 100%. 1843. Uneducated, 31. Imperfectly educated, 57.6. Well-educated, 8.02. Superior education, 0.47. Unascertained, 2.91. Total, 100%. 1844. Uneducated, 29.77. Imperfectly educated, 59.28. Well-educated, 8.12. Superior education, 0.42. Unascertained, 2.41. Total, 100%. 1845. Uneducated, 30.61. Imperfectly educated, 58.34. Well-educated, 8.38. Superior education, 0.37. Unascertained, 2.3. Total, 100%. 1846. Uneducated, 30.66. Imperfectly educated, 59.51. Well-educated, 7.71. Superior education, 0.34. Unascertained, 1.78. Total, 100%. This table, which on its face conclusively establishes an increase in criminals imperfectly educated, and a decrease both in those who could read and write well and those who could not read or write at all, may be, and has been made, the subject of much pseudo-philosophical remark, as proving the injury of education. In the first place, it only shows the effects of partial education, if it shows anything. But the misfortune of statistical results is that they are relied on too implicitly, with a narrow-minded subservience to figures and facts, whereas they require to be accompanied with explanatory circumstances, which may either enhance their value up to the point of mathematical demonstration, or may so pare them away as to render them perfectly worthless. In the consideration of the above figures, all that would seem to appear is that there was an increase of education keeping pace with the increase of population, and that in the statistics of crime, 
the increase of imperfectly educated people, would be as perceptible as elsewhere. Mere reading and writing, unaccompanied by moral elevation, will not reform mankind. Alone they will not prevent a hungry man from satisfying his hunger. The words of Caesar apply to criminals, equally as to conspirators. Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men, and such as sleep o' nights. Yon Cassius has a lean and hungry look. Pursuing this question, and turning to the population tables of 1851, the period of the last census, we find that Middlesex was the most generally educated county, taking the signature of the marriage register as the test of education. Eighty-two percent signed the marriage register, yet in the list of criminality Middlesex stood third of all the counties of England. Gloucester, which was first in crime, was far from being the most ignorant. There, sixty-five percent signed the register. The general average of the whole population by the same list is forty percent. Here again is a qualifying circumstance. London is included in Middlesex, with its vast, seething mass of human misery and corruption to swell the record of crime, while its general population is, of course, about the most intelligent of the British Empire, so that in the same spot is found at once the greatest intelligence and the greatest misery. We are not aware of such qualifying circumstances in Gloucestershire. Dr. Ryan, writing on this point, refers to the Metropolitan Police Report for 1837, by which it appears that of prostitutes arrested in that year there, could not read or write, 1,773, could read and write imperfectly, 1,237, could read and write well, 89, had received a good education, 4, total, 3,103. This is a tolerably fair criterion, for although, as before said, the police only interfere with peace-breakers, and all these came under the technical term of drunk and disorderly, still we believe the state of prostitution in London to be such that an average proportion of all classes of courtesans pass through the hands of the police during the year. Mr. Tate, speaking of Edinburgh, confirms the view put forward as to educational influences. A large proportion of the Edinburgh prostitutes, 87 percent, read and write. The Scottish peasantry are perhaps the best educated in Europe, and those girls who come to Edinburgh from the country are no exception to the rule. The uneducated, Mr. Tate thinks, are city girls. As to the religious denomination of prostitutes, for that a prostitute may have a religion, we may say, in the kindly spirit of Corporal Trim, but doubtingly, a negro has a soul, your honour. In Edinburgh they include all sects, except independents, Baptists, and Quakers. There may be those who smile at the idea of a prostitute having any belief. How many of us are there? whose actions are accordant with our religious professions. Of London we have no data on this point. Illegitimate births seem, by common consent of most writers, to be classed with details of prostitution. In France, it is said by those who profess intimate local knowledge, there is almost a prejudice against marriage, although it can be performed as a legal ceremony. We think Bale St. John states this fact. In the poorer districts of London, the East End, for example, it is notorious that numbers live in a state of concubinage. Again, in the country and away from the dense population of towns, a woman of immoral habits may often be found who has had two or three illegitimate children by different men with whom she has cohabited. Such a woman would most probably have been a prostitute in a town. As it is, she is no better. 
Still, she is not a prostitute for hire. But to proceed to details. The number of illegitimate births in every thousand births in the various counties is as follows. Cumberland, 108. Norfolk, 105. Hereford, 100. Salop, 99. Nottingham, 91. Cheshire, 89. Westmoreland, 87. Suffolk, 81. Derby, 81. Barks, 79. Leicester, 79. North Wales, 78. South Wales, 72. York, 71. Stafford, 69. Sussex, 68. Cambridge, 66. Lincoln, 64. Middlesex, 40. Cumberland is a pastoral and mountainous county with a thinly settled population. Norfolk is an agricultural and grazing county, broken up into large farms. Neither county has many large towns. Stafford is a manufacturing county with a long list of thickly populated small towns in which as great indigence and misery can be found as in any part of England. Middlesex contains London. Here, then, we see at once that illegitimacy and prostitution are not the same thing. Where there are no prostitutes, there are bastards, but the women in the country are mostly employed. They are obliged to work in the fields, rough country labor, or in some domestic manufacture such as button-making, stocking-making, etc. An apparent paradox may be here mentioned, although not intimately affecting these investigations. The preponderance of bastards is accompanied by a preponderance of early marriages. This has been accounted for by the theory that both are dependent on sexual instincts precociously or excessively stimulated, which seek marriage when practicable, or illicit intercourse where not. Illegitimacy is somewhat regulated by the disproportionate number of the sexes. In an excess of females, there are few bastards. In an excess of males, there are many. Upon this fact, unattended by qualifying circumstances, might be based an argument as to the innate sexual instinct in females. It might have been expected the relations would be somewhat different, namely, an increase of prostitution with an excess of men but an increase of bastards with an excess of women. The number of rapes in England seems to be governed by the excess of men over women. Where the number of illegitimate children exceeds the average, rape is less frequent. The cases of abuse of children between the ages of ten and twelve are three in every ten million of the whole population. There is some difficulty in this matter, arising from a legal technicality on the subject of age. In any case, neither of the last items of criminality is of any value, inasmuch as they include only those cases judicially investigated and proved to conviction. Many are guilty, yet acquitted, and many more are never charged with the offence. Shame prevents parties prosecuting, or in the case of children, the fact does not transpire, or else it is compromised. End of section 33。section 34 of the history of prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bev Stevens. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 34, Chapter 25, Great Britain, Prostitution at the Present Time, Part 3. Keeping a brothel is, as we have said, an offence at common law. We have a computation of the number of offences of this kind, based upon every ten million of the population. In Middlesex it was two hundred and ninety-six, 
in Lancashire 183. Both counties include the most populous towns in England. Lancashire contains Manchester and Liverpool. This fact also is of little value, owing to the peculiar administration of the law on the subject. Remote or indirect injuries to the public safety are not noticed in England. The police may be well aware of crime meditated and planned, and of the haunts of crime, but the theory of public justice is cure, not prevention. Concealment of birth is an offence which, as it emanates from undue sexual intercourse, is generally associated with prostitution. In Hereford and other counties, the proportion of illegitimate births is 88 out of every thousand born, and there were 22 concealments to every thousand bastards. In four counties, the illegitimate births were 58 in a thousand, and the concealments 13 in a thousand illegitimates. In 15 counties, there were 53 illegitimates in every thousand births and twenty-seven concealments to every thousand illegitimates. With the largest proportion of illegitimates there are the fewest concealments, namely, with seventy-nine illegitimates out of a thousand births, there were only twelve concealments to a thousand illegitimates. It is absolutely impossible to ascertain the number of prostitutes in London with any degree of certainty, and even a satisfactory approximation is exceedingly difficult. Nevertheless, it is most important to attain as nearly as possible to the actual facts, because without this knowledge no adequate idea can be formed of the vast seedbed of disease and corruption in constant action in a great capital city, shedding forth and disseminating its pernicious growth on every side, through channels unknown and unsuspected. Mr. Cahoon, a magistrate of the British metropolis toward the close of the last century, 1796, made an arbitrary enumeration, fixing the number of prostitutes in London at 50,000. Doctors Ryan, Campbell, Mr. Talbot, and others carry their estimate in 1840 to 80,000. Mr. Maine, now Sir Richard Maine, Chief Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police in 1840, made an estimate of the number of regular London prostitutes, which he considers were then 8,000 and upward. The seemingly irreconcilable discrepancy of these numbers is no doubt to be found in the loose terminology of the one party and the technicality of the other. The term prostitute would seem to be best applied to those unhappy females who make prostitution their sole calling, and may therefore be styled regular prostitutes, while the larger estimate includes all shades, both regular and occasional or irregular, by which is understood those females with whom prostitution is auxiliary to some reputable calling. We cannot find that any reliable or detailed returns have been made on this branch of public life by the London police, although they must possess peculiar and exclusive powers of preparing them. As long back as 1837, the following rough calculation was made. Well-dressed prostitutes in brothels, first class, 813, second class, 62, third class, 20, for a total of 895. Well-dressed prostitutes walking the streets, First class, 1,460, second class, 79, third class, 73, for a total of 1,612. Prostitutes infesting low neighborhoods. First class, 3,533, second class, 147, third class, 184, for a total of 3,864. First class total, 5,806. Second class total, 288. Third class total, 277. Overall total, 6,371. On this return, Mr. Maine very probably based his estimate, 
of 1840. Mr. Talbot, the Secretary of the Society for the Protection of Young Females, made the subject one of special inquiry, both personally and with the aid of the local police of the different cities, and although his details are very meagre, he professes to have satisfied himself of the general accuracy of the following figures showing the regular prostitutes in various cities. Edinburgh, 800. Glasgow, 1,800. Liverpool, 2,900. Leeds, 700. Manchester, 700. All parties are, however, agreed in representing that it is impracticable to form anything like a correct estimate of the number of female servants, milliners, and women in the upper and middle classes of society who might properly be classed with prostitutes, or of the women who frequent theatres, barracks, ships, prisons, etc. In 1851, the police of Dublin published in their statistical returns the number of prostitutes in that city, which is the only public or official paper on the point having any appearance of system or accuracy. It is as follows. 1848, brothels 385, prostitutes 1,343. 1849, Brothels, 330. Prostitutes, 1,344. 1850. Brothels, 272. Prostitutes, 1,215. 1851. Brothels, 297. Prostitutes, 1,170. This table shows a steady decrease in the number of these women. We are uninformed as to any local causes for this, nor do we know whether it has been balanced by an increase of sly or occasional prostitution. From the preceding figures, a calculation has been made of the regular prostitutes relatively to the population in the several towns. It appears to have been based on the number of inhabitants at the date of the various estimates. That of Dublin is, according to the census of 1851, the remainder according to that of 1841. Proportion of Prostitutes to Population Liverpool, Number of Prostitutes, 2,900 Proportion to Population, to Males, 1 to 43 To Females, 1 to 45 To Total Population, 1 to 88 Manchester. Number of prostitutes, 700. Proportion to population, to males, 1 to 156. To females, 1 to 169. To total population, 1 to 325. Leeds. Number of prostitutes, 700. Proportion to population, to males, 1 to 70. To females, 1 to 75 to total population, 1 to 145. Edinburgh, number of prostitutes, 800. Proportion to population, to males, 1 to 106. To females, 1 to 130. To total population, 1 to 236. Glasgow, number of prostitutes, 1,800. Proportion to population, to males, 1 to 87, to females, 1 to 97, to total population, 1 to 184. Dublin, number of prostitutes, 1,170. Proportion to population, to males, 1 to 101, to females, 1 to 119, to total population, 1 to 220. Cork, number of prostitutes, 350. Proportion to population, to males, 1 to 113. To females, 1 to 134. To total population, 1 to 247. The mean of the above may be taken as a fair representation of the general state of the kingdom. 
the qualifying circumstances to which we have already made allusion as peculiar to each city or district, are, of course, neutralized by the aggregate. For example, Liverpool is a great seaport town, and a large number of regular prostitutes would be inevitable there. In Manchester, a large manufacturing city, with an immense pauper and factory operative population, the trade of prostitution would meet with less profitable custom. Accordingly, we find the proportion much smaller. Glasgow is both manufacturing and commercial. There again, the proportion is larger. Dublin has but little commerce, but is a capital city, and has a court and a large garrison. The combination of all these circumstances is found in London, and a fair estimate would be obtained by adding all the preceding proportions together, which would give a mean of about one in two hundred and thirty-two, and this upon the population, two million three hundred and sixty-two thousand, is within a fraction of ten thousand. We have seen that Mr. Maine, in 1840, stated his opinion to be that there were about 8,000 regular prostitutes in London, qualifying that statement by a profession of total ignorance as to the irregulars who did not make prostitution their only means of living. Mr. Maine had peculiar sources of information open to him, and it is more than probable that his opinion was well founded. From the above calculation, from the best sources available to us on this very obscure question, we are satisfied to assume ten thousand as at least a probable approximation to the number of regular prostitutes in London. Mr. Maine, in his statement on this subject, mentioned that there were three thousand three hundred and thirty-five brothels. Some authors have attempted to make a calculation of the number of prostitutes on the basis of this number of houses. One has assumed three, another ten. Dr. Wardlaw has fixed upon five women per house, without, as it appears to us, any precise reason for preferring that figure. These different opinions may be thus worked out. Five women in each house would give— 16,675 prostitutes. Four women in each house, as in Dublin, would give 13,340 prostitutes. Three women in each house, as in Cork, would give 10,005 prostitutes. We have not been able to obtain Mr. Maine's statement, Ipsissimus Verbis, and failing that we may be in error but we should be inclined to think that, in his official capacity as a magistrate, and in his personal character as a lawyer, Mr. Maine would be apt to assign the term brothel indiscriminately to all houses trading in prostitution, whether houses of assignation or houses in which prostitutes habitually reside. If our reading of the word brothels in this sense be correct— it is clear that any attempt to enumerate on the basis of the women attached to each house would be fallacious. The expression used by the Dublin police is houses frequented or occupied, and its ambiguity shows that the authorities there considered the word brothel in the sense given to it by English jurists. How does this number of 10,000 regular prostitutes bear on the population? In London there are, above twenty years of age, bachelors, male, 196,851, spinsters, female, 246,124, husbands, 398,624, wives, 406,266, widowers, 37,064, widows, 110,028, totals, male, 632,545, female, 762,418. Omitting fractions, the proportions would be, on bachelors and widowers, 1 in 23, on total male population, 
one in sixty-three. On total female population, one in seventy-six. On aggregate population above twenty years of age, one in one hundred and thirty-nine. This would establish ten thousand as the nucleus of the prostitution system of London. Those females who come within the designation of irregular prostitutes are in no respect less prejudicial to the community than the regulars. The difference is that they have some other real or nominal occupation, which they follow according to circumstances. An even moderately correct estimate of their number is little better than guesswork, and we therefore think it expedient to put our readers in possession of our own limited means of information, and take them on to a conclusion. There are so many elements to be taken into the account, and the data are so scanty, that we only consider ourselves justified in intimating an opinion, rather than announcing a satisfactory conclusion. To show the extremes to which the doctrine of possibilities may lead in this development of misery and vice, we will recur to the statement of some of the London prostitute needlewomen themselves. We quote from Mayhew's letters to the Morning Chronicle. I now come to the second test that was adopted in order to verify my conclusions. This was the convening of such a number of needlewomen and slop workers as would enable me to arrive at a correct average as to the earnings of the class. I was particularly anxious to do this, not only with regard to the more respectable portions of the operatives, but also with reference to those who, I had been given to understand, resorted to prostitution in order to eke out their subsistence. I consulted a friend who is well acquainted with the habits and feelings of slop workers as to the possibility of gathering together a number of women who would be willing to state that they had been forced to take to the streets on account of the low prices for their work. He told me he was afraid, from the shame of their mode of life becoming known, it would be almost impossible to collect together a number of females who would be ready to say as much publicly. However, it was decided that at least the experiment should be made, and that everything should be done to assure the parties of the strict privacy of the assemblage. It was arranged that this gentleman and myself should be the only male persons visible on the occasion, and that the place of meeting should be as dimly lighted as possible, so they could scarcely see or be seen by one another or by us. Cards of admission were issued privately, and to my friend's astonishment, as many as twenty-five came on the evening named to the appointed place, intent upon making known the sorrows and sufferings that had driven them to fly to the streets, in order to get the bread which the wretched prices paid for their labour would not permit them to obtain. Never in all history was such a sight seen or such tales heard. There, in the dim haze of the large bare room in which they met, sat women and girls, some with babies sucking at their breasts, others in rags, and even those borrowed in order that they might come and tell their misery to the world. I have witnessed many a scene of sorrow lately. I have heard stories that have unmanned me, but never, till last Wednesday, had I heard or seen anything so solemn, so terrible as this. If ever eloquence was listened to, it was in the outpourings of these poor, lorn mothers' hearts, for their base-born little ones, as each told her woes and struggles, and published her shame amid the convulsive sobs of others, nay, of all present. Behind a screen, removed from sight so as not to wound the modesty of the women, who were nevertheless aware of their presence, sat two reporters from this journal, to take down verbatim the confessions and declarations of those assembled, and to them I am indebted for the following report of the statements made at the meeting. Then follow a series of most heart-rending statements, all to the same purport as those quoted in other parts of this work, and bearing all the internal evidence of truth. 
the letter concludes with the following sentence. They were unanimous in declaring that a large number of the trade, probably one-fourth of the whole, or one-half of those who had no husbands or parents to support them, resorted to the streets to eke out a living. Accordingly, assuming the government returns to be correct, and that there are upward of eleven thousand females under twenty living by needle and slop work, the numerical amount of prostitution becomes awful to contemplate. Thus, then, we have it in evidence that, probably, one-fourth of all women engaged in sewing occupations for a livelihood are compelled to have occasional recourse to prostitution as their only and compulsory refuge from starvation. The number of women engaged in these sewing occupations is enormous. According to the census of 1851, they constitute, indeed, the main support of the female working population throughout Great Britain, exclusive of domestic servants, laundresses, and persons employed in agricultural pursuits, and in the cotton and linen factories. The figures for the three kingdoms are as follows. Hatters, 3,500. Straw hat makers, 20,500. Bonnet makers, 7,600. Cap makers, 4,700. Furriers, 1,900. Tailors, 17,600. Shawl makers, 3,200. Milliners, 267,400. Seamstresses, 72,900. Stay makers, 12,700. Stocking makers, 30,700. Glovers, 25,300. Case makers, 31,400. In all Great Britain, this class numbers 1,787,600, of whom there are, under twenty years of age, 458,168. We have not the details of the occupations of London, but the proportion which the population of the metropolis bears to that of Great Britain is about one-ninth. One-ninth of the above aggregate would give for London about 196,500 women engaged in the sewing trades, all of whom, it may be assumed, are over fifteen. We omit from the consideration of female trades those engaged in agricultural pursuits and factories, such occupations having comparatively few representatives in the metropolitan districts, although there are more of them than would be supposed. Laundresses are also omitted, as a very large proportion of them in and about London are, as is well known, married and middle-aged women. But another class to which all writers assign a large amount of prostitution are domestic servants, a body most numerously represented in London. There are in the metropolis 165,100 domestic servants, the peculiarly unprotected character of whom as a class, may be inferred them from the singular fact that to the workhouse, the hospital, and the lunatic asylum, they supply an immense number of inmates, exceeding that of any other class. Thus, then, are shown two very large figures, amounting together to 361,000, as the stock from which prostitutes to any extent may be procured. Some consideration, perhaps, of the ages of prostitutes and of other circumstances in the condition of the female population may enable us to appreciate the state of the case without being driven to the necessity of looking on these enormous totals as incapable of reduction. Nature would indicate the period between fifteen and forty-five as the age during which the trade of prostitution must be carried on. Much has been said as to the means used for decoying young children for purposes of prostitution. Of the fact, we are perfectly convinced, 
but should think it of little numerical importance in the aggregate body. The influence of evil communication on the young is of infinitely greater mischief, and the extent of youthful depravity from this cause is very great among the poorer classes, and would oblige us to date the commencing age of prostitution back to twelve years. As to the period of life at which the prostitute's career is terminated, it is contended by some of the English writers that only an infinitesimal proportion reach the age of forty-five in the exercise of their soul and health-destroying trade. Mr. Tate says, In less than one year from the commencement of their wicked career, these females bear evident marks of their approaching decay, and in the course of three years very few can be recognized by their old acquaintance, if they are so fortunate as to survive that period. These remarks apply more especially to those who are above twenty years of age when they join the ranks of the victims. From the average of Edinburgh, Mr. Tate goes on to assume that not above one in eleven survives twenty-five years of age, and taking together those who persist in vice and those who, after having abandoned it, die of diseases which originated from the excesses they were addicted to during its continuance, perhaps not less than a fifth or sixth of all who have embraced this course of sin die annually. Dr. Ryan seems to adopt an opinion that the average duration of life after commencing prostitution is four years. Captain Miller of Glasgow thinks that the average age at which women become abandoned is from fifteen to twenty, and the average duration of women continuing this vice is about five years. The ages of patients admitted into the Lock Hospital at Edinburgh were as follows. Under fifteen years, forty-two. From fifteen years to twenty years, six hundred and sixty-two. From twenty years to twenty-five years, one hundred and ninety-nine. From twenty-five years to thirty years, sixty-nine. From thirty years to thirty-five years, sixteen. From thirty-five years to forty years, six. Over forty years, six. Total, one thousand. These figures alone would go to make out the presumption that the ages of prostitutes are between twelve and thirty, and that eight hundred and sixty-one of a thousand are between fifteen and twenty-five. According to the above table, nine-tenths of the number at twenty have disappeared at thirty, and according to Captain Miller's opinion that cases of reform and abandonment of their life are very rare, the conclusion would be that their career ends in death. The duration of prostitution being ascertained, we would find the number of women between the ages of fifteen and twenty-five. In the whole female population this is one-fifth, but the very aged or the very youthful are necessarily excluded from the classes of workwomen and servants. Of servants, indeed, there are five and upward under twenty to three above twenty years of age. This, therefore, would indicate very little reduction of the numbers. It is reasonable to suppose that some portion of the above are married women having husbands living, and if so, it is not an unreasonable supposition that their wives are not obliged to have recourse to prostitution. In fact, the poor creatures themselves seem to imply that immunity. The number of wives is about one-third of the whole female population. Of these wives, about one-fourth are employed in trades apart from those of their husbands. If we deduct only such a proportion from the sewing women, it makes something when we have to deal with such enormous masses. We should strike off nearly fifty thousand, leaving only one hundred and fifty thousand sewing women. There is comfort, however, in the fact that, of these sewing women, three-fourths are known to be over twenty years of age, and if we only assume one-half instead of three-fourths, 
allowing the other fourth for the difference between twenty and twenty-five years of age, it brings our figure down to seventy-five thousand. All these deductions are, we fear, in excess, and it must be recollected, moreover, that the above large sums by no means include all the female occupations of London, but merely those classes which, either from the temptation incident to their position, or from the imperative demands of want and necessity, are, by competent authority, supposed to be peculiarly obnoxious to the risk of prostitution. If, to this large number of women, which we cannot assume at less than 273,000 between the ages of 12 and 25, be added all the other denizens of a great city unexampled in its magnitude, embracing in itself all the peculiarities of all other cities, at once a manufacturing, a commercial, a garrison, and a capital city, and finally containing the largest population in the world, one such item being nearly four hundred thousand single females over twelve years of age, then, indeed, the mass of misery, wretchedness, vice, and crime there accumulated appalls the mind seeking to grapple with it, and oppresses us with the apprehension that even eighty thousand, the highest estimate which has been made, is, when understood to include all contingencies, not an incredible figure. Englishmen pride themselves, and it must be admitted not without reason, on their numerous and admirable public charities. In this particular direction it would seem that public munificence has not been so liberally displayed as in some others. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons does not, we fear, apply to minds and hearts of earthly mould. People, in charitable as in other institutions, like to see a return for their investment, and notwithstanding the immense field for benevolent labour in prostitution, there is a general impression among both the public and officials that it is an irretrievably barren waste and that it is worse than profitless to squander money and time upon it. The results which have been achieved would, however, show that the exertions of philanthropy, although not producing so much fruit as in some other quarters, have not been entirely vain. In reference to these results, too, it must be borne in mind that the discipline of the various institutions is severe and even repellent, a policy ill adapted to ensure a large amount of success. The Locke Hospital is the oldest institution in London for the benefit of lost females, and is devoted entirely to the cure of venereal disease. It was founded in the year 1747, and in a century had cured 45,448 cases. The Magdalen Hospital of London was founded in 1758, and up to January 1844 had received 6,968 females. The results were as follows. Reconciled to their friends, or placed in service or other reputable employment, 4,752. Discharged at their own request, 1,182. Discharged for improper conduct, 720. Died, 109. Sent to other institutions, being insane or afflicted with incurable diseases, 107. Eloped, 2. Remaining in the hospital, 96. Total, 6,968. A considerable number of the women, when discharged from the institution, are under twenty years of age, and it is an invariable rule not to dismiss any one, unless at her own desire or for misconduct, without some means being provided by which she may obtain a livelihood in an honest manner. The Locke Asylum was founded in 1787, for the reception of penitent female patients, 
when discharged from the Lock Hospital, and up to March 1837 the number of women received was 984. The results were reconciled to their friends, 170, placed in service or employment, 281, died, 22, remaining in asylum, 18, total 491. Of the remaining number, many had been sent to their parishes, some had eloped, and some had been expelled for improper conduct, but of several even of these, favorable accounts had been afterward received. Some of them were known to be married and living creditably, and others were earning a living honestly. We have been unable to obtain any account of the operations of this institution since the year 1837. The London Female Penitentiary was instituted in 1807. Of 6,939 applicants, 2,717 were admitted into the house. The results were reconciled and restored to friends, placed in service or otherwise provided for, 1,543, discharged from various causes, 631, discharged at their own request, 350, emigrated, 47, sent to their parishes, 23, died, 28, remaining in penitentiary, 95, total, 2,717. The Guardian Society was established in 1812, and from that period up to 1843 had admitted 1,932 wretched outcasts to partake of the advantages it offered. The results were restored to their friends, 533, placed in service or satisfactorily provided for, 455, discharged or withdrawn, 843, sent to their parishes, 53, died, 17, remaining in institution, 31, total, 1,932. Besides these institutions, others have been established with similar objects, namely, the British Penitent Female Refuge, the Female Mission, the South London Penitentiary, and one or two others. As compared with the great number of unfortunate women in London, these institutions have effected but a very small amount of good. During seventy-seven years, ending 1835, ten thousand and five females were received within the walls of four of the London asylums, of which number six thousand two hundred and sixty-two more than three-fifths, were satisfactorily provided for, and 2,980 were discharged for misconduct. Taking the whole of the institutions in London up to that time, it may be fairly estimated that 14 or 15,000 prostitutes have had the opportunity of returning to a virtuous life. Those who, like the Pharisee, content themselves with thanking God that they are not as other men, and even as these unfortunates, are a very impracticable set to deal with, and if such there be who read these pages, we pass them by, and pray for the better health of their souls. The gentle spirits who, imitating a blessed example, think it not pollution to extend their sympathy and saving help to publicans and harlots, may, in the following lines, written by a prostitute and found in her deathbed, see matter for meditation, and ground for the belief that all efforts in the cause of the sinner will not be unsuccessful. They were headed, Verses for my tombstone, if ever I should have one. The wretched victim of a quick decay, relieved from life, on humble bed of clay, the last and only refuge for my woes, a love lost, ruined female, I repose. From the sad hour I listened to his charms, 
and fell, half forced in the deceiver's arms, to that whose awful veil hides every fault, sheltering my sufferings in this welcome vault. When pampered, starved, abandoned, or in drink, my thoughts were racked in striving not to think, nor could rejected conscience claim the power to improve the respite of one serious hour. I durst not look to what I was before. My soul shrank back and wished to be no more. Of eye undaunted and of touch impure, old air of age, worn out when scarce mature, daily debased to stifle my disgust of forced enjoyment in affected lust, covered with guilt, infection, debt, and want, my home a brothel and the streets my haunt. For seven long years of infamy I've pined and fondled, loathed, and preyed upon mankind, till, the full course of sin and vice gone through, my shattered fabric failed at twenty-two. The enormous extent of this evil, its deep-rooted causes, the difficulty of combating it, either by religious arguments, legislative provisions, or appeals to common sense and physical welfare, may well deter the philanthropist from the attempt to purify this stable of Augeus. But benevolence has accomplished tasks as arduous, and we cannot conclude this chapter better than by a short description of the discouragements which attended the first efforts of Mrs. Fry in the reformation of the prostitute felons in Newgate, and of the blessed results of her indomitable perseverance and immovable faith. This admirable woman, on her first visit to Newgate, found the female side of the jail in a condition which no language can describe. Nearly three hundred women, sent there for every gradation of crime and some under sentence of death, were crowded together in two small wards and two cells. They all slept, as well as a crowd of children, on the floor, at times one hundred and twenty in a ward, without even a mat for bedding. Many of them were nearly naked. They were all drunk, and her ears were offended by the most terrible imprecations. The authorities of the prison, of course, advised her against going among them. They were sure that nothing could be effected. She, however, determined to make the trial. She went alone into what she felt was like a den of wild beasts. In vain the governor reasoned with her. She had put her hand to the plough and was not to be turned back. In one short month such was the effect of her merely moral agency and religious instruction that she felt herself justified in inviting the Lord Mayor, the sheriffs, and several of the aldermen to satisfy themselves by personal investigation of the result of the exertions which she herself and some few lady members of the Society of Friends, who had joined her in the good work, had effected. Thus was conviction forced upon the obtuse intellects of corporate authorities, and hence was dated the era of prison reform in England. In our own country, where the means of diffusing intelligence are unbounded, and whose reformatory system for criminals— has already claimed the attention of European statesmen and philanthropists, there can be no insuperable barrier, even in so difficult an undertaking, as that to which our labours are directed. Paraphrasing the opinion of one of the most distinguished essayists of this century, we venture to assert that it is impossible that social abuses should be suffered to exist in this country, and in this stage of society, for many years after their mischief and iniquity have been made manifest to the sense of the country at large. End of chapter 25 End of section 34
Section 35 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 35. Chapter 26. Great Britain. Syphilitic Diseases. The best English and French writers are of opinion that syphilis, as it exists at present, has, in some shape or another, always existed among mankind, although it was not known to science or history, in a distinct manner, until the middle of the fifteenth century. The period at which syphilis first made its appearance in England is involved in obscurity, but we know that it began to attract attention early in the fifteenth century. The first official recognition of it found on record is a police regulation of the year 1430, during the reign of Henry the Sixth, excluding venereal patients from the London hospitals, and requiring them to be strictly guarded at night. In the time of Henry the Eighth, there were six laser houses in London for the reception of venereal patients, namely at Knightsbridge, Hammersmith, Highgate, Kingsland, St. George's Gate, and Mile End. These localities were doubtless fixed upon as being some distance from the city. That the disease, however, must have been known long before the period above specified is certain, from passages which are to be found in the writings of the previous century. John of Gaddesden, who wrote in 1305, and who was a fellow of Merton College, Oxford, thus speaks of the possibility of contracting the disease from leprous women. Ile qui concubuit cum mulier, cum qua quavit leprosas puncturas, intra carnum et corium, sentil et alicondo, calefacciones in toto corpore. Mr. William Acton, upon whose pages as an English standard writer on this subject we draw largely, is of opinion that leprosy, which was formerly so common in Europe, consisted merely of what we now call secondary syphilis. Some of the Jewish observances were no doubt dictated by a scientific appreciation of the influences which predisposed the body to the effects of syphilitic virus. The practice of circumcision seems instituted with a direct view to the preservation of the chosen people from venereal contagion, to which, in a hot climate, and with the extreme deficiency of means for general cleanliness, they would be liable. As to the type of the disease in former times, there seems no ground for believing that it was more severe than at present, while its numerical importance must have been much smaller. The following extract is from a treatise by Queen Elizabeth Surgeon. If I be not deceived in my opinion, I suppose the disease itself was never more rife in Naples, Italy, France, or Spain, than it is in this day in the realm of England. I may speak boldly, because I speak truly, and yet I speak it with grief of mind, that in the hospital of St. Bartholomew, in London, there hath been cured of this disease by me and three others, within five years, to the number of one thousand and more. I speak nothing of St. Thomas's hospital, and other houses about the city, where an infinite number are daily cured. It happened very seldom in the hospital of St. Bartholomew while I stayed there, among every twenty diseased that were taken into the said house, which was most commonly on the Monday, ten of them were infected with the Lues Venerea. It was supposed, in former ages, that syphilis was transmissible by personal communication, touching the clothes, drinking out of the same vessels, or even breathing the same air with infected persons, and accordingly we find the lower orders of people driven out into the fields to die, and physicians refusing to attend the sick for fear of infection. Some writers, indeed, doubted this kind of contagious influence, and held that it required intercourse, or at least contact. But nobles, and especially the clergy, preferred to ascribe their maladies to misfortune rather than to licentiousness, and sought to put down such innovating doctrines. The consequence was that patients were shunned universally, and left to die or get well without assistance. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, that in numerous instances the disease should assume its most inveterate aspect, and hence the notice is found among many old writers as to the supposed malignancy and incurability of what they were disposed to consider a newly imported malady. That the disease, in reality, differed little from that which exists in our day, is proved by the fact that cases of the once formidable black lion are occasionally to be met with in the London hospitals. Cardinal Wolsey, among other charges made against him by his enemies, was accused of whispering to the king, Henry the Eighth, and thereby casting his poisonous breath upon his royal grace. 
he, Wolsey, having at the time the foul contagious disease upon him. The belief as to contagion by this means is not entirely extinct, but is cherished by the laboring classes of England, many of whom entertain great prejudices on the score of health against drinking from the same vessel out of which an infected person has partaken. In 1497, James IV of Scotland, in consequence of the frightful prevalence of venereal disease in his kingdom, issued a proclamation banishing the infected from Edinburgh. His Majesty charges straightly all manner of persons being within the freedom of this Burt, quilks are infected, or has been infected, uncure it with this said contagious plague, call it the Grangor Devoid, red and pass furt of this town, and compare upon the Sandus of Leith at ten hours before none, and there shall they have and find boats ready in the heaven, ordinate to them by the officers of this Burt, ready furnished with victuals, to have them to the inch, inchkeith, and there to remain quill God provide for their health. Those evading this ordinance shall be burnt on the cheek with the marking urn, that they may be kennet in time to come. A remnant of this barbarous system was retained in the regulations of Middlesex Hospital, London, by which an admission fee of forty shillings sterling, ten dollars, was directed to be paid by venereal patients. The reason assigned for it was that a hospital intended for the virtuous might not be made subsidiary to purposes of vice. The regulation, however, became a nullity, and was repealed, owing principally to the fact that the workhouse guardians were in the habit of paying the forty shillings and sending in pauper patients, well knowing that the cost of cure in the workhouse would far exceed the admission fees. In the London hospital a similar regulation exists even now, but is openly evaded, however, by the house surgeon describing the disease as a cutaneous one. The extent of this disease in Great Britain is a matter of opinion alone. There are no positive data whatever upon which to form any conclusion with respect to the general population, while the hospital lists are very imperfectly kept, and it is only in the army and navy returns that we can find any real assistance. British Army The army reports quoted extend over a period of seven years and a quarter, and enter into the details of the various venereal affections of the soldiers, amounting to the aggregate strength of 44,611 quartered in the United Kingdom. The cases admitted into hospitals were Syphilis primary, 1,415, Syphilis consecutive, 335, Ulcer penis non syphiliticum, 2,144, Bubo simplex, 844, Cachexia syphilitica, 44, Gonorrhea, 2,449, Hernia humoralis, 714, Stricture urethra, 100, Phimosis and paraphimosis, 27. Total, 8,072. Ratio, 181 per 1,000 men, or nearly 1 in 5 in the whole number. These returns show that the venereal disease is of much more frequent occurrence in the British than in the Belgian army. British Navy. The Navy reports extend over a period of seven years, and include 21,493 men employed on home service, that is to say, on the coasts or in the ports of Great Britain. Of this number, 2,880 were attacked with venereal disease. Ratio, one in seven. British Merchant Service. The returns of the Dreadnought Hospital Ship for Seamen of All Nations extend over a period of five years, during which 13,081 patients, laboring under surgical and medical diseases, were admitted. Out of these, 3,703 came under treatment for venereal affections, showing a rate of two in seven. As a mode of testing these returns, we turn to the analysis of the surgical outpatients of Messrs. Lloyd and Warmald, assistant surgeons of St. Bartholomew's, the largest of the London hospitals. These outpatients are attended gratuitously by the hospital officers. Venereal cases attended by Mr. Lloyd. Men, 1,009. Women and children, 245. Total, 1,254. Venereal cases attended by Mr. Warmald, men, 986, women and children, 273, total, 1,259. Total venereal cases in men, 1,995, in women and children, 518, in total, 2,513. 
These cases were part of a total of 5,327 general patients. This last item alone would not enable one to form any idea of the number of sufferers from this terrible scourge. There are in London nine great hospitals, besides smaller ones, and dispensaries in every parish, or division of a large parish, and other means of gratuitous medical assistance. Suppose the smaller medical foundations put aside, and their patients thrown into the aggregate of the great hospitals, we should have 22,617 venereal patients— Suppose the private practice of the London Army of Medical Men to yield only half as many more, we have 35,000 venereal patients in London only. Without reckoning the lock hospital, parish doctors, barracks, and all the other institutions, one would very readily imagine that London alone furnished 50,000 venereal patients per annum. Again, on the number of single men and widowers in London above 20 years of age, upward of a quarter of a million, the venereal cases— if in the same proportion as among soldiers and sailors, would in the same period amount to thirty thousand and upward. There is, however, another way of conjecturing the amount of disease introduced into the community by prostitution, which English writers have adopted. The Medico-Chirurgical Review, a periodical of high standing, speaking of the extent of venereal disease and its effects on the population, says, There is every reason to believe that, to represent the public prostitutes of England, Wales, and Scotland, 50,000 is an estimate too low. We presume there will be no objection made to the assumption that, unless each of these 50,000 prostitutes submitted to at least one act of intercourse during every 24 hours, she could not obtain means sufficient to support life. The result of the evidence contained in the first report of the Constabulary Force of England was that about 2% of the prostitutes of London were suffering under some form of venereal disease— but yet we will descend even lower, and presume that of one hundred healthy prostitutes, if each submits to one indiscriminate sexual act in twenty-four hours, not more than one would become infected with syphilis, an estimate which is, without doubt, far too low, yet if admitted to be correct, the necessary consequence will be that of the fifty thousand prostitutes, five hundred are diseased within the aforesaid twenty-four hours." If we next admit that a fifth of these five hundred diseased women are admitted to hospitals on the day on which disease appears, it follows there are every day on the streets four hundred diseased women. Let it be supposed that the power of these four hundred to infect be limited to twelve days, and that of every six persons who, at the rate of one each night, have connection with these women, five become infected, it will follow that there will be four thousand men infected every night, and consequently one million four hundred and sixty thousand in the year. Farther, as there are every night four hundred women diseased by these men, one hundred and eighty-two thousand five hundred public prostitutes will be civilized during the year, and hence one million six hundred and fifty-two thousand five hundred cases of syphilis in both sexes occur every twelve months. If, then, the entire population had intercourse with prostitutes in an equal ratio, the gross population of Great Britain, of all ages and sexes, would, during eighteen years, have been affected with primary syphilis. Be it remembered, we do not assert that more than a million and a half of persons are attacked every year, but that that number of cases occur annually in England, Wales, and Scotland, though the same individual may be attacked more than once. Although it is evident that all the estimates used for these calculations are, we know no other word that expresses it, ridiculously low, yet we find that more than a million and a half cases of syphilis occur every year, an amount which is probably not half the actual number. How enormous, then, must be the number of children born with secondary syphilis! How immense the mortality among them! How vast an amount of public and private money expended in the cure of this disease! End of section 35。section 36 of the history of prostitution。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Arnie Horton。the history of prostitution。by William Sanger。Section 36, Chapter 27, Mexico, Spanish Conquest, Treatment of Female Prisoners, Mexican Manners in 1677, 
priesthood, modern society, fashionable life, indifference of husbands to their wives, general immorality, offenses, charitable institutions, the CUNA or Foundling Hospital. The social condition of Mexico is of importance, as it was formerly the chief seat of Spanish domination in America, and its manners and government gave the key to all the other colonies and vice royalties which owed allegiance to the crown of Spain. Whatever the state of the native population may have been when Spanish leaders and their myrmidons burst upon them and broke up the kingdom of the Mexican emperors, they rapidly succumbed beneath the lust, avarice, and cruelty which were ever the distinctive features of Spanish warfare and conquest in every clime and against every people. Of the enormities perpetuated by these soldiers, the history of the Mexican conquest gives us innumerable instances, but one solitary example from Bernal de Diaz will be enough. He tells us that when they took women prisoners, they made a division of them at night for the sake of greater peace and quietness, and that they branded them with the marks of their owners. They were thus at liberty to choose the handsomest of the Indian women, and reserved them for their own uses. What these uses were can be easily supposed. The fate of less favored female prisoners is left in doubt. They were turned over to their savage allies, to be butchered in cold blood, or otherwise disposed of as most convenient. From Mexico, the flood of Spanish cruelty and immorality spread itself like a stream of lava over the whole of South America. The chivalry of the soldiery soon degenerated, and the self-denial and lofty motives, darkened though they were by bigotry and cruelty in some cases, which had distinguished the priests, were lost. Inglorious ease and luxurious indolence now superseded that love of adventure and unconquerable daring which distinguished Cortez and Pizarro and their comrades. No trace of the old heroic character remained save the grinding oppression and reckless selfishness which usually accompany ambition. An illustration of the loose manners which prevailed in Mexico among the clergy is to be found in the voyages of Thomas Page, a Dominican monk who visited Mexico with some of his order on their road to the western coast of America and to Asia as missionaries. From this work, published in 1677, we learn that the writer and his companions visited the prior of Vera Cruz on their journey, and after a sumptuous dinner, adjourned by invitation to his cell, they found it richly tapestried and adorned with feathers of the birds of the Michoacu. The walls were hung with various pictures of merit. Rich rugs and silk covered the tables. Porcelain of china filled the cupboards and sideboards, and there were vases and bowls containing preserved fruits and sweet meats. My companions, says he, were scandalized by such an exhibition. The holy friar talked to us of his ancestry and of his good parts, of the influence he had with the father provincial, of the love the principal ladies of the place bore him, of his beautiful voice and skill in music. He took his guitar and sang us a sonnet in praise of a certain lady. Afterwards, speaking of the Franciscans of Jalapa, Thomas Page says, Their lives are so free and immodest that it might be suspected with reason that they had renounced only that which they could not obtain. After witnessing a gambling scene in a convent, he concludes that the cause of so many friars and Jesuits passing from Spain to regions so distant was libertinage rather than love of preaching the gospel. The same writer subsequently passes from portraiture to more general delineation, and thus depicts the body of the clergy. It seems that all wickedness is allowable, so that the churches and clergy flourish. Nay, while the purse is open to lavishness, if it be also open to enrich the temple walls and roof, it is better than any holy water. In their lifetime, the Mexicans strive to excel one another in their gifts to the cloisters of nuns and friars. Among the benefactors was one Alonso Quilar, so rich that he was reported to have a closet in his house laid with bars of gold instead of bricks. This man built a nunnery for Franciscan nuns, which cost him 30,000 ducats, and left to it 2,000 dollars yearly and yet his life was so scandalous that commonly in the night with two servants 
he would go round the city visiting scandalous persons, and at every house letting fall a bead and tying a knot, that when he came home in the morning he might number by his beads the uncivil stations he had visited that night. Great alms and liberality toward religious houses are coupled with great and scandalous wickedness. They wallow in the bed of riches and wealth, and make their alms the coverlet to conceal their loose and lascivious lives. I will not speak much of the lives of the friars and nuns of the city, but only that they enjoy there more liberty than in Europe, where they have too much, and that surely the scandals committed by them do cry up to heaven for vengeance, judgment, and destruction. It is ordinary for the friars to visit their devoted nuns, and to spend whole days with them, hearing their music, and feeding on their sweetmeats. For this purpose they have many chambers, which they call loquatories, to talk in, with wooden bars between the nuns and them, and in these chambers are tables for friars to dine at, and while they dine the nuns recreate them with their voices. We need no addition to these deep shadows from the dark pencil of so vigorous a limner as worthy Thomas Page, to delineate character nearly two hundred years ago, but we can scarcely believe it equally applicable to the present day. The reign of oppression in Mexico, it is to be hoped, is approaching its end, and recent events have shown that the population is alive to some of those truths which were long ago patent to all the world except those most intimately concerned. Of modern Mexican society, an accomplished female writer, who had the best opportunities of judging, says, It is long before a stranger even suspects the state of morals in this country, for whatever be the private conduct of individuals, the most perfect decorum prevails in outward behavior. But indolence is the mother of vice. They rarely gossip to strangers about their neighbor's faults. Habit has rendered them tolerably indifferent as to the liaisons subsisting among particular friends. And as long as a woman attends church regularly, is a patroness of charitable institutions, and gives no scandal by her outward behavior, she may do pretty much as she pleases. As for flirtations in public, they are unknown. The present amiability of the Mexican ladies is admitted on all hands, as is the genial warmth of their manner. Some travelers indeed, and among them Mr. Waddy Thompson, are of the opinion that this is attributed to them as a fault, and that the reproach of unchastity is unjustly urged against them, as there is no city in Europe where there is less immorality. The constant presence of a duenna and the house porter, who is an appurtenance of every household of respectability, are excellent checks on immorality. But this would rather argue the necessity of a safeguard not found in the female virtue of Mexico. Besides, these appendages of rank have lost their real meaning, and the duenna may be coveted into the convenient cloak or a better of an intrigue, the more safe as she is the supposed protectress of the husband's honor. A native writer, in summing up the character of his countrymen, says that they are moderate in eating, but their passion for liquor is carried to the greatest excess. The affection which husbands bear their wives is certainly much less than that borne by wives to their husbands, and it is very common for the men to love their neighbors' wives better than their own. This one-sided censor presupposes as a necessary consequence that the neighbors' wives must show some reciprocity. The general immorality of the lower classes in Mexico would almost exclude the expectation of a system of prostitution, as we usually understand the term. Puebla, a manufacturing town near Mexico, is summarily described as having a most devout female population and a most abandoned one, but this is a matter of conduct rather than of calling. The enumeration of offenses in the justice list of Mexico does not tell of one prostitute, although it contains a large number of persons guilty of incontinence. The exact meaning of this offense, in its legal and technical sense, is not given us, but we presume it relates to improper and disgusting practices. The charge of violation of public decency, although it may relate to mutual familiarities, will probably include both indecency and immorality. 
The following table gives the number of persons arrested in the city of Mexico in 1851. Offenses. Drunkenness. Males, 1256. Females, 1944. Total, 3200. Affrays and wounds, 728. Males, 246. Females, total, 974. Incontinence, 354. Males, 403. Females, 757. Total. Violations of public decency, 311. Males, 318. Females, 629. Total. Robbery, 384. Males, 120. Females, 504. Total. Suspicion of robbery, 180. Males, 84. Females. 264 total. Carrying weapons, 209 males. 85 females, 294 total. Picking pockets, 120 males. 25 females, 145 total. False pretenses, 39 males. 17 females, 56 total. Breaking prison, 36 males. 0 females. 36 total. Murder, 15 males, 3 females, 18 total. Total males, 36, 32. Total females, 32, 45. Total males and females, 68, 77. Among a population of inferior intellect, and with the excess of women always to be found in tropical countries, the character of the priesthood becomes of primary importance. On this particular, some writers are of the opinion that what was written in 1677 will apply with almost equal force in the present day, a position certainly open to doubt. The lower orders of the priests and friars in Mexico are generally uneducated and frequently licentious. The most revolting spectacles of vice and immorality are exhibited by some of them. They are remarkable for the rural appearance they present, but they cannot be considered types of the class. For the higher orders and respectable members of the priesthood are exempt from the imputations of such flagrant immorality. Even these are not blameless members of the church. Many of them have nephews and nieces in their houses, or at least those who call them uncle, but to whom scandal ascribes a closer relationship. Among the charitable institutions in Mexico, perhaps the most important is the CUNA, or Foundling Hospital. It is supported by private individuals and the members of the society consist of the first persons in the capital, male and female. The men furnish the money, the women give their time and attention. When a child has been about a month in the hospital, it is sent with an Indian nurse to one of the adjacent villages. But if sick or feeble, it remains in the institution, under the immediate inspection of the society. These nurses are subject to a responsible person, who lives in the village and answers for their good conduct. The child is brought back to the hospital when weaned and remains in his charge for life. Few, however, are left to grow up in the asylum. They are adopted by respectable persons who bring them up either as servants or as their own children. In this, as in other institutions of the same character, the mothers of the children often get themselves hired as nurses. There are usually five or six hundred children in this asylum. End of section 36. Section 37 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ramon Escamilla. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 37 Chapter 28 Central and South America Low Moral Condition San Salvador Guatemala Yucatan Costa Rica Honduras The Caribs Depravity in Peru and Chile Children of the House Intrigue in Lima Infanticide. Laxity of morals in Brazil and Paraguay. Foundling hospital at Rio Janeiro. The whole peninsula of South America, 
and the states comprised in Central America are involved in the same social system with Mexico, derived as they are by common origin from pure or mixed Spanish blood. The same political circumstances and organization have always affected the various territorial divisions, and whether we consider the semi-civilized nations of ancient Peru and its dependencies, or the savage tribes in the valleys of the Amazon and the La Plata, we find them, after the first eruption of Spanish conquerors, victims of indiscriminate oppression, insatiable avarice, and unsparing lust. South America was long considered a mere treasure field of the Spanish monarchy, to be worked without liability to account by every adventurer who chose to encounter the hardships of foreign travel or the perils of residence in a tropical climate and amid hostile savages. The natives far outnumbered their masters, and the same ruthless system of depression was extended to them as to Mexico. The consequence was that before the lapse of many generations from the conquest, there were but two classes throughout the vast Spanish territories, masters and slaves. The natural and inevitable result of servile institutions could not long be postponed. The descendants of the conquerors rapidly degenerated, and imbecility and incapacity took the places of heroism and ability. The original hardihood and daring, which had vanquished uncounted enemies, had traversed unknown wilds, had defied every danger, were lost in voluptuousness and self-indulgence. The posterity of those men who had discovered a new world and swayed the destinies of the old by a nod or the stroke of a pen were unable to protect themselves against the weak ministers of a worn-out despotism, or against any unscrupulous demagogue who could rally a band of roving Indians around him and maraud the peaceable and well-disposed. A state of political degradation reigned supreme over the whole of South America, only to be paralleled by the debasement of its social condition. In Central America, including San Salvador, Guatemala, Yucatan, Costa Rica, and Honduras, the condition of the women is very much the same as in Mexico. The statements of travelers in those little frequented regions are very vague in reference to the subject of public morality, and give us no reliable or detailed information on the specialties which would be of service in this inquiry. In Yucatan, the ladies are said to be somewhat more domesticated than their Mexican neighbors, and to interest themselves in the management of their households and the education of their children. But still the standard of morality is not very high if measured by United States habits and ideas. In the neighboring Republic of Guatemala, the free manners prevalent in the country districts of the kindred territories are usually met with, but these would rather indicate low ideas of decency than any actual immorality. Difference of climate and of race would make many things tolerable, or even reputable, which our colder skies and more rigid notions would totally exclude from the observances of civilized society. The Indian populations of South America have become so completely slaves during long years of bondage that they have lost their prominent characteristics, and are but a reflex of their masters in the lowest state of ignorance. The women may be generally described as of very loose morals, yet kind and gentle unless roused by jealousy, in which case they can use the knife as promptly as their male friends. It is said they make very affectionate mothers. There are a few tribes who have preserved some semblance of nationality. The Caribs of Honduras are a hardy and athletic race. Polygamy is general among them, three or four wives being a not uncommon number. The husband is compelled to have a separate house and plantation for each, and, if he make one a present, he must give the other something of equal value. He must also divide his time among them, giving a week to each in succession. When a carob takes a wife, he fells a plantation and builds a house. The wife then takes the management, and he becomes a gentleman. The women attend their plantations with great care, and, in the course of twelve or fifteen months, have every description of breadstuff under cultivation. About Christmas they engage several crayers, and freight them with produce for Trujillo and Belize, hiring their husbands and others as sailors. It is also the custom, when a woman cannot do all the work required on her plantation, for her to engage her husband as a laborer, and pay him two dollars per week. Industry and forethought are peculiar traits of the Carib women, 
Consequently, they easily surround themselves with necessaries and comforts. The data bearing on the proportion of the sexes in the aggregate population, although too imperfect to be worth presenting, yet go to show that, as in Mexico, there is a considerable preponderance of females. The disproportion in births is not so great as in deaths, for, while the number of males and females born is nearly equal, more of the former than the latter die annually. There are more old women than old men, ascribable, no doubt, to the greater sobriety of the women, drunkenness being a vice which, under the tropics, is rapid in its consequences. In Nicaragua, the women number two to one of the male population. The department of Cuscatlan in San Salvador has an excess of 1,838 women over men and of 1,709 boys over girls. Peru and Chile, though neighboring countries and both in the strip of western coast between the Andes and the sea, present considerable difference of condition. Chile is rapidly rising in political importance by means of the internal energy of the people and the development of natural resources by native and foreign enterprise and capital. It has been asserted by resident eyewitnesses that female virtue was at so low an ebb in Chile within a few years that in most families, even of good standing, there were one or more children who were called children of the house and whose parentage was distributed generally among the ladies of the family. Nay, we have heard that the rights of hospitality sometimes included civilities in respect to the females, which are usually considered as peculiar to certain oriental nations. A rapid change for the better is, however, taking place in these usages, and even the seaport of Valparaiso is described by Wilkes as being greatly improved from the period of his first visit, when few sailors left it without having lost both their money and health among its women. Peru has made but little advance in its recent political changes. The government is in a state of continual anarchy. A new mine of wealth has been discovered in the guano deposits of the Chincha Islands, which has attracted great numbers of foreign vessels to its shores. But the wealth acquired from this source has done little for the people. Lima, the capital, has long been remarkable for the levity and dissipation of its inhabitants. The very dress of the ladies, which may have been originally intended to ensure seclusion and privacy, has become an emblem of intrigue. It consists of a peculiar hood and petticoat, covering the wearer entirely, who, when thus in domino, is styled tapada, and is, by common usage, held to be secure from all impertinent interference or insult. The same term is applied to a shawl worn over the head, so as to cover the mouth and forehead. Under this concealment, the wearer is known only to the most intimate friends, and ladies thus attired frequent the theatres. It is favorable to intrigue, and so perfect is the security that any place of amusement may be visited with impunity, and, even if suspected by the husband or relative, she is protected from discovery by the respect attached to the custom. Dr. Chudi draws a very cheerless picture of the state and prospects of Peru. Its moral degradation is significantly typified in the decline of its population, which has been continually diminishing since the establishment of its independence. That noble land, which contained an enormous population at the time of the conquest, numbered in 1836 less than 1,400,000 inhabitants, not so many as were formerly found in the department of Cusco alone. The deaths in Lima vary annually from 2,500 to 2,800 out of a population of 53,000. In the ten months from January 1st to October 31st, 1841, they were 2,244, the births in that period being 1,682, of which 860 were illegitimate. Quote, not less remarkable than the number of illegitimate children is that of the newborn infants exposed and found dead. 495. These afford the most striking proofs of the immorality which prevails in Lima, especially among the colored people. To them belong nearly two-thirds of the illegitimate births and fully four-fifths of the children cast out to die. There is reason to suspect, though it cannot be positively proved, that no small portion of the latter suffer a violent death by the hands of their mothers. When a dead child is picked up before the church of San Lazaro, 
or in the street, it is carried, without a word of inquiry, to the Pantheon. Frequently it is not even thought worthwhile to bury it. I have seen the vultures dragging about the sweltering carcasses of infants and devouring them in populous streets. Footnote. On comparing the lists of births and deaths from 1826 to 1842, I satisfied myself that the annual excess of the latter over the former averages 550. Quote, the women of Lima are far superior to the men, both corporeally and intellectually, though their conduct in many respects is anything but exemplary. They cling with invincible tenacity to the use of their national walking garb, the sayaimanto, in which they take their pleasure in the streets, making keen play with the one eye they leave uncovered, and quite secure in that disguise from detection, even by the most jealous scrutiny. The veil is inviolable. Any man who should attempt to pluck off a woman's manto would be very severely handled by the populace. The history of their lives comprises two phases. In the full bloom of their fascinating beauty, their time is divided between doing naught and naughty doings. When their charms are on the wane, they take to devotion and scandal. A young lady of Lima rises late, dresses her hair with orange or jasmine flowers, and waits for breakfast, after which she receives or pays visits. During the heat of the day she swings in a hammock or reclines on a sofa, smoking a cigar. After dinner she again pays visits, and finishes the evening either in the theater, or the plaza, or on the bridge. Few ladies occupy themselves with needlework or netting, though some of them possess great skill in those arts. Quote, the pride which the fair limenas take in their dainty little feet knows no bounds. Walking, sitting, or standing, swinging in the hammock or lying on the sofa, they are ever watchful to let their tiny feet be seen. Praise of their virtue, their intelligence, or their beauty sounds not half so sweetly in their ears as encomiums bestowed on their pretty feet. They take the most scrupulous care of them, and avoid everything that might favor their enlargement. A large foot, pataza inglesa, an English foot, as they say, is an abomination to them. I once heard a beautiful European lady deservedly extolled by some fair dames of Lima, but they wound up their eulogy with these words, Pero que pie, valgame Dios, parece una lancha. But what a foot! Good heavens, it is like a great boat! and yet the foot in question would by no means have been thought large in Europe. Quote, the Limenas possess, in an extraordinary degree, talents which unhappily are seldom cultivated as they should be. They have great penetration, sound judgment, and very correct views respecting the most diversified affairs of life. Like the women of Seville, they are remarkable for their quick and pointed repartees, and a limeña is sure never to come off second best in a war of words. They possess a rare firmness of character, and a courage not generally given to their sex. In these respects they are far superior to the dastardly, vacillating men, and they have played as important a part as the latter, often one much more so, in all the political troubles of their country. Ambitious and aspiring, Accustomed to conduct with ease the maziest intrigues with a presence of mind that never fails them at critical moments, passionate and bold, they mingle in the great game of politics with momentous effect, and usually turn it to their own advantage, seldom to that of the state. Add to this picture that, though delicate, modest women are rare, actual adultery is not often committed by the sex, but that concubinage is more common or rather, perhaps, more public than in Europe, the father being usually very fond and careful of his natural children, and a fair view is obtained of female character in Lima. The white creoles are noted for sensuality, and some of the dances in which they indulge are of indescribable obscenity. The influx of foreign ships and seamen into Callao, the port of Lima, has brought in its train the usual accompaniments, drunkenness and debauchery. A few years ago it was almost in decay and ruin. Now it swarms with drinking shops, pulperias, and prostitutes, and is probably as profligate a place as any in the western hemisphere. Passing to the Atlantic coast of South America, we find Robertson, the author of Letters from Paraguay, 
Writing of Female Spanish Society at the City of Santa Fe. Quote, I was particularly struck by the extremely free nature, to use the very gentlest expression, of the conversation which was adopted with the ladies, young and old. It was such as to make me, with my unsophisticated English feelings, blush at every turn, although such modesty, whenever it was observed, caused a hearty laugh. The same author, speaking of female society in Rio, says, quote, There is no society at Rio, for I cannot call that society from which females are excluded. Generally speaking, the husband of a Brazilian wife is not so much her companion as her keeper. His house is the abode of jealousy and distrust, for he can not always stretch his confidence to the point of imagining fidelity in the wife of his bosom, any more than he can rely on the virtuous forbearance of the friend of his heart. His daughters are brought up in Moorish seclusion, and his wife is delivered over to the keeping of a train of somber slaves and domestics. It may be thought that some of these remarks are applicable to periods of time and conditions of society now happily passed away. But the poison of moral depravity, when once taken up, is not to be speedily eliminated from the system of nations more than of individuals. A very recent traveler, Mr. Stewart, testifies to the demoralization of female society in all classes. With such uniform representations of the general immorality and of the low estimate in which female virtue is held in South America, it is not to be expected that there are any special details on the subject of our investigation. Prostitution is in some degree attendant upon a state of public feeling in which the purity of wives and daughters is held in respect, not viewed with jealousy, but with reverence. In South America, even in the present time, females mix but little in society. Their education is very limited, terminates early, and they are always under some kind of guardianship or chaperonage in public. This does not elevate the female character. Freedom and self-respect are the best protectives to virtue and honor, and the seclusion of women from general society only serves to invest them with the attraction of mystery to the libertine, while it takes away from themselves the experience and self-reliance in which they find a safeguard. In South America generally, the character of the priesthood is unfortunately open to reprobation. In Brazil, the priests are reputed to be free livers. Nearly all of them have families, and when seen leaving the dwellings of their wives, or of the females they visit, they speak of them as their nieces or sisters. Some unequivocally admit the relationship existing, and acknowledge their children. The value of the priestly character in estimating the standard of morality among a population is unquestionably great. An enlightened native said to Mr. Eubank, quote, The priesthood of this country is superlatively corrupt. It is impossible for men to be worse, or to imagine them worse. In the churches they appear respectable and devout, but their secret crimes have made this city a Sodom. There are, of course, honorable exceptions. Another, a man of unquestionable authority, said, quote, They are assuredly the most licentious and profligate part of the community. The exceptions are rare. Celibacy being one of their dogmas, you will find nearly the whole with families. At Rio Janeiro there is a foundling hospital, established in 1582, which is a noble institution. The boys are provided for at Botofoga, and are, in due time, apprenticed to trades. The girls reside in the city establishment and are taught to read, write, sew, etc. At each anniversary, bachelors in want of wives attend at the festival, and if they see girls to their liking, make themselves known. If a girl accepts such a lover, he makes his application to the managers, who inquire into his character, and, if satisfactory, the marriage takes place, and a small dowry is given from the funds of the society. In the management of the institution or the reception of infants, there is nothing peculiarly worthy notice. But if those who are averse to such institutions contrast the blessed results of saving these helpless infants from misery, and the horror of beholding their dead bodies cast on dunghills to be devoured as carrion by obscene animals and birds of prey, as has been mentioned in the notice of Lima, 
they would, on such grounds, even if there were no better to be urged, suspend a hasty judgment on foundling hospitals. End of section 37 Recording by Ramon Escamilla Conway, Arkansas R-A-M-O-N-E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A dot wordpress dot com Section 38 of The History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 38. Chapter 29. North American Indians. Decrease of the Indian Race, Treatment of Females, Courtship, Stealing Wives, Domestic Life Among the Crow Indians, Pine Leaf, Female Prisoners, Marriage, Conjugal Relations, Infidelity, Polygamy, Divorce, Female Morality, Intrigue and Revenge, Decency of Outward Life, Effects of Contact with White Men, Traders The aboriginal inhabitants of the vast continent of America have been variously described by different writers, one man lauding them as models of chivalry and virtue, another decrying them as the personification of meanness and vice. Hence, it is only at a recent period, comparatively speaking, that any reliable information has been obtainable on the subject. In the limited space that can be given to a consideration of the Indian and his social habits, we shall endeavor to reject both romance and vituperation. We do not believe him so stoically virtuous as the former class of writers depict. Nor do we think that all of the race are so deeply sunk in depravity as the latter represent. In addition to the authorities quoted in the progress of the chapter, we are under obligations to Mr. Horace St. John's article on prostitution, incorporated by Mr. Mayhew in his tracts on London Labor, and the London poor. At the time of the settlement of Jamestown and Plymouth, it was estimated that there were about two millions of Indians scattered over this continent. They were then a brave and hardy people who lived on the produce of the chase, varying their locations as the facilities for hunting required. When the last census of the United States was taken, their numbers were about 400,000, exclusive of 15,000 in Canada and the British possessions. This decrease has been ascribed to the occupation of their hunting grounds by white men, and the consequent extermination of the game upon which they depended for subsistence. The free use of intoxicating liquors and the introduction of smallpox and other fatal diseases. These causes will, in all probability, result in the entire extinction of the race. In the small number mentioned are many half-breeds, children of white fathers and Indian mothers. It might naturally be supposed that in the several tribes composing this people there would exist great diversity of manners but these are found only in minor particulars. The social institutions of the North American Indians are so generally uniform as to render it possible to sketch the whole at one view. Their occupations are still confined to the chase and the warpath. To perform a round of daily labor, even though it ensured the most ample provision for his wants, would be contrary alike to the inclination and the supposed dignity of the red man. 
who will scarcely deign to follow any pursuit which does not combine enterprise and excitement. Woman, therefore, becomes the drudge and slave. Upon her devolves the duty of cultivating the ground whenever any attempt is made to assist the spontaneous efforts of nature. She it is who must bear the load of game which her husband has killed, must carry wood and water, build huts, and make canoes. In fishing and in reaping their scanty harvest, the man will, at times, condescend to assist her, but otherwise all the labor falls to her share. In those tribes visited by traders, her duties are still heavier. She must join in the hunt, and afterward dress and prepare the skins and furs which are to be bartered for whiskey and other luxuries. To this degraded condition the women seem perfectly reconciled, and expertness at the assigned employment is a source of pride to them. The treatment of the female sex is generally admitted to be a standard by which man's moral qualities can be estimated. It may be doubted if this rule would apply to the Indian tribes, for those who treat their females most mildly are by no means the most virtuous nor is their deference attended by any increase of attachment, the general opinion of a wife's value being the consideration of her capacity to be useful. Where they aid in procuring food or luxuries for the tribe, they are held in more esteem, while in places where the chief burden of providing rests upon the men, they are treated with severity. Even when oppressed with these laborious occupations, the women have as much native vanity in respect to decoration as the sex in any part of the world. And an accurate observer remarks that, judging from the time a squaw often occupies in arranging her hair, or disposing her scanty dress, or painting her round cheeks with glaring circles of vermilion, it is evident that personal ornament occupies as much of her thoughts as among fashionable women in civilized society. Courtship and marriage are differently arranged among the various tribes. The predominant custom is for a man to procure a wife by purchase from her father, thus acquiring a property over which he has absolute control and which he can barter away or dispose of in any manner he pleases. The example of Powhatan, who was chief ruler over thirty tribes in Virginia at the time of the English colonization, is a case in point. It is said that he always had a multitude of wives about him, and when he wearied of any, would distribute them as presents among his principal warriors. In most cases, the woman is not consulted at all, the whole transaction being a mercantile one. In others, an infant female is betrothed by her father, for a consideration, to some man who requires a wife, either for himself or for his son. The girl remains with her parents until the age of puberty, when the contract is completed, at which time the father often makes a present to the husband equal in value to the price originally paid for his daughter. Another mode of obtaining a wife is to steal a girl from some neighboring tribe. Captain Clark, who crossed the Rocky Mountains in the years 1804 to 1806, as one of the leaders of an expedition ordered by the executive of the United States, records instances of this kind. He says, One of the Anahawes had stolen a minatory girl. The whole nation immediately espoused the quarrel, and one hundred and fifty of the warriors were marching down to avenge the insult. 
the chief took possession of the girl and sent her by messengers to the hands of her countrymen in time to avert the threatened calamity a young minotary had carried off the daughter of a chief of the mandans the father went to the village and found his daughter whom he brought home and at the same time took possession of a horse belonging to the offender this reprisal satisfied his vengeance the stealing of young women is one of the most common offenses a more peaceable kind of preliminary to matrimony is for a man desiring a wife to offer a small present to the woman if she accepts it and offers him one in return the match is complete or he may tell her his wishes without any introductory gift and if agreeable she will reply accordingly others will not venture to express their thoughts but will sit quietly by a girl's side and if she does not remove from her seat her assent is understood to be given still another custom is for the lover to enter the woman's tent at night bearing a lighted torch if she allows it to burn it is a sign that his attentions are not desired but if she extinguishes it she thus intimates that he is accepted it will not require much knowledge of human nature to imagine the consequences of these nocturnal visits a recently published work, Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth, New York, 1856, professes to give an accurate account of the domestic life of the Crow Indians, among whom he lived for some years, and became a chief of the tribe, who believed that he was one of themselves, and had been stolen from them in infancy. It may be necessary to say that we only quote him on points where corroborative evidence can be obtained from other sources. His character for veracity is questionable, and among the miners of California, where he is known, any extravagant tale is proverbially called one of Jim Beckworth's lies. His first experience of matrimony showing that the woman's consent was not asked but that the arrangements were made by the parents is thus stated while conversing with my father he suddenly demanded if i wanted a wife i assented very well said he you shall have a pretty wife and a good one away he strode to the lodge of one of the greatest braves and asked one of his daughters of him to bestow upon his son the consent of the parent was readily given he had three very pretty daughters and the ensuing day they were brought to my father's lodge and i was requested to take my choice the eldest was named still water and i chose her the acceptance of my wife was the completion of the ceremony and i was a married man as sacredly in their eyes as if the holy christian church had fastened the irrevocable knot upon us cases are also recorded by indian travelers wherein a custom more assimilating to civilized notions is adopted a young man will court a girl for a length of time using all his endeavors to cultivate her affections and the woman upon her part will entertain an equal tenderness for him again turning to the pages of beckworth we find an instance of this in the case of a woman who attracted his attention it must not be considered that he was a victim of the romantic affliction called first love for he had some six or eight wives in the tribe at the time his description is as follows in connection with my indian experience i conceive it to be my duty to devote a few lines to one of the bravest women that ever lived namely pine leaf in indian barchiampa she possessed great intellectual powers 
her features were pleasing and her form symmetrical she had lost a twin brother in an attack on the village and was left to avenge his death she was at that time twelve years of age and solemnly vowed that she would never marry until she had killed a hundred of the enemy with her own hand whenever a war party started pine leaf was the first to volunteer to accompany them she had chosen my party to serve in i began to feel more than a common attachment toward her one day while riding leisurely along i asked her to marry me provided we both returned safe she laughed and said well i will marry you when we return no but when the pine leaves turn yellow i reflected that it would soon be winter and regarded her promise as valid a few days afterward it occurred to me that pine leaves do not turn yellow and i saw i had been practiced upon when i again spoke to her on the subject i said pine leaf you promised to marry me when the pine leaves turn yellow it has occurred to me that they will never turn yellow am i to understand that you never intend to marry me yes i will marry you she said with a coquettish smile but when when you shall find a red-headed indian i saw i advanced nothing by importuning her and i let the matter rest it would occupy too much space to recite all the details of a long courtship including scenes in war and chase at the camp or on horse-stealing excursions suffice it to say that the heroine accomplished her vow and seemed convinced of the sincerity of her lover she concluded the courtship thus she then approached me every eye being intently fixed upon her look at me she said i know that your heart is crying for the follies of the people but let it cry no more i am yours after you have so long been seeking me i believe you love me our lodge shall be a happy one and when you depart to the happy hunting ground i will be already there to welcome you this day i become your wife women will sometimes voluntarily ask men to marry them promising to be faithful good-tempered and obedient this request is seldom refused as the marriage tie is easily dissolved if the union proves unpleasant tanner who was taken prisoner by a war party and lived among various tribes in the northwest for nearly thirty years relates a case in point the woman's endeavors to secure him as her husband commenced with an invitation to smoke with her he acceded but either his blood was not so warm as that coursing through indian veins or from some other cause it was long before he consented to the proposed companionship which a red man would have accepted on the spot the girl resolutely pursued him and at last with the consent of her father took possession of his hut while he was absent when he returned he could not put the young woman to shame by sending her back to her friends and so they became man and wife beckworth also had some experience of this custom a little girl who had often asked me to marry her came to me one day and with every importunity insisted on my accepting her as my wife i said when you are older i will talk to you about it but she would not be put off you are a great brave she said and if i am your wife you will paint my face when you return from the war and i shall be proud the little innocent used such powerful appeals that i told her she might be my wife he lived with her until he left the indians and her son is now 
1855, chief of the tribe. The women taken prisoners in war are frequently married into the tribe that captured them, but never to the captors, who stand in the relation of brothers to them, and by whom they are protected from insult. A warrior who has taken a female prisoner usually makes an exchange with another who has had the same fortune, each being thus accommodated without infringing upon custom. If a man has seized more than he can dispose of in that way, he generally gives them to any man who will accept them. In the same manner, a woman whose husband has been killed in battle will ask a warrior for a male prisoner, who accordingly becomes the successor of one whom he has probably slain. In these cases, the man is adopted as one of the tribe, is kindly treated, and entitled to his share of all their advantages. The marriages are without ceremony of any kind. The parties agree to live with each other as long as they can do so with mutual satisfaction, and the man conducts his bride to his hut at once or resides with her at her father's cabin. It must not be supposed that the ordinary requirements of a married life are systematically unheeded, for, as a general rule, the squaws are faithful to their husbands who, upon their part, rigidly exact this fidelity, even if they do not practice it themselves. The general description of the position of Indian women already given applies equally to their state after marriage. They continue sometimes the abject slaves, otherwise the patient servants of their husbands, while he eats the food she has cooked and probably caught herself, she must wait in submissive silence. At all times she approaches him with the deference due to a superior being. An Indian will never evince the slightest symptom of tenderness toward his wife. This would be opposed to his idea of manly dignity. But the eagerness with which he will revenge her wrongs proves that his apparent apathy springs only from pride, or a fancied sense of decorum. When Catlin proposed to paint the portrait of the wife of a Sioux chief, his offer was ridiculed, and it was considered marvelous that he should honor a woman in the same manner he had honored the warriors, as the former had never taken any scalps never done anything but make fires, dress skins, and other servile employments. To infer from these facts that there is no conjugal affection among this people would be erroneous. Notwithstanding their assumed indifference, instances are not rare of strong mutual attachment. To an Indian there is nothing inconsistent with affection in his indolently walking through the forest while his wife follows him bearing the heavy wigwam poles, his ideas never having been led to consider this as other than her natural duty. Many pictures of domestic happiness are exhibited among the Indians, and the Blackfeet, Sanee, and Blood tribes strongly desire that their wives may live long and look young. Heckwelder relates a singular instance of indulgence. In 1762 there was a scarcity of food among many tribes, and during the prevalence of this famine a sick woman wished for a mess of Indian corn. Her husband rode about a hundred miles to obtain it, gave his horse in exchange for a hatful, and returned home on foot with the coveted dainty. These lords of creation attempt to enforce their marital rights with much severity, and if their suspicions are excited against their wives, become very indignant, and punish them by beating, 
biting off the nose, dismissing them in disgrace, or even killing them. The wife of a Mandan Indian ran away from him in consequence of a quarrel. By so doing, she forfeited her life, which custom would have justified the husband in taking, and he would have murdered her but for the interposition of the travelers, who gave him a few presents and persuaded him to take his wife home. They went off together, but by no means in a state of much apparent love. This trouble arose from jealousy. In another case, a minetary had much abused his wife for the same reason, and she sought refuge in the camp. Her husband followed and demanded her, and she returned with him, as we had no authority to separate those whom even Indian rights had united. Since an Indian considers his wife as so much property, equally valuable as his horse, and for the same reason, for the labors she can perform, we can easily understand that polygamy is universally allowed, though it is not generally practiced, being confined to great chiefs and medicine men, as the rank and file are often too poor to buy a second wife. Many follow the custom for the mere purpose of amassing wealth, but others of the stoic warriors delight in the harem from the same sensual motives as a Turk or Hindu. Among the communities that Catlin had an opportunity of visiting, it was no uncommon thing to find from six to fourteen wives in the same lodge. He mentions an instance in which a young chief of the Mandans took four wives in one day, paying a horse or two for each. These brides were from twelve to fourteen years of age. An Indian marriage at this age is far from uncommon, and indeed it appears from good testimony that celibacy beyond the age of puberty is very rare. Some of the females are mothers before they are twelve years old. It is not universal for the wives to live all in one hut, some tribes requiring separate lodgings for each. This custom is in force among the crows, and Beckworth relates that, on returning from one of his excursions, he made a round of visits to his wives some of whom he had not seen for months. It is not uncommon for a man to marry his wife's sister, and indeed the whole family of girls, on the supposition that his household will thus be rendered more harmonious. For the same reason, a Cherokee will marry a mother and her daughter at one time, though he will not, upon any account, take a wife from his own kindred. Among the Oregon tribes, it is strictly required that each wife should be purchased from a different family. So well established among Indians is the custom of polygamy that civilization meets the greatest difficulty in opposing it, and if ever abolished, it will overthrow their whole social system, and, in changing their national character, tend to their speedy extinction. Sir George Simpson relates an amusing anecdote of an Indian who came into the subtle districts of British North America, learned to read and write, and adopted the principle of monogamy. Returning to his tribe, he endeavored to persuade them to the same course. Long and earnest were the debates on the question and the finale was, instead of converting them, they reconverted him. He took a great number of wives, forswore books, and never again appeared in the character of a social reformer. Another chief offered to renounce polygamy, he having five wives and a large fortune in horses and cattle. 
falling in love with the daughter of a gentleman in the service of the Hudson's Bay Company, he dismissed his harem and presented himself, with great parade and confidence, to make his matrimonial proposal to the lady's family. To his extreme disgust and mortification, they rejected the honor of his distinguished alliance. He revenged himself by refilling his hut with women as quickly as possible. If the obligation of marriage is easily contracted, divorce is effected with as little trouble. It is not often that a separation takes place, for it is held dishonorable to forsake a wife for a trifling cause, particularly if she has born children. When it does occur, the offspring are usually permitted to decide which of the parents they will accompany, although usage gives the mother the right to take charge of them. In some instances, the form of divorce is simply for the husband to bid his wife go. In others, he will not take the trouble to give her notice of his discontent, but will quietly put his gun on his shoulder and move off himself. There are a few instances of this being done for very slight reasons. But in addition to the restraint of custom just mentioned, the actual value of the wife is a subject of consideration. Where a separation does take place, the man will often endeavor to renew the connection. A missionary mentions a woman who contracted a new marriage after her husband left her. He returned and claimed her. The dispute was referred to a chief, and he, either wanting a precedent or distrusting his judicial capacity, could think of no better expedient than placing the woman at an equal distance from each claimant and then ordering the men to run promising that the one who first reached her should retain possession of the prize. In some tribes, divorce renders it impossible for the woman to marry again, but in others she can make a new alliance as soon as free from the old one. It is difficult to form any opinion as to the morality of females among a people where marriages are contracted and dissolved so easily. We may safely say that they have very little idea of chastity as a positive virtue, notwithstanding their general, although not invariable, fidelity when married which may probably be induced more by fear of consequences than sense of duty. Of prostitution for a price, as known in civilized communities, we find no trace in the Indian nations while in a normal condition. But if we assume Webster's definition, the act of offering the body to an indiscriminate intercourse with men it can scarcely be claimed that they are free. The predominant motive seems to be an inordinate sexual appetite which must be gratified, if not in legitimate marriage, then by illicit intercourse. We are told that in most large assemblies of Indians there are to be seen voluptuous-looking females whose passions urge them to this and Carver, in his Travels in North America, says that among the Manetta Wessis, it was a custom, when a young woman could not get a husband, for her to assemble all the leading warriors of the tribe at a feast, and when their hunger was appeased, to retire behind a screen and submit to the embraces of each in succession. This gained her great applause and always ensured her a husband. Though the custom is now almost obsolete, the principle still exists, and prostitution is regarded by many as the shortest road to marriage. The birth of a bastard child entails little shame upon a girl, 
and that such children are not more frequent is due less to their chastity than to the means they employ to procure abortion one of the reasons advanced for their early marriages is that the impetuosity of the girls would render it difficult to obtain a virtuous wife if the union was delayed the confessions upon starting for war or what is called the war path secret would also favor the opinion that abstract virtue is at a low ebb at these times every warrior is required to relate to his companions each act of illicit intercourse he has committed since the last excursion naming his partner and enumerating the facts attending the frailty this obligation is enforced by the most rigid oaths known to indian customs this immorality is not confined to the single women for the squaws are at times as ready to take part in an intrigue as in any civilized nations beckworth whose experience of indian manners seems to have embraced every conceivable phase of life relates his adventures in this way a brave named big rain was elected chief of the village he possessed a most beautiful squaw who was the admiration of the young men and all were plotting to win her from her lord i determined to steal her be the consequences what they might having enticed the husband to a smoking party he says i went to big rain's lodge dressed and painted in the extreme of fashion and saw the lady reclining upon her couch she started up saying who is here hush it is i what do you want here i have come to see you because i love you don't you know that i am the chief's wife yes i know it but he does not love you as i do i can paint your face and bring you fine horses but as long as you are the wife of big rain he will never paint your face with you by my side i could bring home many scalps then we could often dance and our hearts would be merry go now she pleaded for if my husband should return i fear he would kill you go for your own sake and for mine no i will not go till you give me a pledge that you will be mine she hesitated for a moment and then slipped a ring from her finger and placed it on mine all i had to do now was to watch for a favorable chance to take her away the appointed time had arrived and on going to the place of assignation i found the lady true to her word in fact she was there first we joined the party and were absent about a week we succeeded in capturing stealing one hundred and seventeen horses and arrived safe with them in the camp meanwhile big rain discovered the loss of his wife when we rode in he took no part in the rejoicing but ordered his wife and me to be surrounded and with half a dozen of his sisters all armed with scourges administered a most unmerciful whipping i received it with indian fortitude if i had resisted they would have been justified in killing me also if they had drawn one drop of blood i should have been justified in taking their lives without wishing to delay the progress of the narrative we cannot resist the impulse to express admiration of the indian punishment for a seducer of married women could the same unromantic penalty be duly and zealously inflicted for similar transgressions in places of more pretensions some of the scandals of civilized life would be curtailed to resume 
I sent word to the wife of Big Rain that I should go out again the next night, and should expect her company. She returned a favorable answer, and was faithful to her promise. On my return I received another such flogging as the first. Two nights afterward I started on a third expedition, my new wife accompanying me, and received a third sound thrashing from her husband. Finally he grew furious, but my soldiers said to him, You have whipped him three times, and shall whip him no more. We will buy your claim. He acceded to the offer, and consented to resign all interest and title in Mrs. Big Rain for the consideration of one war horse, ten guns, ten chief's coats of scarlet cloth, ten pairs of new leggings, and the same number of moccasins. This was not a bad remuneration for a faithless woman. In another case, an intrigue resulted tragically. One of the wives of a minitary chief eloped with a man who had formerly been her lover. He deserted her in a short time. She returned to her father's hut, whither her husband traced her. He walked deliberately into the hut, smoked quietly for a time, and then took her by the hair, led her to the door, and killed her with a single blow of his tomahawk. The caprice or generosity of the same chief gave a very different conclusion to a similar incident which occurred some time afterward. Another of his wives eloped with a young man who was not able to support her as she wished, and both returned to the village. She presented herself before her husband and asked his pardon. He sent for the man, inquired if they still loved each other, and on their acknowledgment gave up his wife to her lover, made them a present of three horses, and restored them both to his favor. With the exception of some national customs, the outward life of the Indian is generally decent. A temporary interval of wild license corresponding to the Saturnalia of the ancients, and called the Festival of Dreams, is common among the Canadian tribes. This carnival lasts fifteen days, and laying aside all their usual gravity, they then commit every imaginable extravagance. Our authority does not say whether immorality forms a portion of this relaxation, but from the custom of other bands it is not improbable. Lewis and Clark mention several instances in which they were present at dancing and similar festivals, and witnessed exhibitions of the most foul and revolting indecency. Mr. Catlin records his opinion that the old world has very little of superior morality or virtue to hold as an example to the North American Indians, and we are not inclined to enter into any long comparison of the races. The manners of each have been described, and while it would be unjust to expect the untutored son of the forest to display as much delicacy as his more cultivated fellow-men, it would be equally ungenerous to assert that the white female population, as an aggregate, are governed by the impulses which apparently sway the Indian woman. But whatever doubts there may exist as to the immorality of the Indian women in their natural state, all are entirely removed as soon as they come in contact with the white race. Those in the provinces of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Canada have rapidly learned the worst of vices. They are drunken, sensual, and depraved. The venereal disease commits frightful ravages among them. In fact, 
most of their sickness arises from excess of one kind or another. McLean, in his twenty-five years' service in Hudson's Bay, says that the men employed by the company are reconciled to their hard employment and poor remuneration by the immorality of the women, of whom numbers are prostitutes selling themselves for the smallest remuneration. On the northwest coast, chastity is scarcely even a name. The sea tribes are the most licentious, and at some places, where ships touch for supplies, hundreds of women come down to the beach, and by indecent exposures of their persons, endeavor to obtain permission to come on board. Sir George Simpson received a visit from a chief, who wanted to negotiate the loan of Lady Simpson, and offered his squaw in temporary exchange. Many of the traders on the upper Missouri, from motives of policy, connect themselves with women of the tribes. The most beautiful girls aspire to this station, which elevates them above their ordinary servile occupations. These engagements are not marriages in our sense of the word. A price is paid for the girl, and she is transferred at once to the trader's house. With equal facility he can annul the contract, for which her father is not sorry, as he is thus enabled to sell her over again. The tariff of prices will range from two horses to a handful of alls. Such is the remuneration for which an Indian chief will prostitute his daughter. It must be added that occasionally the couple live permanently together as man and wife, the possibility of their doing so being always supposed in the first instance. End of section 38 Section 39 of The History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ramon Escamilla The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 39 Chapter 30 Barbarous Nations Part 1 Africa, Australasia, West Indies, Java, Sumatra, Borneo. The relations of the sexes among uneducated races are modified by every circumstance of their position, but the natural ascendancy of the strong over the weak is universally displayed, and wherever woman is allowed a social rank approaching that of man, it will be found that a degree of civilization has been attained. Many branches of the human family have advanced, more or less, beyond the utterly savage state, the love of ornament and the practice of exchange having raised them one step in the scale, while they vary as much in the characteristics of their barbarism as civilized nations do in their refinement. Waving generalities, a better idea of their respective customs will be obtained by noticing the position of females among the different nations. Africa some of the most wild and savage tribes of the human family are to be found in the immense peninsula of Africa. Observation has proved that a medium state of refinement is accompanied with the least immorality, and that it is among the merest savages and the most highly polished communities that the greatest profligacy exists. In order to present the subject clearly, we will make a geographical arrangement and, commencing from the south, pass over the continent till we reach the valley of the lower Nile. The Hottentots are a dissolute, profligate race, and have borne that character from the earliest period. It was remarked by Van Riebeck in 1655, and confirmed by Colonel Napier in 1840, the latter describing them as proverbially unchaste. Indecency and lewdness are their characteristics, and even now, though accustomed to clothing, it is not uncommon for them to strip themselves, and dance in a lascivious manner at their festivals. 
The females prostitute themselves readily to strangers, some from inclination, others for money or a gift of finery, but we have no means of estimating the numbers of this disreputable class. A few of superior order are scattered among these degraded creatures, and intelligent and well-conducted women have attracted the notice of travelers. The pastoral Kaffirs are more moral, though more ferocious than the Hottentots, being more addicted to arms and less to debauch. They practice polygamy, buying their wives for so many head of cattle. The girls undergo a probation before marriage, during which they are kept in seclusion. As the tribe wander from place to place, they carry their women with them, and upon them all the domestic labor falls, even the chief's wives assisting in grinding corn and similar work. Divorce is easy on very slight grounds. We occasionally hear of women committing fornication, but no professed class of prostitutes has been described. Marriage is not held as a sacred tie, but adultery by a wife is severely punished. Natural affections appear extremely weak among the Kaffirs, and mothers have but little attachment to their children, the sickly and feeble being sometimes abandoned to avoid the trouble of rearing them. Mrs. Ward knew of a woman who buried alive a sickly daughter. The little creature was but imperfectly interred. It burst from the grave and ran home. A second time it was subjected to the same torture, and again escaped. A third attempt was made with a similar result, when its mother received it, and it ultimately recovered. Such instances of inhumanity are not rare. Husbands frequently drag their sick wives into a thicket and leave them to die. It is important to mention that, where these people have embraced Christianity, their manners have totally changed. Polygamy has been renounced, and they manifest an inclination to conform to the morals taught them. Between the tropics, the people are notorious for licentiousness. Morality is a strange idea to them, nor is a man restrained by any social law from intercourse with as many females as he pleases. The result is that women are regarded strictly as marketable commodities, and the commonest feelings of humanity are unknown. On the Gold Coast, husbands openly prostitute their wives for money. In other places, an adulterer pays a fine to the husband, and many urge their wives to commit the crime for the sake of the penalty. When Laird visited the Niger in 1832, he found the condition of the females upon its borders most humiliating. Polygamy was universal, and wives were reduced to slavery in their own houses. In short, the race may be described as the most idle, ignorant, and profligate in Africa. The king possessed 140 wives, one of whom was under 13 years of age, and all had been purchased for a few muskets or a piece of cloth. Half a dozen of the fattest were known as his favorites, and one of them was said to weigh over 350 pounds. The mother of this prince lived in his palace and amused the court with obscene dances. Adultery by any inmate of the harem was punished with death. When a man died, one at least of his wives was expected to attend him. She was bound and thrown into the river. In another place the woman was buried alive, and in the kingdom of Fundal, when a chief died leaving fifteen wives, the king selected the ugliest to be hanged over the grave, and transferred the remaining fourteen to his own quarters. The native of Western Africa looks upon his wife as a source of pleasure and gain, reckoning her as property to the amount she can earn. With a strange inconsistency, some of these barbarians profess a sentiment of attachment. The king of Ada told Lander that he loved him as he loved his wife. As he was a polygamist, it is to be assumed the traveler thought it a divided affection. Marriage is held as one of the common occurrences of life. When a man is old enough, he takes a wife, and goes on adding to his property until he probably owns a hundred, if he has means enough to buy them. Even under this system, many women cannot obtain stated husbands, as some men will not take permanent wives. But it is safe to assert that no single man lives without female intercourse, and no single woman remains chaste. A wife suspected of adultery is forced to drink a poisonous decoction but she sometimes bribes the priest to render it harmless. Widows who have lived on bad terms with their husbands have to undergo the same ordeal. An illicit connection with the king's wife results in death to both parties, 
but for the wife of a chief the gift of a slave is an expiation. The price of a handsome wife is from eighteen to thirty-six dollars. A plain-looking one is worth about seven dollars. As a man's inclination varies, he often sells one wife and buys another with the proceeds of the transaction. In the kingdom of Dahomey, once the center of the slave trade, a most profligate population is found, and the traveler entering its seaport is immediately struck with the immodesty of the women. Throughout the country, the same characteristic is observable. They are profligates from the highest to the lowest. The king is superior in brutality and filthiness, traits which seem hereditary to the throne of Dahomey, to any of his subjects. He has thousands of wives, his chiefs have hundreds, his subjects tens. The royal favorites are too sacred for the gaze of common people, who must turn aside or hide their faces if any of them are passing. Strangers are excluded from the harem, but the privileged nobility attend the king's feasts, at which his wives take a leading part in drinking rum and conducting the debauch. When the king desires to confer honor on any favorite, he chooses a wife for him and presents her publicly. She hands her husband a cup of rum, which is a sign of union. The king of Dahomey supports an army of several thousand Amazons, who dress in male attire, do not marry, and are supposed not to have intercourse with men. These troops were long considered invincible, but a few years ago they encountered a defeat on one of their marauding expeditions, and a thousand or more were killed on the field. As the king and his wealthy subjects have so many wives, poor people are obliged to content themselves with the company of prostitutes, who are a licensed and taxed class in Dahomey. There appears to be a band of these in every village, but their profits are often insufficient for support, and they resort to industrial occupation, hiring themselves to carry heavy burdens, etc. One traveler saw two hundred and fifty collected in a troop, and another was assailed by a crowd of women who offered to be his wives for a drop of rum. Many of the poorest class stroll about naked, and a gratuity, however small, will purchase their favors. The dirty, lazy, dull people of the Fante coast have the same moral aspect as the subjects of Dahomey. Parents sell their children, husbands sell their wives, women sell themselves for a trifling sum. One woman was so anxious to make a bargain of this kind that she took possession of a traveler's bed, and force was necessary to expel her. Marriage is a mere purchase, a wife costing about sixteen dollars. Women are unsaleable when more than fifteen or sixteen years old. Any man committing adultery is forced to buy his paramour at her cost price. Along the coast of Benan, several customs prevail. Public dancers act as prostitutes and offer themselves at a small price. Every woman considers it an honor to be the king's companion, even for one night. In Ashante, where polygamy prevails, adultery is common, especially among the king's wives, who are honed to pieces if discovered. The people are profligate beyond anything which can be conceived. A practice of unusual depravity prevails among the crewmen, a son who inherits his father's property taking his wives also, and thus his own mother becomes his slave. The ideas of Fernando Po offer a strong contrast to the above, treating their women with consideration, and assigning them far less than the usual amount of work. Polygamy is allowed. The first wife taken by a man must be betrothed to him, at least two years before marriage, and during that time he is in a state of servitude like that of Jacob for Rachel, the girl being kept in seclusion. When she appears as a married woman, all the virgins of the tribe salute and dance round her. This custom is only observed with the first wife, the others being concubines who are governed by her. Adultery is severely punished. For the first offense, both parties lose one hand. For the second, the man and his relatives are heavily fined and chastised. The woman loses the other hand and is driven from the settlement into the woods, an exile more terrible than mutilation. It would be but a needless repetition to pass in review all the various groups of African states. We have seen that in the West, profligacy is a universal feature, and it is scarcely less so in the East. In Zulu, for example, the king has a seraglio of fifteen hundred women. 
The manners of the communities in the Sahara are imperfectly known, but appear to be above those in other parts of Africa, though many customs prevail which shock our ideas of decency. A chief offered Richardson his two daughters as wives. Immorality is usually a secret crime, and their general customs with regard to sexual intercourse are outwardly decent. Still, the condition of the female sex is degraded, for they are regarded as materials of a man's household, and ministers to his sensuality. Abyssinia presents various characteristics of manners. In Tajura, men live with their wives for a short time, and then sell them. Parents are known to hire their daughters out as prostitutes. One chief offered his daughter as a temporary or permanent companion to a traveler, and a woman presented herself as a candidate for similar appointment, saying, by way of recommendation, that she had already lived with five men. One strong evidence of the immorality of Tajura is the fact that syphilis affects nearly the whole population, man and woman, sultan and beggar, priests and their wives inclusive. In Shoa, the king has one wife and five hundred concubines, the latter scattered in various parts of his dominions. He makes a present to the parents of any girl he may desire, and is usually well paid in return for the honor. The governors of provinces and cities follow his example. There are two kinds of marriage in Shoa, one a mere arrangement to cohabit, the other a holy ceremony. The former is almost invariably used, the man and woman declaring before witnesses that they mean to live together. Divorces are as easily obtained, only mutual consent being necessary. A wife is valued according to the amount of her property, and the owner of a hut, a field, and a bedstead is sure to get a husband. When they quarrel in part, a division of property takes place. Concubines are procured as well from the Christians as from Mohammedans and pagans, but the latter are forced to declare themselves converted, for Shoah is professedly a Christian kingdom. A favorite concubine holds the same position as a married woman, and no distinction is made between legitimate and illegitimate children. The court overflows with licentiousness, numerous adulteries take place, and the example is followed by the people, among whom a chaste married couple is rare. The sacerdotal class of Shoa is notoriously drunken and profligate. In a word, the morals of the country are of the lowest description. In the Mohammedan states of the neighborhood, the condition of the female sex is also degraded, and if there is less general prostitution, it is because every woman is the slave of some man's lust and is closely watched by him. In the provinces of Kordofan, south of the Nubian mountains, the sentiment of love is not altogether unknown, and men fight duels with whips of hippopotamus hide on account of a disputed mistress. The wife is, however, a virtual slave, and is still more degraded if she prove barren, the husband then solacing himself with a concubine, who is raised to the rank of a wife if she bear a child. The general demeanor of the girls of Cordofan is modest, and their lives are chaste, while the married women are addicted to intrigue, especially if neglected by their husbands. In some parts of the country, men consider it an honor for their wives to have intercourse with strangers, and often assist the woman to this end. There is a class of pretty dancers who are usually prostitutes and are celebrated for their successes in the latter vocation. Marriage is arranged without the woman's consent. The man bargains for her, pays the price, and takes her home. A feast and dance sometimes celebrate the event. When a wife is ill-treated, she demands a divorce and returns home, taking her female children with her. Trifles often produce these separations an insufficient allowance of pomatum to grease her skin being a valid complaint. The wandering tribes of Cordofan are a moral, modest race, naked but not indecent. A chief of the Berbers offered a late traveler his choice of two daughters for a temporary companion, both being already married. Many women there are ready to prostitute themselves for a present. A virgin may be purchased either as a wife or a concubine, for a horse. A young Berber, who was asked why he did not marry, pointed to a colt, and said, When that is a horse, I shall marry. The condition of women in Khartoum, on the upper borders of the Nile, 
as described in Ferdinand Werner's account of his voyage to discover the sources of the white stream, is so degraded that it may be said with truth the female monkeys of the neighboring woods occupy a far nobler and more natural position. Farther up the river the morals are purer. The keks are described as leading a blameless life. Marriageable girls and children are kept in seclusion, and during a considerable part of the year the women live in villages apart from the men, who possess only temporary huts, the substantial habitations of their wives being accessible to them during the rainy season. A man dare not approach the harem village at any other time, but some of the women occasionally creep into their husbands' huts. Polygamy is allowed, but is too costly for any but the chiefs. Among some of the tribes on the banks of the White Nile, women sell their children, if they can do so with profit. The maidens appear naked, but married women wear an apron. All experience shame at appearing unclothed before travelers. Beyond the mountains of the moon, Verna found a people whom he describes as chaste and decent, where unmarried men and women were kept separate. Our information is so limited that any inquiry into the morals of Africa must be incomplete, but enough has been stated to give a fair idea of the average morality. Statistics are of course impossible, but from a description in general terms we cannot hesitate to form an opinion. Australasia In this division of the Earth's surface are generally included the great island of Australia, Papua or New Guinea, and some adjacent islands comprising New Caledonia and Van Diemen's Land. Politically and geographically, the islands of New Zealand are also in this division, but there is some question as to the propriety of this distribution for ethnographical purposes. Opinions vary as to the state of the New Zealanders. There is much similarity between them and the inhabitants of some of the Polynesian islands, while there are equally strong points of resemblance between them and the Australian aborigines. The New Zealander, when discovered by Cook, was far superior to the Australian in intelligence and in the arts of life. He inhabited a decent hut, could build a stockade fort, and lived upon cooked food. The Australian lived in a hollow tree, could put together a temporary hut made of bark and brush, and fed upon grubs, roots, and raw flesh. Among such a race as the Australian blacks, it is needless to say that the position occupied by women was of the most degrading and brutal character. The Australian savage does not even pay his future spouse the compliment of wooing her. Might makes right in their case. The woman is often betrothed by her parent or kinsman, and becomes her husband's property by sale and bargain. If this has not been effected in the usual way, he acquires his marital privileges by an inroad on the grounds of another tribe, and then meeting a woman, he knocks her down with his wadi, a heavy club, and carries her to a place of security, where he makes himself master of her person by force. This, indeed, is so usual a course of procedure that it has given rise to a belief that the Australian rival bachelors compete for a wife by knocking her on the head, and whoever fells her bears away the bell. The habits of the native Australians are not so observable now as they were at the commencement of the system of colonization. At first a continual intercourse was kept up between them and the settlers. The reciprocal injuries inflicted upon each other, in which the whites were more to blame than the natives, brought about an exterminating warfare. The black race has gradually wasted away from the settled, or rather partially settled country, while the much diminished interior tribes have retreated, in South Australia, New South Wales, and Victoria, far into the wilderness, beyond ordinary communication with the white man. In Van Diemen's land, the natives were almost extirpated by the constant warfare carried on between them and the settlers, convict as well as free, and the government was obliged to take the few survivors under its protection and to establish a place of refuge for them. They were accordingly collected and deported to an island in Bass Straits, under the charge of a special commissioner. But, notwithstanding the increased comforts of their condition, and their immunity from the murderous hostility of their white foes, they have languished, and, instead of the population increasing, it has gradually decreased, until, at the present time, 
it is believed that the numbers are under 100. In central Australia, north of the Murray, the tribes are still comparatively numerous, and in some cases warlike and hostile to settlers. The married women among the aborigines are called gins, and the single girls, lubras. The women follow their lords on their migrations and excursions, carry the loads, and do all the work. They bear patiently and submissively the blows and ill usage to which they are subject. Polygamy is practiced by the more powerful men of the tribes, who appropriate to themselves such women as they choose, and cast them off at pleasure. Now and then they sell or present a gin to a friend in want of such a commodity. There is considerable disproportion between the sexes, attributable partly to continual ill usage, partly to the habit prevalent among savage nations of destroying female infants. At one time in the history of these colonies, the outlying stockmen and shepherds occasionally endeavored to solace their loneliness with a lubra, whom they had managed to decoy from her lawful owner. But the half-breeds from such unions are very rare. The natives, notwithstanding the low estimate they have of their women, are exceedingly jealous of them as property, and keep them away as much as possible from the stations. Chastity is at all times of little account among savages, always excepting the old Celts and Teutons, who held continents in high esteem, and whose women were objects of general respect. From the peculiar habits of the Australian aborigines themselves, it can scarcely be said that prostitution exists as an institution. The woman has no choice in the matter. As between the gins and the lubras and the white settlers, there is scarcely any chance for prostitution. A woman now and then visits the towns or settlements, but always in company with her male friends. When quite young, the girls are not more disagreeable than others of their complexion. When more advanced in years, they are absolutely repulsive, and are rendered hideous by scars and other evidences of brutality. At all times, both sexes are loathsome in their persons, and are clad in filthy blankets or sheepskins, unless when they can pick up tattered remnants of European clothing. Among the New Zealanders, the state of the women was a little better than among the Australians. The amelioration was rather in degree than principle. They were subject to the same control by parents and kinsmen. They were disposed of in marriage as a matter of right, and were often betrothed from infancy, in which case they were tabu, or taboo, to other persons than the young chief or warrior who had purchased the reversion. Cruel punishments of the women for infidelity were general, and even for minor offenses they were subject to very severe chastisement. In one case, even recently, a New Zealand woman was suspended by the heels naked, and in that position unmercifully whipped. Her sense of the outrage was so keen that she committed suicide. Licentiousness among the women was probably more rare formerly than now. Adultery was punished in both parties by death, and the family of the male offender were often involved in the punishment. Now, however, the constant visits of whalers and seafaring men, the gradual settlement of whites in the islands, and, above all, the profits and advantages derivable from illicit intercourse, cause the women to be free of their persons. Parents and even husbands are oftentimes the principal gainers by the transaction, and even negotiate the profit to be made. The marriage ceremony, too, was formerly of so easy a character that, whatever the New Zealand woman might have thought of it, no settler, and especially no seaman, would feel himself bound by the tie. And although associations based on this weak bond were not wrong in the woman, they paved the way for less excusable relations. The influence of civilized institutions and the presence of irregular clergy and missionaries is affecting some improvement in native morals, and many lawful marriages have taken place between the whites and the native women, the offspring of which, a fine race of half-breeds, may be met with throughout the Australian colonies. The example of the consideration in which the native women thus married are held, and the rights and social position that they acquire, is not without influence on others, and predisposes them to the same course. Among the tribes removed from the coast and withdrawn from civilized control, 
the ancient customs are still kept up in their integrity, and the chiefs and natives jealously resist all encroachments on their independence. Among those chiefs, even, who have been converted to a nominal Christianity, Rao Paraha, for instance, heathen institutions of revenge for injury, polygamy, power of life and death over their wives and followers are maintained, and the humanizing lessons of the gospel have made but little way toward an amendment of their barbarous lives. In New Zealand, it is asserted that the venereal disease is very prevalent among the natives, and from their diet and licentious habits is often fatal. In colonial white society, there are no particular incidents to characterize prostitution. At all times during the continuance of transportation, female immorality has been very prevalent. The general law so often observed as attendant upon irregularity of the sexes has been powerfully operative. Besides, there have been local influences at work to deteriorate female manners. The large importations of convict women, who were always the most unruly and vicious of the felon population, and who notoriously gave more trouble and vexation to the authorities than any one else, was prejudicial to public virtue. Just, however, as on account of these faults, women of indifferent character were lightly esteemed, so did the respectable females gain in public opinion, however poor their worldly condition. There was not much regular prostitution, although incontinence prevailed. There was a continual system of marriage going on among the convicts. When a man chose to marry, he brushed himself up, put on a clean shirt, and went to the nearest superintendent, to whom he intimated his desire for matrimony. Permission was always given. The eligibles at the station were forwarded for his inspection, and the selected one rarely refused, inasmuch as her connubial bonds relieved her, during good behavior, from the more galling bondage of the law. Some of these unions turned out more satisfactorily than might have been expected from the character of the parties, especially of the women. South Australia and the gold colony of Victoria never were penal settlements. The deficiency of respectable young women was very much felt by the colonists, and the home government made many well-intentioned efforts to supply the want. A large number of young women went out from Great Britain under the charge of matrons and medical officers. And, in the majority of cases, their arrival was hailed with great satisfaction. It was no unusual thing for a young man, a settler far away up the country, to come down to the government depots at Adelaide or Melbourne on the arrival of a female emigrant ship, and then and there to pick out his partner for life. Of course, the greater number were hired out to service by the colonists, and in the order of events passed from service to independence. Parental care and precaution were exercised by the authorities over the young women thus sent abroad. They were not allowed to hire into dram shops or lodging houses. The parties who hired them required to be known. They had liberty to remain at the depot for some months if not suited, and for any length of time in case of sickness on arrival. And afterward, during good conduct, the depot was an asylum for an indefinite length of time. Notwithstanding all these safeguards, there was a constant supply of prostitution. The good intentions of the emigration commissioners in London were too frequently neutralized by the depraved character of officers of the vessels in which females were sent, or by the interested conduct of the local authorities in England. A good reputation was essential to the intending emigrant, but frequently masters of workhouses and parish officers shipped off unworthy or troublesome characters, who were better got rid of at any price. During the gold mania, prostitution in Australia was rampant. The enormous gains and flaunting extravagance were a great temptation to young women, who could not readily suit themselves with situations, and who disliked the moderate restraints of the depot. The persuasive arts of the procuress and brothel-keeper were not wanting. It was a singular fact that at one time all the public vehicles were owned by brothel-keepers. The profits of these joint callings were perfectly fabulous. It was an everyday sight to see a party of prostitutes in the most gaudy costumes parading the streets in open carriages. 
Indeed, it was generally understood to be part of their contract that they should have unlimited clothing, of the most garish colors and style, and expensive material, and also Sunday rides and open carriages. The police authorities did what they could to check this shameful display, but they were powerless before the reckless extravagance of the miners and the influx of women. It is believed that this excess has now toned down, and miners having taken to buying land and to marriage, order is once more resuming sway, and prostitution in the gold colonies, though not at an end, is much shorn of its public show and display. End of section 39 Recording by Ramon Escamilla Conway, Arkansas R-A-M-O-N-E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A dot wordpress dot com Section 40 of The History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ramon Escamilla the History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 40 Chapter 30 Barbarous Nations Part 2 Polynesia The principal groups of the Polynesian Islands are the Society, Friendly, Samoan, Sandwich, and Marquesas. These last have been rendered famous of late years by Mr. Herman Melville's Taipei and Omu. The South Sea Islands were usually depicted in the most glowing colors by early navigators. The lands were the fairest on Earth's surface. The climate was unsurpassed, combining the genial warmth of the tropics with the fresh breezes of ocean. The soil spontaneously bringing forth in luxuriant abundance the loveliest and most valuable vegetable productions. And, finally, the inhabitants were fitted both in person and disposition to tenant such an Eden. It is easy to comprehend the frame of mind which led to these descriptions. The seaman, after wandering over the pathless ocean with only the dark waste of waters in view, might well recognize a paradise in the green hills and shady groves of the islands of the Pacific, and angels in their dusky denizens. But these pictures were eminently fallacious. The virtues of savage life disappear on close acquaintanceship. Implacable ferocity among themselves sanguinary and exterminating warfare, cannibalism, unbounded licentiousness and its concomitants of unnatural lust and lasciviousness, debasing and horrid idolatry, infanticide, the most grinding tyranny of the strong over the weak and of the man over the woman who is not permitted to live in the same dwelling, eat the same food, cook at the same fire, or even use the same dish as her lord and master. These enormities are the ordinary conditions of savage life. Some local modifications may be found, but such were the main incidents in Polynesian life and character. It is true that in the first instance, the natives received the whites with all friendship, and evinced toward their visitors much hospitality and gentleness of demeanor. This is to be attributed to the wonder and reverence with which they regarded foreigners, looking on them as superior beings of another sphere, and awestruck at their wonderful powers, at the astonishing engines they wielded and managed, and at their unknown attributes. But familiarity lessened respect. Some ill-advised and unjustifiable tyranny brought out the offensive points of savage character, and theft, treachery, and murder were soon practiced as freely against the whites as against each other, whenever fear of consequences did not restrain them. The murder of Captain Cook and the attack on La Perouse were remarkable cases on account of the boldness of the savages, and the public loss in the death of the great navigator, but they were not isolated outrages. Many a small and feebly manned vessel perished among the islands, and, on repeated occasions, when landings were effected, the mariners ran great risks from the uncertain despotism of the natives. Whatever may have been their other qualities, either among themselves or in their intercourse with foreigners, licentiousness was the universal characteristic of the South Sea Islanders. It was not merely polygamy or excess among a few of the more powerful members of the community, but the ordinary habit among all classes. Chastity, whenever met with, was not a customary part of a woman's life, 
but only an incident dependent on particular circumstances, in fact an abnormal condition. It was associated with either marriage or betrothal. A peculiar institution of all these islanders was the tabu or taboo, a semi-religious ceremony performable either by priest or chief, whereby places, persons, or property could be rendered unapproachable by other than the lawful owner. The breach of this law has always been the greatest violation of propriety and public feeling of which a native or foreigner could be guilty. When young girls were betrothed at an early age, either to boys of corresponding years or to older persons, such females were tabooed. This ensured chastity until they had reached a marriageable age. As this betrothal system was almost exclusively confined to chiefs, it follows that the obligation to chastity was very limited. The farther inference would be that chastity was associated rather with property in the female than propriety in the woman. Another institution of the South Sea Islanders was that of the Areoi. These were a body of men and women banded together for certain purposes, which had originally been of a religious character. They had probably been once obi men, medicine men, or wizards, as among the Negroes and Indians. The custom, so often observable among heathen nations, of incorporating amusements and festivities into religious rites had been taken up by these areoi, and in process of time they degenerated into mere mimes or buffoons, and yet preserved to themselves by prescriptive right all the immunities and privileges otherwise accorded to priests. They traveled about from place to place, and sometimes from island to island. Their observances yet retained a trace of their religious origin, inasmuch as they commenced with a sacrifice to the gods, after which they entertained the people with theatrical performances, in which obscene songs and lascivious dances formed the chief features. They gave dialogues and recitations, in which they freely satirized all classes, not excepting the priests. They were everywhere gladly received, and had a right to free quarters wherever they stopped. It is said the members were usually the handsomest of both sexes, the women being the most profligate among the inhabitants. Tradition maintained that these persons had been originally incorporated by the gods, and that one of their rules was perpetual celibacy, and that they should have no descendants. This, though it might perhaps in the outset have been a prohibition intended for pure purposes, had ended in the perversion of such an intention. In their present condition, whether degenerate or not, the inhibition is not taken to exclude them from sexual intercourse and enjoyment, but from its natural consequences. Their lives were accordingly most abandoned, and abortion and infanticide were invariably practiced. Nor were their enormities confined to their own body. After their representations, the wildest excesses were perpetrated in all quarters. Resistance or retaliation was impossible by the sufferer, on account of the fear these wretches excited by the mysterious powers with which they were accredited, and which were, in reality, the secret affiliations of all the bands. When performing, the areoi painted their bodies black and their faces scarlet. They wore dresses of bright-colored plants and flowers. They were divided into several classes, named after some particular ornament, and taking into account the subordinate members of the troops and the attendants who performed the menial offices, they must have been exceedingly numerous. Places were specially built for their reception and for the greater convenience of their representations. Candidates for admission into their number were received by secret ceremonies akin to the mysteries of paganism. Solemnities intended to awe the vulgar were performed, and the idea of special reservation of the blessings of a future Elysium to these deceivers was promulgated and believed. The existence of such organized societies could not but be in the highest degree subversive to all order and decency. Accordingly, when the missionaries first arrived, they found the general depravity of morals the greatest difficulty they had to encounter. Obscenity, libidinousness, and incontinence were so engrafted into the very nature of the people that they seemed almost ineradicable. Accordingly, we find it narrated of an intelligent convert that he expressed his conviction that, quote, the people ought to be induced to discontinue infanticide, human sacrifice, and demon worship, but that preservation of female virtue and Christian marriage would never be obtained. 
The Society Islands are said to have been formerly proverbial, even in Polynesia, for the licentiousness which is still remarkably prevalent among them. The missionary regulations have apparently mitigated the evils, and they have succeeded in establishing laws on the subject, which are not, however, binding upon strangers. The foreigners who come to these islands, while denouncing the conduct of the inhabitants, are too often the chief instigators to vice, and, finding themselves checked in their misconduct, they vent their disappointment on the missionaries. The foreign influences at work in these islands are of a twofold nature, one striving for the improvement of the natives and the inculcation of virtuous principles, and the encouragement or enforcement of virtuous practices. The other, including all the base and sordid passions and motives of seamen and whalers bent on the reckless enjoyment of the passing hour, of traders and adventurers eager in quest of gain, and among the worst specimens of runaway seamen, and even convicts from the Australian settlements. All these influences combined to check the advancement of the natives. The beauty of the women in these islands has been much exaggerated. Commodore Wilkes says, quote, I did not see among them a single woman whom I could call handsome. They have, indeed, a certain sleepiness about the eyes which may be fascinating to some, but I should rather ascribe the celebrity which their charms have acquired among navigators to their cheerfulness and gaiety. Others, who visit them with equally cool judgment, tell us that they were disappointed in their appearance, for, quote, there were few who could be called handsome. Nevertheless, they had eminent feminine graces, their manners being affable and engaging, their step easy and graceful, their behavior free and unguarded their temper mild, gentle, and unaffected, slow to take offense, easily pacified, seldom retaining resentment or revenge, whatever the provocation. There can be no doubt that their demeanor was winning and affable, and their conduct sportive and playful. Their industry was not very great, the few wants of the islanders being amply supplied by nature. The women prepared the poi from the breadfruit and the ava, and, Till Europeans introduced the hog, this was their usual diet, if we accept the cannibal feasts of the warriors, in which the women took no part. The female occupations were weaving flowers and grasses into garlands and mats. Their chief amusement was paddling the canoe or sporting in the surf, for all the islanders took to the water, and the women were, perhaps, from the greater buoyancy of their persons, better swimmers than the men. Before the arrival of the missionaries, it was customary for the women to swim out to a ship and swarm on board, where scenes of debauchery and indecency commenced, lasting as long as the vessel lay in the harbor, and the fascination of which worked so powerfully on the excited passions of the seamen that desertions and mutiny were continually occurring. The earliest intercourse of whites has never yet been beneficial to the untutored savage, and, had these occurrences only taken place on board the ships of foreigners, it might have been laid to the account of foreign corruption. But this was not the case. The gains derivable from the white men's visits might give profligacy a greater zest for both sexes of the natives, for indiscriminate intercourse was a time-worn institution, ere yet the European came. The South Sea Islanders are no exception to the general rule of keeping their women in a subordinate and inferior condition. A chief is sometimes taboo, and his women may not approach him. He may see them when he pleases. At all times, the woman is in bondage. Those of the chief live in separate apartments from their master, and are not permitted to associate with him on equal terms, excepting when the female is of high blood. In this case, she is perfectly independent, can exercise the same powers as her husband, and in some particulars can even throw off her allegiance to him. Polygamy was, and still is, practiced among the chiefs. Even where missionary influences have been successful, the chiefs look upon the abolition of polygamy as a most objectionable innovation. They look back to their past liberty with regret, and cannot understand why they are restricted to one wife. Polygamy could, of course, only be practiced by the powerful at the expense of the weak. Already, from various causes operating among savages, there was a preponderance of males over females, rendered still more great by polygamy. 
This again depreciated female virtue, justifying illicit intercourse to those who lived in forced celibacy, and in its consequences came concealment and infanticide. To such an extent was illicit intercourse carried that some writers assert that no girl ever reached the age of puberty a virgin. The nature of the marriage bond is very uncertain. The husband could get rid of the wife at pleasure. There seems to have been a slight distinction between marriage and concubinage. Most of these social institutions are extended over all the islands alike, with very few local differences. Infanticide, for example, has been practiced in most of the islands, but not invariably so. At Tutuila, one of the Samoan group, it had never obtained. Circumcision was common among most of the natives. Among the Samoans, the women are treated with consideration. The men do all the hard work, even to cooking, while the women perform only indoor labor, attend to the children, and prepare the food for the fire. In the Sandwich Islands, there is no such chivalrous sentiment. At the arrival of the missionaries, there were no marriage institutions among them. The only laws were such as to regulate somewhat their licentiousness. There were traditions to show that at some past time, before the discovery of the island, the marriage tie had been held in respect by the natives, and that the marriage ceremony had been an important one. At present, personal chastisement of the wife by her husband is not infrequent, and it is spoken of them as a matter of course. The relations of parents to children differed much at different periods. The Samoans seem to have been the most observant of moral obligations and natural ties. Among them it was the usage of the mothers to suckle the children for several years, and to bring them up with great care and attention, so much so that a crippled child was sometimes discreditable as evincing a degree of culpable carelessness in the mother. The society in Sandwich Islanders, whose lives were habitually dissolute, shunned all trouble which interfered with their freedom of intercourse, and children were considered especially burdensome. Infanticide prevailed to a frightful extent among them. And, as if the ordinary dissoluteness of the people had not been ample inducement to this most flagitious crime, the tyranny of the rulers invented a poll tax in whose operation children over ten were included. The poorer inhabitants of these blissful regions, who already felt the rod of oppression too severely, found in this an additional motive to child murder. But in its operation it was even more cruel than infanticide, for many children who had been suffered to live were put to death as they approached the period when they would be liable to taxation. The murder was consummated sometimes by the parents, at times mercifully and at times horribly. There were a class of persons who practiced child murder professionally. In the Samoan group, the girls are often early betrothed, without reference to years, the girl being taboo until of marriageable age. During the intervening period, the bridegroom accumulates property. The marriage festival is held with all circumstances of uproar and debauchery, and the guests stay as long as there is anything to eat. The consummation of the marriage and the virginity of the bride are published by the proofs required in the Jewish law. When a man in this group wishes to take a wife, he must ask the chief's consent. This obtained, he presents to the girl of his choice a basket of breadfruit, by accepting which she accepts the donor. The husband then pays the parents a sum of money for her, according to her rank and estimation. Sometimes the courtship is to the family, without consulting the girl, who is expected to conform to her parents' will in the matter. A Samoan may repudiate his wife and marry again, on certain conditions, but the woman may not leave her husband without his consent. Adultery among the Samoans was formerly punished by death, and the marriage vow is strictly observed by them. It is considered highly discreditable for a young woman to form a connection with a native before marriage, although temporary intercourse with a foreigner is not considered objectionable. It may be that such a distinction is in complement to the conceded superiority of the white, but the explanation of a chief would rather put the question on convenience than morality. For he objected to native young men as always hanging about the premises, and attaching themselves to the young woman, 
whereas the foreigner gave his presents and sailed away when the period of his stay was ended, leaving the object of his choice free again. The Marquesas Islands have a singular institution, similar to one prevalent among the ancient Lacedaemonians. A woman has more than one husband. This has been called polyandrism, but it does not seem precisely such. A wife of a young warrior unknown to fame is honored by the advances of a more distinguished individual, by whom children may be begotten. The superior chief takes the wife and her lawful husband under his protection and into his hut. The populations of some of the districts in the Sandwich Islands is rapidly decreasing. By a register kept in Hawaii, it appears there are three deaths to one birth. This disproportion is attributed to low habit of body, the consequence of venereal disease. Syphilis was introduced into these islands by Cook's expedition, and the whole of the natives in some districts are now said to be reduced to a morbid, sickly state, many of the women being incapable of childbearing, and but few of the children attaining maturity. There are other concurrent causes to contribute toward this decay, among which the difference of food and the introduction of clothing, and consequent diminution of ablution among a people who spent half their lives in the water, are not unimportant. But the district of Hanapepe, where the decrease was most rapid, was that in which the virus was first introduced, and here it is still most virulent in its actions and effects. Whatever the causes, the same effect is in powerful operation, though not to the same depopulating extent in other places. At Waialua, in 1832, the population was 2,640. In 1835, it had fallen to 2,415. There had been no war nor epidemic. It was the ordinary condition of the people. Sterility and abortion are considered the most potent causes. Abortion is very common, and there are cases in which women have had six or seven, and sometimes ten in as many years, and no children. Personal and mutual abuse had been practiced in early life among the settlers, and is a cause of sterility. Previous to 1840, infanticide was, as we have shown, common, but here, as elsewhere, the marriage regulations which have been enforced by the missionaries and adopted by the converted natives are already operating in a reactionary manner against the decrease of population, and infanticide is almost unknown. The poll tax for children over ten years of age has been repealed, and in its stead premiums are given for rearing large families of legitimate children. It is admitted by all that licentiousness prevails extensively among the people even at present, but to a far less degree than formerly, when promiscuous intercourse was universal. Men were living with several wives, and vice versa. All improvement in this respect is to be ascribed to the labors of Christian missionaries. To them the Sandwich Islanders owe their moral code, and the enactment of laws respecting marriage, as well as their political institutions. The observance of outward morality and decency of behavior has, as we have mentioned, been made compulsory in those islands in which the missionaries have permanently fixed themselves, and acquired sufficient power to make their regulations respected. They have interdicted public gatherings for the purpose of amusement, and even suppressed private games and diversions. This has been objected to as an interference with innocent recreation and pastime, and as encouraging formalism. But the missionaries had no choice in the matter. Paganism was deeply rooted in the daily life and habits of the people. In all religious festivals, feasting, dancing, and diversion formed so prominent a part that the only method of eradicating the attachment of the people to their heathen practices was to abolish the usages which made the worship attractive. The dances are always immodest, often lascivious and grossly indecent. They consist of little more than contortions and twistings of the limbs and body, and of throwing themselves into postures which, as they are mostly performed by females, are highly conducive to immorality. Even among the Samoans, the dances, as performed by the women, are of the same libidinous character with the others, though the dances of the men are not indecorous. The diseases generally prevalent are skin affections. 
from the delightful climate and simple diet of the people, these are not of a very severe character. The islanders have been no gainers in this respect by their intercourse with Europeans. The venereal disease has been introduced, and, from the deficiency of medical treatment, makes great ravages. Secondary syphilis is sometimes severe. At Tutuila, one of the Samoan group, it is said that venereal disease is entirely unknown, while in the other islands of the group it is very rare. Political Circumstances the introduction of new elements into Polynesian life, the daily increasing intercourse between the islanders and foreigners, all contribute to make the alterations in the social aspects of the South Sea Islands very rapid, so that every year may work new changes. Some recent writers affect to doubt the benefits of missionary labors among the islanders, who, as they say, have been thereby diverted from their innocent and simple habits of life in place of which, it is alleged, a harsh and hypocritical austerity has been adopted. The purity of their morals and the vigor of their constitutions have been sapped and destroyed by the contact with Europeans and Americans, and the whole result of foreign intercourse has been unmixed evil. We reject these conclusions as savoring too strongly of party prejudice and class antipathies. The tendency of the gospel always is to purify and elevate savage tribes. The missionaries have, perhaps, overestimated and overstated the extent of benefit accomplished by them, and the gaiety and cheerfulness, so pleasing in appearance to the casual visitor, yet so deceptive in reality, may have been diminished. But the purity of savage life is a delusion, and something has been achieved, if only an outward conformity to the laws and dictates of Christianity has been produced. West Indies A very slight notice of the West Indies will suffice, for of the savage races scarcely a vestige remains. Of the Negro population a general view is all that is required, and the civilized colonists retain so much of the impress of the countries whence they came as to require no special remarks. When Columbus first visited these beautiful islands he found them inhabited by two classes of men the savage Caribs, who delighted in war and preyed upon the weaker tribes, and the simple communities, whose pacific habits made them victims of their violent neighbors. The people were alike distinct in the treatment of women. The peaceful islanders admitted females to a participation in all the delights of their rural life, allowing them to mingle in the dance, to inherit power, and to share all their pleasures. Among the cannibal Caribs, a different fashion prevailed. The handsomest of their war prisoners were retained as slaves, the rest were drowned. The lot of these exiles, as of the Carib women themselves, was hard enough. The nation was low and barbarous, and its women were treated accordingly, the men regarding them as an inferior race, whose degradation was only natural. A wife was her husband's slave, and all the drudgery of life fell upon her. She approached him with abject humility, and if she ever complained of ill usage, it was at the risk of her life. Her children, however, were loved and watched with tender care. The original inhabitants of the West Indian islands have disappeared, and are succeeded by a mixture of races, of whom the Negroes claim our attention now. Among the blacks of Antigua, as an example, immorality is characteristic. Infanticide is frequently practiced, even since the Emancipation Bill was passed. The reason for this is clear. Under slavery, Negroes could not contract a legal marriage. They therefore cohabited, and the union lasted as long as their affection or appetite existed. No disgrace attached to a woman who had borne children to several men. Now an idea of female virtue has been awakened, and they seek to escape the consequences of an illicit amour by destroying its offspring, upon the principle that where no tangible evidence of a crime exists, no crime has been committed. During slavery, concubinage was general, and although many masters offered rewards to such as lived faithfully with one partner, the vice was all but universal, and a permanent engagement between a man and a woman was seldom formed. Two females frequently lived with one man, one being considered his wife and the other his mistress. 
When the Negroes were emancipated in 1834, many were anxious to be legally married, and others put away the partners of their compulsory servitude and took new companions. Bigamy was not uncommon then, nor is it rare now, many devices being adopted to elude the stringent laws on this matter. Concubinage is less general than formerly, but the marriage covenant is by no means respected, nor is chastity much esteemed. In St. Lucia, sexual intercourse was unrestrained and almost promiscuous, and the negroes of the island are, even to this day, averse to matrimony and inclined to concubinage. In either relation they are equally faithless, the only redeeming feature being love of their children. The same low state of morals is observable in Santa Cruz, but in Jamaica the negroes are mostly married and faithful to their engagements. Formerly the intercourse of the sexes was loose, profligate, and lewd. When the missionaries attempted to reform this, any who submitted to their teachings were ridiculed by the demoralized of their comrades. It must be admitted that Europeans have not shown any good example to the Negroes, but on the contrary have encouraged their vices. End of section 40 Recording by Ramon Escamilla Conway, Arkansas R-A-M-O-N E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A dot wordpress dot com Section 41 of The History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ramon Escamilla The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 41 Chapter 30 Barbarous Nations Part 3 Java A curious system of manners now prevails in Java. Hindus have been succeeded by Mohammedans, and they, in turn, have given place to Dutch, each having impressed some characteristic on the people. As elsewhere, the condition of the female sex will indicate the general character. The institution of marriage is universally known, if not practiced or respected, and the lot of women may be considered fortunate. They are not ill-used in any manner, and the seclusion imposed upon the more opulent is rather a withdrawal from the indiscriminate gaze of the people than that lonely secrecy exacted by jealousy in some parts of the East. The condition of the sex in Java is an exception to the habits of Asiatics. They associate with the men in all the pleasures and offices of life, eat with them, and live on terms of mutual equality. They are sometimes permitted to ascend the throne, and, in short, nowhere throughout the island are they treated with coarseness, violence, or neglect. They are willing and industrious, and are admitted to many honorable employments. Men sometimes act tyrannically in their households, but this only shows the fault of an individual, not of a class. Polygamy and concubinage are practiced by the nobility without reference to public opinion, but are not generally adopted, being regarded as vicious luxuries. The first wife is always mistress of the household. The others are her servants, who may minister to her husband's pleasures, but do not share his rank or wealth. No man will give his daughter a second or third wife, unless to someone far superior in rank to himself, and a woman considers it dishonorable, not in the abstract to prostitute herself, but to form a connection with any man of humbler birth than herself. But, though polygamy and concubinage are seldom known in Java, their absence must not be considered as implying superior morality. On the contrary, it is the most immoral country in Asia. A woman who would not condescend to be the second wife of a chief would not scruple to commit adultery with him. In general terms, both sexes are profligate and depraved, although the islanders boast the chastity of their women as a distinguishing ornament, because a married woman would shriek if a stranger attempted to kiss her before her attendants. Divorce can be procured in Java with the utmost freedom, and is a privilege in which the women indulge themselves to a wanton degree. If a wife pays her husband a sum of money, he must leave her. He is not legally bound to accept her offer, 
but public opinion considers it disreputable to live with a woman who has thus signified her wishes for a separation, and he yields to general sentiment what is not exacted by law. The husband is often changed three or four times before the woman is thirty years old, and some boast the exercise of this privilege twelve times. As the means of subsistence abound, and are procured as easily by women as by men, the former are independent of the latter, and find no difficulty in living without husbands. Unfortunately for the theories of some female formers of the present day, who imagine that such independence foreshadows the millennium of women's rights, it must be admitted that, where the experiment has been tried, the sex are proverbially dissolute. Among the wealthier classes, the utmost immorality prevails, and in the great towns the population is debauched to the last degree. Intrigues with married women continually occur, and are prosecuted almost before the face of the husbands, who are often so tame and servile that they dare not assert their conjugal rights. Travelers have noticed flagrant instances of the looseness of Javanese manners, but one case will suffice. One of the princes who had seduced a married woman, and was in the habit of visiting her at times when her husband, an officer in the public guard, was on duty, was surprised in her company on one occasion, the chief having returned home earlier than was expected. He knew the rank of his visitor, and discreetly coughed, so that the prince had time to escape. He then went to the chamber and flogged his wife. She complained to the prince, who was particularly desirous at that time to conciliate his subjects. He sent for the husband, made him many rich presents, and allowed him to select the handsomest woman in the royal household in place of the frail one who had betrayed him. The husband accepted the peace offerings, allowed his wife to return home with him, and all the parties were satisfied. In Java, women are usually married very young, as their chastity is in danger as soon as they reach maturity. At eighteen or twenty, a girl is considered to be getting old, and scarcely any are unmarried after twenty-two. Yet age does not exclude a woman from the probabilities of matrimony, for widows often procure husbands of fifty. The preliminary arrangements are made by the parents, as scandal would not allow the young people to take any part in a transaction in which they are looked upon, as the natives express it, as mere puppets. The father of the youth, having made a suitable choice, proposes to the parents of the girl. If they are willing, the betrothal is ratified by some trifling present, and visits are made, that the intended nuptials may be publicly known. Subsequently, the price of the lady is arranged, varying according to the rank and circumstances of the family. Sometimes this is plainly called the purchase money, and sometimes by a more delicate term, the deposit. It is considered as a settlement for the bride. The only religious feature in the marriage ceremony is an exchange of vows in the mosque. This is followed by many observances of etiquette and parade. Finally, the married couple eat from the same vessel to testify their common fortune, or the bride washes her husband's feet in token of subjection. The Javanese support a large class of women as public dancers. The inhabitants are passionately fond of this amusement, but no respectable woman will join in it, and all its female partisans are prostitutes. In fact, the words dancer and prostitute are synonymous in their language. A chief of high rank is not ashamed to be seen with one of these women, who figure at most large entertainments, and frequently amass enough money to induce some petty chief to marry them. So strong, however, is their ruling passion, they soon ascertain that domesticity is not their sphere, and become tired of their husbands, whom they divorce without ceremony, and coolly return to their public life. The dress in which they perform is very immodest, but they seldom descend to such obscene and degrading postures as may be witnessed in other eastern countries. European example has not done much for Java. The Dutch merchant usually has a native female called his housekeeper. In every city public prostitutes abound, while about the roads in the vicinity may be found others ready for hire. Their disguise as dancers is thought to conceal their profligacy. Sumatra The population of this island is divided into several tribes, slightly differing in their manners. The Rejangs, who may be supposed to represent its original inhabitants, are rude barbarians, scrupulously attentive to the show, but wanting the spirit of delicacy. 
They drape their women from head to foot, dread lest a virgin should expose any part of her person, and yet modesty is not a characteristic of the people in towns and villages. Those in rural districts who are not so rigid as to costume are more distinguished by decency. The customs of Sumatra are of a peculiar character, great importance being attached to required formulas, and the ritual is more essential than the principle. It is curious to examine the intricate details of a Sumatran marriage contract, which appears to be so little understood even by the people themselves that, we are informed, one of those documents is sufficient to originate an almost endless litigation. There are several modes of forming a marriage contract. The first is when one man agrees to pay another a certain sum in exchange for his daughter. A portion of the amount, say about five dollars, is generally held back to keep the transaction open and allow the girl's parents a chance to complain if she is ill-used. If the husband wound her, he is liable to a fine, and in many ways his authority is controlled. But if he insists on paying the balance of the purchase money, her parents must accept it, and then their right of interference ceases. If a father desires to get rid of a girl suffering from any infirmity, he sells her without this reservation, and she has fewer privileges in consequence. In other cases, marriage is an affair of barter, one virgin being given for another. A man having a son and a daughter will give the latter in exchange for a wife for the former or a brother will dispose of his sister in the same way. Sometimes a girl evades these customs by eloping with a lover of her own choice. If the fugitives are overtaken on the road, they can be separated. But if they have taken refuge in any house, and the man declares his willingness to obey existing rules, his wife is secured to him. The Jewish custom of a man marrying his brother's widow is in force among the Sumatrans, and if there be no brother, she must be taken by the nearest male relative, the father excepted, who is made responsible for any balance of her purchase money which may be due. Adultery is not frequently committed under this system, but when it is, the husband chastises his wife himself, or else forgives the offense. If he desire to divorce her, he may claim back the purchase money, less twenty-five dollars, which is allowed her parents for depreciation in the woman's value. If a man who has taken a wife is unable to pay the whole price, her friends may sue for a divorce, but then they must return all they have received from him. The ceremony of divorce consists in cutting a rattan in two in presence of the parties and their witnesses. Another kind of marriage is when a girl's father selects some man whom he adopts into his family, receiving a premium of about twenty dollars. The father-in-law's family thus acquire a property in the young husband. They are answerable for his debts, claim all he earns, and have the privilege of turning him out of doors when they are tired of him. The Malays of Sumalda have generally adopted a third kind of marriage, which they call the free. In this, the families approach each other on an equal level. A small sum, about twelve dollars, is paid to the girl's parents, and an agreement is made that all property shall be common between husband and wife, and if a divorce takes place it shall be fairly divided. The actual ceremony of marriage is simple. A feast is given, the couple join their hands, and someone pronounces them man and wife. Where the female is an article of sale, little of what we call courtship can be expected. It is opposed to the manners of the country, which impose strict separation of the sexes in youth, and besides, when a man pays the price of his wife, he considers he is entitled to possession, without any questions as to her predilections. But traces of courtship may be met with. On the very few occasions when young people are allowed to meet, such as public festivals, a degree of respect is shown to women, contrasting very favorably with the observances of more civilized communities, and mutual attachments sometimes spring from these associations. The festivals are enlivened by dances and songs. The former have been described as licentious, but an English traveler says he has often seen more immodest displays in a ballroom in his native country. The songs are extempore, and love is the constant theme. Polygamy is permitted, but only a few chiefs have more than one wife. 
to be a second one is considered far below the dignity of a respectable woman, and a man would demand a divorce for his daughter if her husband was about to take an additional companion. Marsden, the traveler already mentioned, says that in the country parts of Sumatra chastity is general, but the merit is lost when he adds that interest causes the parents to be watchful of their daughters, because the selling price of a virgin is far above that of a woman who has been defiled. If a case of seduction occurs, the seducer can be forced to marry the girl and pay her original price, or else give her parents the sum which they would lose by her error. Regular prostitution is rare. In the bazaars of the town some women of this class may be found, and in the seaports profligacy abounds, troops of professional courtesans parading the streets. No one would estimate the morality of a country from the spectacles exhibited in maritime cities. As a general rule, the Sumatran is content to marry and is faithful to his wife. This may proceed from temperament rather than morality, as their ideas on the latter are not very rigid. This is shown by their opinion of incest, which they regard as an infraction of conventional law, sometimes punishing it by a fine, and at other times confirming the marriage, unless it occurs within the first degree of relationship. Borneo Notwithstanding the attention which has been drawn to the island of Borneo within the last few years, it is yet but little known to the general reader. The investigations of Sir James Brooke and others have enabled us to discern many of its social features. Most of the inhabitants of Borneo are in a state of barbarism. Some wander naked in the forest and subsist on the spontaneous productions of the earth. Others cultivate the soil, dwell in villages, and trade with their neighbors. The river communities are more advanced than those who live inland, and the inhabitants of seaports are more educated and more profligate than any. These have been farther debased by the abominable system of piracy, which, until recently, was their occupation. Among the Sidiaks, or dwellers on the coast, there is no social law to govern sexual intercourse before marriage, nor is the authority of parents recognized in the matter. The Diak girl selects a husband for herself, and, while she remains single, incurs no disgrace by cohabiting with as many as she pleases. After marriage she is subject to more stringent rules, for, as a man is allowed only one wife, he requires her to be faithful, or in default punishes her with a severe whipping. If he is incontinent, he incurs a similar penalty. Cases of adultery are not frequent, though they sometimes occur in time of war. The ceremony of marriage is as simple as possible. The consent of the woman is first obtained, then the bride and bridegroom meet and give a feast, which completes the contract. If a girl becomes pregnant, the father of the child must marry her, and this is a common way of securing a husband. A man and woman live together for a time, and separate if there is no prospect of a family. During this probation, constancy is not considered indispensable. The fear of not becoming the father of a family, a misfortune greatly dreaded by the Dyaks, favors the loose intercourse of unmarried people. In some tribes the duties of hospitality require that if a chief is traveling, he shall be furnished with a pro tempore female companion at every place where he sleeps. Among the Dyaks dwelling on the hills, morality is of a higher standard. Single men are obliged to sleep in a separate building, and the girls are not allowed to approach them. Marriage is contracted at a very early age, and adultery is almost unknown. Polygamy is not allowed, but some of the chiefs indulge in a concubine, for which they are generally blamed. There are certain degrees of consanguinity within which marriage is unlawful. One man shocked public feeling by marrying his granddaughter, and the people affirm that ruin and darkness have covered the face of the sun ever since that act of incest. As they marry constantly within their own tribe, the whole commonwealth is in time united by ties of blood, and to this is ascribed the insanity common among them, a conclusion warranted to some extent by the imbecile state of well-known royal families condemned to perpetual intermarriages. It is said that many prostitutes may be found among the people of the South, but this rests on doubtful testimony, and in the Dyak language there is no word to express the vice. 
The Sibnoan females are neither concealed from strangers nor shy before them. They will bathe naked in the presence of men. The unmarried people sleep promiscuously in a common room, but married couples have separate apartments. The labor of the household is allotted to females, who grind rice, carry burdens, fetch water, catch fish, and till the ground. They are not so degraded as in other barbarous nations. They eat with the men, and take part in their festivals as well as their labor. Among the Mohammedan Malays there is more civilization and more corruption. They are polygamists, indulge in concubinage, encourage prostitutes, and ill-use their wives. An English physician lately received a message from the wife of a chief appointing a secret meeting. He was punctual to the assignation and met the lady, who asked him for a close of arsenic to poison her husband, as he ill-treated her. Report says that the Englishman was disappointed in the nature of the interview, but firmly refused to grant her request. The rich Malays allow their wives to keep female slaves, and the jealousy of the mistress renders their situation anything but pleasant. They sometimes serve as concubines, in which case the law renders them free, but many refuse to avail themselves of this advantage. We have no definite account of prostitutes in seaport towns, but they appear to be of several classes, those who cohabit temporarily with the Malays, those who prostitute themselves indiscriminately to all corners, and those who are supported by sailors and profligate Chinese, who invariably create such a class wherever they settle. It is certain that women of this class exist in considerable numbers in Borneo. End of section 41 Recording by Ramon Escamilla Conway, Arkansas R-A-M-O-N E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A dot wordpress dot com Section 42 of The History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Uday Sagar The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 42 Chapter 31 Semi-Civilized Nations Part 1 Persia Women occupy an inferior position in Persia, where they are literally the property of men. The lower classes consider them valuable for the labor. The rich regard them as instruments of pleasure. While Persian poetry and romance are devoted to the praise of female charms, the realities of everyday life prove that sex is held in slight esteem. The wives of the Shah vegetate within the walls of a luxurious prison, and if one is ever permitted to breathe the air outside, she is paraded in solemn procession, guarded by a troop of eunuchs, armed with loaded muskets, in order to drive off any curious wayfarer who might be tempted to gaze on the charms of a royal mistress. Nor is this isolation peculiar to them, it pervades all the upper classes, and brothers are not allowed to see the sisters after a certain age. This jealousy is not decreased by the polygamy, which is common in the country. The religious laws limit a person to four wives, but allow him to keep as many concubines as he can afford. And in pursuance of this privilege, the harem of the palace is said to contain, at times, more than a thousand women, who need a stringent discipline to keep them in order. They are arranged with a strict regard to precedence. The chief favorite lives in splendor. Her attire is covered with costly jewels, and she has the privilege of sitting in the royal presence. Her inferiors are subject to much rigor, and the eunuchs preserve decorum by administering personal chastisement with the heel of a slipper on the face of a refractory woman. They seem insensible to any degradation, Many of them lead a pleasant, idle life, longing for hours in the warm bath, and emerging with innovated frames to deck their pretty persons in order to render themselves attractive to the shah. They coat his favor as much as the fear is thrown, and with good reason. 
the former can raise them to the submit of their ambition the latter can condemn them to be fastened in a sack and thrown from a lofty tower common usage permits a persian to take a woman in three different ways he may marry purchase or hire her in the first case betrothal sometimes takes place in infancy but it must be subsequently confirmed by the parties in this they seldom fail for if a girl shows any repugnance to ratify her father's contract he whips her until she consents and she requires little of this kind of argument to induce compliance the nuptial ceremony must be witnessed by two persons one of whom is a legal officer to attest the contract this is delivered to the bride and by her carefully preserved as it proves her title to provision in the event of widowhood or divorce though a man has the right to put away his wife when he pleases the attendant expense and scandal render it a rare proceeding muhammadan jealousy farther protects the woman as no one will willingly allow a female with whom he has lived to fall into the hands of another in addition to this interest restrains a husband from using his privileges in a direct manner as when he takes the initiative he must pay back the dowry he received with his wife if she applies for divorce he is free from this obligation the advantage being thus on the man's side a species of tyranny is frequently practised until the woman is forced to open the suit when he gets rid of her but retains her property a persian may purchase as many female slaves as he desires these acquire no advantage of position by being his concubines he may sell or otherwise dispose of them at any moment he thinks proper the custom of firing wives still prevails in persia though strict mohammedans abhor and condemn the practice which was prohibited by omar the successor of muhammad in operation it is an agreement made by a man and woman to cohabit a specified time for an agreed sum of money the children springing from this union must be supported by the father if the man terminate the connection prematurely he must still pay the whole stipulated amount and the woman is restrained from accepting any other protector until a sufficient time has elapsed to prove whether she is pregnant by the former although these contracts are ranked as marriages few readers will be inclined to think them anything but systematic prostitution formerly there were numerous open and avowed prostitutes in persia among whom the dancing girls were conspicuous for the beauty of their persons and the melody of their voices they had a considerable sway until the time of fatih ali khan who crowded his palace with concubines and from among them issued edicts to suppress immortality prohibiting the dancing girls from approaching the court and exiling them to the distant provinces social life was most depraved under the safi dynasty public brothels were very numerous and largely contributed to the national revenue no less than thirty thousand prostitutes paying an annual tax in ispahan alone the governors of provinces allowed similar privileges for money and there was scarcely a town which had not one licensed brothel at least whose inmates also licensed and taxed were known as kahbeh or the worthless as soon as the shops were closed these houses were opened and the women repaired to particular localities where they sat in rows closely veiled with each company was an old harridan whose business was to show the faces of a troop to any man desiring a companion and to receive his payment when the selection was made under the reigning family this system has been checked no license is now given and prostitution has retired to secrecy but the vice has in no way decreased and public brothels abound in the all the cities of persia afghanistan marriage in afghanistan is a commercial transaction the women being sold for prices varying according to circumstances this system is carried to such an extent that if a widow marries the friends of her first husband can recover from his successor the amount originally paid for her the necessity of purchasing a wife renders many of the poor classes unable to marry until well advanced in years in opposition to the custom of their wealthy neighbors among whom bridegrooms of 15 and brides of 12 years old are common the prior intercourse of the sexes is regulated by various circumstances 
in crowded towns men have little opportunity of associating with women and their professional matchmakers exist their functions are in the first place to see and report upon any girl whom a man may wish to marry then to ascertain if her family would agree to the match and finally to make arrangements for a public proposal this is made by the suitor's father in company with a number of male friends to the father of the girl while a similar deputation of females waits upon the mother presents are made the selling price determined and the couple are betrothed soon after the parties sign a mutual contract stipulation is made provision for the woman if divorced a festival is given the bridegroom pays for his wife and she is delivered at the dwelling of her future master similar formalities take place in the country but as the social intercourse is less restricted there marriages frequently spring from attachment and the negotiations are mere matters of etiquette a romantic lover may obtain his mistress without the consent of her parents by tearing away her veil or throwing a large white cloth over her and declaring her his affianced bride these proceedings do not release him from the obligation to pray for her which is only evaded by an elopement a serious step considered by the girl's family as equivalent to murder and revenged accordingly unless the couple secure shelter and protection from some neighboring tribe sometimes a man never sees his bride until the marriage is completed in certain districts where this rule nominally exists it is particularly violated secret interviews between the bride and bridegroom being tolerated and called the sport of the betrothed the young man steals after dark to the house of his charmer affecting to conceal his presence from the men and is introduced by the mother to her daughter's room where the couple are left till the morning undisturbed the ordinary result of this is the anticipation of nuptial privileges and cases have been known where the bride has borne several children before she has been formally delivered to her husband polygamy is allowed but is too expensive to be practiced by the majority of the people although some rich men maintain a large number of concubines in addition to the four legal wives the social condition of female is low in afghanistan among the more barbarous tribes they labor in the fields with the poor all the drudgery of the house falls upon them while the rich keep them secluded in the harems the law allows a man the privilege of bearing his wife but custom is more chivalrous than the code and considers such an act disgraceful of avowed prostitutes in this region we know but little beyond the bare fact that such a class exists and that their profligacy is materially aided by the ignorance and insipidity of the wives and concubines when contrasted with the knowledge of the world and comparatively polished manners exhibited by courtesans whose society is frequently sought as a relief from the monotony of home kashmir and oppressed by any rigid code of etiquette and natural addicted to pleasure the people of kashmir find much of their enjoyment in female society and from the earliest times have been noted for the love of singers and dancers in former days the capital city was a scene of constant revels in which morality was but a second reconsideration and now the inhabitants relieve the continual struggle against misfortune and depotism by indulging in gross vices and drawn the sense of hopeless poverty in the gratification of animal passions the women of this delightful valley have long been celebrated for their beauty and are still called the flower of the oriental race the face is of a dark complexion richly flushed with pink the eyes large almond shaped and overflowing with a peculiar liquid brilliance the features regular harmonious and fine the limbs and bodies are models of grace but all writers agree that art does nothing to aid nature and it is not unusual to see eyes unsurpassed for brightness and expression flashing from a very dirty face among the poor class filth and degradation render many women actually repulsive notwithstanding their resplendent beauty travellers always remark the dancing girls who have acquired so much renown in kashmir the village of shangus was at one time celebrated for a colony of these women who excelled all others in the valley but now its famous beauties have disappeared and live only in the traditions of the place 
the dancing girls may be divided into several classes among the higher may be found those who are virtuous and modest probably to about the same extent as among actresses opera singers and ballad girls in civilized communities others frequent entertainments at the houses of rich men or public festivals and estimate their favors at a very high price while the remainder are avowed harlots prostituting themselves indiscriminately to any who desire their company many of these are devoted to the service of some god whose temple is enriched from the gains of their calling the watul or gipsy tribe of kashmir is remarkable for many lovely women who are taught to please the taste of the walapchori they sing licentious songs in an amorous tone dance in a lascivious measure dress in a peculiarly fascinating manner and seduce by the very expression of their countenances when they join a company of dancing girls they are uniformly successful in their vocation and have been known to amass large sums of money now that the valley is in its decadence their charms find a more profitable market in their places the bands of dancing girls are usually accompanied by sundry hideous dianas whose conspicuous ugliness forms a striking contrast to their charge the nut girls are under the surveillance of the government whose licenses their prostitution they are actual slaves and cannot sing or dance without permission from their overseer to whom they must resign a large portion of their earnings in addition to these who may be styled poetical courtesans there exist a swarm of prostitutes frequenting low houses in the cities or boats on the lake but of them we have no distinct account it is certain that they are largely visited by the more immoral of the population and an accurate idea of their status may be formed from a knowledge of the fact that the traveller moorcraft who gave gratuitous medical advice to the poor of serinagur had at one time nearly seven thousand patients on his lists a very large number of whom were suffering from loathsome diseases induced by the grossest and most persevering profligacy in short there can be but little doubt that the manners of the inhabitants of this interesting and beautiful valley are corrupt to the last degree india india exhibits in its different communities many aspects of social life but it may be said in general terms that the state of women is degraded and she is absolutely dependent upon man and can do nothing of her own will she must approach her lord with reverence is bound to him so long as he desires it whatever his conduct may be and if she rebel is liable to be chastised with a rope or a cane in a cruel manner debarred the advantage of education not allowed to eat with their husbands or to mix in society women are yet not treated as abject slaves and from the few revelations of the zenana which have been made it may be inferred that its inmates receive considerable deference and attention polygamy is permitted in india but not encouraged by the religious law and only sanctioned in certain cases such as barrenness inconstancy or some similar cause and then the wife's consent must be obtained before a second and subordinate wife can be added to the household marriage is viewed as a religious duty by the hindus only a few being exempt from the obligation it is forbidden to purchase a wife for money but the girls have little choice as to their destiny being usually betrothed while young a father has the right to dispose of his daughter until 3 years after the age of puberty when she may choose a husband for herself not many remain single till that time as celibacy would be accounted disgraceful and few men would marry a maiden so old in bengal betrothal takes place with many rites and much ostentation the girl bride is taken to her future husband's house and remains there a short time when she returns to her parents until mature the anxiety to dispose of a daughter as young as possible arises from the fact that her birth is regarded as inauspicious and even as a domestic calamity from which her parents are glad to escape hence the character of the bridegroom is a secondary consideration and marriage often results unhappily in fact little else can be expected where the parties are absolutely strangers to each other until the union is effected the uneducated wife without a gleam of knowledge amuses herself by a thousand trivial devices such as adorning her person curling her hair or listening to the gossip of her slaves it is nevertheless generally admitted that the majority of hindu women are faithful to the marital vows 
the severe laws against unchastity are framed more preserving caste than morals and severely punish any woman detected in an intrigue with a man of different grade to herself divorce may be easily effected by the husband but the wife has no corresponding power a man who calls his wife mother renounces her by that act a barren wife may be superseded in the eighth year she who bears only daughters or whose children die in the birth in the eleventh year and one of unkind disposition may be divorced without any delay the custom that prevails in different provinces respecting wives and their treatment may be described in a few words in arrakan when a man wants money he pawns his wife for a certain sum or else sells her altogether in the southern parts of the peninsula polygamy is largely practised the shianagas of canara are not allowed to take a second wife unless the first be childless the karanas the panchalura and other tribes permitted polygamy and the purchase of wives among the Vudas, every man had as many wives as he pleased all worked for him and a lazy one was divorced sans ceremony the karubura took no notice of an act of adultery if the wife was a hard-working woman otherwise she might live with any man who chose to keep her in rajaputana woman holds a higher position and exercises considerable influence on the actions and tastes of men for a rajput consults his wife on every important occasion the estimation in which they are held is indicated by a national proverb which says when wives are honoured the gods are pleased when they are dishonoured the gods are offended this district exhibits the hindu women in the most favourable circumstances and even here they hold but a subordinate place as must always be the case where polygamy is tolerated it is scarcely necessary to review all the local peculiarities of so extended a people enough has been said to show the social condition of married women it remains to give some account of prostitution some of the dancing women and musicians of southern india were attached to every temple a portion were reserved by the sensual brahmins for their exclusive pleasures and the rest hired themselves out indiscriminately each troop was under a chief who regulated their performances and prices in the temple of tulava near mangalore a curious custom existed any woman could dedicate herself to prostitution by eating some of the rice which had been offered to the idol and was allowed her choice to live within or without its precincts in the former case she received a daily allowance of food and her prostitution was limited to the priests in the latter her amour were unrestricted but a stipulated portion of her profits must be given to the temple in sindh every town has a troop of dancing girls many of whom are very handsome before the british conquest the vice was largely encouraged numbers of women acquired considerable fortunes and their political influence was potent in the darbars of the debauched amirs an evident reform has taken place of late years the lascivious scenes of the southern country are not enacted at least to some extent in hindustan proper where the interest of the english government has been directed against immorality toward the close of the last century an official report was made on the morals of british india it was bad enough much luxury prevailed in private life receptacles for women of bad character abounded prostitutes had a place in society made an important figure at great entertainments and were admitted to the zenanas to exhibit their voluptuous dances contrasted with former years a great improvement is now perceptible and the profligacy of large cities scarcely exceeds the vices of european communities thus benares with a population of one eighty thousand had one thousand seven hundred and sixty four prostitutes and decca with nearly sixty seven thousand inhabitants had seven seventy prostitutes apart from governmental influences it can scarcely be denied that europeans have contributed to the advance of vice by taking temporary companions these liaisons were scarcely considered improper the custom was to purchase girls from their mothers many of them were faithful and attached to their protectors but their extravagance and propensity for gambling made them very costly adjuncts the religious ceremonies originated by the brahmans were often but scenes of the widest debauchery rivalling the ancient egyptian festival of bubastis and no good would result from an extended description of dances performed by nude or semi-nude women by the desecration of wives by a licentious priesthood or of the disgusting polygamy of the brahmans suffice it to say that such customs existed but are now yielding to more refined observances 
the general profligacy of the country has introduced syphilis in most parts of hindustan some assert that it was carried there after the discovery of america but neither history nor tradition warrants this opinion it may be noticed that it is not called by any sanskrit word but is known by a persian appellation our notice of india would be incomplete without an allusion to the sati or burning of widows and to infanticide the shastris are full of recommendations to perform the first of these shocking observances and promise ineffable bliss to the voluntary victim it was carried to such an extent that fifteen thousand women are reported to have perished in one year in bengal this is doubtless an exaggeration although the number was confessedly very large among the horrible details of the practice we find that betrothed children of eight or ten years old and women of eighty-five have alike been thrown into the burning pile fearful scenes have been witnessed on these occasions a miserable wretch has twice escaped from the fire and clung to the feet of a traveller vainly imploring him to save her and then naked and with flesh already burned from parts of her body has been bound and thrown into the flames by the frantic relatives let british rule in india be what it may no man no aborigines protection society can regret its spread in conjunction with the services rendered to our common humanity by the abolition of the sati infanticide formerly prevailed to a great extent but is now almost extirpated from british india the crime was sanctioned by custom but not by religion or tradition its victims were chiefly females and the murder was in consequence of the difficulty of marrying them within the required bounds of caste or of the ruinous expenses which fashion required should be incurred at the wedding ceremonies rather than from any other cause it appears to have been the custom among the ancient dwellers on the banks of the indus for the father of a female child to carry it to the market-place and publicly demand if any one wanted a wife if the reply was an affirmative it was betrothed at once and carefully read but otherwise it was immediately killed wilkinson asserted twenty-five years ago that twenty thousand children were annually murdered in malwa and rajputana but by the system of rewarding parents who reared their offspring and gradual introduction of salutary laws a mighty reform has been effected ceylon under the original institutions of the singhalese the never licensed public prostitution nor made brothels of the temples as in india whatever effect the buddhist religion produced was in favour of virtue but the character of the people is naturally sensual profligacy among men and want of chastity among women are general characteristics and even those who profess christianity and acknowledge the moral law of england are not free from the stain in ceylon as indeed in most parts of asia marriage is contracted at an early age a man attains his majority at sixteen and a girl as soon as marriageable by nature is marriageable by law at which time her parents or relatives give a feast inviting a number of single men soon after a man who may desire to marry her sends one of his friends to her parents to mention in apparently a casual manner that a rumour of intended marriage of his friend and the daughter is in circulation if this announcement meets a favourable reception the father of the bridegroom calls inquires the amount of the dowry and carries the negotiation a few steps farther mutual visits are then exchanged preliminaries settled and an auspicious day fixed for the wedding which takes place with much ceremony the stars are consulted in every step and should the bridegroom's horoscope differ from the bride's his younger brother may act as his proxy at the ceremony the whole buddhical ritual is a tedious succession of formalities entails enormous expenses and cannot be followed by the poor to those of low caste it is positively forbidden even if they are rich enough to meet the outlay and with these marriage is limited to a single agreement between the parents of the young couple among the candians polyandrism prevails to a great extent a matron of high caste being sometimes the wife of eight brothers the people justify this custom upon several grounds among the rich because it prevents litigation saves property from minute subdivision and concentrates family influence with the poor because it reduces expenses and frequently where one brother could not alone maintain a wife and family the association of several can command the means this plurality of husbands is not necessarily confined to brothers for 
a man he may, with his wife's consent, introduce a stranger who is called an associated husband and is entitled to all marital rights. This practice does not extend beyond the province of Kandy, although it was formerly prevalent throughout the maritime districts of the island. Another Kandyan peculiarity was a kind of marriage, called Bema, in which the husband lived at his wife's house. He received but little respect from his relations and could be ejected at once if unpopular. There is an ancient proverb in reference to this dubious arrangement, which says that a man married according to the Bema process should only take to his bride's house a pair of sandals to protect his feet, a palm leaf to shield his head, a staff to support him if sick, and a lantern in case he should be expelled in the dark, so that he may be prepared to depart at any hour of the day or night. In Ceylon, women frequently seek for divorces for the most trivial cases, and as separation can be attained by a mere return of the marriage gifts, it often takes place. If a child is born within nine months from this separation, the husband is required to support it for three years. If a married woman commits adultery and the husband is a witness, he may kill her lover. When a man puts away his wife on account of an intrigue, he may disinherit her and the whole of her offspring even if the latter were born before any crime had been committed by their mother. If he seeks a divorce from Capers, he must relinquish all his wife's property and share with her whatever may have accumulated during her cohabitation. The Singhalese do not always exercise the privileges, but are frequently indulgent husbands and forgive offences which most people hold unpardonable. In proof of this, a Candian asked the British authorities to compel the return of an unfaithful wife pleading his love for her and promising to forget her frailty. English jurisdiction did not extend so far as this, and the woman coldly turned her back upon her husband and accompanied her paramour, whom she soon after deserted a third partner. Many instances of this kind have induced the native poets to produce a number of satirical effusions upon woman's inconstancy, and a traveller translates the following specimen. I have seen the Adambra tree in flower, white plumage on the crow, and fish's footsteps on the deep have traced through ebb and flow. If man it is who thus asserts, his words you may believe, but all the woman says distrust, she speaks but to deceive. To understand the first clause it will be necessary to remember that the adambra is a kind of fig tree, and the natives assert that no mortal has ever seen it in bloom. Infanticide was at one time common in Ceylon, and all female children except the firstborn were liable to be sacrificed, especially if born under a malignant planet. But laterally the British government have denounced the crime as murder and punished it accordingly. This has had the effect of gradually abolishing it, and the population has increased in consequence. The social condition of the Singhalese woman is not so degraded as in other parts of the East, but their moral character does not correspond. Profligacy is prevalent. Open and acknowledged prostitution is rare, excepting in the seaport towns, and of its extent there we have no reliable particulars. Under the Candian dynasty a common harlot had her ears and ears cut off and was publicly whipped in a state of nudity. End of section 42 Recording by Uday Sagar Section 43 of The History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ramon Escamilla The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 43 Chapter 31 Semi-Civilized Nations, Part 2 Ultra-Gangetic Nations In this division, we include the immense tract lying between Hindustan and China. Although these countries present some variety of customs and degrees of progress, yet, generally speaking, their manners are uniform. In all, the condition of women is extremely low. They are held in contempt, are taught to abase themselves in their own minds, and employ their license by degrading themselves still farther. 
The effect of Asiatic despotism is plainly visible. Every man is the king's serf, and the support of the community devolves upon the women, who, in Cochin, China especially, plow, sow, reap, fell trees, build, and perform all the other offices civilization assigns to the stronger sex. The marriage contract is a mere bargain. A man buys his wife, and may extend his purchases as far as he pleases, the first bought being usually the chief. A simple agreement before witnesses seals the union, which can be dissolved with equal facility, the only requisite in Cochin, China, being to break a chopstick or porcupine quill in presence of a third person. A man has also the privilege of selling his inferior wives. The unmarried women are almost universally unchaste, and do not incur infamy or lose the chance of marriage by prostituting themselves. Custom allows a father to yield his daughter to any visitor he may wish to honor, or to hire her for a stipulated price to any one desirous of her company, and she has no power to resist the arrangement, although she cannot be married against her will. A wife is considered sacred, more as the property of her husband than from respect to her chastity. The theory of the law is that a man's harem cannot be invaded, even by the king himself. But Asiatic absolutism never was famed for its adherence to law when personal interest was in the other scale, and there is but little exception in this case. Adultery is punished in Siam by fine, and in Cochin, China, by death. In Burma, executions of females are very rare, but they are disciplined with the aid of the bamboo, husbands sometimes flogging their wives in the open streets. Although professed prostitutes exist in large numbers throughout the region, still there are not so many as might be expected, because no single woman is required to be chaste. Little is known of their habits, peculiarities, or position, except that in Siam they are incapacitated from giving evidence before a justice. This restriction does not seem to arise from a consideration of their immorality, but from local prejudices, and the disability under which they labor is also extended to braziers and blacksmiths. Celebes Leaving the Asiatic continent for a short time, we will now examine the condition of the inhabitants of Celebes. This island is noticed here rather than with Java, Sumatra, and Borneo, which are included in the list of barbarous nations, because it enjoys a considerable degree of civilization, and in its political and social state is far in advance of other countries of the Indian archipelago. The idea of freedom is recognized in its public system, and its institutions have assumed a republican form. Women are not excluded from their share in public business, and though their influence is usually indirect, their counsel is sought by the men on all important occasions. In Wajo, they are not only elected to the throne, or rather the presidential chair, but also often fill the great offices of state. Four out of the six counselors are frequently females. Their domestic condition, to some extent, corresponds with their political privileges. The wife has the uncontrolled management of her household, eating with her husband, and mingling freely with the other sex on public or festival occasions. The women write about, transact business, and even visit foreigners as they please, and their chastity is better guarded by the sense of honor and the pride of virtue than by the jealousy of husbands or the surveillance of parents. This is the bright side of the picture. For the reverse, we find the barbarian practice of polygamy, which is universally permitted, under certain restrictions. The most important of these is that two wives seldom inhabit the same house. Each has usually a separate dwelling. The men can easily procure a divorce, and, if the wish to separate is mutual, nothing remains but to do so as quickly as possible. If the woman alone desires to be released from the matrimonial bond, she must produce a reasonable ground of complaint. Concubinage is rarely practiced, although some man may take a woman of inferior rank as a companion until he can marry a girl whose birth equals his own. The morals of both men and women are superior to those of any other race in Eastern or Western Asia. Prostitution is all but unknown. 
The dancing girls are generally admitted to be of easy virtue, but even they preserve decorum in their manners, and dress with great decency, although their public performances are of a lascivious nature. China In the immense empire of China, a general uniformity of manners is observable, for its civilization has been cast in a mold fashioned by despotism, and the iron discipline of its government forces all to yield. There is great reason to believe that prostitution forms no exception to the rule. We know that a remarkable system exists, that frail women abound in the celestial empire and form a distinct class. We know something of the manner in which they live, and how or by whom they are encouraged, but no traveler has as yet given any lucid account of the vice and its connections, and our comparatively meager knowledge is drawn from a multiplicity of sources. The general condition of the female sex in China is inferior to the male, and the precepts and examples of Confucius have taught the people that the former were created for the convenience of the latter. Feminine virtue is severely guarded by the law, not for the sake of virtue, but for the well-being of the state and the interest of the men. But national morality, inculcated by codes, essays, and poems, is, in fact, a dead letter, for the Chinese rank among the most immoral people on the earth. The inferiority of women is recognized in their politics, which embrace the spirit of the Salic law. The throne can be occupied only by a man, and an illegitimate son is more respected than a legitimate daughter. The paternal government of China has not failed to legislate on the subject of marriage. In this contract, the inclinations of the parties themselves are practically ignored. Parental authority is supreme, and it is not unusual for weddings to take place between persons who have never seen each other before the union. Matchmaking is followed as a profession by some old women, who are remunerated when they succeed. When two families commence a negotiation of this kind, all particulars are required to be fully explained on both sides, so that no deceit can be practiced. The engagement is then drawn, and the amount of presents agreed on. This contract is irrevocable. If the friends of the girl desire to break off the match, the one who had authority to dispose of her receives fifty strokes of the bamboo, and the marriage proceeds. If the bridegroom, or the friend who controls him, is dissatisfied, he receives the same punishment, and must fulfill his engagement. If either of the parties is incontinent after betrothal, the crime is punished as adultery. If any deceit has been practiced, and either person has falsely represented the party about to be married, the offender is severely punished, and the marriage is void, even if completed. In spite of all precautions, such instances sometimes occur. It must be noticed that, Though betrothal binds a woman positively to her future husband, yet he cannot force her from her friends before the stipulated time has expired, nor can they retain her beyond the assigned day. Polygamy is allowed under certain restrictions. The first wife is usually chosen from a family equal in station to that of the husband, and acquires all the rights and privileges which belong to a chief wife in any Asiatic country. The man may then take as many more women as he can afford to keep, but these are inferior in rank to the first married, although the children have a contingent claim to the inheritance. This position, if it brings no positive honor, brings little shame. It is sanctioned by usage, but was originally condemned by strict moralists, who designated the arrangement by a word compounded of crime and woman. It is a position which only a poor or humble woman will consent to occupy. A national proverb says, quote, It is more honorable to be the wife of a poor man than the concubine of an emperor. End quote. The social rule which makes all subsequent wives subordinate to the one first married may probably have had some effect in forming this opinion. The Chinese system is rigid as to the degrees of consanguinity between which marriage may be contracted. In ancient times, the reverse of this seems to have been the rule, and tradition says that much immorality was the result. The law now prohibits all unions between persons of the same family name, and is attended with some inconvenience, because the number of proper names is small. 
If such a marriage is contracted, it is declared void, and the parties are punished by blows and a fine. If the couple are previously related by marriage within four degrees, the union is declared incestuous, and the offenders are punished with the bamboo, or, in extreme cases, by strangling or decapitation. Not only are the degrees of relationship definitely specified, but the union of classes is under restriction. An officer of government must not marry into a family under his jurisdiction, or, if he does, is subject to a heavy punishment, the same being accorded to the girl's relations, if they have voluntarily aided him, but they are exempt if their submission was the result of his authority. To marry a woman absconding from justice is prohibited. To forcibly wed a free man's daughter subjects the offender to strangulation. An officer of government, or any hereditary functionary, who marries a woman of a disreputable class, receives sixty strokes of the bamboo, and the same modicum awaits any priest who marries at all, he being also expelled from his order. Slaves and free persons are forbidden to intermarry. Those who connive at an illegal union are considered criminals, and punished accordingly. According to Chinese law, any one of seven specified causes are allowed to justify divorce, namely, barrenness, lasciviousness, disregard of the husband's parents, talkativeness, thievish properties, an envious, suspicious temper, or inveterate infirmity. Against these, the woman has three pleas, any one of which, if substantiated, will annul the husband's application. They are that she has mourned three years for her husband's family, that the family has become rich, having been poor at the time of marriage, or that she has no father or mother living to receive her. These are useless when she has committed adultery, in which case her husband is positively forbidden to retain her, but under other circumstances they present a check to his caprice. In cases of adultery, a man may kill both his wife and her paramour if he detect them and execute his vengeance forthwith, but he must not put her to death for any other crime. In the same connection may be mentioned a law denouncing severe penalties on any man who lends his wife or daughter. This is not an obsolete enactment against an unknown offense, for instances do sometimes occur of poor men selling their wives as concubines to their richer neighbors, while others prostitute them for gain. From this view of the social condition of women and the laws of marriage, it is necessary to pass to a subject which has given China an unenviable notoriety, namely the custom of infanticide. Two causes appear to have encouraged this practice, the poverty of the lower classes and the severity of the laws respecting illicit sexual intercourse. The former is the principal cause. When the parents are so indigent as to have no hope of maintaining their children, the daughters are murdered, for a son can earn his living in a few years and assist his parents in addition. Among this class, the birth of a female is viewed as a calamity. Several methods are adopted to destroy the child. It may be drowned in warm water, its throat may be pinched, a wet cloth may be pressed over its mouth, it may be choked with rice, or it may be buried alive. When Mr. Smith, a missionary, was in the suburbs of Canton in 1844, he made many inquiries as to the extent of infanticide. A native assured him that, within a circle of ten miles radius, the children killed each year would not exceed five hundred. In Fokien province, the crime was more general, and at a place called Ke King Chow, there were computed to be from five to six hundred cases every month. A foundling hospital at Canton was named as preventing much of the crime, but it seems to have received only five hundred infants yearly, but a very small proportion of the births. The Chinese generally confess that infanticide is practiced throughout the empire, and is regarded as an innocent and proper expedient for lightening the pressure of poverty. It is not wholly confined to the poor. The rich resort to it to conceal their amours. The laws punish illicit intercourse with from seventy to one hundred strokes of the bamboo. If a child is born, its support devolves upon the father, but in cases where the connection has been concealed, this evidence is usually destroyed. 
prostitution prevails to a prodigious extent. Seduction and adultery, says Williams, in his survey of the Chinese empire, are comparatively infrequent, but brothels and their inmates are found everywhere, on land and water. One danger attending young girls walking alone is that they will be stolen for incarceration in these gates of hell. This illusion may be explained by the fact that in 1832 there were from eight to ten thousand prostitutes in and near Canton, of whom the greater portion had been stolen while children and regularly trained for this life. Many kidnappers gained a living by stealing young girls and selling them to the brothels. And in times of want, parents have been known to lead their daughters through the streets and offer them for sale. A recent visitor to Canton describes the sale of children as an everyday affair, which is looked upon as a simple mercantile transaction. Some are disposed of for concubines, but others are deliberately bartered to be brought up as prostitutes and are transferred at once to the brothels. Of Chinese houses of prostitution we have no particular description, but one singular feature is the brothel junks, which are moored in conspicuous stations on the Pearl River, and are distinguished by their superior decorations. Many of them are called flower boats, and form whole avenues in the floating suburbs of Canton. The women lead a life of reckless extravagance, plunging into all the excitements which are offered by their mode of life to release themselves from ennui or reflection. Diseases are very prevalent among them, and visitors suffer severely for their temporary pleasures. They are usually congregated in troops, under the government of a man who is answerable for their conduct, or for any violation of public peace or decency. The last can scarcely be considered an offense, for the Chinese make a display of their visits to brothels. Persons pass to and from the flower boats without any attempt at concealment, and rich men sometimes make up a party, send to one of the junks, retain as many women as they wish, and collectively pass the time in debauch and licentiousness. This is not the only form prostitution assumes in China. Women of the poorer classes, whose friends are not able to provide for them, are lodged in prison under the care of female warders, and these employ their prisoners in prostitution for their benefit. An incident which occurred at Shenxi a few years since reveals another phase. A young widow resided there with her mother-in-law, both being supported by the prostitution of the former. Her charms failed, she was deserted by her visitors, and starvation seemed inevitable. The old woman would not recognize her daughter's inability to support her, and flogged her. The prostitute, in attempting self-defense, killed her mother. She was convicted of the crime, but, as the victim had acted illegally in endeavoring to force her to prostitution, the sentence of the court, which had ordered her to be hewn to pieces, was commuted into decapitation. As before remarked, it is much to be regretted that we have not more reliable information of the vice, which is acknowledged to be all but universal in China. Japan the recent connection established by American enterprise with the semi-fabulous empire of Japan, the Zipanji of Columbus, makes the institutions of that country more than usually interesting. From the earliest accounts of the Dutch and Jesuit writers to the present time, we know that the Japanese, like the Chinese, have attained a high degree of civilization, and among both the vices which, in the present experience of mankind, seem the accompaniments of that improvement, have been developed in a remarkable degree. Among savage tribes, female honor is held in very little esteem. The woman is merely property. As we advance in the scale of intelligence, they take higher grade, and virtue and modesty are more cherished. Our information concerning Japan is, even yet, comparatively limited, but no circumstance of its ordinary life seems more clear than that female virtue among the higher classes is much valued and that at the same time there is an enormous extent of public prostitution in which men of all ranks indulge. The Jesuit Charlois, Comfer, Adams, and some Dutch writers have given accounts of Japan from the 16th century to the present time. 
Like most Oriental nations, the manners and habits of the Japanese have undergone so little change that the practices of a century ago are the fashions of today. The most recent traveler, for those who composed Commodore Perry's expedition can hardly be said to come under that denomination, is Captain Golovnin, and he had opportunities for close observation not equaled since the times of the early writers. He was commander of the Russian sloop of war Diana, and visited the Japanese Empire in 1811. Having paid a visit of ceremony ashore, he was induced by the duplicity of the Japanese, who are adepts in all the political arts of lying and hypocrisy, to trust himself in their hands a second time without arms or escort. The Japanese had an old grudge to settle with the Russians on account of injuries done them by certain individuals of that nation, and took the opportunity of rendering a quid pro quo by entrapping the unlucky Golovnin, who was thus made prisoner. He was treated at first with much indignity and severity, afterward with more indulgence, but did not regain his liberty for upward of two years. The Japanese can marry only one wife, but have as many concubines as they please. The precise value of the distinction is not readily appreciated, as the concubine does not lose caste by her position. There are great facilities of divorce, and without cause shown, but a gentleman who exercises this privilege loses his character as a husband, and can only procure another wife or additional concubines by paying a large price to his father-in-law. Adultery is punished with death, either by law or at the hands of the husband. Japanese husbands are represented as jealous, and as keeping their wives and women in strict seclusion. This strictness is relaxed in the cases of the middle and poorer classes, the necessities of the household removing those artificial obligations imposed on the higher ranks by pride or fashion. But even the women of the humbler ranks do not converse with, or even speak to strangers, unless in the presence of their husbands. An anecdote is told in Adams's narrative, which somewhat resembles that of Lucretia in Roman history, and which would imply great self-respect among the high caste of Japanese ladies. A nobleman made dishonorable advances toward a lady of rank during her husband's absence on a journey, and, notwithstanding a repulse from her, seized an opportunity to gratify his passion by violence. On the husband's return, the wife treated him with reserve, and declined any explanation of her singular conduct, which, however, she promised to afford at a banquet to be given the following day. Accordingly, during the feast at which the author of the outrage was present, when the guests had satisfied their appetites, the lady made her appearance. She told her husband and his friends what had happened, denounced herself as unworthy to live, received the caresses of her husband and relations, by whom, however, she refused to be comforted, and then left from the parapet of the house, and so killed herself. Meanwhile, the criminal had escaped, but when the horror-stricken guests rushed out to pick up the devoted wife, they found the nobleman weltering in his own blood at her side. He had ripped himself up, the ordinary way of committing suicide in Japan. The Japanese brothels are of great splendor, and very numerously frequented, containing thirty, forty, fifty, or even a larger number of women. Every place of public entertainment or refreshment maintains prostitutes as part of the establishment. On stopping at a tavern, it is customary for the courtesans of the house to come out, painted and bedizened, and set forth the claims of their house to the traveler's patronage, exhibiting themselves as one of the items of the bill of fare. No village, however insignificant, is without one or more houses of ill fame, and there are villages on much frequented roads, in popular districts, the whole of whose female inhabitants are prostitutes. Two in particular, Agasaki and Goi, are thus described by Kumfer. The females are designated Keise, which literally signifies a castle turned upside down. It is uncertain whether the government licenses these places, or merely tolerates them. The former is the more probable, when it is considered that in their mythology they have a goddess analogous to the Corinthian Venus, 
in whose worship prostitution is a recognized part of the ceremony. Attached to the temple of this impure deity are a large number of priestesses, six hundred or upward, who all prostitute themselves to the worshippers. Notwithstanding this large force, there are constant offers to recruit the ranks by young girls. The extent of this vice, which is universal throughout the empire, would cause it to be taken as a regular institution of Japan. Nothing is done sub rosa. Courtesans form part of a pleasure party. Parents sell their children to brothel keepers, or apprentice them for a time to such places, and at the expiration of their term, they resume, it is said, but this is doubtful, their places in society without any stain on their reputations. Husbands make bargains for the transfer of their wives' charms, which is a legitimate charge over and above the gratuity to be accorded to the lady. Kumpfer, in describing the prostitute quarter of Nagasaki, says it consists of very handsome houses. The poor people sell their prettiest daughters to the brothel keepers, who bring the girls up with various accomplishments. The price of these women is regulated by law, and many of the prostitutes are enabled to abandon their calling, for their good education and agreeable manners procure them husbands, and in their married condition they are fully as good as others. In his lifetime, the brothel-keeper is said by some writers to rank with the skinner or tanner, an opprobrious calling, while others say he ranks with merchants, and his company is not deemed objectionable. This latter statement, if true, may be owing to the circumstance that he holds a government license. In Japan, as in China, the crown is the fountain of all distinction, and every government official has peculiar privileges and a distinct position in the social scale. After his death, however, the brothel-keeper is held in great disesteem. The sanctity of the burial place, to which particular reverence attaches, would be polluted by his unholy presence, and his odious remains are denied the right of sepulture, and are dragged in the clothes in which he died to a dunghill, there to be devoured by wild beasts and birds of prey. Prostitution as a public institution is said to have been introduced into Japan by a certain warlike emperor or usurper, who, leading his troops from one place to another in the empire, feared lest, from want of home comforts and domestic ties, they might become disgusted and abandon his service. Accordingly, as a substitute for lawful enjoyments, he had stations for bands of prostitutes at various points, to the nearest of which he led his fatigued soldiers after his engagements. Another statement as to the origin of this system is that, on one occasion during a revolution, the spiritual emperor having fled, attended by his foster mother and a numerous band of female attendants, temporary nuns, the emperor and his foster mother drowned themselves in fear of capture by the enemies, whereupon the attendant nuns, cut off from all other resource, adopted libertinism as a means of livelihood, and this gave the first public example and sanction to a reprobate state of life. There are in Japan various religious institutions of a character similar to convents and monasteries. The vow of celibacy and chastity is one of the requisites of this state, yet notwithstanding this vow, the monks are described as living very intemperately, seducing both women and girls, and committing other shameful enormities. Among the mendicant religious orders to which both sexes belong, the nuns are numerous. They are described as being very fine-looking women. They are generally the children of indigent parents, and good looks are essential to success in their calling, between which and prostitution there seems no difference save in name. Indeed, many of these mendicant nuns go direct from the brothel to their new employment, which, combining various qualifications, is probably more lucrative. We have been unable to find any information as to the nature or extent of venereal diseases, if any, in Japan. Of infanticide also we have no account. Commodore Perry, in the narrative of his expedition, confirms the facts above stated so far as his opportunities for observation extended. Difficulties were at first thrown in the way of his seeing the Japanese women, and when he walked about, the interpreters preceded him, and, under a show of doing him honor, ordered all the women into their houses. 
Afterward, on the Commodore's remonstrance, the women were allowed to make their appearance, and their manners and looks were not by any means unpleasing. When the officers of the expedition were entertained, they sometimes waited on the party with tea, coffee, and other refreshments. Their manners were mild, their countenances were soft and pleasing, the only objectionable point about them being the abominable habit of blackening their teeth with a highly corrosive pigment, partly composed of iron filings and a fermented liquor called sake, which affected the gums very offensively, and caused an appearance and odor decidedly unpleasing to the tastes of Western travelers. The women of the working classes were engaged in hard field and outdoor labor, but not to a greater extent than in densely populated countries in most parts of the world. Commodore Perry assumes that licentiousness must be prevalent in large cities, but he bears his testimony to the good conduct of the women whom the people of the expedition met while on shore. The opportunities of information and particular inquiry were, however, not very great, owing to the more important political objects of the visit and the not very protracted stay of the squadron in Japan. Not content with the excess of incontinence in which the Japanese as a nation indulge, they largely practice unnatural vices, and the youth of the province of Kyoto, which is the peculiar appanage of the spiritual emperor, are celebrated on account of their beauty and command a high price in this horrid traffic. End of section 43 Recording by Ramon Escamilla Conway, Arkansas R-A-M-O-N E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A dot wordpress dot com Section 44 of The History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ramon Escamilla the History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 44 Chapter 31 Semi-Civilized Nations Part 3 Tartar Races Central Asia is but little known and seldom visited. Among the most remarkable of its people are the Kyrgyz Kazakhs, who form a nation of shepherds. They dwell in huts, or temporary habitations of wicker work covered with fleeces, and are a robust, hardy race, addicted to sensual enjoyments. Their manners as to the treatment of the female sex are coarse, but it is curious to remark that, while the men are indolent and licentious, the women are fond of exertion, for which their only recompense is to be treated as slaves. The Kyrgyz, when rich enough, eagerly avail themselves of the privilege of polygamy, Indeed, this part of the Mohammedan creed is the one they have embraced with most ardor, yet few possess sufficient wealth to marry more than one wife. The price paid for a woman will range from five or six sheep among the poorer classes, to two hundred, five hundred, or even a thousand horses among the rich, to which are added different household effects, and occasionally a few male or female slaves. A considerable share of these payments is absorbed by the Mohammedan mullahs, who find a profitable source of revenue in marrying these people. They consecrate the union as soon as projected, and immediately the amount of the kalim, or price, has been arranged between the parties. The mullah solemnly asks the parents of the bride and bridegroom, Do you consent to the union of the children? Repeating the question three times to each, and then reading prayers for the happiness of the couple to be married. No marriage is complete till the whole of the stipulated amount is paid, but neither party can honorably retract after the first installment has been offered and accepted. From that time the bridegroom has leave to visit his bride, if he engages not to take away her chastity. In cases where this liberty leads to an anticipation of the final ceremony, the unpaid portion of the kalim is not allowed to protract the union, which is hastened as much as possible. If a man find his wife to have been incontinent before he married her, he may return her to her parents and demand the restitution of her price or the substitution of one of her sisters. If he actually detects her in the commission of adultery, 
he may kill her. Otherwise the adulterer is fined, and the wife may be divorced or chastised. The morals of the Kyrgyz are good. Chastity in the woman is highly prized, and the sensuality of the men is served by prostitutes, who live in each camp, either in companies or in separate tents. Numbers of these women appear wherever the Russians have encampments, and virulent disease among them has tended rapidly to thin the people. The prostitutes are composed of two classes, widows and divorced women, who have no other means of subsistence, and linger out a miserable life in dirt, rags, and contempt, and a few who addict themselves to prostitution from mere licentiousness. Circassia the race known as Abassians, considered the aborigines of the Caucasus, were described by Strabo as a predatory people, pirates at sea and robbers on land. These characteristics they preserve to the present day, but otherwise they are a virtuous nation, strange to the worst vices of civilized life and humble in their desires. Their religion permits polygamy, but as wives are costly, they are usually contented with one, who is the companion rather than the menial of her husband. The women are industrious, are allowed full liberty, and are free in their social intercourse, the veil being worn only to screen their complexions and not for seclusion. Their laws against immorality are stringent. An act of illicit intercourse is punished by fine or banishment. A dishonest wife is returned to her parents, and by them sold as a slave, as is also a wanton girl. Illegitimate children cannot claim any relationship, and if sold as slaves or assassinated, no one is expected to redeem them in the one case or avenge them in the other. When a man desires to divorce his wife, he must give his reasons before a council of elders, and if they are not satisfied, he must pay her parents a stated amount to recompense them for the burden thus thrown upon them. Should the woman marry again within two years, this sum is returned. Among the Circassians themselves, women are not secluded. A man will often introduce his wife and daughters to a traveler, and unmarried women are frequently seen at public assemblies. They observe one singular custom. A husband never appears abroad with his wife, and scarcely ever sees her during the day. This is in accordance with ancient habits, and is a prolongation of the marriage etiquette, which requires a man, after he has removed his bride's corset of leather, worn by all virgins, for some time to refrain from openly living with her. Throughout the Caucasus, a high state of morality is found. Open prostitution is unknown, and any girl leading a notoriously immoral life would be compelled to fly beyond the bounds of the territory, if she escaped being sold as a slave or put to death by her indignant friends. There is a general opinion that Circassians will sell their daughters to any Turk or Persian who wishes to buy them, but this is not the fact. They are particularly careful as to the position of anyone who wishes to intermarry with them. Great precautions are taken to ensure the happiness of the girls, and long-continued negotiations frequently lead to no result. The majority of females sold as Circassians are either children stolen from the neighboring Cossacks or slaves procured from those Circassian traders who own allegiance to Russia. Turkey Proud, sensual, and depraved in his tastes, the Turk is too indolent to acquire even the means of gratifying his most powerful cravings. Satisfying his pride with the memory of former glories, his lust looks forward to the enjoyment of a paradise crowded with beautiful ministers of pleasure, and he passes his time in an atmosphere of epicurean speculation, lounging on cushions and sipping coffee with a dreamy indifference to all external objects. Even the poor indulge in this idleness. They measure the amount of labor necessary to keep them from positive want, and spend the rest of their time waiting the sensual heaven promised by their prophet. In such a lethargy, the most violent passions are fostered, and when these become excited, the Turk cannot be surpassed in brutal fury. All his fancies are gross. Moral power is an incomprehensible idea, and he can conceive no authority not enforced by whip or sword. 
The Turkish character thus exhibited corresponds with their estimate of the female sex. The person alone is loved. Intellect in a Turkish woman is rarely developed and never prized. She finds her chief employment in decorating her person, her sole enjoyment in lounging on a pile of cushions and admiring the elegance of her costume. Turkey is literally the empire of the senses. Polygamy is now growing into disrepute there. Recent laws have conferred many privileges upon women in matters of property, and their comparative independence has rendered them averse to a position in which they only acquire secondary rank. Men who marry wives of equal rank to themselves frequently engage in their marriage contracts not to form a second alliance, and this stipulation is very seldom violated. The customs of the country do not permit a man to see his wife before marriage. She may gratify her curiosity by a stealthy glance at him, but this privilege is seldom used. In consequence of the separation of the sexes, a race of professional matchmakers has arisen, as in China, who realize considerable profits from their calling. Children of three or four years old are sometimes betrothed, marriage taking place about fourteen. When a wedding is contemplated, each family deputes an agent to arrange preliminaries, the terms of the contract are embodied in a legal document, and the woman is then called a wife by writing. This is concluded some days before the actual wedding, but the interval is occupied with rejoicings and hospitality, on which the bridegroom generally expends a year's income. The union is a mere civil contract blessed by religious rites. All concubines are slaves, even in the harem of the sultan, since no free Turkish woman can occupy that position. The morals of Turkish women are generally described as very loose. Their veils favor an intrigue, the most jealous husband passing his wife in the street without knowing her. The places of assignation are usually the Jews' shops, where they meet their lovers, but preserve their incognito even to them. Lady Mary Wortley Montague imagined, quote, the number of faithful wives to be very small in a country where they have nothing to fear from a lover's indiscretion, end quote. The dancing girls of Turkey are prostitutes by profession. Their performances are much enjoyed by all classes, and they dance as lasciviously in the harem, where they are often invited to amuse the wives and concubines as before a party of convivialists in the kiosks. Their costume is exceedingly rich, both in color and material. During the day they resort to coffee houses, where they attach themselves to companions whom they entertain with songs, tales, or caresses until night, when their orgies are transferred to houses belonging to their chiefs. Many of these habitations are furnished with every possible luxury. Another form of prostitution is temporary marriage. For instance, a man on a journey will arrive in a strange city where he desires to remain some time. He immediately bargains for a female companion, a regular agreement is drawn up, and he supports her and remunerates her friends while he remains. When he is tired of her or wishes to leave the place, she returns to her friends and patiently waits for another engagement of the same kind. Northern Africa A very brief notice only is required of the semi-barbarous states of Northern Africa, particularly as an account of Algeria under the French has already been given. The mass of the population are Moors, and therefore our remarks will mainly apply to them. Like the Turks, they are proud, ignorant, sensual, and depraved, and their treatment of women exactly accords with this character. They regard the female sex but as material instruments of man's gratification, and this idea is become so generally received that the sole education of a girl is such as will render her acceptable to some gross sensualist. Intellect and sentiment are not the possessions which will recommend her. To be attractive, she must be fat. A girl of such bulk as to be a good load for a camel is considered a perfect beauty, and accordingly the mother does not train her daughter in seductive arts, but feeds her into a seductive appearance, as pigeons are fed in some parts of Italy. 
She is made to swallow every day a certain number of balls of paste saturated with oil, and the rod overcomes any reluctance she may have to the diet. The Moors are extremely jealous of their enormous wives. Some have been known to kill their women before proceeding on a journey. Others have forbidden them to name an animal of the masculine gender. They are entirely shut up within the walls of the harem, where they pass their time perfuming and decorating their persons to attract the favor of their lords. The general marriage laws of Mohammedan countries prevail in the Barbary states. Four wives and as many concubines as he pleases are the limits within which a man is confined, but few men marry more than one woman. An extensive system of prostitution prevails in all the cities. The low drinking shops are crowded with women. The public dancers, who all belong to the sisterhood, exist in large numbers, and are very much encouraged. Their society is a favorite recreation with moors of all classes. A man entertaining a party of friends will send for a company of dancers to amuse them. There, amid the fumes of tobacco and sometimes of liquor, for the precepts of the Quran are disregarded on such occasions, the women practice the most degrading obscenities, and the orgies become such as no pen can describe. These prostitutes are of various classes, from the low, vulgar wretches who exist in misery, filth, and disease, to the wealthy courtesans who live in luxury and splendor. A late traveler was introduced by a friend to a Moorish lady. He was ushered into a spacious apartment hung with rich colored silks. Reclining on a splendid divan, with every appliance of wealth around her, was a woman of extreme loveliness. Elegant in her manners and address, she seemed a model of feminine grace, nor did the visitor discover until after he had left her that he had been conversing with a Moorish prostitute. Siberia The state of manners to which the population of these snowy tracts has arrived is very low. They are rude, ignorant, and gross. The condition and character of the female sex correspond with that of the male. In the perpetual migration of tribes, they bear the heaviest burdens, and in their habitations the man regards his wife as a mere domestic slave, to whom it is unnecessary even to speak a kind word. There are some exceptions to this rule, especially toward the center of the district, removed from Russia on the one hand and the sea on the other, where more equality of the sexes is observable. A wife is generally obtained by purchase, and if a man is not rich enough to pay the sum demanded by the parents of a girl for the privilege of marrying her, he hires himself to them for a term ranging from three to ten years, according to an agreement, and his services in that time are considered equivalent to the value of his bride. These contracts are faithfully observed, the woman is invariably given up at the specified time, and the man released from his servile condition and admitted to all the dignities and rights of a son-in-law. Where the bridegroom is in a condition to pay for his bride, the preliminary negotiations are managed by his friends and her parents. They are very quietly arranged, but the spirit of bargaining is strong on both sides. The stipulated amount must be paid before the marriage is completed, and if a man steals away his bride before he has paid the full cost, the father watches an opportunity and recaptures her, retaining her in pledge until the balance is forthcoming. The marriage ceremonies vary in different tribes. With some there is no feast or form of any kind. With others, every marriage must take place in a newly built hut, where no impure things can have been. The most detailed account of marriage ceremonies we can find is among the Chuvasis. They offer a sacrifice of bread and honey to the sun on the betrothal, that he may look down with favor on the union. When the wedding day arrives, the bride hides herself behind a screen while the guests are assembling. When the party is complete, she walks three times round the room, followed by a train of virgins bearing bread and honey. Then the bridegroom enters, removes her veil, kisses her, and they exchange rings. She is now saluted as the betrothed girl, and is again led behind the screen, whence she emerges wearing a matron's cap. The concluding rite is for her to pull off her new husband's boots, thus promising obedience to him. In this tribe, the husband can divorce his wife by merely taking her cap from her head. 
Polygamy is practiced by many, though some prefer to take one wife for another as often as inclination prompts them, rather than take charge of several at the same time. Jealousy is little known among any of the races of Siberia. Modesty is not a female characteristic, nor is chastity very highly prized. If a wife commit adultery, the husband usually extracts a fine from the paramour for invading his rights without permission. Their barbarous manners would not induce us to expect any refined modesty. A traveler was introduced to the family of a rich man, the head of a tribe, and upon entering his low-roofed but spacious habitation, found himself in company with five or six women, wives, and daughters, all entirely naked, who appeared excessively diverted at being discovered in such a state. The dancing women are as lewd as can possibly be conceived. Indeed, obscene postures are the principal features of their entertainments. A licentious intercourse between unmarried persons is almost universal. With some, Religious dissensions are extremely bitter, but profligacy is more powerful, and a woman who would rigidly refuse to eat or drink with a man of some other creed will prostitute herself to him from sheer lust. Abandoned women reside in all the towns in large numbers, and are scarcely reprobated by other classes. The education of a Siberian girl appears to be simply telling her that marriage is her destiny, and that her husband will require her to be faithful. With this view she forms acquaintances, is seduced by one and yields to another, until her profligacy becomes so notorious that no one will purchase her as a wife, and she follows, as a means of living, the habits she had resorted to for the indulgence of her vicious appetite. It is said that many prostitutes become so from this cause. Eskimo The Eskimo require but a very short notice. As a race, they are dirty, poor, and immoral. Dishonesty is a prominent characteristic, especially manifested toward any strangers coming within their reach. The lamented Cain, in his Arctic explorations, mentions the trouble to which he was exposed in guarding his stores from their pilfering propensities. But, after he had administered one or two lessons of chastisement, they abandoned this habit and became of great assistance to him. He says, quote, There is a frankness and cordiality in their way of receiving their guests, whatever may be the infirmities of their notions of honesty. End quote. And when he parted from them on his perilous journey south, he remarks, quote, When trouble came to us and them, and we bent ourselves to their habits, when we looked to them to procure us fresh meat, and they found at our brig shelter during their wild bear hunts, never were friends more true. Although numberless articles of inestimable value to them have been scattered upon the ice unwatched, they have not stolen a nail. End quote. The Eskimo women are not absolute slaves. Their duties are almost entirely domestic, and during the winter especially their life is one of ease and pleasure, so far as their notions can comprehend such advantages. Crowded inside a low hut, two or three families together, they spend their time in eating and sleeping alternately, both sexes being perfectly naked, except a small apron worn by the women as a badge of their sex. This nudity arises from the excessive heat of their cabins, which are rendered impervious to the cold outside. Dr. Kane mentions one occasion on which he was a visitor when the thermometer outside stood at 60 degrees below zero, and inside the temperature mounted to 90 degrees, and says, quote, Bursting into a profuse perspiration, I stripped like the rest, and thus an honored guest, and in the place of honor I fell asleep. Respecting the morality of the men or the virtue of the women, little is known. Perry says that husbands frequently offer their wives to strangers for a very small sum, and also that it is not uncommon for a change of wives to be made for a short time. He adds that in no country is prostitution carried to a greater extent, the departure of the men on an expedition being a signal to their wives to abandon all restraint. Lust rules paramount, and the children are taught to watch outside the hut, lest the husband should return unexpectedly and find his habitation occupied by a stranger. Their marriage contract is a mere social arrangement, easily dissolved, but this is rarely done, the general custom being for a man to chastise his wife when she displeases him. 
The usual form of matrimonial discipline consists in forcing her to lead the reindeer while he rides at ease in the sledge. Their laws permit any man to have two wives, and a regal perquisite of the great chief was the privilege of having as many as he could support. These brides were not uncommonly carried off from their parents by force, the ceremonial rite following at the convenience of the parties. Such attempts are sometimes resisted. An aspirant for the favors of the daughter of a chief succeeded in conveying her to his sledge, but the father pursued with such alacrity that the adventurous lover had to abandon the fair one, and made his escape with some difficulty, leaving the equipage as spoils to the victor. Dr. Kane is of opinion that the services of the Lutheran and Moravian missionaries have produced a beneficial influence on the morals of the people. What may be called their normal religious notions extended only to the recognition of supernatural agencies, and to certain usages by which these could be conciliated. Murder, incest, burial of the living and infanticide were not considered crimes, and these have aided exposure and disease, the smallpox has made fearful ravages among them, to thin their numbers, and impress them with the idea that they are so rapidly dying out as to be able to mark their progress toward extinction within one generation. This is more applicable to the northern tribes, removed from the effects of civilization, among whom murder and infanticide still exist, though not to so great an extent as formerly, while in the southern latitudes, where it was formerly unsafe for vessels to touch upon the coast, hospitality is now the universal characteristic, and truth, self-reliance, and manly honest bearing have been inculcated with considerable success, though not enough to render their notions of property accordant with those of civilized nations. Iceland This country is inhabited by a serious, humble, and quiet people. Isolated from the rest of the world, they remain to this day in an almost primitive condition, and nine centuries have produced little change in their manners, language, or costume. The condition of the sexes is somewhat equal. The men divide their labors with the women, but do not oppress them. Both are alike filthy and coarse in their habits. Their hospitality assumes some singular forms. Women salute a stranger with a cordial embrace, but their dirty habits generally render him anxious to escape from their arms as quickly as possible. A missionary was upon one occasion especially scandalized. He was visiting at the house of a rich man, who treated him liberally, and upon retiring to his room at night was followed by his host's eldest daughter, who insisted upon helping him to undress and prepare for bed, declaring that it was the invariable custom of the country. Few absolute laws regulate the intercourse of the sexes. Christianity has abolished polygamy, and public opinion holds a strong check upon illicit intercourse. With the exception of their seaports, the people may be called a moral race. The proportion of illegitimate to legitimate children is about one in every seven. Lord Kames relates an anecdote which would stamp the Icelanders of 150 years ago as anything but moral. He says that in 1707 a contagious distemper had cut off nearly all the people, and, in order to repopulate the country, the King of Denmark issued a proclamation authorizing every single woman to bear six illegitimate children without losing her reputation. Report says the girls were so zealous in this patriotic work that it soon became necessary to abrogate the law. Greenland The population of Greenland is partly composed of European colonists and partly of Eskimo. They are a vain and indolent people whose virtues consist in the negation of active vice. Their women occupy an inferior position. Marriage is essentially a contract for mutual convenience, dissolved when it ceases to be agreeable. It is considered etiquette for a girl, when any man demands her in marriage, to fly to the hills and hide herself, in order to be dragged home with a great show of violence by her suitor. If courted by a man she dislikes, she cuts off her hair, which is a sign of great horror, and usually rids her of her lover. The Greenlanders consider themselves the only civilized people in the world, 
and consequently pride themselves on decorum. They do not allow marriages within three degrees of affinity, and consider it disreputable for persons who have been educated in the same house to marry, even if no relationship exists between them. Prostitution prevails to a considerable extent, widows and divorced women almost invariably adopting it as a means of living. There are numerous habitations in the large communities which can only be considered as brothels, but the life of an abandoned woman is generally reprobated, and those following it incur the most undisguised odium of the people at large. End of section 44 Recording by Ramon Escamilla Conway, Arkansas R-A-M-O-N-E-S-C-A-M-I-L-L-A dot wordpress dot com Section 45 of the History of Prostitution This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 45 Chapter 32 New York Statistics Part 1 Schedule of Questions Age Juvenile Depravity Premature Old Age Gradual Descent Average Duration of a Prostitute's Life Nativity Proportion of Prostitutes from Various States New York Effects of Immigration Foreigners Proportion to Population It is to be hoped the reader has already perused the introduction to this volume, containing a description of the modus operandi, adopted to obtain the necessary information from the prostitutes of New York City. The following schedule of questions was prepared for this purpose, and the ensuing pages present in tabular form the answers received thereto. How old will you be next birthday? Were you born in America, and if so, in what state? How long have you resided in New York City? If born abroad, in what country? How long have you resided in the United States? How long have you resided in the state of New York? What induced you to emigrate to the United States? Did you receive any assistance, and if so, from whom, and to what amount, to enable you to emigrate to the United States. Can you read and write? Are you single, married, or widowed? If married, is your husband living with you, or what caused the separation? If widowed, how long has your husband been dead? Have you had any children? How many? Boys, girls. Were these children born in wedlock? Are they living or dead? If living, are they with you now, or where are they? For what length of time have you been a prostitute? Have you had any disease incident to prostitution? If so, what? What was the cause of your becoming a prostitute? Is prostitution your only means of support? If not, what other means have you? What trade or calling did you follow before you became a prostitute? How long is it since you abandoned your trade as a means of living? What were your average weekly earnings at your trade? What business did your father follow? If your mother had any business independent of your father, what was it? Did you assist either your mother or your father in their business? If so, which of them? Is your father living, or how old were you when he died? Is your mother living? Or how old were you when she died? Do you drink intoxicating liquors? If so, to what extent? Did your father drink intoxicating liquors? If so, to what extent? Did your mother drink intoxicating liquors? If so, to what extent? Were your parents Protestants, Catholics, or non-professors? Were you trained to any religion? If so, was it Protestant or Catholic? Do you profess the same religion now? How long since you observed any of its requirements? In addition to this comprehensive series, space was left for any remarks the examiner might wish to make upon other points. 
The queries were printed on a large sheet of paper with sufficient blanks for the answers, and the officer was desired, as soon as he had obtained all the information required, to fold the sheet and sign his name on a line left for that purpose. With the date the inquiries were made, the locality of the house in which the woman resided, and the police district in which it was comprised. It is a matter of much regret that in the burning of the island hospital, Blackwell's Island, on February 13th, 1858, all the schedules were destroyed. They contained many facts which, from want of space, are but slightly alluded to in the following pages and would have been of material service in any measures hereafter taken to mitigate the sorrows or prevent the excesses of the abandoned women of New York. Farther prelude is unnecessary. It only remains to give the answers, as received, with such deductions as may arise from them. Question. How old will you be next birthday? Age. Number. Fifteen years. Two. Sixteen years, seventeen. Seventeen years, sixty-two. Eighteen years, one hundred forty-three. Nineteen years, two hundred fifty-eight. Twenty years, two hundred sixty-eight. Twenty-one years, two hundred six. Twenty-two years, one hundred seventy-six. Twenty-three years, one hundred fifty-three. Twenty-four years, ninety-six. Twenty-five years, ninety-seven. Twenty-six years, seventy-five. Twenty-seven years, fifty-three. Twenty-eight years, fifty-eight. Twenty-nine years, forty-nine. Thirty years, forty-four. Thirty-one years, eighteen. Thirty-two years, sixteen. Thirty-three years, twenty-nine. Thirty-four years, fifteen. Thirty-five years, nineteen. Thirty-six years, twenty-three. Thirty-seven years, eleven. Thirty-eight years, nine. Thirty-nine years, seven. Forty years, twenty-five. Forty-one years, seven. Forty-two years, six. Forty-three years, six. Forty-four years, three. Forty-five years, six. Forty-six years, two. Forty-seven years, two. Forty-eight years, five. Forty-nine years, three. Fifty years, four. Fifty-one years, one. Fifty-two years, three. Fifty-three years, three. Fifty-five years, five. Fifty-seven years, three. Fifty-eight years, two. Fifty-nine years, two. Sixty years, two. Sixty-two years, one. Sixty-three years, one. Sixty-six years, two. Seventy-one years, one. Seventy-seven years, one. Total, two thousand. The facts exhibited by this table are sufficiently palpable to render remarks almost unnecessary, but the existence of juvenile degradation is so clearly proven as to call for a few observations. Between the ages of fifteen and twenty years are found about three-eighths of the whole number embraced in this return. Between the ages of twenty-one and twenty-five years, nearly three-eighths more of the whole number are included, giving in the first ten years of the table three-quarters of the aggregate prostitution, while the next period of five years, or from twenty-six to thirty, contains one-eighth more. It is thus upon record that seven out of every eight women who came under this investigation had not yet reached thirty years of age. Beyond this standard, each year shows but a few, and of these veterans, the majority are those who are now keeping houses of ill fame. Comparing this with the ages of residence in New York, as given in the census reports, it will appear that prostitutes under twenty years of age are in excess about twenty-five per cent. As this inquiry shows that, for every four abandoned women between the ages of twenty and thirty, there are three between fifteen and twenty but the official classification proves that for every four women in the state between twenty and thirty years old, there are only two between fifteen and twenty. While juvenile degradation is an inseparable adjunct of prostitution, premature old age is its inevitable result. Take, for example, the career of a female who enters a house of prostitution at sixteen years of age. Her step is elastic, 
her eye bright. She is the observed of all observers. The habitués of the place flock around her, gloat over her ruin while they praise her beauty, and try to drag her down to their own level of depravity, while flattering her vanity. As the last spark of inherent virtue flickers and dies in her bosom, and she becomes sensible that she is indeed lost, that her anticipated happiness proves but splendid misery, she also becomes conscious that the door of reformation is practically closed against her. But this life of gay depravity cannot last. Her mind becomes tainted with the moral miasma in which she lives. Her physical powers wane under the trials imposed upon them, and her career in a fashionable house of prostitution comes to an end. She must descend in the ladder of vice, follow her from one step to another in her downward career. Today you may find her in our aristocratic promenades. Tomorrow she will be forced to walk in more secluded streets. Tonight you may see her glittering at one of the fashionable theatres. Tomorrow she will be found in some one of the infamous resorts which abound in the lower part of the city. Today she may associate with the wealthy of the land. Tomorrow none will be too low for her company. Today she has servants to do her bidding. Tomorrow she may be buried in a pauper's coffin and a nameless grave. This is no fancy sketch, but an outline of the course of many women now living as prostitutes in the lowest class in the city of New York. Any one conversant with the subject knows that there is a well-understood gradation in this life, and as soon as a woman ceases to be attractive in the higher walks, as soon as her youth and beauty fade, she must either descend in the scale or starve. Nor will any deny that of those who commence a life of shame in their youth under the most specious and flattering delusions, the majority are found, in a short time, plunged into the deepest misery and degradation. Here is seen, at a glance, a reason for the large number of juvenile prostitutes. Youth is a marketable commodity, and when its charms are lost they must be replaced. The following cases from life will substantiate this view. For obvious reasons the names are suppressed. C.B. is a native of New York, and now resides in the 8th Police District of the city. She is twenty years old, and became a prostitute at the age of sixteen, through the harshness and unkind treatment of a stepmother, her own mother having died when she was an infant. Take another case from the same neighborhood. L.B. was born in Vermont. Her father died while she was a child. At the age of fifteen she was enticed to the city, and became an inmate of a house of prostitution. She is described as an intelligent, well-educated girl of temperate habits. One more instance from the same locality. F. W. is a native of New York City, is the child of honest, hard-working parents, has received a medium education, at seventeen years old, was seduced under a promise of marriage, and deserted. She then embraced a life of prostitution, influenced mainly by shame, and the idea that she had no other means of subsistence. These women are residing in that part of the city which contains the majority of the first-class houses of prostitution. They have not yet descended in the scale. The ensuing selection, taken from the fourth police district, the antipodes of the former locality, will forcibly exhibit the operation of this gradual deterioration. E. S. was seduced in Rochester, New York, at the age of sixteen. She accompanied her seducer to this city, and for a season lived here in luxury. She was finally deserted, and now drags out a wretched existence in Water Street. E. C., residing in the same neighborhood, is now nineteen years of age. She was married when but a child, and five years since, or when she was only fourteen years old, was driven on the town through the brutal conduct of her husband. Passing through the various gradations of the scale, she has now become a confirmed drunkard, has endured much physical suffering and lost to all sense of shame, will doubtless continue in her wretched career till death puts an end to her misery. To continue this chain of evidence, the following cases have been selected from the registers of the Penitentiary Hospital, now remodeled and called the Island Hospital, Blackwell's Island. S. A. of New Jersey was admitted as a patient when only fifteen years of age, suffering from disease caused by leading a depraved life and within six months was received and treated therein no less than four times. A. B., born in Scotland, was admitted and treated for venereal disease at fourteen years of age. 
L. A. D., born in England, was admitted at sixteen years of age, two years since, with similar disease, and with only short intervals, has been an inmate of the hospital continuously from that time. M. H. was admitted at seventeen years of age, and endured a long and painful illness. M. J. D., after following a course of depravity for a year, was admitted at eighteen years of age, lingered in agony for twenty-five days, and then died solely from the effects of a life of prostitution. It is not necessary to pursue this subject farther, as sufficient facts have been adduced to support the assertion that youth is the grand desideratum in the inmates of houses of ill fame. Young women have been traced from the proudest resorts to the lowest haunts, and have been shown as suffering pain and sickness in a public institution, or dying there in torture. But no attempt has been made to calculate the misery produced in the respective families they had abandoned. The excruciating parental agony caused by the departure of a daughter from the paths of virtue seems more a matter for private contemplation by each reader than for any delineation here. We have witnessed the meetings of parents with their lost children, have stood beside the bed where a frail suffering woman was yielding her last breath, and have shuddered at the awful mental agony overpowering her physical suffering. No doubt can exist that, were it possible to introduce the reader of these pages to such scenes, or even could they be adequately described in all their accumulated horrors, the cordial cooperation of all the friends of virtue and humanity would be secured in furtherance of any plan which would check this mighty torrent of vice and woe. From the fact that youth is the grand desideratum, it is evident that a constant succession of young people will be driven into this arena, either by force or treachery. The average duration of life among these women does not exceed four years from the beginning of their career. There are, as in all cases, exceptions to this rule. But it is a tolerably well-established fact that one-fourth of the total number of abandoned women in this city die every year. Thus, by estimating the prostitutes in New York at six thousand, and this is not an exaggerated calculation, as will be proved hereafter, the appalling number of one thousand five hundred erring women are hurried to their last long homes each year of our existence. Neglected and contemned while living, they pass from this world unnoticed and unwept. But their deaths leave vacancies which must be supplied. The inexorable demands of vice and dissipation must be gratified, and who can tell what innocent and happy family circle may next have to mourn the ruin and disgrace of one of its members? In a subsequent portion of this work it will be necessary to notice the means employed for ensnaring the innocent and unsuspecting and to show that this is a danger which threatens all classes of the community. Question. Were you born in America? If so, in what state? State. Number. Alabama. 1. Carolina North. 2. Carolina South. 4. Columbia. District of. 1. Connecticut. 42. Delaware, 1. Georgia, 1. Illinois, 1. Kentucky, 2. Louisiana, 4. Maine, 24. Maryland, 15. Massachusetts, 71. Missouri, 1. New Hampshire, 7. New Jersey, 69. New York, 394. Ohio, 8. Pennsylvania, 77. Rhode Island, 18. Vermont, 10. Virginia, 9. Total born in United States, 762. The number of prostitutes in New York who were born within the limits of the United States slightly exceeds three-eighths of the aggregate from whom replies to these queries were obtained. They are natives of twenty-one states and one district and may be subdivided in geographical order as follows. 1. The Eastern District, containing Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, contributes 172 women to the prostitutes of New York City. 2. The Middle States, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, District of Columbia, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, 
contribute five hundred and sixty-six women. Three, the southern states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana, contribute twelve women. Four, the western states, Ohio, Illinois, Missouri, and Kentucky, contribute also twelve women. On what hypothesis can these proportions be explained? Maine, on the extreme northeast, with a rocky, surge-beaten coast, fronting on the wild Atlantic with a harsh, cold climate, sends twenty-four women from her population of five hundred eighty thousand, while Virginia, with one million four hundred twenty-one thousand inhabitants, contributes but nine. This difference in favor of the southern state cannot be explained on the ground of distance, for the boundaries of each state are nearly equidistant from New York. Nor can it be sustained by the idea that Maine has more sea-coast, as the maritime coast of the southern state is at least equal to that of the northern one, and the ordinary tendencies to immorality in seaport towns would be equally felt in each. The case is still farther involved by the fact that in all southern cities the majority of prostitutes are from the north, and it is a well-known circumstance that at certain periods large numbers of courtesans from New York, Boston, and other cities emigrate southward. Were the generally received opinion of the effects of a warm climate upon female organization to be adopted in this connection, not only would there be no necessity for this exodus, but the number of prostitutes received from Virginia should largely exceed those from Maine. This fact is sufficient to confirm the idea already expressed, that fraud or force is used to entrap these females. The natives of a bleak northern state are far more likely to be deceived by the artful misrepresentations of emissaries from New York than the denizens of the southern portion of our Union. The former lead a life of comparative hardship, the latter one of comparative ease. In Maine, over six thousand women or one in every forty-six of the female population, are immured for six days in every week in a crowded factory. In Virginia, over three thousand women, or one in every one hundred and thirty-four of the female population, are similarly employed. This mode of life will form a matter for subsequent consideration, so far as its tendencies to immorality are concerned. Again, Place in contrast Rhode Island with eighteen women living by prostitution in New York, in a population of only 140,000, and Maryland with fifteen prostitutes in New York, in a population of 418,000, and a more palpable difference in favor of the southern state is apparent. The former sends one prostitute out of every 8,000 of her inhabitants, the latter one out of every 28,000. Calculating on the basis of the respective populations, Vermont and New Hampshire have nearly the same proportion as Maine. Massachusetts exceeds the average, and Connecticut, par excellence, the land of steady habits, has a still larger excess. New Jersey has the largest proportion of any state in the Union, and Pennsylvania shows about the average of Maine. The southern and western states have but few representatives. New York, the home state, will be noticed in due course. The preceding facts will supply materials for reflection, in conjunction with the question, on what hypothesis can these proportions be explained? The self-evident answer to this query would seem to be that the excess from the eastern and middle states arises from the employment of a much larger proportion of females in manufacturing and sedentary occupations. A young woman of ardent temperament cannot but feel the hardship of this position in life as compared with her more favored sisters in other states, and when such an idea has once obtained possession of her mind, it forms a subject for constant thought. Thus, when already predisposed in favor of any change, she falls into the hands of the tempter a pliant victim. Beyond the hardship attendant on her daily labor, the associations which are formed in factories or workshops where both sexes are employed very frequently result disastrously for the female. Notwithstanding all the care which may be taken on the part of the employers, and it is a subject for national pride that American manufacturers are doing far more to elevate the moral character of their employees than the same class of men in other lands, 
It is morally impossible that these intimacies can be entirely suppressed, nor can their ruinous effects be prevented. Study the moral statistics of any of the manufacturing towns in Great Britain or on the continent of Europe, and the same results are presented, but in a more alarming degree, because there the supervision is not only weak in itself, but is frequently entrusted to improper persons whose interest is often in direct opposition to their duty. A FEW WORDS IN RESPECT TO THE STATE OF NEW YORK The number of prostitutes in proportion to the population far exceeds the ratio from any other state except New Jersey. Beyond the effect of manufactures, which operate here to a corresponding extent as in other states, the immense maritime business of New York City, and the constant flood of immigrants and strangers passing through it, must be taken into consideration. This constantly fills some localities with sailors, men proverbial for having in every port a wife, and many of whom are notorious frequenters of houses of prostitution. This circumstance proves that this infernal traffic is governed by the same rules which regulate commercial transactions, namely, that the supply is in proportion to the demand. If, by any miracle, all the seamen and strangers visiting New York could be transformed into moral men, at least from one-half to two-thirds of the houses of ill-fame would be absolutely bankrupt. The constant flood of immigration leaves a mass of debris behind it, consisting in the first place of men idle and vicious in their own lands, who transfer their vices to the country of their adoption, and for a time after arrival here devote what means they possess to the pursuit of debauchery, and materially help to swell the torrent of immorality. Another class of immigrants are women, many of whom are sent here by charitable associations or public bodies in foreign lands, as the most economical way to get rid of them. Many of these females become mothers almost as soon as they land on these shores. In fact, the probability of such an event sometimes hastens their departure. They exist here in the most squalid misery in some tenement house or hovel. Their children receive none of the advantages of education for, as soon as they can beg, they are compelled to aid in the struggle for bread, and the most frequent result is that the boys are arrested for some petty theft, and the girls become prostitutes, thus contributing to meet the demand caused by the classes already mentioned. But, in addition to these foreign children born by accident in our state, the proportion of prostitutes from New York is increased by the facility offered for transit from the interior to the city. Doubtless there are many courtesans from the eastern and southern districts who find their way to some of the large cities in their own part of the country, and so, on the same principle, when a woman in this state has fallen into vicious habits, her natural resort is to this metropolis. In addition to the more extended market it offers for her charms, its advantages as a great central rendezvous for the nation must not be overlooked. Here a prostitute can live until her attractions wane, and hence she can easily reach any southern or other point where abandoned women are in demand. Despite of the large number of prostitutes ascertained to have been born within the bounds of New York State, it cannot be conceded that we are any less moral than our neighbors in other parts of the Confederation. It is a matter for the most serious consideration to be followed by sound and judicious action, either legislative or personal, that so large a number of American girls fall victims to this fell destroyer, in a land where a good education is within the reach of every one, where industry, if properly applied in the right channels, will afford a comfortable maintenance for all, where the natural resources are sufficient to support nearly half the inhabitants of the world. Question. Were you born abroad? If so, in what country? Countries. Numbers. Austria. 2. Belgium, 1. British North America, 63. Denmark, 1. England, 104. France, 13. Germany, 249. Ireland, 706. Italy, 1. Poland, 3. Prussia, 6. Saxony, 2. Scotland, 52. Switzerland, 17. Wales, 1. West Indies, 4. At sea, 13. Total born abroad, 1,238. It has been frequently remarked, and as generally believed, 
in the absence of any satisfactory information on the subject, that a very large majority of the prostitutes in New York are of foreign birth. But the facts already developed, with the few remarks which will be made upon the above table of nativities, go far toward falsifying that opinion. The enumeration shows that five-eighths only were born abroad, the dominions of Great Britain furnishing the largest proportion. The ratio in which the several parts of that kingdom supply the new world with courtesans may be stated in round numbers as follows. Ireland contributes one prostitute to every four thousand of her population. British North America, one prostitute to every seven thousand of population. Scotland, one prostitute to every sixteen thousand of population. England and Wales, one prostitute to every fifty thousand of population. Of course, this will be understood as referring to all prostitutes now living in this city, assuming the average nativities of all to be fairly represented in the replies obtained from a portion. But these numbers, being based upon the population of the several countries, give but a very imperfect idea of the extent of vice among that portion of their people who have settled in America, and a more satisfactory comparison can be drawn from the records of emigration. Upon an examination of the arrivals in each year from the time the existing Board of Commissioners of Emigration was organized, to the end of 1857, a period of ten years, it is found that the numbers average 230,000 per annum, which gives a proportion of one prostitute to every 250 emigrants. This is based upon the theory that one-fourth of the abandoned women die, or are otherwise removed from the city, every year. To repeat this fact in plainer words, of every 250 emigrants, men, women, and children who land at our docks, at least one woman eventually becomes known as a prostitute. End of section 45、section、46 of the History of Prostitution this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger Section 46 Chapter 32 New York Statistics Part 2 This demoralization may be accounted for in several ways. There is frequently a protracted interval between the time when families arrive at the intended port of departure and the day on which they sail, and during this space they are exposed to all the malign influences invariably existing in large seaport towns, which must impart vicious ideas to young people who have recently left some secluded part of the country. Take Liverpool, for instance, the port whence the largest number of emigrants come to us and which contains one prostitute for every eighty-eight inhabitants. And the wonder will be, not that so many are contaminated, but that so many escape. When the dangers of the town are surmounted, another source of immorality is found in the steerage passage across the Atlantic. This occupies from one to three months, during which time the females are necessarily in constant communication with the other sex and frequently exposed to scenes of indelicacy too glaring to be described here, and this in addition to the constant machinations of the abandoned and unprincipled men who are to be found, in greater or less numbers, in every ship's complement of crew and passengers. Under such circumstances the germ implanted in the seaport town often develops into its legitimate fruit. But when the ship has reached her haven, and the perils of the sea are past, there are dangers to be encountered on land. The present arrangements for disembarking emigrants at Castle Garden have removed many of the most objectionable features formerly incident to their entry into the land of their adoption. Yet there are many still remaining. If a family desire to travel to the interior of the country, they can do so at once. But should they remain in the city, they are exposed to the tender mercies of the emigrant boarding-house keepers, generally themselves natives of the old country, who, having been swindled on their arrival, are both competent and willing to practice the same impositions on others. It must not be concluded that all who follow the business are worthy of this sweeping condemnation. Many of them are undoubtedly honest. 
Yet it cannot be denied that others do pursue this nefarious course, and when they have drained all the resources of their customers, they turn them adrift to beg, or starve, or sin for a subsistence. To one or the other of these causes many girls owe their ruin. Indeed, there can be no reasonable doubt that a majority of the prostitutes of foreign birth are more or less influenced thereby. In addition to these, there are other snares constantly set for strangers, to which we shall hereafter allude. It is scarcely within the province of this section to notice measures calculated to remove the evils named. With the first, the American people have no possible means of interfering. With regard to the second, many difficulties must be encountered and overcome. The commissioners of emigration have taken steps to avert some of the evils, and, in consequence of their application to the present Congress, a bill has been introduced making it a penal offense for any officer or sailor on emigrant ships to have carnal intercourse with any passenger, whether with or without her consent. The third evil named is a local question peculiarly and entirely under our own control. And, at the risk of anticipating the subject, it may be suggested that the most effectual way of obviating it would be the organization of a plan offering inducements and facilities for young women to leave the city, thus removing them from its baneful influences to a part of the country where their own labor would give them the means of a comfortable subsistence and a virtuous life. It is but poor policy to retain in New York numbers of persons who can by no possibility procure employment in an already overcrowded field of labor, and who must eventually consent to earn a precarious living by the sacrifice of virtue. It matters not through what agency their ruin is effected, whether by the oppression of a boarding-house keeper, the intrigues of an intelligence office, or the wiles of abandoned ones of their own sex. The degradation is an indisputable fact, and the expenses to every citizen from the extra cost of police supervision, courts of justice, hospitals, and penitentiaries would probably be enough to remove many from the city who are debauched for the want of opportunity to leave. It would be far better to try the system of prevention in the first instance, and this would probably be successful in many cases, whereas any reformatory plan is almost useless where the Rubicon has been passed. Question. How long have you resided in the United States? Length of residence. Numbers. Under two months, nine. Under three months, eleven. Under six months, twenty-one. Under one year, seventy-five. Under two years, one hundred fifty-nine. Under three years, ninety-nine. Under four years, eighty-three. Under five years, one hundred six. Under ten years, three hundred fifty-two. Ten years and upward, Two hundred ninety two. From birth, seven hundred sixty two. Unascertained, thirty one. Total, two thousand. In intimate connection with the subject of the nativities of prostitutes now in New York are the answers to the above inquiry. Deducting the number of native born women, it will be found that five hundred and sixty three, or more than forty five per cent, of the foreigners have resided in the United States less than five years and of this number, 115, or nearly 21 percent, have resided here less than one year. These averages support, to some extent, the opinion already advanced, that a large proportion of the prostitutes in New York City were either seduced previous to leaving their port of departure, or on their passage, or very soon after their arrival here, when they commenced forthwith a practice which forces them eventually to become a burden upon the tax-paying community. In a majority of cases, this must be the result of their career. The successive fall from one gradation of their wretched life to a lower, finally landing them in the prisons or hospitals of a city, toward whose expenses neither their pecuniary ability nor their labor have ever contributed a farthing. Their support thus falls upon the working population, an argument of dollars and cents which will not be without its influence in a consideration of the numerous evils of prostitution. The remaining fifty-five per cent, having been in the United States more than five years, are by law entitled to receive any assistance which their necessities may demand from local funds, 
but of this number there are some who have doubtless been chargeable to public institutions before they had completed the required term of residence, as there are unquestionably many who, in order to procure relief, make false representations as to the time of their arrival. Reasoning from well-ascertained facts, there can be little exaggeration in the estimate that from eighty to one hundred thousand dollars per annum is the amount which the citizens of New York contribute to the support of foreigners who have been less than five years in the United States. Nor can this be prevented unless the claims of suffering humanity are entirely ignored. Of course, the idea that a sick or disabled man or woman is to be left to perish cannot be entertained for one moment. If they are in want or in pain, every dictate of our common nature demands that they shall be relieved. But it may be suggested to those interested in the question of local taxation to give their prompt assistance to any practicable scheme which will diminish the amount of vice, and consequently reduce the expenses resulting therefrom, such as a carefully devised plan for shielding emigrants from corrupting influences, and forwarding the destitute to sections where labor may be obtained. Upon the moral effects of such an arrangement it is unnecessary to remark, as they are self-evident. Of its successful working and eventual economy, but little doubt can be entertained. Question. How long have you resided in New York State? Length of Residence Numbers under two months, thirty-five. Under three months, twenty. Under six months, forty-three. Under one year, one hundred thirty-two. Under two years, one hundred eighty-six. Under three years, one hundred fifty-two. Under four years, one hundred ten. Under five years, one hundred twenty-seven. Under ten years, three hundred seventy-four. Ten years and upward, four hundred thirty-three. From birth, 353. Unascertained, 35. Total, 2,000. Question. How long have you resided in New York City? Length of residence. Numbers. Under two months, 46. Under three months, 30. Under six months, 56. Under one year, 140. Under two years, 236. Under three years, 189. Under four years, 128. Under five years, 135. Under ten years, 388. Ten years and upward, 427. From birth, 185. Unascertained, 40. Total, 2,000. These tables require no comment. The attention of the reader may merely be called to the fact that 394 women have been already reported as born in the state of New York, of which number 353 have resided within its limits continuously from the time of their birth, and that 185, or nearly one-half, were natives of New York City, and have resided therein from the day they were born. This fact alone demonstrates that the influences of metropolitan life are not very favorable to the advance of female morality. Question. What induced you to emigrate to the United States? Reasons. Numbers. Came as stewardesses. 2. Ran away from home. 18. Ill usage of parents. 34. Came with their seducers. 39. Came to improve their condition. 411. Sent out by parents or friends, 81. Came with relatives or to join relatives already in the United States, 619. No special cause assigned, 34. Total of foreigners, 1,238. This table shows that a majority of the prostitutes of foreign birth were induced to emigrate to the United States either by considerations of policy 411 assigning as their reason a desire to improve their condition in life, or from family connections, 619 having arrived with relatives and friends, or with the purpose of joining relatives and friends already in this country. It will not be denied by any one familiar with the subject that one main reason for emigration is always found in the comparative difficulty of earning a livelihood in the place of the emigrant's nativity and the expectation of doing better in a strange land. 
a conclusion sustained by the fact that a prosperous year in Europe serves to check the arrivals here, and vice versa. With the difficult problem of labor and remuneration in the old world it would be out of place to interfere. But it may be remarked that, badly as many branches of female employment are paid for with us, they are still worse paid for in England. Reference to a previous chapter, treating of the causes of prostitution in that country, will at once establish this point, and the instances therein quoted of the wages paid in London will remove all surprise that this country should be a receptacle for underpaid operatives, or that the hope of realizing better wages should be sufficiently powerful to sever all ties of birthplace and home. But many of these impoverished women were actually dependent upon friends for the payment of their passage money, and consequently arrived here almost literally penniless, with very slight prospects of obtaining work, and frequently but with one alternative, and the only one they had before coming here, which they must embrace or starve. Another class assign as a reason for expatriation the ill usage of parents, in itself a prolific cause of prostitution under any circumstances, but more especially when its effects have been to drive the girl a distance of four thousand miles from home. From an examination of these causes alone, it is apparent that, however well qualified, physically and morally, to add their quota to the prosperity of the United States, had their exertions been properly directed. Yet the circumstances under which these women emigrated were so embarrassing as to render them easy victims to those whose special business seems to be to ensnare the friendless and unfortunate. This branch of inquiry may be continued by a reference to the following table, giving a summary of answers to the question, Did you receive any assistance, and if so, to what amount, to enable you to emigrate to the United States? Amount of assistance, numbers. Paid their own expenses, 262. Received assistance, amount not specified, 618. Received assistance, $20 each, 89. Received assistance, $25 each, 94. Received assistance, $30 each, 43. Received assistance, $35 each, 15. Received assistance, $40 each, 24. Received assistance, $45 each, 6. Received assistance, $50 each, 28. Received assistance, $55 each, 3. Received assistance, $60 each, 12. Received assistance, $65 each, 2. Received assistance, $70 each, 2. Received assistance, $75 each, 2. Received assistance, $100 each, 12. Received assistance, $110 each, 1. Received assistance, $120 each, 3. Received assistance, $140 each, 2. Received assistance, $150 each, 3. Received assistance, $175 each, 1. Received assistance, $180 each, 2. Received assistance, $200 each, 5. Received assistance, $220 each, 1. Received assistance, $250 each, 2. Received assistance, $300 each, 4. Received assistance, $400 each, 1. Received assistance, $600 each, 1. Totals, 976 and 262. Total of foreign-born prostitutes, 1,238. It appears that only 262, or about one-fifth of the total number, paid their own passage money, the remainder having received pecuniary assistance toward that object ranging from an unspecified amount, which in all probability was not more than the positive expenses of the voyage, to six hundred dollars. It will be observed that the majority did not receive more than forty dollars each. 883 of those assisted, stating that such help did not exceed that sum. This certainly was but a very inadequate amount to pay the expenses of an outfit and a voyage across the Atlantic, and then to support a person in a strange land until employment could be secured. 
particularly if she was but one of a family each member of which had the same imperative necessity for work as herself. These remarks may be thought inconsistent with the statements published in 1856 of the amount of money brought to this country by immigrants. But it may be suggested that, although these reports gave a correct statement of the sum in the possession of all the passengers by a certain vessel, they are altogether silent as to the numbers who were destitute. They merely proved what has been universally conceded within the last three or four years, namely, that among the immigrants arriving are many with considerable cash means. But it does not require much reflection to convince any one that when a family bring available funds with them they will leave New York as quickly as possible in search of some locality where their money may be advantageously employed. This is still more likely as the fact of their being possessed of capital proves them to have practiced habits of industry and economy at home, which would scarcely abandon them when they reached the new world. The aggregated facts as to property do not touch isolated cases of poverty, the most dangerous to this community, because individuals who are forced to remain in the city from want of means to leave it not only swell its long list of paupers, but are in circumstances which may materially influence them to become prostitutes, and have the spur of necessity to urge them forward in this or any other course which may offer a respite from starvation. The following table corroborates this theory. It consists of replies to the other part of the same question. Did you receive any assistance, and if so, from whom, to enable you to emigrate to the United States? By whom assisted? Numbers. Paid their own expenses, 262. By relatives or friends, 805. By money remitted by relatives or friends in the U.S., 100. Stole money from their friends, 34. By seducers, 28. By public authorities, 9. Totals, 976 and 262. Total of foreign-born prostitutes, 1,238. As a general rule, the parties by whom assistance was rendered were not likely to advance any amount beyond what was absolutely required. Even this amount would perhaps be reduced before the termination of the voyage, if it should prove a protracted one, and the provisions of the passengers be exhausted, as there are on board every ship persons who are willing to sell articles of food at prices ranging from three to six times their value, and who are equally ready to supply demands for brandy or tobacco also. On a review of the responses given to the three questions which have been under consideration in this section, it appears that the opinions expressed are legitimate deductions from the premises. They may be thus recapitulated. The majority of those immigrants who subsequently become prostitutes in New York were almost destitute in their own country. They arrive here with little or no means of support. Their poverty renders them peculiarly liable to yield to temptation, if, indeed, many of them have not previously fallen. Thus, if we do not receive them as prostitutes when they reach our shores, we receive them in a condition immediately to become such for the sake of subsistence. Question. Can you read and write? Degree of Education. Numbers. Can read and write well. 714. Can read and write imperfectly 546 can read only 219 uneducated 521 total 2000 714 of the women who were examined in new york city say that they can read and write well this must not be regarded as proof that they have received a superior or even a medium education but is a phrase which may be interpreted to mean that they can read a page of printed matter without much trouble and can sign their names, although truth compels the admission that their writing is very often a species of penmanship extremely difficult to decipher. Beyond such acquirements as these, very few, scarcely one in each five hundred, have progressed. Five hundred and forty-six can read and write imperfectly, a grade of education which may be defined as midway between the amount of knowledge already described and a state of total ignorance. Enough, in fact, to relieve them from the suspicion of being altogether illiterate, which is the sole advantage that they can claim over the 219 who can read only, or the 521 who confess that they can neither read nor write. As a whole, 
There is little doubt that the prostitutes in New York believe, where ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise. These remarks are made from observations upon this class during a long hospital experience. But seriously, such a state of ignorance is most deplorable. To give an idea of the facilities for acquiring education in the various countries from which these prostitutes reach us, the following statement from the United States Census for 1850 is submitted. The ratio of persons receiving education is as follows. United States, one to every five of total population. Denmark, one to every five of total population. Sweden, one to every six of total population. Prussia, one to every six of total population. Norway, one to every seven of total population. Great Britain, one to every eight of total population. France, one to every ten of total population. Austria, one to every thirteen of total population. Holland, one to every fourteen of total population. Ireland, one to every fourteen of total population. The following is a fair average estimate of the acquirements of native and foreign-born prostitutes. Degree of Education Natives Foreigners Can read and write well. Natives 25% Foreigners 10% Can read and write imperfectly. Natives 50% Foreigners 50% Uneducated Natives 25% Foreigners 40% Total 100 the average of educational facilities in the United States is as one to five. In European countries it is one to ten. In other words, every one in this country has twice the opportunities for education compared with those born in the old world. Opportunities which, in the cases of these women, at least, have not been improved to their full extent. Of those who claim to be well educated, the United States show more than the average. In the class imperfectly educated, foreigners show one half of their number, and the superior advantages in this country only produce exactly the same proportion. The proportion of those uneducated is not much more favorable in natives than in foreigners. Some allowances must be made, however, in this calculation, for the fact that many children of foreign birth arrive here at an early age, and gain such education as they possess in American institutions. But even this will but slightly affect the disproportion alluded to. But no possible modification of the facts can be conceived sufficient to excuse the negligence of the parents or friends of one-fourth of the native-born prostitutes in this city at the present day, when education may be obtained literally without money and without price. Sectarian bigotry must be held responsible for much of this offense. If our children cannot be educated as we please, they shall not be educated at all. If they must not read the books we wish, they shall never learn the alphabet, is in effect, if not in words, the language of thousands in this country today. What are the results of this cruel policy? The children go forth into the world, the boys to earn a precarious living by the sweat of their brow, the girls condemned to the most servile work in any family where their stupidity may find a shelter until they meet with some man of their own mental caliber, whom they marry, and forthwith bring up their unfortunate children in the same manner in which they themselves were reared. This is the brightest view of the future of ignorant children. The darker shades are depicted in the annals of vice and crime, may be seen daily in our prisons, hospitals, poorhouses, and pauper burying grounds. The picture is not overdrawn nor will the reply so common in this generation, these are the children of foreigners, serve to exonerate the parents. For even if all the uneducated native women who have answered these questions were born of foreign parentage, a fact which must be proved before it is admitted, but which we are not inclined to concede, yet they were born on our soil, where public schools were open to receive them, and their intelligence would enhance the credit of the land in the same proportion that their ignorance diminishes it. A love of their adopted country, its institutions, and its fame, is not too much to ask of parents who derive their maintenance from its resources. It is a libel upon the parental instinct, it cannot be called feeling, 
to allow any child in the United States to arrive at years of maturity without acquiring a good, plain, solid education. Fathers or mothers who pursue such a course as this would consider themselves unjustly accused if told they were training their daughters to become prostitutes. But such is the fact. It is scarcely possible to imagine anything so likely to lead a woman from the paths of rectitude as ignorance, coupled with the conviction that such ignorance is an insurmountable barrier to her progress in life. It drives her to intoxication to drown her reflections, and from intoxication to prostitution the transition is easy and almost certain. Here, then, are a number of young women thrown into society every year without the least education, untrained for good, and only fit for evil, ignorant of their duties to themselves or to the world, with sensibilities callous because they have never been cultivated, with faculties on a level with the inferior animals from the same cause. They are expected to succeed in life. It would be as consistent to take a man who had never seen a steam engine and give him the control of a locomotive and a train of cars without anticipating an accident, as it is to presume in this day of knowledge that an uneducated man or woman can ever become a respectable and useful member of society. Could our liberal facilities for education be duly improved, much would be done to prevent the vice of prostitution. No classical or extraordinary tuition is required to accomplish this end. Merely common sense rightly cultivated, and conscience enlightened and developed, so as to appreciate the difference between right and wrong, will do much to aid a woman to pass unscathed through trials which constantly ruin the ignorant. The question has sometimes arisen whether it should not be made compulsory on parents to educate their children. The present is not the place to discuss that subject, but the following statistics will show to what extent the duty is neglected. The United States Census for 1850 reports Population of New York City, 515,547 Proportion of population between the ages of 5 and 15 years, 101,006 Children attending school, 76,685 Percentage of children attending school, 75 and 9 tenths the New York State Census for 1855 reports Population of New York City, 629,904 Proportion of population between the ages of 5 and 15 years, 116,627 No returns are made of the numbers attending schools, and these must be sought from other sources. The report of the Board of Education for 1856 states the average daily attendance at the ward or public schools to be 44,598. The same document gives data from which the attendance at religious, corporate, or other public schools can be calculated, but says nothing of private schools. An approximate estimate of the latter can, however, be made with the help of the United States Census. In 1850, the proportions were about one private to every twelve public scholars. And since that period, there has probably been but little change in the ratio. From these facts, the subjoined may be assumed a reasonably correct statement. Average attendance at public schools, 44,598. Allowance of 20% for absentees whose names are on the school registers but who attend irregularly. 8,920. Corporate schools receiving state assistance, 7,517. Corporate schools without receiving state assistance, estimated, 10,000. Private schools, estimated, 6,000. Total children attending school, 77,035. This would give a school attendance of 66% of the population between the ages of 5 and 15 years, or 10% less than in 1850. That the proportionate numbers receiving education are diminishing is susceptible of proof from one fact. In 1856, the pupils in the public schools were 347 more than in 1855. During the last 15 years, the population of the city has increased more than 20,000 per annum and of this increase, about one-fifth, or four thousand, are between the ages of five and fifteen. 
It follows that in 1856 there were 4,000 additional children in New York as compared with 1855, but there were only 347 additional attendants at the public schools. Admitting that other schools received the same increase of pupils, and admission more liberal than facts would warrant, the education of 700 only would be provided for, leaving 3,300 destitute of instruction. In the course of the year 1856, the attention of the Board of Education was directed to the large number of children not attending any school, and upon the basis of a partial census of the city they were assumed to amount to 60,000. This was conceded to be an overestimate. The figures given above would make the number 39,594, which may very likely be nearer the truth. But even this may be in excess, and to allow for all possible contingencies, we will place it at 30,000. Even this is an alarming statement. The suggestion that of all the children in our city, nearly 27% are growing up in a state of perfect ignorance presents so many frightful considerations that the mind revolts at the bare possibility. But the facts will not permit any other construction. If this criminal neglect be continued, it must produce fatal consequences to society, and the view of impending results would almost sanction a compulsory education. End of section 46 Section 47 of the History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 47. Chapter 32. New York. Statistics. Part 3. Question. Are you single, married, or widowed? Condition? Numbers. Single. 1,216. Married. 490. Widowed. 294. Total. 2,000. The civil condition of the prostitutes in New York City furnishes matter of serious consideration in view of the slight restraints which the ordinarily received rules of society place upon the passions, and the utter inefficiency of such regulations to counteract the influences tending to female degradation, influences, in fact, which they very frequently augment rather than check. In the cases of many females now under notice, marriage was invested not only with the sanctions of a civil contract between the parties, as recognized by our state laws, but, according to the tenets of the Roman Catholic Church, which was regarded as one of the seven holy sacraments which it is deemed an act of sacrilege to violate, yet, in the face of these ordinances, the civil contract is broken, the sacrament is profaned in one-fourth of the total number of cases, or four hundred and ninety out of two thousand, which are now under notice. It would be out of place to enter here on any disquisition respecting the duties of the married state. Regarded in its abuses as provocative of prostitution, it is noticed hereafter. And joined by the precepts of holy writ, supported by the sentiment of the world, and respected by all virtuous men, marriage is an institution which needs no argument to enforce its claims to the most rigid observance. That this sacred compact is too frequently violated by one or the other of the contracting parties is proved by almost daily experience either in courts of law or by intercourse with the world. Conflicting testimony sometimes renders it doubtful to whom the blame ought to be imputed, but there can be no uncertainty whatever as to the opinions entertained by society at large in such cases. If the husband has been guilty of a breach of his conjugal duties, he reads the whole of the evidence, graphically reported, with occasional embellishments in the columns of the daily papers, flatters himself that he is acquiring notoriety, is congratulated by friends of his own predilections on his success, and in a short time is fully reinstated in his former social position. On the contrary, if the weight of evidence is against the wife, the whole artillery of the world's scorn is leveled at her head. She is driven from society, crushed by the proudly virtuous frowns of her own sex, and the contemptuous sneers of the other. Dishonored 
and despised, she is too often left with no means of existence but indiscriminate prostitution. The temptation to such degradation being aggravated by the consciousness of her previous infidelity and its results. There is no possibility of salvation for her. The moral world has resolved she shall not repent, and the least attempt on her part to atone for an error over which she mourns with all the intensity of her nature, is sternly resisted by the virtuous indignation of society, which erects an impassable barrier between herself and her hopes of reformation. Of the prostitutes in New York, one thousand two hundred and sixteen have never been married. Their sin is the less because they have not to answer for broken vows nor have they any outraged confidence on which to brood, but to endure only the sin and odium attached to their present condition. Two hundred and ninety-five prostitutes are widowed. In their cases death has put an end to the marital contract, and, thus left free to act for themselves, they stand in nearly the same condition as single women. An investigation of the nativities of these women shows that about one-third each of the single and married prostitutes are natives of the United States, and of widows about one-half were born in this country. The question may arise as to the causes to be assigned for the depravity of married women, and for the large proportion of widows in the ranks of the abandoned. It would certainly appear that one of the principal, if not the principal, cause which can be specified is the very early age at which such marriages are contracted. Young people yield to the impulse of a moment, acknowledge the charms of a person they meet in a ballroom or public assembly, and are married with a very imperfect knowledge of each other's character, with but little reflection on the probable result of the alliance, and with but a slight appreciation of the obligations they are contracting. It was a wise regulation, whether regarded physically or morally, which fixed the earliest period of marriage in ancient Germany at twenty-five years, and declared the union invalid if the parties had not reached that time of life. Nor would the morality of New York suffer if a similar restriction was the rule instead of the exception here. The annexed cases, selected at random from the replies received, are submitted in support of this opinion. E. C now nineteen years of age, is a married woman who has been separated from her husband five years, and must therefore have been married when less than fourteen years old. C. W., now twenty-one years of age, has been a widow for five years, and was married at fifteen. A. S. was married at sixteen, and E. R. at fifteen. C. C., now twenty-eight years old, has been a widow more than twelve years. C. G., aged twenty-four, has been a widow seven years. Both these women were under sixteen when married. The list might be extended almost indefinitely. The following inquiry, as a continuation of the same branch of the subject, is embodied in this section. Question. If married, is your husband living with you, or what caused the separation? Causes. Numbers. Living together. Seventy-one. Ill usage of husbands, 103. Desertion of husbands, 60. Desertion of husbands to live with other women, 43. Intemperance, 45. Husbands went to sea, 39. Husbands refused to support them, 29. Infidelity, 25. No cause assigned, 75. Totals, 419 and 71. Aggregate of married women, 490. The most striking and painful fact in these answers is revealed in the first line of the table, which contains an announcement so disgraceful to humanity that, but for the positive evidence adduced by the figures, it would be scarcely credited, namely, that of 490 married women now living as prostitutes, Seventy-one, more than one-seventh, are cohabiting with their husbands. It cannot be controverted that such cohabitation necessarily implies a knowledge of the wife's degradation, and a participation in the wages of her shame. Nor will any argument, however plausible, succeed in removing from the public mind the conviction that the man is far the more guilty party of the two, and he cannot escape the suspicion that he was the primary agent in leading his wife to prostitution, or, in legal parlance, he was an accessory before the fact. 
While such a consideration will not exonerate the woman from her offences, it may be justly pleaded in extenuation. Although it will not prove her guiltless, it will sink him to the lowest depths of disgrace. The conduct of husbands is alleged in a majority of the cases as the cause of separation. Two hundred and thirty-five out of four hundred and nineteen women give the following causes. Husbands refused to support their wives, twenty-nine. Husbands deserted their wives, sixty. Husbands deserted their wives to live with other women, forty-three. Ill usage of husbands, one hundred three. Total, two hundred thirty-five. The cases wherein intemperance, infidelity, or no cause assigned were replied, are vague, and may be construed to attach blame to either or both. Sufficient has been proved to show that, in many cases, prostitution among married women is the result of circumstances which must have exercised a very powerful influence over them. The refusal of a husband to support his wife, his desertion of her, or an act of adultery with another woman, are each occurrences which must operate injuriously upon the mind of any female. And by the keen torture such outrages inflict on the sensitiveness of her nature, must drive her into a course of dissipation. Many women thus circumstanced have actually confessed that they made the first false step while smarting from injuries inflicted by their natural protectors, with the idea of being revenged upon their brutal or faithless companions for their unkindness. Morality will argue, and very truly, that this is no excuse for crime. But much allowance must be made for the extreme nature of the provocation, and the fact that most of these women are uneducated, and have not sufficient mental or moral illumination to reason correctly upon the nature and consequences of their voluntary debauchery, or even to curb the violence of their passions. Ill usage of husbands, a crime particularly rife in England, and apparently fast becoming naturalized here, also stands as a prominent cause of vice, and is one which cannot be too pointedly condemned. It strikes at the root of the social fabric, and must invariably be denounced both on account of its enormity as an offense, and of its almost inevitable consequences to the woman, a sense of degradation, too often followed by the sacrifice of rectitude, as the only means to escape such brutal tyranny. Without advocating capital punishment, it may be allowable to suggest the query whether our city would not be benefited if all such unmanly offenders against propriety were to be tried by a jury of married women, and hanged without benefit of clergy. The following table will conclude this section. Question. If widowed, how long has your husband been dead? Length of time, numbers. Under six weeks, two. Under three months, six. Under six months, eight. Under seven months, one. Under eight months, two. Under one year, twenty-two. Under two years, thirty. Under three years, thirty-eight. Under four years, thirty-three. Under five years, twenty-four. Under six years, twenty-one. Under seven years, seventeen. Under eight years, eighteen. Under nine years, sixteen. Under ten years, thirteen. Ten years and upward, thirty-two. Time not specified, eleven. Total, two hundred ninety-four. It will be perceived that nineteen prostitutes have been widows less than one year, twenty-two for one year, thirty for two years, and so throughout the scale. The table presents but little necessity for observation, the principal conclusion to be drawn from it being that the majority of this class are driven to a course of vice from the destitution ensuing on the husband's death. It has been shown that a large number of them are very young, and it can be scarcely necessary to repeat that any young woman in a state of poverty will be surrounded with temptations she can with difficulty resist. Much as this state of society may be deplored, its existence cannot be denied. Question. Have you had any children? Condition of women. Replies. Total of women. Single. Yes, 357. No, 859.
Total of women, 1,216. Married, yes, 357, no, 133. Total of women, 490. Widowed, yes, 233, no, 61. Total of women, 294. Totals, yes, 947, no, 1,053. Total of women, 2,000. The women who reply to this question in the affirmative are single women, 357, or 30 percent, married women, 357, or 73 percent, widows, 233, or 79 percent. In continuation of this subject is the question, if you had children, how many? Number of women, condition of women, number of children born. 357, single women, 490. 357, married women, 791. 233, widows, 636. 947 women were mothers of 1,917. The replies give the total number of children born by each class. Thus, the single women have given birth to 491 children, the married women to 791 children, and the widows to 636 children. The following tables exhibit the same facts in a more extended form, showing the number of children which each woman has born, and specifying the sex. Question. If you have had children... How many? Replies of single women. Number of women. Born by each. Totals. Aggregate. One mother. Eight boys. Two girls. Totals. Eight boys. Two girls. Aggregate ten. Two mothers. Three boys three girls. Totals, six boys, six girls. Aggregate, twelve. Two mothers, two boys, three girls. Totals, four boys, six girls. Aggregate, ten. One mother, one boy, four girls. Totals, one boy, four girls. Aggregate, five. One mother. Three boys, two girls. Totals, three boys, two girls. Aggregate, five. One mother. One boy, three girls. Totals, one boy, three girls. Aggregate, four. One mother. Four boys. Totals, four boys. Aggregate, four. One mother. Three boys, one girl. Totals, three boys, one girl. Aggregate, four. Five mothers. Two boys, one girl. Totals, ten boys, five girls. Aggregate, Fifteen. Six mothers. One boy, two girls. Totals, six boys, twelve girls. Aggregate, eighteen. Three mothers. Three boys. Totals, nine boys. Aggregate, nine. Two mothers. Three girls. Totals, six girls. Aggregate, six. Thirty-three mothers. One boy, one girl. Totals, thirty-three boys, thirty-three girls. Aggregate, sixty-six. Four mothers. Two girls. Totals, eight girls. Aggregate, eight. Seventeen mothers. 
two boys totals thirty four boys aggregate thirty four one hundred fifty mothers one boy totals one hundred fifty boys aggregate one hundred fifty ninety nine mothers one girl totals ninety nine girls aggregate ninety nine twenty seven mothers one abortion totals twenty seven abortions aggregate twenty seven one mother four abortions totals four abortions aggregate four three hundred fifty seven mothers totals two hundred seventy two boys one hundred eighty seven girls thirty one abortions aggregate four hundred ninety replies of married women number of women born by each totals aggregate one mother seven boys eight girls totals seven boys eight girls aggregate fifteen two mothers seven boys seven girls totals fourteen boys fourteen girls aggregate twenty eight one mother seven boys six girls totals seven boys six girls aggregate thirteen one mother eight boys four girls totals eight boys four girls aggregate twelve one mother six boys six girls totals six boys six girls aggregate twelve one mother four boys six girls totals four boys six girls aggregate ten one mother five boys four girls totals five boys four girls aggregate nine two mothers four boys four girls totals eight boys eight girls aggregate sixteen two mothers three boys four girls totals six boys eight girls aggregate fourteen one mother seven boys totals seven boys aggregate seven one mother two boys four girls totals two boys four girls aggregate six six mothers four boys two girls totals twenty-four boys twelve girls aggregate thirty-six three mothers two boys three girls totals six boys nine girls aggregate fifteen seven mothers three boys two girls totals twenty-one boys fourteen girls aggregate thirty-five five mothers four boys one girl totals twenty boys five girls aggregate twenty-five three mothers four boys totals twelve boys aggregate twelve eight mothers two boys two girls totals sixteen boys sixteen girls aggregate thirty-two seven mothers three boys one girl totals twenty-one boys seven girls aggregate twenty-eight five mothers three girls totals fifteen girls aggregate fifteen eleven mothers three boys totals thirty-three boys aggregate thirty-three eleven mothers one boy two girls totals eleven boys twenty-two girls aggregate thirty-three twenty-three mothers two boys one girl totals forty-six boys twenty-three girls aggregate sixty-nine four mothers one boy one girl totals four boys 
four girls. Aggregate, eight. Twenty-eight mothers. Two girls. Totals, fifty-six girls. Aggregate, fifty-six. Twenty-eight mothers. Two boys. Totals, fifty-six boys. Aggregate, fifty-six. Seventy-four mothers. One girl. Totals, seventy-four girls. Aggregate, seventy-four. One hundred fifteen mothers. One boy. Totals, one hundred fifteen boys. Aggregate, one hundred fifteen. Four mothers. One abortion. Totals, four abortions. Aggregate, four. One mother. Three abortions. Totals, three abortions. Aggregate, three. Three hundred fifty seven mothers. Totals, four hundred fifty nine boys, three hundred twenty five girls, seven abortions. Aggregate, seven hundred ninety one. Replies of widows. Number of women. Born by each. Totals. Aggregates. One mother. Six boys, four girls. Totals. Six boys, four girls. Aggregates. Ten. Three mothers. Five boys, four girls. Totals. Fifteen boys, twelve girls. Aggregates. Twenty-seven. Two mothers. Six boys, three girls. Totals, twelve boys, six girls. Aggregate, eighteen. One mother. Six boys, two girls. Totals, six boys, two girls. Aggregate, eight. Six mothers. Three boys, four girls. Totals, eighteen boys, twenty-four girls. Aggregate, forty-two. One mother. Five boys, three girls. Totals, five boys, three girls. Aggregate, eight. Four mothers. Three boys, three girls. Totals, twelve boys, twelve girls. Aggregate, twenty-four. One mother. Five boys, one girl. Totals, five boys, one girl. Aggregate, six. One mother. Two boys, four girls. Totals, two boys, four girls. Aggregate, six. One mother. Four boys, two girls. Totals, four boys, two girls. Aggregate, six. Nine mothers. Three boys, two girls. Totals, twenty-seven boys, eighteen girls. Aggregate, forty-five. Five mothers, two boys, three girls. Totals, ten boys, fifteen girls. Aggregate, twenty-five. Two mothers, four boys, one girl. Totals, eight boys, two girls. Aggregate, ten. One mother, one boy, four girls. Totals, one boy, four girls. Aggregate, five. One mother, five boys. Totals, five boys. Aggregate, five. Three mothers, four boys. Totals, twelve boys. Aggregate, twelve. Nine mothers, two boys, two girls. Totals, eighteen boys, eighteen girls. Aggregate, thirty-six. Four mothers, one boy, three girls. Totals, Four boys, twelve girls. Aggregate, sixteen. One mother. Three boys, one girl. Totals, three boys, one girl. Aggregate, four. Four mothers. Three girls. Totals, twelve girls. Aggregate, twelve. Ten mothers. Three boys. Totals, thirty boys. Aggregate, thirty. Eleven mothers. 
one boy, two girls. Totals, eleven boys, twenty-two girls. Aggregate, thirty-three. Twenty mothers, two boys. Totals, forty boys. Aggregate, forty. Forty-seven mothers. One boy, one girl. Totals, forty-seven boys, forty-seven girls. Aggregate, ninety-four. Thirty mothers. One girl. Totals, thirty girls. Aggregate, thirty. Forty mothers. One boy. Total, forty boys. Aggregate, forty. One mother. Two abortions. Totals, two abortions. Aggregate, Two. Two hundred thirty three mothers. Totals three hundred sixty nine boys, two hundred sixty five girls, two abortions. Aggregate six hundred thirty six. Commencing with the offspring of single women, it will be seen that one was the mother of ten children, eight boys, and two girls. Two women gave birth to six children each. Four gave birth to five children each. Three gave birth to four children each. Sixteen gave birth to three children each. Fifty-four gave birth to two children each. Two hundred and forty-nine gave birth to one child each. Twenty-seven have suffered abortion once, and one has suffered in the same manner four times. The corresponding tables for married women and widows express similar facts in the same form. It is not necessary to quote them as the figures give all the required information. The results may be recapitulated thus. Boys, girls, abortions, totals. 357 single women bore 272 boys, 187 girls, 31 abortions. Totals, 490. 357 married women bore 459 boys, 325 girls, 7 abortions, totals 791. 233 widows bore 369 boys, 265 girls, 2 abortions, totals 636. 947 women bore 1,100 boys, 777 girls, 40 abortions, totals 1,917. Excess of male over female births, 223. Ratio of excess upon the total number born, 11 and 6 tenths percent. The next point claiming attention is the number of illegitimate children resulting from prostitution, based upon answers to the question, Were these children born in wedlock? Legitimate children of married women, 469. Legitimate children of widows, 358. Total legitimate, 827. Illegitimate children of single women, 490. Illegitimate children of married women, 322. Illegitimate children of widows, 279. Total illegitimate, 1,090. Aggregate, 1,917. The whole of the children born by single women are, of course, illegitimate. Of the children of married women over 40 percent, and of the children of widows 44 percent, are illegitimate. Taking the total number of children of the three classes and calculating upon this broad basis, it will appear that 1,090 illegitimate children were born giving an average of 57 percent, or, to speak in plain terms of every hundred children born by women who are now prostitutes, forty-three were born before the mothers, married women or widows, had embraced this course of life, and the remaining fifty-seven were the fruit of promiscuous intercourse, liable physically to inherit the diseases of the mother, morally to endure the disgrace attached to their birth, and very probably to be reared in the midst of blasphemy, obscenity, and vice, to follow in the footsteps of their parents, and perpetuate the sin to which they owe their origin. 
The excessive mortality among this class of children is developed in the following replies to the question, Are these children living or dead? Living children of single women, 133. Living children of married women, 334. Living children of widows, 265. Total living, 732. Dead children of single women, 357. Dead children of married women, 457. Dead children of widows, 371. Total dead, 1,185. Aggregate, 1,917. The ratio of mortality will be as follows. Children of single women, 73%. Children of married women, 58%. Children of widows, 59%. Average on the total number, 62%. Or more than six deaths for every ten children born. The average infantile mortality of New York City for three years is, under one year of age, 8,499. From one year to two years, 3,259. From two years to five years, 2,578. Total, 14,336. The population between those ages in 1855 was 77,568. This would give a mortality of 18 and one-half percent, or about one and three-quarters to every ten children under five years of age. It is not exceeding the bounds of probability to assume that the greater part of the children of prostitutes die before they reach the age of five years, which will give a pro rata mortality among that class of nearly four times the average ratio of New York City. This calculation must be taken in connection with the cases of abortion produced by extraneous means, not admitted in the replies to the interrogatories, and which will probably never be known. It is impossible to doubt that these are far more frequent than recorded in the tables. Under the heads of premature births and stillborn, the following numbers are reported. Years, premature births, stillborn, total. 1854, 435, 1,615, 2,050. 1855, 374, 1,564, 1,938. 1856, 387, 1,556, 1,943. Totals, 1,196, 4,735, 5,931. The births during the same period were 1854, 17,979, 1855, 14,145, 1856, 16,199, total 48,323. This would show a proportion of 12 and one half percent, or one to every eight of all the children born in New York City. It is not to be taken for granted that all these are the result of improper conduct, although unquestionably many are so. Applying the same ratio to the children of prostitutes, and calculating the 1,917 births in these tables as extending over a period of five years, would give 48 cases each year, but multiplying the average by four, the proportion of deaths from natural causes, we shall find the appalling number of 192 cases each year, an array of infantile mortality presenting features which place it almost on a level with the infanticide of some eastern nations. Were it possible to form any definite idea of the abortions actually procured, and which are suspected, on reasonable grounds, to amount to a very considerable number, the amount would be startling. The sacrifice of infant life, attributed to what cause you may, is one of the most deplorable results of prostitution, and urgently demands active interference. The attention of the American Medical Association has been drawn to this subject, 
and from a report on infant mortality in large cities by D. Meredith Rees, M. D. L. L. D., etc., published in their transactions, we extract, quote, The causes of mortality among children of tender age are, in a multitude of cases, to be found only by extending our inquiries to their intrauterine life and the physiological state of the parents, but especially the sanitary condition of the mothers, their hygienic and moral habits and circumstances. Celibacy should be required of all syphilitic persons of either sex. End quote. It will at once occur to the mind of the reader that enforced celibacy would not affect the maternity of prostitutes. They are liable to give birth to children, and as their physiological condition is such as to preclude the possibility of their children being healthy, the only way to check infant mortality in this class is to deal with the mothers, and adopt means, if not to prevent their infection, at least to limit the ravages of disease as much as possible. This point is discussed more fully in the chapter on remedial measures. To men tainted with syphilis the same course of reasoning would apply. If debarred from marriage, the sexual appetite would drive them to commerce with prostitutes, and their illegitimate children swell the total of mortality. The health of parents must be protected before we can hope for healthy children. Dr. Reese's very able pamphlet contains some remarks upon abortionism and its extent. Thus, quote, the ghastly crime of abortionism has become a murderous trade in many of our large cities, tolerated, connived at, and even protected by corrupt civil authorities. These murderers, for such they are, are well known to the police authorities. Their names, residents, and even their guilty customers are no secret. Would that it were only the profligate, or even the unfortunate of their sex, whose guilty fear or shame thus seeks to hide the evidence of illicit amours. End quote. That prostitution largely contributes to this crime cannot be doubted, but to what extent must remain unknown, from the secrecy which surrounds it. The revolting cases which appear at intervals in the daily papers are but a mere fraction of the total. Question. Are these children living with you, or where are they? Numbers. Children living with the mothers. Seventy-three. Children boarding at the expense of mothers, 247. Children boarding with mothers' relatives, 140. Children supporting themselves, 129. Children living with the fathers, 59. Children in public or charitable institutions, 36. Children adopted by families, 20. Children unascertained, 28. Totals? 659 and 73. Aggregate of children, 732. This table shows the social influences to which the survivors of this ill-fated band of children are exposed. There are 73 stated to be living with their mothers, and so far as they are concerned, no reasonable person can entertain any hopes as to their future morality. Born in the abodes of vice, their dwelling is in an atmosphere of squalid misery or sordid guilt. They never have a glimpse of a better life. They are marked from their cradles for a career of degradation. They can fall no lower, for they stand already on the lowest level. Such as these are denominated dangerous classes by the French authorities, and from their ranks are obtained many of the inmates of prisons and brothels. The children stated to be with their fathers, fifty-nine in number, it may be concluded, were born before the mothers fall from virtue, and are decidedly the most fortunate of any coming under notice, while those living with the parents or relatives of the mother, amounting to one hundred and forty, or boarding at the mother's expense, of whom there are two hundred and forty-seven, stand less chance of contamination than if actually residing within the domains of vice. Those living in public or charitable institutions exhibit one cause of taxation upon the general body of the citizens, and show that, indirectly, Every man in New York is compelled to contribute toward the maintenance of vice or its offspring. A visit to the public institutions on Blackwell's and Randall's Islands will prove that this is but one item of the expenses which prostitution inflicts upon the community. End of section 47 
Section 48 of The History of Prostitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 48. Chapter 33. New York Statistics. Part 1. Question. For what length of time have you been a prostitute? Table with first column time, second column numbers. One month, 71. Two months, 49. Three months, 76. Four months, 62. Five months, 51. Six months, 126. Seven months, 129. Eight months, seventeen. Nine months, twenty-one. Ten months, thirty-two. One year, three hundred and twenty-five. Two years, fifty-five. Three years, two hundred and forty-five. Four years, two hundred and three. Five years, one hundred and twenty-five. Six years, eighty-seven. Seven years, fifty-six. Eight years, Sixty-nine, nine years, thirty-two, ten years, twenty-six, eleven years, eight, twelve years, fourteen, thirteen years, six, fourteen years, seven, fifteen years, nine, sixteen years, thirteen, seventeen years, three, eighteen years, four, nineteen years, eight, twenty years, four, twenty-one years, two, twenty-two years, one, twenty-three years, two, twenty-four years, two, twenty-five years, one, twenty-seven years, one, twenty-nine years, one, thirty years, one, thirty-two years, one, thirty-four years, one, thirty-five years, one, an ascertained fifty-three. Total, 2,000. It has already been stated that the average duration of the life of a prostitute does not exceed four years from the commencement of her career. This is one year beyond the estimated duration as given by some English writers, but very far below the average as ascertained in Paris, in which city, at the time M. Parent de Châtelet instituted his elaborate system of investigation, he found in the gross number of 3,517 prostitutes 242 who had led that life for upward of 14 years, and 641 who had continued their course upward of 10 years. What a contrast to the table given above! In Paris, six and two-thirds percent had survived the horrors of courtesan life for 14 years. In New York, only two and three quarters percent have reached the same period. In Paris, seventeen and a half percent existed. In New York, three and three quarter percent exist after ten years of exposure. Or in other words, where seven exist in Paris, only three have survived in New York. Or where seventeen exist in Paris, only four survive in New York. It cannot be asserted that Paris is a more healthy city than New York, and this difference must arise from the fact that, while judicious arrangements are enforced in the former, a similar policy has not been recognized in the latter. If this relative mortality were the only fact known on this matter, the economy of human life would be an irresistible argument in favor of measures of supervision judiciously conceived and promptly executed. In the city of New York, 634 women, more than 31 per cent, have been on the town less than one year, and 325, or more than 17 per cent, for a space of time ranging from one to two years. Here, then, is one half of the total number, the experience of the remainder extending through various periods up to 35 years. With reference to those who assign such an extent of duration, it may be remarked, as was done in considering the question of age, that they are, with scarcely a solitary exception, those who, having been prostitutes in their younger days, 
are now engaged in brothel-keeping, and are thus exempted from many dangers attending the ordinary life of a harlot. If the same rule had been observed here in their cases, as was done in the inquiries at Paris, namely to exclude them from the list of prostitutes, the relative mortality given above would have shown still more unfavorably for New York. It may be asked, what peculiar dangers attend the life of a prostitute in this city? There is a frightful physical malady to which all are liable, and which will be alluded to under its proper head. There are other dangers to which prostitutes, in a greater or less degree, are exposed. It is not necessary to remind the reader that at intervals the public is shocked by accounts in our daily papers of cowardly and outrageous assaults upon these unfortunate women, perpetrated by ruffians of the other sex. Sometimes it is an onslaught made by a party of men for little or no provocation on the number of females, or it may be an attack of a paramour on his victim. To this latter description of ill-treatment common women are peculiarly liable, for, beyond their habits of promiscuous intercourse, almost every one of them, particularly those in the middle or lower classes, has attached herself to some indolent fellow who acts as her protector. Bully, or a lover, is the common designation, when she becomes involved in any difficulty with strangers, but who exercises an arbitrary and brutal control over her at other times. In many cases, singular as it may appear, an actual love is felt by the woman for her man. In others, it is a mere arrangement for mutual convenience, the man taking her part in all quarrels, and the woman providing funds to maintain him in idleness. The intemperate habits of the prostitutes also tend materially to shorten their lives. In addition to physical dangers must be considered the mental anguish they undergo, which inevitably preys upon the constitution. To this even the most depraved of them are at times subject. In the earlier stages of their career is an agonizing memory of the past, thoughts of home, regrets for the position they have lost. As they proceed in their course, they suffer from an anticipation of the future. The grave, a nameless pauper grave, yawns before them, thoughts of the inevitable eternity intrude, and a past of shame, a present of anguish, a future of dread, are the subjects of thought indulged by many who would never be suspected by the gay world of entertaining a serious reflection. It may be said, in the words of Byron, quote, But in an instant or so, winters of memory seem to roll, and gather in that drop of time a life of pain, an age of crime. End quote. The period for their nocturnal reverie returns, and, though with a breaking heart, they must deck themselves with tawdry finery, and forcing a smile upon their faces, resume a loathsome trade to earn their daily food. With such torments, physical and mental, can long life be expected as their lot? Can any human frame withstand these incessant attacks for a lengthened period? It would not be at all surprising if the ratio of mortality among prostitutes were greater than it is. Question have you had any disease incident to prostitution? If so, what? First column labeled disease, second attacks, third numbers. Gonorrhea, one attack, 153. Gonorrhea, two attacks, 53. Gonorrhea, three attacks, 44. Gonorrhea and syphilis, 36. Syphilis, one attack, 395. Syphilis, two attacks, 81. Syphilis, three attacks, 38. Syphilis, four attacks, 12. Syphilis, five attacks, 4. Syphilis, six attacks, 4. Syphilis, eight attacks, 1. Total attack, 821. The nature and effects of venereal disease have been already so fully specified in notices of the various systems adopted for its prevention, given in the preceding pages of this work, that it would be a needless repetition to dwell upon them here. It is sufficient for the present purpose to call attention to the fact that more than two-fifths of the total number of prostitutes examined during the investigation confess that they have suffered from syphilis or gonorrhea. The probability is that the real number far exceeds this average, 
that, alarming as is the confession, the actual facts are much worse. This opinion is based upon the results of professional experience, and a knowledge of the difficulty which exists in obtaining any voluntary reliable statement on the subject. Even assuming that the answers obtained are correct, they indicate ample cause for the perpetuation of the disease, and its introduction into almost every branch of society. One half of the total number who confess that they have suffered, or are suffering from this disease, state that they have been so afflicted once only. In other forms of sickness, which admit of a perfect cure, this would be no cause for alarm. But in this instance, it is a mooted point among medical writers whether the syphilitic taint can ever be eradicated from the system where it has been implanted, and the arguments on each side are urged with great ability. Without presuming to pass an opinion on the question, or expressing any doubt of the correctness of those learned men who think it possible to remove the taint from the body, it is policy to urge, in this case, the views of their opponents that it cannot be eradicated. Upon this ground, every citizen is competent to determine for himself the amount of public mischief resulting daily from a mass of prostitutes, two out of every five of whom are confessedly diseased. Question. What was the cause of your becoming a prostitute? First column labelled causes, second numbers. Inclination, 513. Destitution, 525. Seduce and abandoned, 258. Drink and the desire to drink, 181. Ill-treatment of parents, relatives or husbands, 164. As an easy life, 124. Bad company, 84. Persuaded by prostitutes, 71. Too idle to work, 29. Violated, 27. Seduced on board emigrant ships, 16. Seduced in emigrant boarding houses, 8. Total, 2,000. This question is probably the most important of the series, as the replies lay open to a considerable extent those hidden springs of evil which have hitherto been known only from the results. First in order stands the reply inclination, which can only be understood as meaning a voluntary resort to prostitution in order to gratify the sexual passions. 513 women, more than one-fourth of the gross number, give this as their reason. If their representations were borne out by facts, it would make the task of grappling with the vice a most arduous one, and afford very slight grounds to hope for any amelioration. But it is imagined that the circumstances which induced the ruin of most of those who gave the answer will prove that, if a positive inclination to vice was the proximate cause of the fall, it was but the result of other and controlling influences. In itself such an answer would imply an innate depravity, a want of true womanly feeling, which is actually incredible. The force of desire can neither be denied nor disputed, but still in the bosoms of most females that force exists in a slumbering state until aroused by some outside influences. No woman can understand its power until some positive cause of excitement exists. What is sufficient to awaken the dormant passion is a question that admits innumerable answers. Acquaintance with the opposite sex, particularly if extended so far as to become a reciprocal affection, will tend to this. So will the companionship of females who have yielded to its power, and so will the excitement of intoxication. But it must be repeated, and most decidedly, that without these or some other equally stimulating cause, the full force of sexual desire is seldom known to a virtuous woman. In the male sex, nature has provided a more susceptible organization than in females, apparently with the beneficent design of repressing those evils which must result from mutual appetite equally felt by both. In other words, man is the aggressive animal, so far as sexual desire is involved. Were it otherwise, and the passions in both sexes equal, illegitimacy and prostitution would be far more rife in our midst than at present. Some few of the cases in which the reply inclination was given are herewith submitted, with the explanation which accompanied each return. 
C.M., while virtuous, this girl had visited dance-houses where she became acquainted with prostitutes, who persuaded her that they led an easy, merry life. Her inclination was the result of female persuasion. E.C. left her husband and became a prostitute willingly, in order to obtain intoxicating liquors which had been refused her at home. E.R. was deserted by her husband because she drank to excess, and became a prostitute in order to obtain liquor. In this and the preceding case, inclination was the result solely of intemperance. A.J. willingly sacrificed her virtue to a man she loved. C.L. her inclination was swayed by the advice of women already on the town. J.J. continued this course from inclination after having been seduced by her lover. S.C. This girl's inclination arose from a love of liquor. Enough has been quoted to prove that, in many of the cases, what is called willing prostitution is the sequel of some communication or circumstances which undermine the principles of virtue and arouse the latent passions. Destitution is assigned as a reason in 525 cases. In many of these, it is unquestionably true that positive, actual want, the apparent and dreaded approach of starvation, was the real cause of degradation. The following instances of this imperative necessity will appeal to the understanding and the heart more forcibly than any arguments that could be used. As in all the selections already made, or that may be made hereafter, these cases are taken indiscriminately from the replies received, and might be indefinitely extended. During the progress of this investigation, in one of the lower wards of the city, attention was drawn to a pale but interesting-looking girl, about seventeen years of age, from whose replies the following narrative is condensed, retaining her own words as nearly as possible. Quote, I have been leading this life from about the middle of last January, 1856. It was absolute want that drove me to it. My sister, who was about three years older than I am, lived with me. She was deformed and a cripple from a fall she had while a child, and could not do any hard work. She could do a little sewing, and when we both were able to get work we could just make a living. When the heavy snowstorm came, our work stopped and we were in want of food and coals. One very cold morning, just after I had been to the store, the landlord's agent called for some rent we owed, and told us that, if we could not pay it, we should have to move. The agent was a kind man, and gave us a little money to buy some coals. We did not know what we were to do, and were both crying about it, when the woman who keeps this house, where she was then living, came in and brought some sewing for us to do that day. She said that she had been recommended to us by a woman who lived in the same house, but I have found out since that she had watched me, and only said this for an excuse. When the work was done, I brought it home here. I had heard of such places before, but had never been inside one. I was very cold, and she made me sit down by the fire, and began to talk to me, saying how much better off I should be if I would come and live with her. I told her I could not leave my sister, who was the only relation I had, and could not help herself, but she said I should be able to help my sister, and that she would find some light sewing for her to do, so that she should not want. She talked a good deal more, and I felt inclined to do as she wanted me, but then I thought how wicked it would be, and at last I told her I would think about it. When I got home and saw my sister so sick as she was, and wanting many little things that we had no money to buy, and no friends to help us to, my heart almost broke. However, I said nothing to her then. I laid awake all night thinking, and in the morning I made up my mind to come here. I told her what I was going to do, and she begged me not, but my mind was made up. She said it would be sin, and I told her that I should have to answer for that and that I was forced to do it because there was no other way to keep myself and help her, and I knew she could not work much for herself, and I was sure she would not live a day if we were turned into the streets. She tried all she could to persuade me not, but I was determined, and so I came here. I hated the thoughts of such a life, and my only reason for coming was that I might help her. I thought that, if I had been alone, I would sooner have starved, but I could not bear to see her suffering." She only lived a few weeks after I came here. I broke her heart. I do not like the life. I would do almost anything to get out of it. But now that I have once done wrong, I cannot get anyone to give me work, and I must stop here unless I wish to be starved to death. 
End quote. This plain and affecting narrative needs no comment. It reveals the history of many an unfortunate woman in this city, and while it must appear to every sensitive heart, it argues most forcibly for some intervention in such cases. The following statements of other women who have suffered and fallen in a similar manner will show that the proceeding is not an isolated case. M. M., a widow with one child, earned one dollar fifty cents per week as a tailoress. J. Y., a servant, was taken sick while in a situation, spent all her money, and could get no employment when she recovered. M. T., quoting her own words, had no work, no money, and no home. S. F., a widow with three children, could earn two dollars weekly at cap-making, but could not obtain steady employment even at those prices. M. F. had been out of place for some time and had no money. E. H. earned from two to three dollars per week as tailoress, but had been out of employment for some time. L. C. G., the examining officer reports in this case, quote, This girl, a tailoress, is a stranger without any relations. She received a dollar and a half a week, which would not maintain her, end quote. M. C., a servant, who was receiving five dollars a month. She sent all her earnings to her mother, and soon after lost her situation when she had no means to support herself. M. S., also a servant, received one dollar a month wages. A. B. landed in Baltimore from Germany, and was robbed of all her money the very day she reached the shore. M. F., a shirt-maker, earned one dollar a week. E. M. G., the captain of police in the district where this woman resides, says, quote, this girl struggled hard with the world before she became a prostitute, sleeping in station houses at night and living on bread and water during the day. End quote. He adds, quote, In my experience of three years, I have known over fifty cases whose history would be similar to hers and who are now prostitutes. End quote. These details give some insight into the undercurrent of city life. The most prominent fact is that a large number of females, both operatives and domestics, earned so small wages that a temporary cessation of their business, or being a short time out of a situation, is sufficient to reduce them to absolute distress. Provident habits are useless in their cases, for, much as they may feel the necessity, they have nothing to save, and the very day that they encounter a reverse sees them penniless. The struggle a virtuous girl will wage against fate in such circumstances may be conceived. It is a literal battle for life and in the result life is too often preserved only by the sacrifice of virtue. Seduced and abandoned. 258 women make this reply. These numbers give but a faint idea of the actual total that should be recorded under the designation, as many who are included in other classes should doubtless have been returned in this. It has already been shown that under the answer inclination are comprised the responses of many who were the victims of seduction before such inclination existed, and there can be no question that among those who assign drink and the desire to drink as the cause of their becoming prostitutes may be found many whose first departure from the rules of sobriety was actuated by a desire to drive from their memories all recollections of their seducers' falsehoods. Of the number who were persuaded by women, themselves already fallen, to become public courtesans, it is but reasonable to conclude that many had previously yielded their honour to some lover under false protestations of attachment and fidelity. It is needless to resort to argument to prove that seduction is a vast social wrong, involving in its consequences not only the entire loss of female character, but also totally destroying the consciousness of integrity on the part of the male sex. It matters not under what circumstances the crime may be perpetrated. None can be found that will exonerate the active offender from the imputation of fraud and treachery. A woman's heart longs for a reciprocal affection, and, to ensure this, she will occasionally yield her honour to her lover's importunities, but only when her attachment has become so concentrated upon its object as to invest him with every attribute of perfection to find in every word he utters and every action he performs but some token of his devotion to her. Love is then literally a passion, an idolatry, and his power is universally acknowledged. But this passion cannot be the growth of an hour. Its developments are gradual. From the first stage of mere acquaintance, it ripens progressively under the influence of tender words and solemn vows, frequently sincere, but often simulated, 
until the woman owns to herself and admits to her lover that she regards him with affection. Such an acknowledgment, virtually placing her future life in his custody, should inspire him with the high resolve to protect her name and fame, to justify the confidence she has reposed. But not unfrequently is it made the medium for dishonourable exactions, and for a momentary gratification valueless to him except as a proof of her fervent adoration, and fatal in its consequences to her, he tramples on the priceless jewel of her honour, confidingly surrendered to this love and truth. It should be remembered that, in order to accomplish this base end, he must have resorted to base means, must either have professed a love he did not feel, or have allowed his affection to cool as he approached its consummation. Pure and sincere attachment would effectually prevent the lover from performing any act which could possibly compromise the woman he adores. None but an unmitigated ruffian can calmly and deliberately wrong an unsuspecting female who has acknowledged a tender sentiment towards him, thus placing herself so entirely in his power. The crime of seduction can be viewed only as a mean and atrocious perjury, and strangely callous must he be whose conscience in after-life does not pursue him with scorpion stings and fiery tortures. But how account for the participation of the female in the crime? simply by viewing it as an idolatry of devotion which is willing to surrender all to the demands of him she worships, to the intensity of her affections which absorbs all other considerations, to a perfect insanity of love, excited and sustained by a supposed equal devotion to herself. As soon as this conviction of a mutual love possesses her mind, as soon as her heart responds to its magic touch, she lives in a new atmosphere, her individuality is lost. Her thoughts revert only to her lover. Devoted to the promotion of his happiness, she thinks not of her own, and only when it is too late does she awake from the spell that lures her to destruction. In such a case as this, a woman does not merit the contempt with which her conduct is visited. She has sinned from weakness, not from vice. She has been made the victim of her own unbounded love, her heart's richest and purest affections. Moralists say that all human passions should be held in check by reason and virtue, and none can deny the truthfulness of the assertion. But while they apply the sentiment to the weaker party, who is the sufferer, would it not be advisable to recommend the same restraining influences to him who is the inflictor? No woman possessed of the smallest share of decency or the slightest appreciation of virtue would voluntarily surrender herself without some powerful motive not pre-existent in herself, but imparted by a destroyer. Well aware of the world's opinion, she would not recklessly defy it, and precipitate herself into an abyss of degradation and shame, unless some overruling influence had urged her forward. This motive and this influence, it is believed, may be uniformly traced to her weak but truly feminine dependence upon another's vows. Naturally unsuspicious herself, she cannot believe that the being whom she has almost deified can be aught but good and noble and trustworthy. Sincere in her own professions, she believes there is equal sincerity in his protestations. Willing to sacrifice all to him, she feels implicitly assured that he will protect her from harm. Thus, there can be little doubt that, in most cases of seduction, female virtue is trustingly surrendered to the specious arguments and false promises of dishonourable men. The everyday experiences of life are amply sufficient to justify this opinion, for it is a fact that these specious arguments and false promises are continually resorted to by many men for the express purposes of seduction, and, nefarious as these cases confessedly are, still they form common incidents in the lives of some who claim to be what the world calls respectable, men who, in the ordinary relations of life, would scruple to defraud their neighbours of a dollar, do not hesitate to rob a confiding woman of her chastity. They who, in a business point of view, would regard obtaining goods under false pretenses as an act to be visited with all the severity of the law, hesitate not to obtain by even viler fraud the surrender of woman's virtue to their fiendish lust. Is there no inconsistency in the social laws which condemn a swindler to the state prison for his offences, and condemn a woman to perpetual infamy for her wrongs? Undoubtedly there are cases where the woman is the seducer, 
but these are so rare as to be hardly worth mentioning. Seduction is a social wrong. Its entire consequences are not comprised in the injury inflicted on the woman, or the sense of perfidy oppressing the conscience of the man. Beyond the fact that she is, in the ordinary language of the day, ruined, the victim has endured an attack upon her principles which must materially affect her future life. The world may not know of her transgression, and in consequence public obloquy may not be added to her burden, but she is too painfully conscious of her fall, and every thought of her lacerated and bleeding heart is embittered with a sense of man's wrong and outrage. Memory points to the many bright passages in their acquaintance, and says, These shun but to ensnare you, to the many tokens of endearment received from her betrayer, and says, These were but so many arguments to effect your ruin. To the many vows he breathed, and says, These were but perjury. To the many smiles with which he was greeted, and says, These were but so many hypocritical devices. She remembers the thrill of joy with which her heart so gaily bounded when he first told her she was beloved, and she contrasts her ecstasy then with her agonies now. She remembers with detestation the caresses he was wont to bestow. But, above all, she remembers, and her blood boils with indignation as the thought is forced upon her, that by these means he has wrought her shame. She has learned in the school of sorrow that man's promises of fidelity are valueless, and her future life, whether spent in sorrow and repentance for the past, or in a wild, impetuous career of subsequent vice, will be indelibly marked with the remembrance of his treachery. It cannot be a matter of surprise that, with this feeling of injustice and insult burning at her heart, her career should be one in which she becomes the aggressor and man the victim, for it is a certain fact that in this desire of revenge upon the sex for the falsehood of one will be found a cause of the increase of prostitution. The probabilities of a decrease in the crime of seduction are very slight, so long as the present public sentiment prevails, while the seducer is allowed to go unpunished, and the full measure of retribution is directed against his victim, while the offender escapes, but the offended is condemned. Unprincipled men, ready to take advantage of woman's trustful nature, abound, and they pursue their diabolical course unmolested. Legal enactments can scarcely ever reach them, although sometimes a poor man without friends or money is indicted and convicted. The remedy must be left to the world at large. When our domestic relations are such that a man known to be guilty of this crime can obtain no admission into the family circle, when the virtuous and respectable members of the community agree that no such man shall be welcomed to their society, when worth and honour assert their supremacy over wealth and boldness, there may be hopes of a reformation, but not till then. The following cases will exhibit some of the results of seduction. M. C., a native of Pennsylvania, seventeen years of age, was induced to run away from home with her lover, who promised to marry her as soon as they reached Philadelphia. Instead of keeping his word, he deserted her. She was afraid to go home, and had no means of living except by prostitution, which he practiced for eight months in Philadelphia, and then came to New York to reside. Her father, a physician, died when she was about ten years old, and her mother subsequently married a hotel-keeper, in whose house the girl was reared, and to the associations of which she probably, to some extent, owes her fall from virtue. In one of the most aristocratic houses of prostitution in New York was found the daughter of a merchant, a man of large property, residing in one of the southern states. She was a beautiful girl, had received a superior education, spoke several languages fluently, and seemed keenly sensible of her degradation. Two years before this time she had been on a visit to some relations in Europe, and on her return voyage in one of her father's vessels she was seduced by the captain, and became pregnant. He solemnly asserted that he would marry her as soon as they reached their port, but the ship had no sooner arrived than he left her. The poor girl's parents would not receive her back into their family, and she came to New York and prostituted herself for support. A. B., the child of respectable parents in Germany, was seduced in her native place by a man to whom she was attached. He promised to marry her if she would accompany him to the United States. She obtained the permission and necessary funds from her parents, and two days after they landed in New York, her seducer deserted her, carrying off all the money she had brought from home. 
H. P., a schoolgirl, sixteen years of age, was seduced by a married man who now visits her occasionally. C. A. was seduced in New Jersey, brought to New York, and deserted among strangers. M. R. was seduced by her employer, a married man. A. W. was seduced while at school in Troy, New York, and was ashamed to return to her parents. L. H. followed a lover from England who had promised to marry her. When she arrived in New York, he seduced and diseased her, and then she discovered that he was a married man. There is no necessity to multiply these cases. End of section 48《Section 49 of the History of Prostitution》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The History of Prostitution by William Sanger. Section 49. Chapter 33. New York Statistics. Part 2. Drink and the Desire to Drink. We will alter an old saying and render it, when a woman drinks, she is lost. It will be conceded that the habit of intoxication in woman, if not an indication of the existence of actual depravity or vice, is a sure precursor of it, for drunkenness and debauchery are inseparable companions, one almost invariably following the other. In some cases, a woman living in service becomes a drunkard. She forms acquaintances among the depraved of her own sex, and willingly joins their ranks. Married women acquire the habit of drinking, and forsake their husbands and families, to gratify not so much their sexual appetite as their passion for liquor. Young women are often persuaded to take one or two glasses of liquor, and then their ruin may be soon expected. Others are induced to drink spirits in which a narcotic has been infused to render them insensible to their ruin. In short, it is scarcely possible to enumerate the many temptations which can be employed when intoxicating drinks are used as the agent. Ill-treatment of parents, husbands, or relatives is a prolific cause of prostitution, 164 women assigning it as a reason for their fall. In consideration of their important relations to society, it may be well to inquire what are the duties of parents, husbands, and relatives. In all countries where the obligations of the marriage contract are recognized, one of its most stringent requirements is found in the necessity to provide for the children of such union. This is acknowledged as a moral duty on account of the relationship between parents and children. It is recognized as a religious duty because especially enjoined in holy writ, and it is regarded as a civil duty because the future welfare of any community must depend upon the training of its future citizens. As to the moral duty, what arguments would be effectual to prove to a hard-hearted parent the necessity of bestowing a kindly education upon his child? Surely nature itself would supply all the necessary reasons. The still, small voice of conscience will whisper to him, I have been the instrument of bringing this child into the world, and I am therefore responsible for its welfare. And even plain old-fashioned common sense— despised as it is since a certain philosophy has come into fashion, would say, I am the father of a child, and it is my interest to do the best I can for it. The religious duties are abundantly enforced in the scriptures. These, while requiring in explicit terms the obedience of children to their parents, and annexing to such commandment the only promise which the Decalogue contains, are equally plain in specifying the duties of parents. These points are acknowledged by all sects and parties, and commentators or preachers, however much they may differ on questions of theology, or articles of faith, or rules of church government, are unanimous upon the extent of parental obligation. The civil duties are important for the reason already assigned. Children will be our successors in this arena, as we have succeeded the patriot fathers who achieved our independence, and made us the people that we are. The principles enunciated by every shot fired during the Revolutionary War have descended to us, but we are only trustees for their safe transmission to the next generation, and we shall be recreant to our duty, false to the memory of our ancestors, and traitors to our country, 
if we allow our children to assume the responsibilities that will naturally devolve upon them without due preparation for the sacred trust. Having thus briefly alluded to the duties of parents, it remains to give some information as to the manner in which such obligations are performed, selected from the returns received in the progress of this investigation. L. M., a very well-educated girl, I was seduced at eighteen years of age and forced to leave home to hide my disgrace. Admitting that this girl had been led into an error, the plain duty of her parents in every point of view was to endeavour to reform her instead of driving her from home. Human nature in its most favourable condition is fallible. All are liable to error, but as all hope for forgiveness, so should they forgive. This is the doctrine of the sublime prayer taught by our Saviour to his apostles, this is the duty of humanity. The bruised reed he will not break is a divine promise from which poor finite man might draw a valuable lesson. E.B. My parents wanted me to marry an old man, and I refused. I had a very unhappy home afterward. This case was directly in conflict with the dictates of nature. She had formed an attachment for a man who would, in all human probability, have made her a good husband and caused her to remain a virtuous member of society, but her parents wanted her to marry an old man, and, in consequence of refusal, treated her with unkindness. She has now, poor girl, to answer for her sin of incontinence, but who can tell what other offences would have been laid to her charge had she married as desired by her parents? How many awful deeds recorded in the annals of criminal jurisprudence have been produced by ill-assorted marriages? How many outrages, how much bloodshed, owe their origin to such a cause? Parents who, for their own selfish purposes, would drive a daughter into a marriage repugnant to her feelings, deserve the severest condemnation. So far from performing their duty in the matter, they are acting in diametrical opposition to it. C.B., my stepmother ill-used me. The stepmother in this case stands in the place of the natural parent. In assuming the duties, she assumes all the responsibilities of the relation, and is equally guilty as if this girl were her own child. Women's feelings in a normal state are generally kind, gentle, and forgiving, but when they are perverted, she becomes more inveterate than men. So it was in this instance. E.G. My mother ill-treated me and drove me from home. My father was very kind, but he died when I was seven years old. A similar case to the proceeding in the perversion of feminine feelings, coupled with the melancholy fact that the girl's father, who had always used her kindly, died when she was a child. It would be natural to conclude that all the affections of a widow would concentrate upon her children, but the reverse of this is too frequently found to be true and as soon as the husband to whom her vows were pledged is laid in the grave, and the children are deprived of his protecting hand, her love is alienated from them. A mother's duties to her offspring are increased by her husband's death, but she neglects them, and does violence to the maternal instinct. M.B. I support my mother. It may possibly be objected that this case does not come within the scope of this section as showing no positive neglect of parental duty, but, by implication, it is decidedly entitled to a place in the catalogue. It is, unfortunately, for the sake of morality, but one of many similar instances which have been encountered, and some of which will be noticed in due course. The self-evident conclusion is that if this mother had properly trained her daughter in early life, she would not now have to endure the agony arising from the knowledge that every morsel of food she eats, every article of clothing she wears, is purchased with the proceeds of her child's shame. It is difficult to imagine any position more disgusting than this, any circumstance more horrible than that of a mother quietly depending for existence upon the prostitution of a daughter, with the certainty that the inevitable result of such a vicious course of life will drive the child of her affection to a premature grave and a dreadful eternity. J. C. My father accused me of being a prostitute when I was innocent. He would give me no clothes to wear. My mother was a confirmed drunkard, and used to be away from home most of the time. Here we have a combination of horrors scarcely equalled in the field of romance. The unjust accusations of the father, and his conduct in not supplying his child with the actual necessaries of life, joined with the drunkenness of the mother, present such an accumulation of cruelty and vice that it would have been a miracle had the girl remained virtuous. 
it is to be presumed that no one will claim for this couple the performance of any one of the duties enjoined by their position. S.S. I had no work and went home. My father was a drunkard and ill-treated me and the rest of the family. Here is a specimen of a father's cruelty. His daughter is out of employment and has no home but with her parents, and he, maddened with liquor, abuses her for flying to her natural protectors. Where was she to expect aid and comfort but from the authors of her being, and how was such expectation realized? She was forced to resort to prostitution as a means of living. C.R. My parents are rich. They would not let me live at home because I had been seduced. In this case there was no excuse for parental unkindness. Blessed with an ample supply of this world's treasures, they could calmly see their daughter exposed to want and penury. Living in the enjoyment of opulence themselves, they could doom her to earn a miserable subsistence by a life of shame. Satisfied with their own lot, and complacently surveying the comforts which surrounded them, they condemned her to a cause of infamy in which no enjoyment could be found to cheer her path where every day must add fresh tortures to her lot, every hour sink her yet lower in the social scale. Why? Because an indiscretion or a crime, call it which you please, had made her a fitting object for their kindness, because her own act had placed her in a position where she felt her disgrace, and asked their sympathy and aid to retrace her steps. Can there be a more pitiable object than a woman who has sacrificed her virtue to the importunity, the entreaties, or the vows of her lover, when she reflects upon her conduct? The delirium of love is past, but the overwhelming sense of shame is left. She feels that a momentary act has blasted her future life. She knows that the world will condemn her, and the only resource she has is an appeal to her parents. If they kindly take her by the hand, in all probability the evil will extend no farther, and she may regain her position in life. If they refuse their sympathy, they practically drive her to a course of vice, for there is no other road open to her. Who then is responsible for her after-career but those who have the power to preserve her from farther guilt and shame? J. A. I am the eldest of a large family. My father is a drunkard and would not support his children. I have supported my parents, brothers and sisters for the last five years. This is an example of an outrageous social crime which cannot be contemplated without horror. The parents of a family, with their remaining children, relying for subsistence upon the aid furnished from the sinful earnings of the firstborn. In this instance, the economy of nature is reversed. The filial affection which leads a child to support her aged and infirm parents can be understood and appreciated, but it is impossible to reprobate too severely the conduct of a man whose own actions have reduced him to poverty, and who then encourages his daughter to lead a life of prostitution that he may revel on money produced by a cause of debauchery which he was mainly instrumental in producing. A. B. My lover seduced and diseased me while I was working in a factory. I went home and my parents turned me out. Neither laws of character nor physical suffering were sufficient punishment for this poor girl, only eighteen years of age, nor could the probability of a future moral life induce her parents to pardon the first offence. They had sent her to work amid associations which were almost certain to cause her ruin. This of itself is a sufficient ground for their condemnation, for they were in comfortable circumstances and could not plead poverty as an excuse. And when this ruin was accomplished, they added to their former crime by refusing a shelter to the sufferer. These cases are taken from actual facts. The words included in inverted commas are, as nearly as possible, those used by the women when being questioned. As to the truth of the statements, we hesitate not to believe them all to be substantially correct. They are not a fiftieth part of the instances in which similar disclosures have been made, but they are sufficient for the purpose of argument, and to prove that the assertions made in other places rest upon a solid foundation, and are not mere fancies of the brain. It would certainly be much more to the credit of society if their authenticity were not so indisputable. The foregoing examples strongly suggest and justify a farther consideration of the duties of parents. While these include the obligation to furnish a child with food and clothing, they do not stop at that point. 
It would be erroneous, indeed, for any father to imagine he had fulfilled all the requirements of his position when he gave a child enough to eat and to wear. He would attend to the wants of his cattle in the same way, but there is something more to be done in the case of his children. He must so treat them as to induce, on their part, a sentiment of gratitude. Children are proverbially keen-sighted, and they seem to have a natural faculty for logic, so far as they themselves are concerned. They can very soon discriminate whether a parent is doing barely just as much as the laws of the country and the voice of public opinion require, or whether he is acting toward them with true paternal affection. In the former case they become selfish, and practice all their little arts to obtain as many advantages that the law allows them as possible, without entertaining any feelings of respect or affection toward their parents, because they know that such obligations cannot be evaded without censure. In the latter case, their gratitude and affection forms a return for the kindness bestowed. They immediately perceive that they are loved, and, as a natural consequence, endeavour to manifest love in return, by acting in a manner most pleasing to their parents. By simply encouraging this sentiment, children can be moulded much as the father wishes, whereas, by destroying it, he loses one of the most effective aids to his government. There are so many different ways by which this affection for children can be manifested, and they are all so simple and so certainly effective, that it is scarcely possible to conceive how any man or woman of the most ordinary intelligence can overlook them. In addition to providing for the personal wants of his family, their education claims a large portion of the parents' care. Not only the mere tuition imparted in schools, but a careful training at home, as preliminary to their conflict with the world, is required. It is the instruction and advice given in the quiet of the domestic circle that exercises the most powerful influence, most effectually shapes the destiny of the future man or woman. No person is justified in delaying the performance of this duty. So soon as a child can talk and walk, so soon is this guidance necessary. It would be an interesting and important matter of investigation to ascertain, if possible, the time of life at which children become influenced by the temptations which surround them. The result would show a much earlier age than is generally supposed. A boy, when playing with his companions, overhears an improper expression from one of them. His mind retains it, and it may prove the germ from which habits of profanity subsequently spring. A girl may notice an improper action which will rest upon her memory and produce sad fruit hereafter. Thus the education of children for the ordinary duties of life cannot be commenced too soon. If delayed, the probabilities are that, when you attempt to cultivate the soil in after years, you will find it already choked with weeds, which require more time and trouble to eradicate than would the inculcation of proper principles in early life. A lady remarked upon one occasion, in presence of an eminent preacher, that she thought children should not be trained to any religious exercises until they had arrived at an age when they could fully understand such subjects. The reply of the aged minister is appropriate to the present subject. He said, Madam, if you do not implant good doctrines in your children's minds before that time, the devil will fill them with mischievous ones. A somewhat prevalent error in the training of children must not be passed unnoticed, namely, excessive rigidity. This practice is common in many well-meaning but unthinking families professing Christianity. Everything is conducted with as much mathematical precision as if they were demonstrating a problem in Euclid. Such a system is open to very grave objections from the numerous cases in which it has proved prejudicial to the child's best interests. It acts precisely like the spring of a watch which you can retain in a fixed position by a mechanical contrivance, but which resumes its elasticity and power the moment the pressure is removed. Children's minds are elastic also. You can confine them within any circle you please by the exercise of parental authority, but in a large proportion of cases the end sought to be attained is surely defeated. Many justly blame this cause for the mishaps of their future lives. It presents virtue and a religion in a repulsive aspect, picturing them only as connected with asceticism, not recognizing the beauty and happiness which are their chief attractions. Thus is engendered in the minds of children an intuitive dislike for what they are taught to consider as a bondage. It is not uncommon to hear men describe the way in which their youthful Sabbaths were spent, and attribute to the irksome monotony of that day's discipline their subsequent distaste for even a few hours' confinement in church. 
this strictness, like ambition, overleaps itself, and extinguishes the spirit it is designed to foster. The proper way to educate children for lives of usefulness, honour and happiness, the most effective plan to reach the desired end, is to cultivate their affections and reason, instead of repressing the one and fettering the other by stringent applications of arbitrary rule. But no man or woman can educate children properly unless their precepts are confirmed by example. Talk to your son as long as you please upon the advantages of temperance, and then let him see you in a state of intoxication the next day, and all your labour will be fruitless. Enlarge in the presence of your daughter upon the value of integrity, and then allow her to hear you utter a falsehood, and she will contrast the theory and practice, and conclude that the former is worthless. Parents must educate themselves before they can hope to instruct their children, and must lead a life in conformity with the principles they teach, if they expect any beneficial results from their endeavours. Before leaving this part of the subject, another matter may be mentioned, namely the necessity of winning the confidence of children. Their hearts pine for sympathy. If they are in trouble, encourage them to reveal their perplexities to you. Sigh with them when they are sad, and rejoice with them when they are happy. A girl who has been in the habit of imparting all her childish sorrows to her mother, and has there found a heart which would beat in unison with her own, will not withhold her confidence as she grows in years. Remember that children, while a blessing to their parents, are also a responsibility. You have the power to train them for good or evil. You can win their trust or inspire them with distrust. You can make them useful members of society or render them nuisances to the community. To you their destiny is confided to a great extent, and from you will be required an account of the stewardship. The length to which these observations have been extended can be justified by the importance of the subject, and the conviction that a more careful fulfilment of parental duties would go very far toward diminishing prostitution. Every man must admit it to be his duty to aid in effecting this desirable consummation, and while it would be utopian to imagine that the vice can be eradicated by family influences, it is reasonable to conclude that its extent may be materially curtailed. Great as are the duties and responsibilities of a father, they are equalled by those devolving upon a husband. He has to provide for the welfare of his wife besides caring for the interests of his children. When he marries, he vows to remain faithful to the woman of his choice, to love, honour, and cherish her so long as they both shall live. This is an implied oath, if not audibly expressed in all circumstances, and any violation of it is neither more nor less than perjury. Of course, the obligation is a mutual one. The wife is bound by the same ties, and in as stringent a form as the husband. It cannot be said that every case of prostitution in a married woman is the result of her husband's misconduct, but it is notorious that many women are induced or compelled by such misconduct to abandon a life of virtue. All married prostitutes cannot be exonerated from the charge of guilt, yet the facts which will be hereafter quoted prove that many were driven to a life of shame by those who had solemnly sworn to protect and cherish them. The violation of any known duty is a positive crime against society, but it becomes increased in magnitude when it involves more than one person in the offence. It is then the cause of a second transgression, and sophistry would vainly attempt to prove that the man who committed the first and caused the commission of the second offence was not morally responsible for both. Descending from generalities, it may be truly asserted that the man whose conduct to his wife is such as to lead her to vicious practices is guilty in both respects. Here are some few cases in point. C.C. My husband deserted me and four children. I had no means to live. In this case the husband violated the law of God in forcibly rending the matrimonial bond and violated the laws of his country by leaving his wife and children as burdens on society. For the former of these offences he must answer at the bar of infinite justice. For the latter, he is liable to punishment in this world. Then why not punish him? asks someone. For the very simple reason that he could not be found. In this day, the law does not assume the latitude claimed by the Spanish Inquisition, and sentence a man to punishment without giving him an opportunity to plead his cause. 
a woman in a state of destitution, with four hungry children looking to her for bread, has neither time nor means to pursue a delinquent husband. Her present necessities require her immediate attention, and so he escapes the penalty the laws have awarded, and can live, although it may be with an uneasy conscience, in some other place, and probably repeat there the iniquities he has practised here. The custom of deserting wives and children would receive a severe check were it possible in every instance to enforce the legal provisions respecting abandonment. J.S. My husband committed adultery. I caught him with another woman, and then he left me. This individual's turpitude was enhanced by his boldness. He seems to have recklessly defied all consequences, to have been entirely callous to any sense of shame, and, when detected in his adulterous intercourse, he adds desertion to his offence. He regarded not the feelings of her whom in early life he had won to his side by vows of affection. He outraged the laws of decency, and trampled upon the statutes of his country. His wife's agony may be conceived, although words would be faint to express it, and the mental sufferings she must have endured before she abandoned herself to indiscriminate prostitution as a means of living will not aggravate her offence. A. G. My husband eloped with another woman. I support the child. Here the husband was morally as guilty as in the previous case, but without the disgusting bravado which characterized that. He had, however, another claim which should have secured his fidelity, namely an infant child but this tie was powerless to restrain him. Fascinated by the charms of another, forgetting all the rights of his wife, all the obligations of paternity, and all the requirements of morality, he basely abandoned those dependent upon him, and forced the wife, whose virtue he was bound to protect, into a career of vice to support his child. A. B. My husband accused me of infidelity, which was not true. I only lived with him five months. I was pregnant by him, and after my child was born I went on the town to support it. The first idea derived from this statement would be that five months of matrimonial life had been sufficient to change this husband from a devoted lover to a revengeful tyrant, who would not scruple to resort to a groundless accusation to effect his purpose. In this short space of time he conveniently forgot the promises he had made, repudiated the bonds in which his own act had placed him, and, to accomplish a separation for his wife, did not hesitate to bear false witness against her, placing her in a position from which she could extricate herself only by performing a logical impossibility, namely, by proving a negative. Nor could the probable destiny of his unborn child influence his determination. It mattered not to him whether the infant first saw the light in a den of infamy, nor whether his unkindness killed it before it was born, so that he could desert his wife. Neither did it make any difference to him whether she starved to death or maintained her existence by the most loathsome means. He was satiated with possession, and neither the voice of nature nor the dictates of conscience could arrest his purpose. The result was precisely what might have been expected. She became a prostitute rather than starve and let her child starve. R.B. My husband brought me here, a house of ill fame. I did not know what kind of a place it was. He lives with me, and I follow prostitution. Another variety of unnatural conduct. The wife in this case was a very good-looking young woman, not exceeding eighteen years of age. The husband held a respectable and well-paid employment, and was in possession of ample means to support her. By false representations, he induced her, within three months after marriage, to board in a fashionable house of prostitution. She soon discovered its character, but eventually succumbed to his orders, and became guilty. He resides with her, and is supported by her. What language can be used adequately to denounce such a cold-blooded piece of treachery on the part of a wretch claiming to be human? L.W. I came to this city from Illinois with my husband. When we got here, he deserted me. I have two children dependent on me. This man brought his wife from a distant state to a strange city, where she had no friends nor relatives to advise and assist her, and there abandoned her, with two helpless children, to the mercy of the world. Had he left her where she had been living previously, it is possible she might have found sufficient friends to assist her until she was able to support herself. But with a refinement of cruelty, he transferred her to a place where she was unknown, and then effected his escape. 
the entire circumstances favour the supposed existence of a determination to abandon her as soon as they arrived in New York, where he could act thus with more safety than in her native place. C.H. I was married when I was seventeen years old, and have had three children. The two boys are living now, the girl is dead. My oldest boy is nearly five years old, and the other one is eighteen months. My husband is a sailor. We lived very comfortably till my last child was born, and then he began to drink very hard, and did not support me, and I have not seen him or heard anything about him for six months. After he left me, I tried to keep my children by washing or going out to day's work, but I could not earn enough. I never could earn more than two or three dollars a week when I had work, which was not always. My father and mother died when I was a child. I had nobody to help me, and could not support my children, so I came to this place. My boys are now living in the city, and I support them with what I earn by prostitution. It was only to keep them that I came here. These were the words used by an honest, sorrowful-looking woman encountered in the course of this investigation in the fourth police district of the city. No reasonable doubt can be entertained of the truth of the story. The manner in which she told it plainly indicated that she was narrating facts. Some inquiries were made respecting her of the keeper of the house, and he, for it was a man, stated that he knew her story to be correct. He had at first employed her as a servant because he wished to help her, but the wages he could pay were insufficient to support her children, and she eventually prostituted herself because she could earn more at this horrible calling, and was thus enabled to discharge her maternal duty. But at what a sacrifice was this obtained! In order to feed her helpless offspring, she was forced to yield her honour. To prevent them suffering from the pains of hunger, she voluntarily chose to endure the pangs of a guilty conscience. To prolong their lives, she periled her own. And at the time when this alternative was forced upon her, the husband was lavishing his money for intoxicating liquor. If she sinned, and this fact cannot be denied, however charity may view it, it was the non-performance of his duty that urged, nay, positively forced her to sin. She must endure the punishment of her offences, but, after reading her simple, heart rending statement, let casuists decide what amount of condemnation will rest upon the man whose desertion compelled her to violate the law of chastity in order to support his children. End of section 49